check, rice checks, and good hot Ralston presents Space Patrol! <laughs> High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! <laughs> In today's transcribed adventure, Cadet Happy is piloting a space observatory while a scientist studies a strange phenomena. It's an invisible force that completely destroys all matter. Right now, Buzz Corey is in Terra the Fifth, warning Happy to veer away from the force, but too late. Out of control, the space observatory whirls toward the invisible menace. Happy! Happy, can you hear me? Pull away from it. I'm trying to, sir, but the rockets don't seem to have any effect. Use full power on your starboard rockets. I am, sir, but we're caught in some sort of a whirlpool. Have hit full repeller ray. If you're caught in there, you're finished. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Hole in Empty Space. <laughs> Hear that, gang? That's right. Buzz Corey will send you a real, honest-to-goodness Space Patrol space set. Sounds just like a walkie-talkie. Looks just like the space Buzz Corey himself uses. Imagine, you can talk on it to someone a straight 50 feet away. Now, let me show you with this space right here. Uh, calling Bob Rate. Can you hear me, Bob? I'll say loud and clear. Just like talking on the walkie-talkie in the telephone, right? Right. I call it the magic phone you can carry anywhere. Yes, sir. See how the space sounds, boys and girls? Just like a telephone. Just like a walkie-talkie. And lots of fun. Yes, sir. So send for your space set today. You get two blue and yellow plastic space You get 50 feet of communication cord. You get a space briefing sheet. Now, here's all you do to get the entire set. Buy a box of Instant Ralston. Then, with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and an instant Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in continental U.S. and may be withdrawn at any time. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. The Space Patrol, with its well-trained personnel, has a very high morale. Disciplinary action is rarely necessary. In fact, a serious infraction of important regulations is so unusual that Commander Corey himself insists on a personal accounting from the man involved. Right now, Buzz is reading a report from the Commandant of the Mercury Patrol Squadron as Happy enters the central office on Terra. Commander. Yes, Happy? Lieutenant Grayson's waiting in the outer office. Oh, thanks. Ask him to come in, please. Yes, sir. Lieutenant Grayson, Commander Corey wants to see you. I'll call you when I'm through here, Happy. Yes, sir. Commander, at ease, Lieutenant. Sit down. Yes, sir. You have an exceptionally fine record. I've been looking it over, and so far I can find no explanation for your behavior of the last few hours. I'm sorry, Commander. Is that all you have to say? Except that I'm ready to take the brainograph test. Lieutenant, it shouldn't be necessary to resort to the brainograph to obtain a routine report from a space patrol officer. I realize that, sir. You return from a routine search mission, three hours overdue and with ammunition expended, yet you refuse to offer any explanation. Those are the facts, Commander. I want a straightforward answer. Why didn't you file a report with your commanding officer? Commander, Colonel Gregory is a practical officer. He goes strictly by regulations, by routine. That's hardly a criticism, Lieutenant. I realize that, sir. But if I told Colonel Gregory what happened out there... He'd conclude that I was, well, space happy. You're not responsible for the conclusions of your commanding officer. In all due respect, Commander, in this case, I'm not so sure. What do you mean? Something's out there in space that regulations don't cover. Commander, I want a brainograph test so I can be sure of myself, sure that my mind isn't playing tricks on me. Grayson, suppose you tell me the whole story. All right, Commander. I was about to head back for Mercury when I saw a meteor. I tracked it on the view scope to see if it was headed toward any shipping lanes. Yes, it was still pretty big on the screen when it suddenly vanished. Exploded? No, sir, just vanished. I started after it and checked for fragments. There weren't any. It was just as though... as though the meteor disappeared into a hole in space. A hole in space? I know it doesn't make sense, but that's the only way I can describe it. Nothing showed up on the viewscope. I, I tried both the ultraviolet and infrared scanners. Nothing. 
What about the cosmic missiles you fired? I swung in a wide circle around the point where the meteor disappeared. Suddenly, a black spot appeared on the sun, as though a planet were between me and the sun, an eclipse. But it wasn't a planet? No, Commander. There was no planet within thousands of DUs. There was nothing, no solid object to account for that spot. Well, maybe it was on the sun itself. No, because it moved across the sun in relation to the movement of my ship. That's when I fired the cosmic missiles. What happened? The missiles vanished. Without an explosion? Without an explosion. Lieutenant, that's the strangest story I ever heard. You don't believe me? I didn't say that. I think your account deserves further investigation. You should have told Colonel Gregory. He'd have put me in the infirmary for mental and emotional checkup. I figured I'd get a brainograph test sooner if I risked disciplinary action. And I was right. He sent me here to Terra immediately. That isn't a very wise risk to take, Grayson. Commander, that thing in space, whatever it is, is moving. Moving toward the inner planets. Can you point out the location where you saw it? On that wall chart? Yes, sir. It was approaching the Mercury orbit on a line from the star Myra. About here, sir. How fast was it moving? It seemed to vary, but at the time I wasn't in any condition to make accurate measurements. I thought I was going space happy for certain. Are you ready for that brainograph test? Yes, sir. And come on. Oh, excuse me, sir. Happy will you get Major Robertson? I want to run a brainograph test. Yes, sir. Oh, here's a top priority bulletin from communications, sir. A robot space freighter vanished. What do you mean, vanished? Well, it suddenly pulled off course. Two passenger ships tracked it. It swung in a wide circle, then smaller and smaller circles, and then just disappeared. Not a trace on the view scopes. Where did this happen? Midway between Mercury and Venus, sir. On an orientation line with Myra. Lieutenant Grayson, I think we'll cancel that brainograph test. Happy. Yes, sir. Get my ship ready immediately. I'll notify Colonel Gregory that Lieutenant Grayson is assigned to temporary duty with headquarters. Thank you, sir. As astrogator aboard Terra 5. Commander, we're out beyond the point where the robot freighter vanished. Very good, Lieutenant. Happy established a zigzag course toward the sun. Yes, sir. We'll lace back and forth across the line between the sun and Myra. Reduce our velocity to 10,000 DUs. Right, sir. All view scopes negative, Commander. What's our approximate position, Grayson? In a few minutes, we'll cross the Venus orbit, sir. Well, this is the craziest search I've ever been on, Commander. Looking for something that isn't here. It's there, all right. It just doesn't show up on any instruments. If you could have seen that meteor vanish and those missiles... No, wait. There's something moving across the sun. A black spot. That's it. We've located it. Now, let's be certain. Check the view scope, Happy. Yes, sir. Does anything register? Nothing except the sun itself. Reverse rockets while I turn on the space phone, Happy. We'll hold our present position for the time being. Commander Corey and Terra 5 to Major Robertson at Space Patrol Headquarters, Terra. Commander Corey to Major Robertson. Major Robertson here. Go ahead, Commander. Robbie, we're at the Venus orbit, Sun Myra orientation. We found what we're looking for. What is it? We don't know. It's visible only as a black spot against the sun. And it definitely is not a solid object. Well, I've contacted Professor Jelka for you, Commander. He's aboard Space Observatory Number 2 off Saturn. Good. Robbie, space phone and all planets bulletin immediately. All shipping is to avoid this sector of space until further notice. Yes, Commander. All commercial, private, and space patrol ships are to evacuate this sector immediately. Roger. Well, Professor Jelka is waiting on the 150 megacycle channel, Commander. Thanks, Robbie. Corey out. Happy switch to 150 MCs. Yes, sir. Commander Corey aboard Terra 5 calling Professor Jelka aboard Space Observatory Number 2. Professor Jelka here. Go ahead, Commander. Professor... Have you detected any unusual phenomenon in space the last few days in the direction of Myra? Mm, no, no, Commander. There's something out there, now within the orbit of Venus. It's not a solid object, but it cuts off light from the sun. Well, it's possibly a cloud of gas or tiny particles. Too sharp an outline, Professor. Besides, things like meteors, cosmic missiles, and spaceships just don't disappear permanently in a gas cloud. Did you say disappear? Vanish completely, without an explosion or a trace. Uh, Commander, I must have a chance to study this thing at once. I think I know what it is. It's got us baffled. What is it? I call it a cycloplex. A cycloplex? I wrote a paper about it 12 years ago, purely as a theoretical idea. This is no theory. It exists. This is marvelous, Commander. With your permission, I pull the space observatory out of the orbit around Saturn and head for your present location. Well, good. No ordinary instruments register it. You might have some that will. Set your vector for Pluto. Where that vector crosses the orbit of Venus, you'll roughly be at our position. Thank you, Commander. I'll contact you when I'm on the vector. Good. Corey out. 
Well, at least there's one man in the solar system who seems to have an idea what this thing is. I hope so. But what's more important, I hope he'll know what to do about it. I've got the observatory in the view scope, sir. It's only a few DUs away. A very good time, considering. Turn on the space phone, Happy. Yes, sir. Corey aboard Terra 5 calling Professor Jelka. Jelka here. Go ahead, Commander. We've picked up the observatory in the view scope. Have you located us? Uh, yes, Commander. But I can't detect the cycloplex. I've used several types of detection devices. You'll see the black disk against the sun in a few minutes. We'll join space locks with you and come aboard the observatory. Very good, Commander. Corey out. Grayson. Yes, sir. Well, Happy and I handle the controls. You watch that black spot. If it moves away from the sun, let me know. Right, Commander. We're abreast of the observatory airlock, sir. Oh, good. Stand by with magnetic holding field. Standing by, sir. Corey to Joker. Uh, go ahead, Commander. Professor. Hold your space observatory on an even vector. We're going to make contact. Yes, Commander. Apply magnetic holding field, Happy. Space lock secured, sir. Lieutenant Grayson, keep an eye on the controls. Happy and I'll enter the observatory. Yes, sir. Open the inner hatch, Happy. Press the release catch in the observatory hull. Come in, Commander. This is the most thrilling moment of my life. Professor Jalka, it's about the most puzzling moment of mine. Well, this is my cadet, Happy. How do you do, Professor? Uh, how do you do? I tell you, Commander, this is a cycloplex, just as I described it 12 years ago. They really do exist. Well, fine, Professor, but tell me, just what is a cycloplex? Well, uh, well, you might call it a hole in space. That's just the way Grayson described it. Grayson? Lieutenant Grayson, the space patrol officer who discovered it. Professor, this cycloplex has already destroyed a meteor, two cosmic missiles, and a robot spaceship. And it's moving toward the inner planets. If it holds its present direction and velocity, Mars will move right into it in a few days. Ah, that would indeed be a calamity. What's the nature of this thing? What happens to objects that move into it? Well, they are transported into other dimensions. Or perhaps into a matrix of several dimensions. Well, they cease to exist in space as we know it, that's certain. Yes, for years, mathematicians have speculated on the possibility of many separate dimensions existing simultaneously. I'd like to circle around it and study it some more. Or to maneuver the observatory and still manage the instruments. Well, Commander, the controls are very much like standard spaceship controls. Couldn't I work them while the professor handles the instruments? Ah, that would be splendid. All right, Happy, you maneuver the observatory. I'll go back to our ship with Grayson. We'll keep you informed as nearly as we can on the location of the cycloplex. Commander, they're getting pretty close. I'll tell Happy to be careful. Commander Corey to Cadet Happy. Happy here. Go ahead, sir. You're bearing pretty close to the cycloplex, Happy. Change your vector. The professor wants me to hold it on this heading, sir. His instruments are beginning to pick up something. Remember what happened to that robot spaceship, Cadet. But this isn't a robot. And the instruments are picking up something. We are on the verge of an exciting discovery, Commander. According to my theory... Well, right now, Professor, I'm relying on Grayson. He's had practical experience with this thing. Happy, this is an order. Pull away from the cycloplex. Yes, sir. Look at the observatory. It's whirling toward it. Happy, pull away from it. I'm trying to, sir, but the rockets don't seem to have any effect. Use full power on your starboard rockets. I am, but we're caught in some sort of a whirlpool. Pat, hit full repeller ray. If you're caught in that cycloplex, you're finished. We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a moment. Hi, gang. Space Patroller Dick Tufel speaking from the planet Earth. Today I'm doing a man-on-the-street report. Going to see what some of these young fellows here on their way to school think about those three checkerboard super cereals, Rice Chex, Wheat Chex, and Instant Ralston. Now, here's a sharp-looking lad. Uh, say, tell me, what did you say the very first time you tried delicious Wheat Chex, that bite-sized super cereal spun out of shredded wheat? What did I say? I said... Enough said. Thank you. Now, here's a fine-looking boy. Uh, say, what do you think of Rice Chex, the bite-sized super cereal made of crisp and crunchy shredded rice? Uh, what did you say, for example, the very first time you tried it? 
Thank you. That's good enough for me. And here's another young man. Tell me, what's your opinion of Instant Ralston, the hot super cereal? Man, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. <laughs> there you are, gang. That's what these fellows think about the checkerboard super cereals. The only three official cereals of the Space Patrol. Try them yourself. You'll say the same thing. Mm-hmm. Man, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. Get them at your grocers today in the red and white checkerboard packages. The super cereals that helped us supercharge you, rice checks, wheat checks, and to warm up your motor, good hot Ralston. A space patrol officer, Lieutenant Grayson, has discovered an alarming peril in outer space, an invisible force that completely destroys matter without leaving a trace. Professor Jelka, an astronomer and mathematician, says this force, which he calls a cycloplex, is actually a hole in outer space. Happy, piloting the space observatory for the professor, flew in too close to the strange force. Now the observatory is being whirled closer and closer to disaster. Meantime, Commander Corey and Lieutenant Grayson in Terror the Fifth are trying desperately to find a way to save Happy and Professor Jelka. Happy, is your repeller ray on full? Yes, sir. All rockets on the starboard side and stern as well. The observatory is being pulled faster than ever toward the cycleplex. Jelka never should have ordered Happy to go so close. The observatories have a very low power ratio in proportion to their mass, Grayson. We can only give it a boost with our own power. You mean make magnetic contact with the observatory? Yes. Great idea, Commander. You realize what'll happen if we fail? I'm waiting your orders, Commander. And let's go. You handle a magnetic holding field, Grayson. Yes, sir. Commander, what are you doing? I'm going to tow you away from the cycloplex. Don't try it, sir. There's some sort of a whirlpool effect. A vortex, the professor calls it. There, if I may have enough power to pull itself and the observatory out of danger. But, sir, you can't... The sooner we act, the better chance we'll all have. Stand by for orders. Standing by, sir. We're ready to make contact, Happy. Grayson, apply magnetic holding field. Yes, sir. All right, Happy. Keep the observatory rockets on full power. Yes, sir. We're going to increase our own power slowly at first. We won't try to fight the cycloplex force too strongly. We'll cut across at a tangent, understand? Yes, Commander. Here we go. Is it working, Commander? I can't tell yet. Happy. Yes, sir. As I increase the ship's power, it'll put a terrific strain on the hull of the observatory. Watch for any sign of damage. I will, Commander. There's that sound again. What is it? It's coming from the space phone system. Happy, do you hear it? Yes, sir. You're picking it up from the professor's instrument. He says it's caused by the cycloplex. Commander, our vector's changing. We're moving away from the cycloplex. We'll add a little more power. Happy, did the professor turn off his instrument? No, sir. Then we're free of the cycloplex pull. That's right, sir. We're swinging away in the other direction. Good. Wow. What a relief. Happy, we'll proceed several DUs away from this position until we're sure we're safe before we break contact. Yes, sir. Then we'll join space locks and come aboard the observatory. Got it? Yes, Commander. I'll maintain vector till further orders. Check. Corey out. Commander. Well, how did the observatory stand up under that pull? Well, apparently quite well. Smoke and rockets, Commander. For a while there, I thought we were all going to plunge right into the core of that cycloplex. I thought so too, Happy. Professor, did you manage to find out anything about this phenomenon? Very little. Although it did finally activate some of the instruments. Well, exactly what is it, this force? I can't say. Apparently, this vortex, the whirlpool effect, is some sort of an electromagnetism. And that might account for its effect on the instruments. And this whirlpool effect extends beyond the core. Yes. It draws the objects into the center if they get too close. We sure found that out. And we also know that this force is moving steadily toward Mars. We've got to get busy and do something. Well, is this cycloplex big enough to swallow a whole planet? What about that, Professor? Well, the core itself is fairly small. But with that vortex of force around it, it might easily demolish Mars. Certainly, it would make it unlivable. Well, how can we fight this cycloplex? Every force we know of has some other force that can oppose it. But this thing is from some other dimension, Commander. It's an intruder into our space-time system. You mean it isn't even from, from another galaxy? From another part of our space? Yes, it's completely new to us, Cadet. It's impossible to imagine dimensions beyond the three we know. Length, breadth, and thickness. Huh? Professor, you mentioned that it has some sort of magnetic effect. That's right, Suppose we could produce a powerful magnetic force to oppose it. Mm, 
It would take more power than any planet power system could produce. And how could we transfer it here? Professor, you've heard of Huddleston's ring, haven't you? Uh, yes. A very interesting effect. What's Huddleston's ring, sir? It makes use of an effect that occurs at temperatures close to absolute zero. Oh, like those of outer space? Exactly. Extremely low temperatures, some metals become superconductors of electricity. Superconductors? They have no resistance to the flow of current. That means if a current is started in a ring made of a superconducting material, it flows indefinitely. Even when the power is cut off? Right. And if the power is constantly applied, the current builds up. It increases more and more. Oh, I see. A scientist named Huddleston has been conducting experiments with a giant ring in outer space near Jupiter. Yes. He has a laboratory spaceship in the center of the ring. Suppose that Huddleston turns the power on full, charging that ring and the magnets around it, and keeps the power on. Would it destroy the cycloplex? Mm, perhaps it would be dangerous. A magnetic force of incredible intensity would be built up. There is no telling. Professor, I want to send Huddleston's ring into that cycloplex. Under robot control, naturally. Well, Professor, do you think it would work? I don't know. But it's a challenging experiment. If it did, it would prove that electromagnetism is a force common to all dimensions of existence. Right now, I'm not interested in proving any theory. I want to save Mars. Happy, let's get back to Terra 5. I want to contact Huddleston. Cycloplex seems to be moving steadily toward Mars, Commander. Keep the ship moving with it, Grayson. Keep that black circle right in the center of the sun. Yes, sir. Major Robertson, Space Patrol Headquarters, Terra, calling Commander Corey aboard Terra 5. I'll take it. Happy to hand me that vector analysis, please. Here you are, sir. Corey here, Robbie. Go ahead. We've contacted Huddleston, Commander. He's all enthused over the idea. Oh, good. How long will it take him to get the ring on the way? Or does he have to convert the controls to robots? No, a robot unit was built into the ship. Huddleston's in the ring waiting for your instructions. Well, here's the procedure, Robbie. Huddleston will pull out of the orbit around Jupiter under manual control. Check. When he's on the vector, which I give you in a minute, a space patrol cruiser will pick him up in space. Huddleston will handle the ring and its slab ship by remote control until we pick it up on our view scope. Got it, Commander. Then I'll take control of the ring from that point on. Okay, Robbie. Now here's the vector I want you to relay to Huddleston. Nothing in the view scope yet, sir. Widen the scanning arc, Happy. The lab ship may be slightly off vector. Yes, sir. Uh, Commander. Yes, Grayson. Cycloplex seems to be increasing velocity. Any change in vector? No, sir. I'll check with Professor Jelka. Corey to Jelka in observatory. Uh, Jelka here. Go ahead, Commander. Lieutenant Grayson reports an increase of velocity by the cycloplex. He's right, Commander. My calculations confirm it. Is it still heading toward Mars? Yes, Commander. Is there any possibility of its changing direction? Uh, I'm afraid its motion is unpredictable. We don't know enough about it. Well, that's all, Professor. Thank you. Commander, look at the view scope. I never saw an image like that before. It isn't very clear, Happy. See if you can get rid of that blur. I'll try it, sir. No, sir. That's as clear as I can get it. I'll check with Robbie. Commander Corey to Major Robertson. Robertson here. Go ahead, Commander. We fixed something up in the view scope, but it doesn't look like Huddleston's ring and lab ship. You got a blurred blotch? Yes. Now, that's the ring, Commander. I've been tracking it from Jupiter. Huddleston says your screen's blur is a tremendous magnetic force. Right, Robbie. I'm ready to take over control of the ring. It's now 14.20 and 15 seconds, universal start time. Tell Huddleston the switchover will occur at 14.21. Corey out. The ring's approaching very fast, Commander. The robot control panel's ready, sir. Fine, Grayson. Happy you take over our controls. Yes, sir. Grayson, feed the view scope data into the vector computer. Yes, sir. I want to get the ring headed for the target as soon as possible after switchover. It might be hard to control if that magnetic force builds up much higher. Ten seconds to switchover. Trajectory computed, Commander. Thanks, Grayson. Five seconds. Three. Zero. Now we'll find out if we've got the ring under control. Watch the view scope, Grayson. See if the ring turns in the new vector. It's responding, Commander. Good. It's heading straight for the cycloplex now. Nothing to do but wait and hope it works. few more seconds, we'll know. Yeah, Huddleston's ring is practically in the outer field of the vortex now. Nothing's happening, though. Wait. The blur around the lab ship seems to be dimming. It's as though the cycloplex were choking down the magnetism. Look, you can see the outline of the ring now. And the lab ship. I'm afraid it's not going to work, Commander. The power of the cycloplex is too strong. Wow, look at that. The lab ship just blew apart. The ring is still intact. The blur is building up again. The magnetic force pulled the ship apart. The ring's in the black circle now. Something's happening. It's a battle of magnetic forces. 
The black circle is growing smaller. It sure is. It's shrinking and rapidly. If that ring can hold up long enough, the, the cycloplex is just a black dot. It's gone. The cycloplex is gone, Commander. It worked. Whew. Look at the view scope, man. Huddleston's ring is still there. Thanks to you, Commander. It saved a planet. It took all of us. Enter the story in our logbook, Happy. Yes, sir. What a mission to describe. We've just filled in a hole in empty space. Hey, uh, maybe I should make the log entry in invisible ink. <laughs> we'll be back with an exciting preview of next week's thrilling Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. Hey, it's got things popping everywhere. It's setting the world on fire. It's even stopping traffic. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the Space Patrol Spaceophone, and I'm going to tell you how to get a set. A set complete with two spaceophones, 50 feet of communication cord, and an official briefing sheet on spaceophoning. What an offer. What an invention. The magic phone you can carry everywhere. Sounds like the walkie-talkie in the telephone. Barrels of fun. You can talk to someone standing a straight 50 feet away. Now, I'll show you with this spaceophone here. Hello, Commander Corey. Hi, Dick. Hi, gang. Aren't these spaceophones terrific? You can play space patrol with them just as though you were a real space patroller living up here on Terra. Yes, sir, gang. Your space phone will look exactly like the one space patrollers use. Only yours will be even more terrific because they're a special model made for use on Earth alone. And good looking, too. And some blue and yellow plastic. Now don't wait. Send for your space phone set today. Complete with two space phones, 50 feet of cord, and a briefing sheet. Now here's all you do. Buy a box of instant Ralston. Then with your name and address. Send 25 cents in coin and an instant Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. And now, an action preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story. Buzz and Happy have been captured by two criminals and are aboard a relay space station near the Pluto orbit. While the criminals are removing a secret power unit, Buzz and Happy are locked in a passageway looking for some method of escape. The lights. What happened to the lights? They must have disconnected the Cosmolite power unit. They'll be coming through the passage in a minute to get us, Commander. They won't need to, Happy. Stecker has already figured out how he's going to get rid of us. How? When they get back into their ship, they're going to leave the relay station airlock open. What? In a few seconds, this passage will be a complete vacuum. Every bit of air will escape into space. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Glow Worm Project, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! And now, a special message from Commander Corey. Boys and girls, this is your commander. I'm now holding an important bottle. When empty, it's worth very little. When filled, it's the most valuable bottle in the world. I mean, when it's filled with the greatest gift one person can give to another, his own blood. America has millions of these bottles to fill, and any grown-up can fill them. So, gang, will you help me get that message across to every grown-up in the USA? Then do this. Join the Space Patrol blood boosters now. Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston, directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Bela Kovach, Ken Mayer, Dick Beals, and Norman Jolly. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol. And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston present Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief, of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy are in their spacesuits investigating a gigantic six-wheeled atomic digging machine on the planet Mercury. 
As they walk across the deeply cracked ground in 300 degree heat, the huge machine starts moving toward them with increasing speed. They're trying to run us down with the machine, Commander. Get to the ship, Happy. It's hard to run in these bulky suits. Maybe we can dodge the driller. Don't try it. The driller's big, but it can turn like a cat. It's gaining on us. Don't look back. Run. Hey! Quick, Happy, on your feet. My foot caught the crevice. Give me your hand. No, you sir. I can't get loose. I'm caught. Commander, get away, please, while you can. The driller's almost on top of us. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The City of the Sun. Hey, gang, listen to this poor old rocket ship here at the Lunar Fleet Base. You know what the trouble is? That rocket's trying to run on ordinary fuel. Now, here's that same rocket ship loaded with super fuel. Now, that's what I call a real blast off. And boys and girls, to get a bright and snappy start, you need super fuel too, especially in the morning. So start your day with a breakfast that supercharges you. A nourishing breakfast with a checkerboard super cereal, like Rice Chex. Triple crisp Rice Chex. Triple crisp because it's toasted three times. And oh boy, is Rice Chex delicious. Makes breakfast sparkle, that's how good it is. Rice Chex. Golden shredded rice biscuits in that modern bite sized design for easy eating. So remember, gang, to start off bright and snappy in the morning, eat a nourishing breakfast with a checkerboard super cereal and get supercharged. Today, try your spoon out on Rice Checks. Commander Corey and Cadet Happy are on the planet Mercury, organizing space patrol units into a search for Professor Mallison, whose spaceship vanished on the dark side of the planet. But now, a second emergency on another part of Mercury sends Buzz and Happy racing to the hot side of the tiny planet to Solaria, the city of the sun. Who's behind the sabotage, sir? I don't know, Happy. So we've got to find out. But I've got a pretty good idea what the motive is. What's that, sir? Solaria has suddenly become very important because of the mineral deposits that have been found about 60 miles south of the city. South? That means it's hotter than the Solaria area. Well, how do they work it? With robot-controlled mining equipment operated from Solaria. In the spacesuits, a few technicians can work in two-hour shifts on the mining site itself. Oh, and whoever sabotaged the power plant doesn't want those mining operations to continue. Yeah, and probably cuts into their own source of revenue. I suppose this is more important, but... I sure would have liked to locate Professor Mallison first. We've got the search units well organized, Happy. They'll comb the entire dark side of Mercury with infrared viewscope scanners. Well, do you think the professor could still be alive, sir? Mm, he's been missing over four days. That would be a long time to hold out in sub-zero temperature on the dark side of the planet. Well, how about the space phone signal picked up yesterday, though? That, that was from Mallison, wasn't it? Mm, it was his code, all right. But it was an automatic signal. It could have been sent from one of the small rockets Mallison had aboard his ship. When released, it automatically sends back information on cosmic radiation, temperature, and Mercury's own magnetic field. Oh, that's what Mallison was studying? Yes. Even if we locate the rocket, it wouldn't mean it's anywhere near Mallison's ship. A commercial spaceship picked the signal up briefly just for a few seconds. All they got was Mallison's identification code and the temperature. 122 degrees below zero. Yeah, which could mean that Mallison released the rocket several days ago and it landed on the dark side of the planet. Right. Commander... What's that? It looks like steam shooting out of the ground down there. It's like a geyser. Geyser on the hot side of Mercury? Happy, check our exact position. I don't like the looks of this. Yes, sir. I'll call Solaria Space Control. Corey and Terra 5 to Space Control Solaria. Corey and Terra 5 to Space Control Solaria. Space Control Solaria to Commander Corey, Lieutenant Orris here. Lieutenant, I'm flying low northeast of Solaria. My cadet and I have sighted something that looks like steam shooting out of the ground. Steam, Commander? Yes, I'll give you our position. Check it against the location of water conduits leading to the city. Yes, sir. Happy, got the data? Yes, sir. We're 10 degrees, 27 minutes, 48 seconds south by 112 degrees, 51 minutes, 08 seconds east. Got that, Lieutenant? Yes, sir. I'll check it against the chart. Commander, do you suppose it is a broken conduit? I don't know what else it could be, Happy. Possibly a quake broke the pipe. Commander, it looks like a broken conduit, all right. Solaria's main water supply line runs right through that point from melting and pumping station number three on the cold side of Mercury. Better check with Solaria water control. See if they've noticed a drop in pressure. Yes, sir. Thanks for telling us. If that's a bad break, we'll be in a tough spot here. Is there a seismograph in Solaria? I believe there is, sir. I suggest you check the city engineering office. Have them contact other cities on the planet and see if there's been a quake in this area. Yes, Commander. We'll circle this vicinity to see if any further trouble develops. Report back when you get the information. Corey out. 
from the looks of that ground down there, sir. They must have a lot of quakes in this region. You mean those deep cracks? Well, those were formed millions of years ago, Happy, when Mercury first began to dry out under the terrific heat. Yeah, but with one side of the planet covered with ice and the other side with blistering heat, well, wouldn't there be a lot of quakes? Well, as far as I know, there hasn't been a serious one reported in recent years. We'll keep circling till we hear from Solaria. Can we take it easy, Burdock? This is pretty rough ground. Well, these atomic drillers weren't made for comfort, bro. And I want to get plenty of distance between us and that broken water conduit. We're going steady with this thing. If we hit one of those cracks at the speed, we'll tip over. Just quit worrying. We're riding on six wheels. And each of them are 20 feet in diameter. And every wheel has its own power drive. I think we're in more danger of being spotted by a space patrol ship than we are of upsetting this monster. What do we do with the driller when we get to our spaceship? We just leave it. It's pretty well camouflaged to blend in with this cracked yellow ground here. We can find it again if we need it. You aren't planning to drill any more holes in the Solaria water supply, are you? No, uh, not right away. But this job will cause plenty of trouble. You think they'll be able to repair it? Probably. But with things like this happening, trouble with power and water, the rival companies are going to think twice about using Solaria as a base of operations. Hey, Burdock, watch it! It nearly tipped us over. Well, we just relax, Joe. We're almost to the ship. Well, sir, it looks like the conduit broke in just that one place. Uh, that's lucky, but even at that, it'll take several hours to get many equipment out here to repair it. Space Control Solaria calling Commander Corey aboard Terra 5. Corey here. Go ahead, Lieutenant. A maintenance crew is getting ready to leave Solaria now, Commander. They know the location. Oh, good. We'll head for Solaria. What about the seismograph reports? No quakes have been detected anywhere on Mercury, sir. The chief engineer doesn't understand how that conduit could have broken. How's your water supply? Pressure has dropped to less than a quarter of normal, sir. We're already on a strict water rationing. Nearly all industries have been ordered to shut down for 24 hours. Will it take that long to repair the damage? At least. Oh, uh, Commander, Colonel Henderson thought you might be interested in a report on Professor Mallison. Well, yes, I am. Have they found him? No, sir. But another automatic signal was picked up by a cargo ship, apparently from a grounded instrument rocket. It isn't much help. What do you mean? It's sending inaccurate information. The cargo ship pilot got a rough fix before the signal stopped. It's on the hot side of Mercury... But the temperature data was 122 degrees below zero. Same as the other report. The sending mechanism must have been damaged when the rocket landed. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks, Lieutenant. I'll contact you when we reach Solaria. Corey out. All right, Happy. Get on vector for Solaria. Yes, sir. Hey, wait a minute. Look down there on the ground. What is it, Commander? See those gouges? A sort of crisscross pattern. Yeah, two rows of them. They're tracks. <laughs> what would make tracks that far apart? Some heavy earth-moving machinery, probably. Oh, from when the conduit was laid. Uh, I don't think so. Focus the viewscope toward the steam spout. There, see? The tracks end right near the place where the break is. Say, that's right. Follow those tracks in the other direction, Happy. Hey, they lead away from Solaria. That makes them interesting. Any surface equipment out here would be more likely to come from Solaria than anywhere else. We're going to find out where those tracks lead. Just a few minutes more, Grove. Our ship's on the other side of the jagged butte. Well, she'll be glad to get out of this villa. You're mighty peculiar, aren't you? You don't like spaceships either. Who says I don't? Well, didn't you get space sick the other day? Well, or was it because I shot down the lab ship? You shouldn't have done that, Burdock. He wasn't bothering us. It was on some scientific mission. Well, it's just too bad. He came snooping around just as we blasted off from our hideout. We didn't have a chance. Don't be so squeamy. By acting quickly, we probably kept the space patrol from spotting us near the power relay station. And what's the matter? The review scope. It's a ship. Yeah. It's flying low, right toward us. You think they see us? I don't know. Hey, why'd you stop the driller? Because if we're moving, they might spot us. But with the sides and top of the drill camouflage, they might not notice. Well, they went right over. It's a space patrol ship. They must have spotted the break in the water line. Yeah, but why were they going so slow? How do I know? We'll just sit tight and see what they're up to. Happy, look down there. The tracks stop. It's hard to tell that... The ground must be packed almost as hard as concrete in some places. I'll circle back. Use the viewscope scanner. Yes, sir. Uh-oh. Hey, there is something down there. A hump of something. A small hill, maybe. Now, look closer. Did you ever see a hill on wheels? Yeah, 
I can see it now. It's a big piece of machinery, and it's camouflage. Happy, get our spacesuits out of the locker. I'm setting the ship down. Yes, sir. Check the refrigeration units and the suits carefully. We're going to be walking around in oven temperature down there. They must have seen us. Why would they land their ship clear out here? Just take it easy, Grove. We're safe in the driller. Nobody could get in unless we opened the door. Somebody's getting out of the ship. Two men. Yeah. Hey, that's Terra 5. Come into Corey's ship. If we don't open up, Corey will go back to his ship and report us. They'll send a crew out here with cutting torches. If Corey gets back to the ship. How can we stop him? We'll stop him all right. You just wait and see. Wow, now that we're on the ground, that machine looks enormous. It's an atomic driller, Happy. The camouflage covers the drill part, but it's built to cover the toughest kind of terrain and drill through solid rock. Yeah, then that's what happened to the water conduit. Drilling into the main would be simple for that machine. Yeah, it looks that way. Have your gun ready, Happy. Whoever's in there probably won't be too eager to answer questions. Hey, Commander, it's moving. They're making a getaway. Get back to the ship, Happy. Yes, sir. Commander, it's coming toward run, us. Run, Happy. They're trying to run us down. It's, it's hard to run in these bulky space suits. Maybe we can dodge the driller. Don't try it unless you have to. That driller's big, but it can turn like a cat. The, gr- the ground's so full of cracks and ditches. Commander, it's gaining on us. Don't look back. Run. Hey. Half on your feet, quick. My foot's caught in the crevice. Now give me your hand. Run for it, Commander. They can't get both of us. You've got to get away. No, give me your hand, Half. No, you, sir. I'm caught. Commander, look out. The driller's right on top of us. You've got to leave me. We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a moment. Shh. Space Patroller Dick Tufeld, gang. I've got a secret for you. Wait till I close the door. Okay? Now, here's a secret Buzz Corey wants you to know about. The secret of how Space Patrollers get a rip-roaring start in the morning. Now, here's what they do. They eat a breakfast that supercharges them. A good breakfast with one of the three checkerboard super cereals. Rice Chex, Wheat Chex, and Instant Ralston. Chex, they're the super cereals with that modern bite-sized design. The cereals with a swell new taste you'll like right off the reel. And to warm up your motor, there's Instant Ralston, the hot super cereal. Has a heart of the wheat flavor that you'll really warm up to. So now you know how space patrollers get that rip-roaring morning start. Get a flying start yourself every morning, gang. Sit down to a nourishing breakfast with a checkerboard super cereal and get supercharged. Rice checks, wheat checks, good hot Ralston, the super cereal. Flying low above the hot side of the planet Mercury, Buzz and Happy have sighted a gigantic atomic drilling machine. The driller is driven by Burdick and Grulf, who have bored a hole in the water conduit leading to Solaria, a city in the sun-baked Mercury desert. Buzz and Happy don spacesuits to investigate a cleverly camouflaged drilling machine. Suddenly, the driller started up, rolling across the cracked and fissured earth on its six giant wheels. Happy caught his foot in a large crack in the ground. And now, as Buzz tries to pull Happy free, the enormous driller roars down upon them. It's no use, sir. It's still right after us. It's going to crush us. Fall flat. Dive into that crevice quickly. Yes, Happy, are you all right? I guess so, sir. I'm half buried in the dirt. Uh, don't move yet. Stay down in the crevice until the driller's out of sight. We don't want them coming back to finish the job. I sure thought we were goners when that big thing thundered over us. We were lucky to find a crevice deep enough. They're still going, I guess. Yeah. Fortunately, they didn't stop to wreck our ship. That means they're sure they crushed us under the wheels. The driller's completely out of sight now, sir. All right, into the ship, Happy. We won't take time to get out of these suits till after we blast off and start our search for that drilling machine. Well, here we are. Here's your spacesuit, Burdock. Get into it. Let's get to the ship. Mm, I see you're all ready. Yeah, all but the face piece. You know, sometimes I get the impression you don't enjoy riding in a driller. Let the funny stop. Let's get out of here. <laughs> How do we know Corey didn't send a space phone message before he got out of his ship? You're right, Grove. But before we leave, I'm going to set a magnesium bomb and leave it in here. What for? I'll make sure that this drill is useless to anybody else. And it'll leave this cab in such a mess that the space patrol can't find any fingerprints. All right. All right, but let's get at it. 
There's something up ahead, sir. Looks like smoke. You're right, Happy. It's the drilling machine that's on fire. It's not moving. Hey, do you suppose whoever was in it got out? Well, let's hope so. Uh, wait a minute. By the color of the smoke, that must be magnesium. It must have been deliberately started to wreck the control mechanism. But where's the driver? Uh, take a look at that scorched area on the ground a few yards from the driller. A blast-off scar. Uh-huh. Our driller operator had a spaceship hidden here. Turn on the viewscope, Happy. Maybe you can pick up a trace of him. I'll contact Space Control Solaria. Commander Corey aboard Terra 5 calling Space Control Solaria. Commander Corey calling Space Control Solaria. This is Space Control Solaria, Commander. Lieutenant R.S. speaking. Lieutenant, relay this bulletin to all Mercury Space Patrol units. Yes, sir. A spaceship of unknown type just blasted off from the vicinity of the broken water conduit. Interrogate all space-borne private craft. Ground all suspicious ships and hold the occupants. I'll relay that message, Commander. Can you give any sort of description of the ship? No, we merely saw the blast-off scar. Looked like it was from a small space cruiser. That water main break was deliberately sabotaged. An atomic driller did the job. Atomic driller? Yes. We found it abandoned near the break. Tell Colonel Henderson I want investigators sent out to examine it. They'll need firefighting equipment. Yes, sir. Make an immediate check of all known atomic drilling machines on Mercury. Where they are and who has them. Yes, Commander. How's the water situation in Solaria? It's even more serious than we thought, sir. We're setting up cargo ships to bring some in from other cities. Oh, uh, Commander, a Venus-bound passenger ship reported seeing a wrecked lab ship south of Solaria. The pilot thought it might be Professor Mallison's ship. South of Solaria? How far south? Fifteen D.O., sir. That's the hottest part of the planet. Even if the ship wasn't badly damaged by the crash, it looks bad for Mallison. The same passenger ship also picked up Mallison's automatic coat, sir. And another temperature report. 122 degrees below zero. Below zero? That seems impossible. Have you sent any units to investigate? Not yet, sir. Colonel Henderson... Uh, yes, I know. You've got problems of your own, Lieutenant. You give me the location of that crash ship. I'll investigate it myself. And 87 degrees, 16 minutes, 43 seconds west. Good I... I suppose that's the ship you shot down. Shut up, Inverness. I got their frequencies, both of them. Got it, Lieutenant. One more thing, Commander. The passenger ship pilot isn't sure, but he thought he saw something moving near the crashed ship. It doesn't seem likely. No, it doesn't. But I'll get there as quickly as I can. Corey out. Corey alive? Yeah. It was somebody else we ran over with the driller. Cut it off. That is the first ship you shot down, and there's someone still alive. There couldn't be. That was four days ago. And even in the best space suit made, nobody could live four days in that heat. What are we going to do? We're going to make sure. Maybe we can get there before Corey does. And if not, we'll cut Corey's investigation short. Murdoch, maybe we didn't kill those men with the driller. Maybe it was Corey and somebody else, and they escaped somehow. Well, if he did, he wouldn't escape this time. You marked down those coordinates, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, they're right here. All right. I'll take the controls. You get on the view scope. We don't want to get close to another ship, especially Corey's. We're nearly to the location, sir. Drop her down a few thousand feet, Hap. Yes, sir. Yeah, this part of Mercury looks even worse than where we were before. Rougher terrain. Yes, and it's even hotter. Close to 500 degrees. Now, listen. Get that down, Hap. Yes, sir. M-L-S-28. Mercury Lab Ship 28. That's Mallison's identification code. Temperature minus 122 degrees. Hey, it cut out. Minus 122 degrees, I got a fix in that signal, Happy. It's almost directly below us. Look. It's a cracked up ship, all right. A lab job, too. Get your spacesuit on, Happy. Yes, sir. Whatever we do, we've got to do it fast. Hey, Commander, down there by that cliff, it's a man in a spacesuit. That's incredible. He's waving to us. Stand by for repeller ray. That's a lab ship, all right. Even in the viewscope, you can see it's pretty badly smashed up. Yeah, but we're too late. Curry ship is landing right near it. What do we do? He'll probably go in to find what's left of Mellison. When he does, we'll swoop down and bless the wreckage, and then shoot up Terrify. Better not get so low, Burdock. They may see us. There's not much they can do about it. Anyway, I'm keeping between them and the sun. Nobody's going to look up at the sun, especially here on Mercury. Wait a minute. They're running right past the ship. Where are they going? Oh, maybe. Seeing something close to the cliff. Burdock, it's a man. And he's alive. After four days in the blessed furnace down there, it's impossible. See for yourself. Uh, must be Mellison. We've got to make sure that none of them get out of here. Get your spacesuit on, Grove. We aren't going to land. Not unless we have to. But I'm going to make sure that all three of them are finished before we leave here. 
Check your suit spacer phone, Happy. That's working okay, sir. And so's the temperature control. Yeah, we'll need it. All right, open the outer hatch. Allison's acting pretty strange, sir. He just stands over there and motions to us instead of coming toward us. It's hardly a normal way to greet rescuers. Let's see if the spacesuit transmitter's working. Professor Mallison, this is Commander Corey. Can you read me? He's just waving more excited than ever. Professor, if you hear me, hold both hands over your head. He's doing it. Apparently he can hear us, but his transmitter's out. I thought I heard something in the earphones just for a second and another voice. Professor, is there some reason why you want us to come over there? If there is, hold your hands straight out at your sides. Yeah, that's what he wants us to do. We better do as he asks. How did he manage to survive in this heat? Commander, it's a cave. Yeah, I see. Commander, can you hear me now? Oh, yes, Professor. My space phone wasn't working, so I couldn't answer you. Commander, you've got to look at this. It's a happy surprise to find you alive, Professor. That spacesuit must be remarkably resistant to heat. It isn't the suit that's responsible. Just look in here, where the beam from my atomic light is shining. It just looks like an ordinary cave. Further back, look at the walls. You mean that shiny blue-black mineral? Commander, that's ice. Ice? Ice. In this part of Mercury? Right. Thousands of tons of it, perhaps millions. That's how you manage to stay alive. It's cool in the cave. Yes, with 570 degrees outside, inside it's a constant 122 below zero. And your automatic rocket transmitter was right. Commander, do you realize what this underground ice means to Mercury, to the people of Solaria in particular? You mentioned millions of tons. A conservative estimate. Think how easily it could be melted and piped to Solaria. Only a matter of a few miles in comparison with the present haul of more than a thousand. It certainly is a timely discovery. Dozens of conduits can be built from here to Solaria at a fraction of the cost of the one line that was broken. A spaceship? Yeah, it must be a space patrol craft. Let's get to our ship, Professor. Believe me, this news will be welcome in Solaria. Well, what I don't understand is how all this ice could be underground in the hot part of Mercury. The rock above insulates it. This is not a new phenomenon by any means. Why, on the planet Earth, more than a thousand years ago, Indians in the Arizona desert used to get ice from a natural cavern such as this. Hey, wait a minute. That's not a space patrol ship. It's a private cruiser. You're right, sir. It's taxiing around on repeller ray. I've seen that ship before. Why, it's the one that shot my lab ship down. Are you sure? I'm positive. Hey, what's a crazy fool doing? He's backing the ship right toward the cave. You better get out of here or he'll run over us. Got something worse than that in mind. He's seen us and doesn't want us to get out. Well, maybe he's just backing up to get room to blast off between here and the opposite wall of the canyon. Up in your life. Quickly, get out of the cave. He's going to put his stern in here and turn on his rocket blast. Lucky we saw him in time to get out of the cave. Now get behind this rock. Maybe he won't see us from the ship. Hey, you're right, Commander. He's pushing the tail of his ship back in the cave with blasts from his forward rocket. He really intends to see that we don't get away from here. But keep close to the rock. I think we'll be safe here. Hey, he's keeping his forward rockets on to hold the ship in the cave. Something tells me he's going to regret this. ship's wrecked. He shot right across the canyon into the opposite wall. His hand must have slipped off the controls. No, Happy. The heat from his rocket exhaust turned the ice into steam and it popped the ship out of the cave like a cork. We'd better get over there, Commander. They may be badly hurt. If they haven't got spacesuits on, they haven't a chance. Commander, I see somebody getting out. Yeah, there are two of them. And they do have spacesuits on. Let's get them. By their attitude, I don't think we'll have any trouble. No, sir. You know, uh, during the last few minutes, sir, I've really realized what a wonderful thing water is. Isn't that so? Yes, sir. In the form of ice, it saved Professor Mallison's life. And when those two fellows turned it into steam, it uh, simply cooked their goose. (laughs) (laughs) An exciting preview of next week's new Space Patrol adventure after this important question. Have you sent for your Space Patrol spacophone yet? You better hurry! hurry! Yes, sir, this sensational offer is soon going to end. And you don't want to be left without one of these thrilling new space phone sets, do you? No, siree. So, hurry! More fun. You can talk back and forth on the space phone to someone a straight 50 feet away. Just like talking on the telephone. Complete with two space phones, 50 feet of communication cord, and secret briefing sheet. Now remember, these are official space phones, made especially for you on Earth. Real beauties, too. Gleaming blue and yellow plastic. Look exactly like the space phones Buzz Corey and the gang use. So don't wait a single day. Hurry! Hurry!
Yes, sir, you have to hurry, because this offer soon comes to an end. To get the complete Space Patrol Spaceophone set, do this. Buy a box of Instant Ralston. Then, with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and an Instant Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in continental U.S. and may be withdrawn at any time. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. And now for a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story. Buzz and Happy have just entered a spaceship in Neptune City spaceport in search of a traitor against the United Planets. They pause in the open hatch a moment. He may be up forward, tampering with the controls. Wrong guess, gentlemen. Commander, look out! Here we are, Cadet. I've got a ray gun. Yeah, well, I've got a... I warned you. Carter, put down that gun. Don't try to get to your feet, Commander. What are you doing in this ship? Preparing it for its last voyage. (laughs) There's an explosive hidden aboard. Time to go off two hours after blastoff. And you, my friend, (laughs) will be aboard. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Queen of Space. Boys and girls, this is your commander. Do you know how life-giving oxygen is carried to the cells of the body? By the bloodstream. So when a person loses a great deal of blood in an accident or in sickness, there's not enough blood left to do that job. Result? The person dies. So will you help me save lives by joining the Space Patrol blood boosters? It's fun. It's patriotic. So join the Space Patrol Blood Boosters today. Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmerer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Ken Mayer and Norman Jolly. Dick Tufel speaking. Now don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks Rice Checks and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol. And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston present Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy have just entered a spaceship in Neptune City spaceport in search of a traitor against the United Planets. They pause in the open hatch a moment. He may be up forward, tampering with the controls. Wrong guess, gentlemen. Commander, look out! Stay where you are, cadet. Oh, yeah? Cardo, put down that gun. Don't try to get to your feet, Commander. You'll get what the cadet got. What are you doing in this ship? Preparing it for its last voyage. There's an explosive hidden aboard. Time to go off two hours after blastoff. And you, my friends, will be aboard. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Queen of Space. (laughs) Gang, this is Space Patroller Dick Tufeld at an aqua jet boat race on Mars. Now, my favorite is the shooting star. But hey, it doesn't have a chance. That driver's filling up the tank with ordinary fuel. You see what I mean? No zip, no zoom. Hey, but wait. The driver's now putting in some super fuel. Wow, look at the shooting star go. Bound to be a winner now because she's supercharged. Supercharged with super fuel. Now, you want to be a winner too, don't you, gang? You bet. In sports, in school, in everything you do. Well, then remember the story of the shooting star. Ordinary fuel, ordinary start. Super fuel, super start. So don't wait. Get supercharged. And gang, get supercharged the way Buzz Corey does. Eat a good breakfast with a checkerboard super cereal, like rice checks or wheat checks. 
some cereals, yes, sir. If you want flavor, just get Chex. If you want something different, just get Chex. C-H-E-X, Chex. Right for a bite, because they're bite-sized. Get them at your grocer's today in the red and white checkerboard package. Rice Chex, Wheat Chex, the bite-sized super cereals that help to supercharge you. Commander Corey, Cadet Happy, and Tonga, Assistant Security Chief of the United Planets, are on the planet Uranus to investigate a series of accidents that have occurred to passenger ships. In the chart room of the Space Patrol office, Buzz is briefing Happy and Tonga. You two have made a lot of flights between the outer planets, so I don't have to impress on you the tremendous distances involved. No, sir. And you know that here in Uranus, we're outside the orbits of seven of the ten planets of the solar system. And yet we're barely halfway between the Sun and Pluto. That's right. Now, everyone realizes that the companies running freight and passenger ships between Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto are working under handicaps. Yeah, the long hauls cut down on their profits. Right. A freighter could make 16 trips from Earth to Mercury, for example, while other freighters make only one trip from Neptune to Pluto. But that doesn't explain all these accidents on the outer planet runs. No, it doesn't, Tonga. At least not entirely. Unless unless the companies are cutting down on safety checkups to save money. Robbie and I thought that was the explanation at first. However, it's a pretty short-sighted company that would cut corners on inspections, especially when it keeps losing ships like Spaceways Incorporated. Now, one good thing, no passengers have been lost. Not yet. It's our job to find out what the trouble is before any human lives are sacrificed. Well, from the report, Spaceways Incorporated had had most of the accidents. Yes. Of course, they are a new concern. They haven't had the experience that trans-orbit lines have had. Commander... Isn't Transorbit operated by a woman? Yes. And she's a very capable manager, according to all reports. Her name is Jelna Fenton. Well, I, I thought Transorbit just handled the uh, inner planet surface. Yeah, they did until recently. But now they have half a dozen ships on the runs between Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Have they been having trouble, too? Yeah, a little, but not nearly so much as spaceways. Now, our regular space patrol inspectors haven't been able to find the source of the difficulty. So we're going to do a little undercover work. That's where you come in, Tonga. Yes, Commander. You'll pose as a writer for a magazine, gathering material for a series of articles on living conditions on the outer planets. Good. Then I can make trips from planet to planet without arousing suspicion. Yes, and we'll give you a chance to observe conditions around spaceports and watch the personnel. What do you and I do, Commander? Well, for the time being, we'll just make routine inspections of space patrol bases and keep in touch with Tonga. How do you want me to contact you, Commander? Use your miniature spacophone. Keep it with you at all times. I will. And don't use it when there's anyone around. When do I start? Immediately. There's a spaceways passenger ship leaving Uranus for Pluto in the morning. Be aboard it. Right, Commander. Happy now, blast off in Terra the Fifth a few hours after your ship leaves. I got your message, gentlemen. What's up? You can cancel that trip to Mercury, Cardo. You're staying here on Neptune. What about that spaceway ship I was supposed to um, fix? I've already arranged it. Oh, what happens this time? Does the oxygen reclaiming unit give out? No, we won't use that one again for a while. I've got a better one. Yeah? What? The orbit computer. It's been tampered with, so it'll give the wrong vector. Oh, that's not so serious. Oh, isn't it? On a run to Pluto with a full passenger list? You know how little reserve power those spaceway ships have. Hey, that's right. They'll run out before they can get back on course. Unless they get a spaceophone fix from space control. They won't be able to. Halfway to Pluto, their spaceophone power unit will fail. <laughs> a few more accidents like this and nobody will get aboard a spaceway ship. Which means that Transorbit will have all the business. I've sure got to hand it to you, gentlemen. At first, I thought you were crazy to take on these outer planet runs. I mean, it would have been crazy if we were merely going to be satisfied with a few crumbs that spaceways didn't want to be bothered with. If you keep on, Jelna, you'll be known as the Queen of Space. The Queen of Space. You know, Cardo, I think I rather like it. We're on vector, sir. Yes. You know, that's the fourth time you've checked in the last half hour. We're on automatic control. Well, gee, sir, a guy has to do something to keep busy. We're still 10 million DUs from Pluto, and I've read every tech manual in the ship. Imagine having to make this run every day, Happy, on a freighter. Oh, no, thanks. I'd go crazy. Tonga calling Commander Corey. Tonga calling Commander Corey. Maybe she's getting bored, too. <laughs> Corey here. Go ahead, Tonga. Commander, something's wrong aboard this passenger ship. Well, what's the trouble? Where are you? I'm in my private compartment. I think the ship is off course. Happy, get a fix on Tonga's signal. Yes, sir. What makes you think you're off course, Tonga? I overheard a couple of the crew members whispering. They don't want to alarm the passengers, but I know the steward is very worried. Well, how could the ship get off course? Oh, I don't know, but I heard the steward say that the ship's space phone is out of commission. Does anyone aboard know you've got a miniature space phone? No, Commander. I've got a fixer. 
We sure are off course by nearly 30 degrees. Did you hear that, Tonga? Yes. And they must have been off for some time. There are thousands of DUs from the regular space lane. Now, Tonga, listen. I could space phone the correct course to you to give to the pilot, but that would mean somebody would know you're a space patrol agent. Of course, if the ship is really in trouble... Oh, I don't think so. At least not yet. Well, then Happy and I'll change vector and come close enough so that the pilot will pick us up in his view scope. He'll naturally follow us. And you'll lead the ship to Pluto. Oh, just a minute. Got the position charted, Happy? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, they're about here. Mm-hmm. Tonga, you're much closer to Neptune than to Pluto. These outer planet ship line operations don't have too much reserve power. We'll lead you back to Neptune. All right, Commander. We're changing vector now. We should be in view scope range in about half an hour. Go out and mingle with the passengers. Contact me if any serious trouble develops. Right, Commander. Corey, out. Well, Happy, what was it you were saying about this Pluto run being boring? Here's that schedule of spaceways flights, Jelna. Most of them are inward bound from Pluto. Mm, Spaceways Common is due this afternoon at Neptune City Spaceport. Leaves for Neptune's moon tomorrow morning. That doesn't give us much time. True, but it might give us a fine opportunity. How do you mean? With a short haul to the moon coming up tomorrow, chances are the maintenance crew won't do much work on the ship. Yeah, that's right. They'll wait till he gets back, unless there's something that needs immediate attention. All right, Cardo. Keep an eye on the comet when it comes in. After that long run from Pluto, the pilot and the rest of the crew will probably head for town for a good time. Yeah, you're right, Jelna. Say, I wonder how that other ship's making out, the big passenger job. Right now, the pilot's probably discovering he's millions of DUs off course and with a low power supply. But don't start making any inquiries, Carter. Don't worry. I'll wait for the official announcement. Another Spaceways ship lost. think they see us, sir? They ought to. They show up strong enough in our view, Scott. Well, I hope the pilot has sense enough to follow us. He'll probably be very glad to, Happy. I want to change vector now. Watch the screen see if he follows us. Yes, sir. How about it, Happy? I think he's got the idea all right, sir. Tonga calling Commander Corey. Corey here. Go ahead, Tonga. I'm back in my compartment. Everything's all right. Good. Does the pilot know we're headed for Neptune? He just made an announcement through the public address system. We passengers have been told that the ship is making an emergency landing in Neptune. There's no panic, I hope. No, we've been assured that it's nothing serious. There's a lot of grumbling about the delay, but nobody's alarmed. Well, find out all you can, Tonga. I'll arrange to meet you when you land on Neptune. Jelma, something went wrong. What do you mean? That ship that was supposed to get lost in the run to Pluto. Well, what about it? Just landed here on Neptune, of all the rotten breaks. But the orbit computer did fail, didn't it? Yes, but a space patrol ship happened along, and the pilot followed him to Neptune. Did you say happened along? Yes. Apparently, the space patrol ship didn't even know the passenger ship was in trouble. At least the space patrol didn't attempt to make contact. Well, maybe it's better this way. Now we've got 35 or 40 unhappy passengers. We'll tell their friends what an inefficient line Spaceways is. Next time, they'll all take trans-orbit. One thing I admire about you, Jelna, you always look on the bright side of things. How about the comet? It's working out the way you said it would. The crew headed for town for a good time, and the ship is due for an overhaul after it gets back from Neptune's moon. But it won't get back, Cardo. It's going to be blown up on the way. Blown up? Yes. You can sneak aboard tonight and plant an explosive in one of the aft compartments. I suggest the emergency rations compartment. Suppose they check the ship before blast-off. It isn't likely they'd check the emergency rations before a short trip to that moon. Especially when there's a major overhaul coming up in a couple of days. I've got it all worked out. The explosive will be in a regular emergency ration. I've looked all over the spaceport, Commander, and I can't find Tonga. I wonder what's delaying her. She's had plenty of time to check in at the space hotel and get back here. Shall I look again, sir? And maybe she's over in wing B. Oh, here she comes, Happy. Yeah, she sees us. Let's move over here behind these pillars. Remember, Half, don't call her by name. Commander. What did you find out? The orbit computer in the ship had been tampered with. So had the space phone transmitter. So somebody wanted that ship to get lost. Yes. And I picked up a very interesting rumor about who might be behind it. Who? I've been talking to some of the Spaceways employees. They think Lance Orbit is trying to run them out of business. Well, that's a serious charge. Do they have any evidence? No, but I heard a certain name mentioned. Uh, Brox Cardo. Brox Cardo, huh? Yes. Cardo works for John Fenton of Trans Orbit. And what's Cardo supposed to do? Well, I couldn't learn anything specific, but 
I get the impression that Carter would do just about anything. Transorbit's main offices are here in Neptune City. Happy maybe you and I can check up on this, Cardo. Yes, sir. And, Tonga, the best thing for you to do is go ahead with our original plan. You mean go on to Pluto? Yes. When is the next passenger ship leaving for Pluto? Spaceways hasn't any scheduled until day after tomorrow. But there is a trans-orbit ship leaving tomorrow morning. And take that one. Oh, and by the way, this might be a good time to start gathering material for those magazine articles you're supposed to be writing. Oh? Huh? See if you can get an interview with Jelna Fenton at Transorbit. All right, Commander. In the meantime, happy now, check up on Brock's Cardo. Slow down a little, Happy. We don't want Cardo to suspect we're trailing him. Yes, sir. He's heading for that spaceship. Well, that's the comet. Just got in from Pluto this afternoon. See, it's a beautiful ship, isn't it, sir? Yes, it's the pride of spaceways. Now, hold it, Happy. Cardo's getting in the ship. Yes. I'm very curious to know why a transorbit employee is snooping around a spaceways ship. What do you suppose he's got in that box he's carrying? Suppose we find out. Come on, Happy. Been in there a long time. Up the ladder, Happy. Let's find out just what he's up to in there. Which way, sir? Look up forward. He may be tampering with the controls. Wrong guess, gentlemen. Commander, look out! Stay where you are, cadet. Oh, yeah? Cardo, oh, no, put I... down that gun. No. I'll try to get your feet, Commander. You'll get what the cadet got. What are you doing in this ship? Preparing the comet for its last voyage. What do you mean? There's an explosive hidden in the aft compartment. Time to go off two hours after blast-off tomorrow. But there'll be passengers aboard. Yes, I know. It looks like there'll be two extra passengers, Commander. The cadet and you. We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a moment. Gang, this is Space Patroller Dick Tufel speaking from the Interplanetary School Stadium on Terra. Just saw a swell football game here. Listen to this crowd cheering the winners. Yes, it sure is fun when you're a winner and hear something like that. Right, gang? But remember, to be a winner, you have to be supercharged. And here's the way to take care of that. Eat a good breakfast with rice checks or wheat checks, the bite-sized super cereals that help to supercharge you. Delicious? Why, there's sure plenty of zing in that Rice Chex flavor. And man, oh man, Rice Chex biscuits are toasted and toasted to make them crisper and crisper. And Wheat Chex, ah, there's a flavor you'd fly to the moon for. Now remember, it's fun to be a winner and hear this. So move right up and be a winner. Move right up to the table for a breakfast that supercharges you. A good breakfast with Rice Chex or Wheat Chex. Get them today, gang, and get supercharged. At the Neptune City spaceport, Commander Corey and Cadet Happy entered a spaceship to apprehend a suspected saboteur. The saboteur, Brox Cardo, attacking Buzz and Happy by surprise, put them to sleep with a ray gun. Now heavily bound and gagged, they're locked in a compartment in the spaceship in which Carter was planted an explosive, time to go off two hours after the ship blasts off for Neptune's moon. Meanwhile, following Buzz's instructions, Tonga has called on Jelna Fenton, head of the Transorbit Space Lines, in her office on Neptune City. To obtain information, Tonga is posing as a writer for the Inner Planets Weekly magazine. You've given me some very interesting facts, Miss Fenton. I won't take up any more of it. Jelna, I... Oh, excuse me. Oh, it's quite all right. I, I was just leaving. Oh, this young lady's writing an article about us for the Inner Planets Weekly. Well, that's, uh, that's fine. Thank you again, Miss Fenton. Goodbye. Goodbye. And I think you're very wise to take a transorbit ship to Pluto. Thank you. <laughs> the girl's not much of a space traveler. She was on the ship that got lost, frightened her to death. That's so? Now I am glad that ship got here safely. She'll write up her horrible experience on a spaceway ship. And give Transorbit a nice plug. Yeah, so well. Now, what I wanted to And I managed to work in that line of yours. You know, calling me the Queen of Space. Oh, of course, I did it very modestly. Yeah, sure, Jolly. But listen, I planted the explosive in the comet, all right. Oh, good. Did anyone see you? Yes. Commander Corey of the Space Patrol. What? Now, don't worry. I took care of him and his cadet both. They're locked up in the ship. When the ship blows up tomorrow, they'll Wait. be... Thoughts 
herself. She was listening. Who? That girl, the reporter. Oh, do you think she heard us? We've got to find out. Come on, Cardo. We'll follow her and see where she goes. Oh, if I can only get my hands free. We've got to get loose, Happy. There's a bomb aboard this ship. Cardo set it to go off, and the ship's about halfway to Neptune's moon. There. I'll untie your hands. Thank you, sir. I don't know how we're going to get out of this compartment, but we've got to. Well, when somebody comes aboard, maybe they can hear us pounding on the door. Possibly. This ship is heavily soundproof. Can't even hear the roar of the rockets when... I wonder. You mean maybe we've already blasted off? That could be. Listen. No. I don't hear anything. There's no telling how long that ray gun put us to sleep. If we're in flight now, that bomb may go off any second. Look, let's try banging on the door. All right. Hey, open up. Open up. Anybody out there? Open up. Oh, wait a minute. Do you hear anything? Yes. Hey, somebody's heard us. Hey, Tonga. Commander. Happy, are you all right? Yes, Tonga, but how did you know we were here? I overheard Carter tell Jung. Oh, so we haven't blasted off. Obviously not. Now we've got to find that bomb and get it out of the ship. Yes, sir. Commander, I think Carter and Jelna are after me. They may think so, Tonga, but as a matter of fact, we're after them. As soon as we fix that bomb, we'll be on our way. Let's get at it, Happy. I can carry the bomb, sir. It's not heavy, huh? Are you sure that's the right box? Yes, Tonga. It's the only one that was hidden in the emergency ration storage compartment. Yeah, you can tell by the weight. This box is twice as heavy as the others. Happy, you and I'll take this bomb to the Space Patrol emergency officer here at the spaceport for detonating. And we'll all meet later at gate 7. Yes, sir. Tonga, while we're doing that, you call Neptune Unit Space Patrol headquarters and alert them to pick up Cardo and gel the fence. Look, there they are. We're too late, Jelna. That girl set them loose. Why didn't you give the commander and that cadet another blast with a ray gun? It would have kept them unconscious till after the comet blasted off. Well, what difference does it make now? The girl found them. Makes a lot of difference. Commander won't lose any time in getting out an alarm for us. Uh, what do we do? Well, let's get to our ship and blast off. We've got to get off Neptune. Yeah, we got to get off Neptune before Corey has a chance to alert the space patrol. Oh, wait. The girl's leaving and coming this way. Get out of sight before she sees us. I'd like to really fix her. Never mind the girl. Wait a minute. It might be a good idea to take her with us. What for? Don't be an idiot. You've got that ray gun, haven't you? Yeah. Then get her. With all these people around? Come on. If we handle it right, nobody will notice. Just have that gun ready. Now, Cardo. In a hurry, miss? <gasps> oh, why, Miss Fenton. What a nice surprise. You're not half as surprised as you're going to be. This is a ray gun on your back. Now come along quietly. Get moving out toward the ship's... Tonga's not at gate seven, Commander. I know, and she won't be. What? She never did call headquarters. I just checked. Tonga's not in the habit of disobeying orders. But, but what happened? John of Fenton's own private space cruiser just blasted off. I got the report from space control. Well, sir, do you think she has Tonga with her? That's what I'm afraid of, Happy. Get to our ship. We're going after them. I've got the ship on vector for Saturn, Jelna. Put it in full acceleration. We've got to get plenty of distance between us and Neptune. Yeah. How's the girl? Still locked up in the compartment. Oh, I found out who she is. Yeah? Who? Tonga, assistant security chief of the space patrol. Oh, that's not good. Why? This could mean plenty of trouble. Oh, and I suppose you don't think we're in trouble now? Tonga can help keep Corey off our necks. Yeah, but will she? To save her own, sure. Besides, we don't care whether she cooperates or not. Jelma, look, the rear view scope. Ship. It's coming right toward us and gaining every second. Jelna, they're after us. Now, don't get excited. Calm down. That's a space patrol ship. It's Corey. So much the better. Relax, Cardo. Relax. It's a private cruiser, sir. Yes, with a transorbit trademark on it. It's Jelna Fenton's ship, all right. And we're sure gaining on it. They must know they're being followed. They don't seem to be doing anything about it. Turn on the space phone, Happy. Yes, sir. This is Commander Corey aboard Terra 5 calling Jalna Fenton and private cruiser N-5-6. Corey to Jalna Fenton. Cruiser N-5-6 to Terra 5. Go ahead. Return to Neptune immediately. You're under arrest. Really, Commander? Is Brox Cardo aboard? Brox Cardo? I never heard of him. This is an order, Miss Fenton. Return to Neptune immediately or we'll have to use force. It's very interesting, Commander. But I don't think you will. You wouldn't want to risk harming your assistant security chief, would you? So you have Tonga aboard. That's right, Commander. 
I suppose you think I'm bluffing. No, Joe. I believe you. I'm warning you. If you harm Tonga in if any way... If you don't want her harm, then I suggest you just go about your own business and leave us alone. Goodbye, Commander. Jella, listen. Tonga calling Commander Corey. Hey, Tonga's still got her miniature space phone, and she's on her private frequency. Go ahead, Tonga. Commander, I'm aboard Jelna Fenton's private cruise. I know. Abby and I are right behind you. I just talked to Jelna, and she refused to return to Neptune. I've tried to get out of the compartment, but, but I can't. It's locked. Well, listen, Tonga. Right now, Jelna has the upper hand. If we join airlocks with her ship, she'll carry out her threat to harm you. Well, she'll have to land sometime. Yes, but that still doesn't help your case. Where is your compartment? Amidships, on the starboard side. I'm going to try something, Tonga. Maybe a little risky, but in the long run, you'll stand a better chance of getting away. Anything you say, Commander. Whatever you do, don't let Jalna know I've talked to you by miniature space of phone. Yes, sir. Obey their orders exactly. Corey out. Happy while I put on my spacesuit. Get me an atomic torch. Atomic torch, yes, sir. Hurry. I'll pull up close to Jalna's ship. What's Corey up to? His ship's right off our starboard. Now, I guess he doesn't believe we've got Tonga aboard. But if he starts anything, he'll find out soon enough. Corey to Jalna. Corey to Jelna. You going to talk to him? Yes. What is it, Commander? I want to be sure Tonga's aboard. Don't you trust me? I want to see that she's all right. Well, that's fair enough. Cardo, go bring Tonga up here so the Commander can see her. Okay. Keep pulling in closer to Jelna's ship, Happy. We're nearly touching now, sir. I'm going to keep back so they can't see that I've got a spacesuit on. You know what to do. Yes, sir. As soon as you tell Jelna that you see Tonga, I let our ship drop back a little, and you go out the airlock and jetpack over to Jelna's ship. That's right. Turn on the space phone, Happy. Well, Jelna, have you got Tonga? Let's see her. Uh, yes, Commander. She's right here at the nose port. Don't you see her? Yes. Are you all right, Tonga? Yes, Commander. Now, are you satisfied, Commander? Just see that you don't harm her. Then get your ship away from here. Cut it, Happy. Okay, sir. All right. Drop back now. I'm going out the airlock. Be careful, sir. Uh, Corey's pulled his ship away. Good. He finally got some sense. I was afraid for a while he was going to connect airlocks. Would have been just too bad for Tonga if he had. I'll take her back and lock her up again. All right. Never mind. I'll take care of it. Corey! Commander! Don't reach for that gun, Cardo. Cardo! Send your arm with sentence. Let go of me, Tonga. Let go. Then stop struggling. Drop it, Cardo. All right. You asked for it. I just stay down there. How did you get aboard, Corey? Doesn't the spacesuit give you a hint? I came in through the airlock. I triggered the latch with an atomic cutting torch. Tonga, you can let go of Miss Fenton now. I've got her covered. Yes, Commander. We'll lock them up after I contact Happy. Commander Corey calling Cadet Happy. You made it, sir. Right, Happy. Tonga and I have got Cardo and Miss Fenton. She seems pretty unhappy. I suppose she's disappointed because there won't be an article about her in the Inner Planet Weekly. Uh, well, tell her to cheer up, sir. There'll be a nice long one about her in the next Space Patrol crime report. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back with an action preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story in just a moment. Say, do you hear that clock? Time's running away fast, gang, but it's something you just can't hold back. So don't wait. Send for a Space Patrol spaceophone set now. This offer soon ends. The spaceophone, the magic phone that sounds like a walkie-talkie. But time's a wasting, so hurry. Now think of it. A spaceophone that looks exactly like the one Buzz Corey uses. But remember, this offer will soon end. Time is really running out. So, gang, hurry. Hurry while there's still time. Send today for your spaceophone set. You can talk on it to someone a straight 50 feet away. But don't wait. Act now. This offer soon ends. You get two blue and yellow plastic spaceophones, 50 feet of communication cord, and a briefing sheet. Here's all you do. Just buy a box of Instant Ralston. Then, with your name and address, send an Instant Ralston box top and 25 cents in coin to Space Patrol. Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in continental U.S. and may be withdrawn at any time. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. And now for a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story. 
Buzz and Happy are climbing the face of a steep cliff on the planet Saturn in pursuit of a criminal. At one side of them, a great waterfall thunders down 1,000 feet to the valley below. Colgar must have reached the top, Commander. I don't see him. It's amazing. He went up this cliff like a mountain goat. It's sure hard to get a foothold. Look out, Happy. There's a rock falling. Smoke and rockets. Wow, that was close. There are more coming. Press close to the side of the cliff. Hey, it looks like the whole top of the mountain is coming down on us. That's Colgar's work. He started a landslide. And it's coming down right on top of us. What are we going to do? Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Giant Bubble, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! This is your commander, gang, with a story about the warriors in your bloodstream. Do you know what they are? They're the white blood cells, and they're warriors against disease. When a person is sick, he often needs a whole extra army of these warriors. That's just one reason why it's vital to have a big supply of blood in hospitals. Will you help me remind grown-ups that America needs more blood donations? Then join the Space Patrol blood boosters. Uh, Don't wait. Join today. Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmerer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Nina Berra, Virginia Hewitt, and Norman Jolly. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol. And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol program on your local ABC television station. Consult your newspaper for time and channel. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston present Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy are climbing the face of a steep cliff on the planet Saturn in pursuit of two criminals. At one side of them, a great waterfall thunders down a thousand feet to the valley below. Colgar must have reached the top, Commander. I don't see him. They went up the cliff like a couple of mountain goats and with hardly any footholds. Look out, Happy, there's a rock falling. Huh? Wow, smoke and rockets, that was close. There are more coming. Press close to the cliff. Hey, it looks like the whole top of the mountain is coming down on us. Holgar's work. He started a landslide. He's right on top of us. What are we going to do? We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Giant Bubble. You can't buy it anywhere, gang. Today is positively the last time we can make this sensational offer. I'm speaking of... The Space Patrol Spaceophone. The magic phone you can carry anywhere. The magic phone from mysterious outer space. The magic phone created in the secret laboratories of the Space Patrol. The Space Patrol Spaceophone. Imagine, you can talk on it to someone a straight 50 feet away. Complete with two blue and yellow plastic spaceophones. Complete with 50 feet of communication cord. Complete with secret briefing sheet. But remember now, today is absolutely the last time we can make this unusual offer. The Space Patrol Spaceophone. To get the whole set, here's what you do. Buy a box of Instant Ralston. Then with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and an Instant Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in continental U.S. and may be withdrawn at any time. That's an instant Ralston box top and 25 cents in coin to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. In Commander Corey's central office at Space Patrol headquarters on Terra, Cadet Happy is puzzling over some reports from the security section as Buzz enters. 
Oh, I can't make head or tails of this thing. Kathy, has Dr. Berman been in? Huh? Oh, I uh, beg your pardon, sir. What would you say? Have you seen Dr. Berman? He was to meet me here. Oh, no, sir. He hasn't been in. Uh, did the appropriation go through? Yes, Happy. I just got the Secretary General's approval. That ought to make Dr. Berman just about the happiest man in the solar system. Mm, yes, sir. Which, judging by your expression, is more than can be said for you. What's the trouble, huh? Well, Major Robertson asked me if I'd check over these reports of intercepted messages, and I haven't been able to make much headway. Uh, those unidentified space phone signals from Saturn. Uh-huh. All I can figure out is that the broadcasts seem to follow a time pattern, and they're in perfectly plain English, but, well, they just don't make sense. I know. You know one word keeps popping up in several of the messages. Uh, that is, if it is a word, uh, Gleck. Now, what in the universe is Gleck? And no one else around here seems to know either. Well, all I can gather is that whoever is sending the messages doesn't like Gleck. And one message says, suggest getting rid of Gleck at source. Uh-huh. Well, forget about it. Turn the folder back to Robbie. Yes, sir. Mandatory? Oh, yes, Dr. Berman, come in. Thank you. Abby, this is Dr. Berman, the inventor of a new process of constructing atmosphere shells. Oh, I heard about it. Yeah, it's something to do with blowing a big bubble out in space, isn't it? Oh, that's right, young man. A bubble of transparent electroplast. Dr. Berman's method might entirely do away with the old cumbersome method of constructing atmosphere shells section by section and sealing them together. With electroplast, sir? Yes, cadet. With a strong plastic developed in a plant on Venus, which has the peculiar property of remaining in liquid state when powerful electromagnetic waves of a certain frequency are penetrating it. Oh, I get it. You blow a bubble with it out in the vacuum of space, and while the stuff is soft. Exactly. When the magnetic waves are cut off due to the cold, the electroplast hardens almost immediately. Hey, it's almost like freezing a soap bubble. <laughs> nice comparison, Cadet. However, we've never quite been able to freeze a soap bubble. To my great regret, they always break. Well, maybe uh, this will cheer you up, Doctor. The Secretary General has approved the appropriation as requested. Splendid. As I understand it, you're authorized to go ahead and construct a shell for the Venus satellite. The Venus satellite? Yes, sir. But the satellite is only a mile in diameter. It'll be completely enclosed by an electroplastic shell. Hey, that's great, but... Oh, wait a minute. You blow up the shell out in space, right? That's right. Far enough away from a planet so the electroplast will form a perfect sphere. Uh-huh. But how do you get the satellite inside the sphere? We cut the shell in half. Then several powerful spaceships move the two halves to the satellite, and the two parts are sealed. Then we install a space lock, and we've got a small, low-gravity world. Uh, Commander, I hate to rush off, but I'm very anxious to get back to Venus and get the project underway. Of course, Doctor. If there's anything I can do to help, just let me know. Thank you. My chief problem at first is to get several thousand cubic feet of Gleck out into space. Several thousand cubic feet of what? Gleck. Oh, uh, you wouldn't know. Gleck is a technical slang for electroplast. I see. Well, where did the term come from? Oh, I don't know. You know how it is with slang? Probably some technician got tired of saying electroplast and invented the word Gleck. The term caught on. Well, goodbye, gentlemen. Goodbye, Doctor. Hey, Commander, uh, hadn't we better tell him about the messages? No, Happy, not yet. Yeah, but one of those messages said, get rid of Gleck at the source. I know. The source is Venus. And then someone on Saturn wants to wreck the doctor's project. I'll have Robbie assign a full monitoring crew to the Saturn frequencies. We're going to blast off for Venus and keep an eye on the plant itself. It's dark enough now, Drovic. Let's get over to the tunnel. Okay. You better watch your step with that explosive. It won't take much of a jar to set it off. How much time have we? Mm, exactly ten minutes before the tunnel car comes out of the underground plant. But I can assure you we're going to be away from the plant area when the cargo of electroplast goes up. Cargo, I'm surprised there aren't any guards patrolling the ground. Why should there be? Now, who, who would want to wreck Dr. Berman's project? Well, you shouldn't have sold out to him. With your half-interest in the electroplast process, he could have made millions of credits. I got out because I thought he was on the wrong track. He wanted me to think that, so I would sell out. Sure, Colgate. But sure. I'll fix him. Oh, here are the tracks. We just put the explosive on the rails? Wait. I've got a better idea. See that flat car off on the siding? Put the explosive on that and push it into the tunnel. Yeah, great idea. The tunnel blown up, Berman can't get any electroplast out of the plant for weeks. That's going to be a job shoving that heavy car, though, so we'd better get started. Hold it, half. This is where the foreman saw them in. There they go, sir, over that small ridge. That's where the tunnel comes out, the lower levels of the plant. Tunnel? Yes. 
The tracks lead to the spaceport where the electroplast is pumped aboard cargo ships. But what would they be doing out there this time of night? Well, let's find out. The odd foreman thought they were on some special detail. Well, it seems to me if they were on legitimate business, they'd carry a time yeah. lights. Keep yours off until I tell you to turn it on. Yes, sir. All right. Now, shove the car. <sighs> It's as heavy as if it were on Jupiter. Once we get it moving, it won't be so bad. How far are we going to push it? Just inside the tunnel. The track has a downhill grade. The car will go. All right, Happy, turn on your light. Yes, sir. It's colder. Somebody's seen us. Keep shoving only a few more feet and it will be on the main track. Hold it a minute. What are you men doing? Now why don't you mind your own business? Get that flat car off the main track. Here comes the tunnel car. Let's go, throw it. No, you don't. Come back here. Let him go, Happy. We've got to shove this car back in the siding quickly. Yes, sir. I hate to let him get away, but we've got to clear the tracks. Uh, the tunnel car is coming pretty fast, uh, sir. A couple more feet. Uh, 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 it's clear, sir. The switch. We've got to throw the switch. The tunnel car will be derailed right into us. Hold your light here. Yes, sir. <laughs> Just barely. Look what was on this flat car. A can of explosives. Come on, Happy. We'll go to the main gate and give some orders. Nobody's going to leave the flat. The car got through. It cleared the tracks. I got to look at them as we ran out. Yes, space patrol. Man. Space patrol? They probably got the flats around it. How are we going to get out? Oh, wait a minute. Look up ahead there. There is Berman. How can you tell? By his walk. There. No, I'm sure of it. He just passed the window in the blockhouse. Well, let's get away from here before he recognizes you. I got you. a better idea. Berman will get us out of here, even past the space patrol. Oh, he's going into the blockhouse. Let's follow him and see if he's alone. What's in the blockhouse? Test equipment for the black experiments. That's where I got the explosive. Come on. But quietly, take it easy. And this all drawing. Gate captain, please. Quiet. Berman is in the lab. Yes, thank you. Captain, this is Dr. Berman. Would you locate Commander Corey for me? I don't know where he is, but... Oh, he is? Put him on, please. He's talking on the intercom. Commander, Dr. Berman, I... What? The tunnel. Good heavens. Thank you, Commander. That would have set the project back for weeks. Yes, I do have an idea who's behind this. Something happened earlier today that aroused my suspicion. Oh, with the Russian, I'll wait. Yes, Commander, but I'm not positive. I don't like to discuss this over the intercom. Yes, I know it's urgent, but uh, can you come to the blockhouse? Fine, Commander. Let's get him. Kogar! Don't reach for that intercom, Berman. Yes, it was me. You tried to blow up my plants. Keep the Reagan on him, Droy. Yes, Berman, you double-crossing swindler. I didn't wreck your plan, but you'll never build an atmosphere shell. We were friends once, Colgar. I can't understand this. Oh, can't you? You tricked me into thinking you were failing in your electroplast research, so I would sell. But that was your decision. I was trying to be honest with you. You walked out on me when I needed your help. We haven't time to argue with him, Colgar. You're right, Droid. Berman, give me a pass so I can get out of gate. A pass? Yes. A time stamp pass with your signature for Drovic and me. Say that we are being sent to Venus City for special work on the project. Come on. We don't have much time. Come on. Hurry up. Put your name on it. That's it. Kuga. Someone's coming. Get behind the door. Berman, you stay where you are. And if you warn them, you'll regret it. Believe me. Right in here, Happy. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Berman. Oh, I didn't know you had company. Commander, I... Hey, Commander, look out! It's not him throwing! Give me that ray gun. I'll give you something just as good! Now, stay where you are. Drovic, hold the gun on them a minute. Where are you going? In the next room. I'm going to fix up a few chemicals that will turn this blockhouse into a blast furnace. Then we'll lug these meddling space patrolmen in here with Berman. You'll never get out the gate! No, you don't watch it, Corey! <laughs> What's happened? Corey got clever. 
cracked him with the gun butt. All right. Lock them in there. First, disconnect the intercom. Okay. Uh, take care of... Uh, good. And by the time we're out of the gate, this blockhouse will be blown to pieces. And Corey with it. We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a moment. Say, it's a fire. A four-alarm blaze on Terra. But, hey, what's the matter with that atomic fire control power unit? Oh, too bad. It's trying to get along on ordinary fuel. But wait. Now that fire control officer is filling up the tank with super fuel. Wow, listen to that fire control unit go now. It's supercharged, that's what. Supercharged with super fuel. Yes, sir, boys and girls. To really get going, the answer is super fuel. That's why Buzz Corey eats a good breakfast with the bite-sized super cereals that help to supercharge you. And I mean rice checks and wheat checks. Now, there's a couple of swell-tasting cereals. And, boy, both of them have that modern bite-sized design for easy eating. So, gang, get a quick start in the morning like Buzz Corey does. Eat a good breakfast with a checkerboard super cereal and get supercharged. Get them today. Rice checks, wheat checks. Kolgar and Drovic are determined to destroy Dr. Berman's plans to employ a new process for constructing atmosphere shells. The two criminals have knocked Buzz, Happy, and the doctor unconscious, locked them in a blockhouse on the grounds of Dr. Berman's Venus plant. They have also prepared chemicals that will blast the interior of the building. Now, as Kolgar and Drovic head for the main gate, Buzz and Happy try to break their way out through the door. It's a cinch we can't break the door down. Let's see if we can rouse Dr. Berman. Maybe he's got a key on him. Yes, sir. Doctor. Doctor. Commander. Did they get away? Yes. Do you have a key to the door? We're locked in. Locked in? Yes. And there's going to be an explosion any second. They wrecked the intercom so we can't call for help. My, my keys? Where, where are my keys? Well, they must have taken them. Hey, Commander, how about the window? It isn't very big, but I think if we smashed it, we could get through. Yeah, this metal chair ought to do the trick. Yeah. It's no use. We hit it again. Yeah. You can't break it, Commander. It's electroplast. An electroplast? Yes. My discovery. And it's sealing us up in a death trap. Wait. Didn't you say it turns to liquid when electromagnetic waves strike it? A certain frequency, yes. It... Commander, you've got it. There's a generator in this room. Where is it? This cabinet. Do you need any help? After I set the dials, throw the switch on the lower panel. Wait. Now. I've got it focused toward the window. Watch it. How long will it take to work? Just a few seconds. It's starting to melt. Hey, it's just like wax. I think we can get out now. Happy, help me slide the desk under the window. Hurry. Yes, sir. All right, Dr. Berman, you first. I'm really not much good at this sort of thing. If you don't get out, you'll never be any better. Just dive out, doctor. It's not much of a drop. All right. Okay, Happy. Yes, sir. All right, doctor. Look out below. Here I come. All clear, Commander. Come ahead. All right. Let's get away from here before it blows up. Wow. We got away just in time. Commander... If you hadn't thought of that electromagnetic wave when you did... Lucky you had the equipment in the lab, Doctor. Happy, let's get to the main gate and see if our friends have escaped. We were too late, Doctor. The guard let them through. Yeah, but we'll get out on all planets alarm. They won't get far. I think he was once my friend. Dr. Berman, I know this has been a terrible experience for you, but I've got to ask some questions. Do you know where Koger might go? No, I don't. Some time ago, I heard he was living on Saturn. Saturn's a big planet. Any particular area? I don't know. You'll have the Saturn spaceports watched. Now, Doctor, is there anything destroyed in the blockhouse which would delay the construction of the shell around the Venus satellite? Uh, fortunately, no. And you can go ahead and direct the project out in space. Yes. I want to do it right away. The lab ship is ready. Good. Happy and I are going to keep an eye on things, just in case our friends Kolgar and Drovic decide to try something else.
1,000 BUs outside the satellite orbit, sir. All right, Happy. Cut our velocity and keep pace with the satellite in its orbit. Yes, sir. That's 1,600 hours universal star time, Happy. We should be about ready to blow the bubble up any time now. There it goes, cold guy. It's getting bigger. We better not get any closer to Berman's bubble. Let's watch it from here. I didn't think it would work, but look at it. We're going to wait till it's nearly finished. And blast the shell with a cosmic low-frequency missile. Yeah. But first we take care of Berman's control ship. The shell will be an easy target after Berman's out of the way. How did he get out of the blockhouse? We saw the explosion. Well, he won't get out of this explosion. Keep his flagship in your side, bro. The shell doesn't seem to be getting any bigger, sir. It is, all Hap. Happy. Starboard view scope. A, a private cruiser. Yes. Heading in toward the lab ship. Let's go. Well, it's still on the side, Kolga. We're too far away. We can't risk a miss. Hold your fire. Well, if we get too close, he may spot us. So what? Those laboratory ships can't maneuver very fast. Koga, a review scope. Uh, space patrol ship coming in fast. Well, we've been lining up on Berman. They've been lining up on us. To change back to it quickly. This is Commander Corey aboard Terra 5 calling the unmarked private cruiser. You're in a restricted space sector. Acknowledge immediately and change your vector. What do we do? Keep going. Commander Corey calling Koga aboard unmarked private cruiser. Cut your velocity and acknowledge or we'll fire. Cut our velocity, Drovich. I'll talk to Corey. Cut velocity, sir. He's still keeping close to the lab ship. Better cut our own velocity. Don't get too close, Happy. Yes, sir. Pull them an automatic range finder. Commander, there's a flash from their ship. They're firing at us. Kicking on automatic evasion control. Yes, sir. Here comes another one. Wow, that was close. Shall I let them have it, sir? Not yet, Happy. They can't have more than three cosmic missiles in that small ship. Well, that was it, sir. Can I let them have it now? Well, there isn't much point in firing on an unarmed enemy, is there? Well, no, but we can't let them get away. I don't intend to, but I want them to think they are. Well, they're barreling off on a new vector now. That's fine. Let them gain some distance. Kick the view scope up to maximum sensitivity. Yes, sir. You'll find out just where Mr. Colgar is going in such a hurry. Good shooting, Drovic. You knocked out the great Commander Corey. That must have been that last shot that did it. I didn't see his ship explode, though. He's out of the fight. Probably punctured his hull. Too bad we haven't just one more cosmic missile left. It would be a cinch to knock out Berman's lab ship. Yeah, by now, Berman's probably alerted all space patrol units in the Venus area. You're right. We'll head for Saturn and pick up some more cosmic missiles at our Ortak Valley hideout. And then we'll be back. They're still in the view scope, sir. Apparently heading for Saturn. Now, that checks. We picked the original messages up from Gleck about there. Notify Saturn Space Control to order all units to watch for an unmarked ship, but not to challenge it. After all he's tried to do to us, Colgar is our baby. Space Control Saturn calling Commander Corey aboard Terra 5. Corey here. Go ahead. Commander, an unmarked private cruiser entered Saturn atmosphere ten minutes ago. It's been under constant surveillance. Has it landed yet? It hasn't approached any city, sir. Our last report, less than a minute ago, said the ship was headed for the Ortak Valley region at steady decrease in altitude. They let down in the mountain area into the central Ortak Valley. Order all ships to keep clear of the Ortak Valley until further notice. Corey out. Check Ortak Valley coordinates, Happy. Yes, sir. low ceiling, sir. Yes. Keep her steady, Happy. We've got thousand-foot cliffs on either side of us. Yeah, I'm checking them through the infrared view scope, sir. I've got something on the ground scope, Happy. Cut our velocity. It's a spaceship. Yes. The one we're looking for. Their landing ladder is down, so they probably aren't in the ship. I'd just like to see them try to take off now. Set her down, Happy. Koga, Listen. Yeah, a spaceship landing. A space patrol. It's Terra 5. Corey tricked us. What do we do? We have no missiles aboard, and we can't get back to the ship anyhow. That isn't time. I know. Up the cliff, huh? Climb that cliff. It's straight up and down, a thousand feet high. I know a fairly easy way up. If Corey doesn't see our start, he'll never suspect we took that way out. Come on, Drovic, before Corey gets out of the ship. Two sets of footprints lead over here, Happy. Yes, sir. They lead away from the ship, and there aren't any coming back. 
Apparently, they're headed for the cliff. They may be holed up in a cave, so be careful. Yes, sir. Hey, they end right at the cliff. The ground is harder here. Still, we make footprints, so they they climb the cliff. What? Why, it's practically a wall. Uh, look here. Some fresh dirt has been kicked away. Huh? If they can climb it, we can. Sir, listen. The roaring sound. Probably a waterfall farther up the canyon. Okay, Hap, let's get going. Go on, Drovic. Keep moving. Go down. I can't, I can't get a foothold. We can't go back. Cody and the killer turned that way up. It's a 500 foot drop. I'd rather have Cody get me than slip off this cliff. Grab hold of that overhanging rock. And swing your foot around this bulge. That is almost a pet from here on up. Go on. I can't get past you. So either move or I'll kick you up. No, no, I'll go on. Watch out for this soft shale. You'll slide off the cliff. I thought I was finished. See? You started a miniature landslide. Yeah. That gives me an idea. Start pushing these rocks down. These boulders. Come on, get busy. They must have reached the top, Commander. I don't see them. They went up the cliff like a pair of mountain goats. Look out, Happy. Rocks are falling. Huh? The rockets, that was close. There are more coming. Press close to the cliff. Hey, it looks like the whole top of the mountain's coming down at us. That's Korgar's work. He's got a landslide. What are we going to do? Look at the ledge that leads over there toward the waterfall. Hurry. Be careful. Yes, sir. Oh, it missed us. Yes. But look at the cliff. Now there's no way up or down. The fall's on one side and 800 foot drop on the other. We're stuck. Wait. Look, behind the falls. What? Behind the falls, there's an opening there. You're right. And there's a path behind the falls. Watch your foothold. These rocks are wet and slippery. Well, I guess that landslide took care of them. Yeah, but how are we going to get down to our ship? It's a long way, but it's safer. Come on, let's get going. The ship sure looks good. Yeah. Get in and let's blast off. What's your hurry? Corey. That's right, and don't try anything, either of you. The last line. I saw it crash right on top of the path. Uh-huh. So did we, from behind the waterfall. There's a nice, easy path the other side of the fall. Yeah, a straight and narrow path. Something you ought to try sometime. <laughs> An exciting preview of next week's thrilling Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. Right now, gang, this is Space Patroller Dick Tufel And Commander Corey. We're here to tell you that today is the last time we can offer you the Space Patrol Spaceophone. You get a whole set, gang, complete with two Spaceophones. 50 feet of communication cord. And secret briefing sheets. So don't wait. Send for it today. Just like talking on the telephone. It's the magic phone you can carry anywhere. Looks exactly like the Spaceophones my Space Patrollers use on Terra. Talk on it to someone a straight 50 feet away. Use it indoors or outdoors. But remember, today is the last time we can make this offer. So don't wait. Send for your Space Patrol Spaceophone set today. Now remember, you get two blue and yellow plastic Spaceophones. One for you and one for the person you're talking to. And a secret Space Patrol briefing sheet. Now to get the whole set, do this. Buy a box of Instant Ralston. Then with your name and address, send 25 cents and an Instant Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. That's Space Patrol, Box 686. St. Louis, Missouri. And now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story. Buzz and Happy are stranded on the Martian desert, a hundred miles from the nearest city. They've just come to an expanse of tiny green plants carpeting the desert for miles. Something's wrong with my throat, Commander. It feels tight. It's hard to breathe. Mine's the same way, Happy. It couldn't be the dust coming up from the ground, sir. No, it comes from the plants. Every time we take a step, the plants shoot out spores, poisoning the atmosphere. It's getting worse. And what's still worse, these are poisonous lichens. Poison? What are we going to do, sir? We can't go back. No. If we go on, these plant spores will paralyze our breathing muscles. We'll suffocate. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Electronic Burglar, when Wheat Checks, 
rice checks, and good hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol. And now, a word from Commander Buzz Corey. You know, gang, one of the greatest health steps in history was the organization of the National Blood Program of the American Red Cross. A program started in the belief that Americans would give blood to help their neighbors in peace, just as they did for fighting men in war. How would you like to help these people get more blood donations? Here's how you can help. Join my Space Patrol blood boosters. You help your country, and you have a lot of fun. So, boys and girls, join the blood boosters today. Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Bela Kovach, Ken Mayer, and Norman Jolly. Dick Tufeld speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present... The new exciting Space Patrol! And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Wheat checks, rice checks, and good hot Wilson present Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol. In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy are stranded on the Martian desert, a hundred miles from the nearest city. They've just come to an expanse of tiny green plants carpeting the desert for miles. Something's wrong with my throat, Commander. It feels tight. It's hard to breathe. Mine's the same way, Happy. It couldn't be the dust coming up from the ground, No, sir. it comes from the plants. Every time we take a step, the plants shoot out spores, poisoning the atmosphere. It's getting worse, Commander. What's still worse? These are poisonous lichens. Poison? What are we going to do, sir? We can't go back. No, if we go on, these plant spores will paralyze our breathing muscles. We'll suffocate. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story... The Electronic Burglar. Say, you want to have some fun, gang? Well, listen to this jet cycle. There's nothing in the tank but ordinary fuel, and here's the result. Just a putt-putt. That's all it is with ordinary fuel, but pour in some super fuel. Wow, that jet cycle is supercharged now. Yes, sir, gang, when it comes to supercharging, you need super fuel. And the same thing is true of you, especially in the morning when you haven't had a bite to eat for hours. So to really get up ahead of steam, to really get set for a lightning takeoff, you have to get supercharged. And here's Buzz Corey's way of doing it. He eats a good breakfast with rice checks or wheat checks, the super cereals that help to supercharge you. Bite-sized checks. Checks, the cereals that taste so good. Checks, the cereals that are so crisp, so absolutely different. So take a tip from Buzz Corey. Eat a good breakfast with a super cereal and get supercharged. The super cereals, rice checks, wheat checks. Even on the man-made planet Terra itself, few citizens are aware of the existence of the Maris Design and Development Company. Yet, from Mercury to Pluto, there's hardly a man, woman, or child whose life isn't made more secure and pleasant because of the engineering know-how in the creation of electronic devices by the Maris Company. And so, when Howard Maris reported that his Terra offices had been burglarized, Commander Corey assumed personal charge of the investigation. Right now, Buzz and Happy are standing before the damaged door of the Maris Company vault, questioning the perplexed and worried executive, Howard Maris. I can't understand why the alarm system didn't work. I said it myself last night, just as I always do. How do you set it? There's a lock switch in my private office. Once that switch is set, nobody can force an entrance to the building without setting off the alarm. But what if somebody had the key to the outside doors? If they used it before regular opening time, even a key would set off the alarm. The only sign of force, inside or out, is at the vault door. Mr. Maris, are you positive you set the alarm switch last night? Absolutely. And the alarm did work, you know. Yes, but several hours too late. By the time our men got here, the metal on the endurium door had cooled where the atomo torch had melted it. 
It's the most baffling thing I've ever run into, Commander. Mm -hmm. One fact is pretty clear, Mr. Maris. Yes, what's that? Whoever did this job was extremely familiar with your operations. Are you suggesting it was an inside job? Yeah, it almost had to be. Just look at what was taken. Yes, the analyscope plans. The most valuable thing in the vault. Well, excuse me, sir, but uh, what is this uh, analyscope? It's a device for detecting mineral deposits hundreds of feet underground. It's ten times more efficient than any other instrument or method we have. Those plans in the hands of someone who knows their value are worth at least a million space credits. Wow. Oh, excuse me. Yes, Mary's here. Oh, very well. Commander, I'm wanted in my office. Would you excuse me, please? Surely, Mr. Maris, go ahead. Thank you. Well, Commander, if it was an inside job, why did the thief have to use an atomic torch on the vault? He got into the building without setting off the alarm. The alarm didn't go off until the thief was safely away. If I didn't know Maris so well, I'd suspect him of being involved in the robbery. Well, how about his uh, chief engineer, Cheller? Uh, they both agreed to a brainograph test. I think they'll pass it. They've worked with Robbie and me on top secret projects a number of times. Maris and Cheller are exceptionally honest. Well, the security department men have gone over everything and haven't found a single clue. What's the next step? The brainograph. Excuse me, sir, but have a look at this. What? On the floor of the vault here, it looks like broken glass. It is. Somebody dropped his glasses. Gather it up carefully, Happy. Yes, sir. Well, there's hardly anything left but slivers. Don't cut yourself, but get all of it. Hey, Maris doesn't wear glasses. Neither does Cheller. Happy, don't mention this to anyone. We'll have a check made on Maris' employees to see who does wear glasses. I hope there are enough large pieces there to tell what the optical formula is. I've got it, sir. The pieces are in this piece of paper. All right, Hap. We'll turn it over to the lab. Goodbye, Stokes. And so long, Maris, and thanks. Don't make that any time. Now, Commander, you mentioned a brainograph test. Whenever you're ready. Fine, Mr. Maris. By the way, the man who just left, he looks familiar. Oh, that was Ward Stokes. He's a precision machinist. Does special assignments for me from time to time. Oh, sure. I remember him now. About a year ago, Major Robertson had him work on a special view scope for the security lab. Oh, that's so? I had him in mind for the analyscope job. Did you discuss it with him? Oh, no. No, I wouldn't do that until I'd checked with security. That's our standard policy on really important jobs. Stokes just dropped in to pick up an instrument case he left in my office. I see. Your man, uh, Captain Scoville, talked to him. Captain Scoville and his men will remain on duty here for a day or two, Mr. Maris, checking the alarm system. Yes, Commander, I understand. They won't interfere with your regular operations any more than they have to. Now, if you'll get Cheller, Happy and I will take you to headquarters for the brainograph test. Oh, Stokes, uh, you got into case all right. Yes, walked right into Maris' office. One of Corey's men gave me the one silver, but didn't even stop me. <laughs> Has the case been tempered with? No, oh, it was on the floor exactly where I left it yesterday. After all, it looks... Just like what it's supposed to be, an instrument case. <laughs> yes. Uh, not even Boss Corey would suspect this small box of being an electronic burglar. And now that we've got it back here, no one will ever suspect. Oh, I see you found your spare glasses. Yeah. Uh, you know I've worn glasses for 30 years, and I never broke a pair till last night. And you never cracked a safe till last night, either. Oh, did you? <laughs> well, if I did, I, I wouldn't have been so awkward when I removed the protective goggles. No. Nah. Well, it was a small price to pay for what we've got. Yes. Uh, that reminds me, you better put that robot burglar away and help me copy the analyscope design. Where do you want me to put the burglar? In the staging room for now. All right. This uh, stage set's a great piece of work, even if I do say so myself. <laughs> startling duplicate of Merce's private office. Oh, it would have to be, wouldn't it? Otherwise, we couldn't have trained our mechanical helper to find the alarm switch in the real office, you know. I've made dozens of machines operated by electric eyes, but until you came along, it never occurred to me to, <laughs> well, to... Yes, to make a machine that works for you instead of somebody else. Yes, Bartram, I guess that's it. <laughs> The toughest part of the whole job was getting a hold of Maris' burglar alarm key long enough to make a duplicate. <laughs> Maris doesn't suspect us. Corey doesn't suspect us. I'd say we pulled it off without a hitch. But now we better get ready to blast off from Mars. Happy, I suppose you heard the results of the brainograph test. Yes, sir. Maris and Scheller didn't have anything to do with the robbery. Not only that, but they haven't the remotest idea who might have done it. That's great. They accept that it doesn't help us much. 
Oh, how about the fragments of glasses? Well, the lab couldn't tell a thing. The boys did their best, but the pieces aren't big enough to indicate the optical formula. Oh, well. Maybe it wasn't a thief that dropped it there anyway. Maybe not. Mary says that he and Cheller are the only ones that go into the vault. We would get this clue just when our chief optical expert is in the hospital. Dr. Pricer? Yes. I contacted Pricer and showed him the fragments on the telescreen. He thinks he could determine the lens formula after he's out of the hospital. When will that be? In ten days. You know, I think I'll take his suggestion. Pricer says this man Stokes might be able to help us. Stokes? Oh, the fellow Maris was talking about? Yes. Stokes helped Pricer on some high-precision optical work a while back. Pricer thinks he's great. He could well be, with both Maris and Pricer raving about him. Now let's pay him a visit, Happy, and see if he can put our glass jigsaw puzzle together. Mr. Stokes, I imagine you're a pretty busy man, but at the moment, you're the only one who can help us. I'm rather rushed, Commander, but if it's for the Space Patrol, I'll be glad to if I can. I have some fragments of what apparently was once a pair of glasses. Can you determine the optical formula from these small pieces? Why, it would be rather difficult. May I ask why you want this information? By tracing the prescription, we might be able to check with various opticians and find a thief. A thief? Yes. Confidentially, I'll tell you that these fragments were found in Maris's vault after the burglary. You know about that, of course. Uh, yes, uh, perfectly outrageous. And uh, this is the only clue you have so far. Oh. Well, I'm afraid I couldn't give you a very accurate analysis, Commander. Mm, I see. Well, perhaps Dr. Pricer can do it when he gets out of the hospital. Uh, however, uh, let me examine these fragments more closely. Will you let me take them into my lab in the next room? Of course. It won't take me long to find out if further tests will be worthwhile. He didn't seem very interested at first, Commander. It's a challenge to his ingenuity. He'll probably help us. Mm. All these pictures of gadgets on the walls. Are these Stokes inventions? I suppose so. Hey, come and look at this one, sir. The picture here by the door. All right. It's a miniature view scope, no bigger than your hand. An amazing piece of construction. Uh, well, I'd like to see the actual thing. Hey, I wonder what's in this room here. Happy. Oh, oh well, I wasn't snooping, sir. I, I just thought... Hey, look at this. What is it? For a minute, ah, I thought I'd been here before. But this is an exact duplicate of Maris's private office. It does look like it. Same furniture arrangement, same size, same fixtures. Yeah, maybe the same person designed the offices, and Maris's is just like Stokes. No, I don't think so, Happy. What do you mean, sir? These walls don't reach the ceiling. This is a room built inside a larger room, like a stage set. You're right. It seems kind of silly. It certainly does. And then... Hey, what's that, Commander? Machinery of some kind, but I don't see. Oh, it's that instrument case, the lid's opening. Look at it, Commander. Now the whole case is moving, rolling across the floor. I wonder what could have started that thing up. Now look, it, it's running a long rod up in the air. Yeah, very ingenious. A telescoping rod in sections with a key on the end of it. I'd sure like to have one of those things. <laughs> it looks like it's on its way to unlock something. Mm -hmm. To unlock a mystery. Watch it closely, Happy. I'm going to tell him about you. Well, tell him you can probably figure out the optical prescription. Then, in a day or two, give him a fake formula. Good. Then Corey will never be able to trace you. Uh -huh. Go tell him and get him out of here. Yes, yes. Commander, I've got good news for you. Uh, Commander, where are you? In here, Stokes. Oh. Happy and I are watching this fantastic gadget of yours. How does that thing get started? Uh, here, I'll shut it off. Uh, no, wait. Let's see what it does. Uh, it's just a silly toy. I'll turn it off. Later, Stokes. But, 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 Commander. Hey, hey, it acts like it's looking for something. Now it's heading right for that little, that little dude here on the wall there. The lock switch. It's feeling for the keyhole. A very clever machine, Stokes. So that's how the alarm system was shut off. I... What do you mean? You can't deny this room is an exact replica of Maris's office. Suppose it is. Lots of offices are alike. I see. Then, of course, you won't mind taking a brainograph test. That'll be enough snooping, Corey. Get your hands off, you two cadet. Get their weapons, Stokes. Yes, Bowser. Keep behind them in case I have to use this ray gun. So you're Stokes' partner in the burglary. Boucher, huh? Hold them, Stokes. Confounded men, you should have locked the door. How did I know they'd be coming here? And that robot... How did it get started? The timing mechanism. I, I forgot to shut it off. So just 12 hours after the robbery, it started up again. Yeah. In another three hours, the robot would turn the lock switch back on, move back to its original position, 
withdraw its wheels and levers and become an innocent instrument case again. Too bad Stokes has such a good reputation as a precision machinist or we'd never have come here. It is too bad, Corey. But I'm afraid it's too bad for you. What are we going to do with them? We can't dispose of them here on Terra. We'll take them to my lab on the Martian desert where they'll never be found. We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a moment. Say, gang, listen to this boy going to the breakfast table. He doesn't care if he ever gets there, does he? He doesn't like his breakfast cereal, that's why. No zip, no lift, no flavor. Now, here's a girl. Listen to how she goes to breakfast. Uh Uh-oh, she doesn't even bother about going. Same trouble, a cereal dull as can be. No taste. No tang, no nothing. Now, here's another youngster going to breakfast. Ah, no wonder he's in a hurry. He's really going for breakfast because this fella does what Buzz Corey does. He has a checkerboard super cereal for breakfast every single morning. Rice checks or wheat checks. The cereals with that modern bite-sized design for easy eating. And boy, it's not just the size that makes checks easy to eat. It's that flavor. Man, oh man, checks have a flavor that keeps that spoon of yours going up and down, up and down, up and down until the cereal bowl's empty. So get the cereals that have you spinning to the table for them. The super cereals that help to supercharge you. Rice checks, wheat checks. Buzz and Happy have been captured by two criminals who stole designs for a valuable new mineral detection device from the Maris Design and Development Company vault. The thieves, Stoke and Boucher, have locked a space patrolman in a compartment on a spaceship and are heading for a hideout on the Martian desert. We certainly aren't taking any chances, sir. My wrists are tight so tight, my fingers are numb. If we can work loose before the ship lands, we might be able to fight our way out of this mess, Happy. Keep at it. Yes, sir. Now, they cut the rocket. Still that increased gravity pull? Yes, sir. If they're carrying out the original plans. That means we're landing on Mars. We've got to work fast before they can land. Unlock the compartment, Stokes. I'll keep them covered. All right. Now you two on your feet. Let's check these ropes. Turn around. I said turn around. And I say something, I mean it, Corey. I'll remember that, Doctor. With the little time you got left, I suggest you dwell on more pleasant memories. Uh, okay. The ropes are still tight. Get moving, you two. This is our little Martian hideout. Sure is a filthy little hideout. Well, maybe we'll let you clean it up before we do away with you. Let's get some heat on. I'm freezing. Stokes, you're going right back to the ship and blast off for Lowell City. You still think I should make Hmm. contact with Thoth? Yes. I'll stay here and guard Corey and the cadet until everything is set. Leave the designs here. I'll put them in the cupboard. All right. If you find everything safe in Lowell City, then make arrangements for getting the money from Tharp, and we'll hand over the design. When do we get rid of Corey and the cadets? Just as soon as you get back. Nobody will ever find them out here in the desert. You better get going. Oh, uh, I wanted to ask you a couple of things. Uh, Come out to the ship with me. Well, all right. I don't imagine you'll want to leave, Corey. But we'll lock the door just in case. Well, sir, we've got until Stokes gets back to get out of here. Even if we overpower a voucher, we'll need Stokes' ship to escape. Do you see a space phone in here? No, sir. But maybe there's one hidden around someplace. Happy, there's a heating control. Kick the switch with your foot. You cold, sir? No, but put it on full, quickly. Yes, sir. There it is, sir. Good. Now, if this room will just heat up in a hurry. There goes Stokes. Now, when Boucher comes into this heated room, I have a hunch you'll have some trouble with his glasses. Huh? Coming in from the cold air, they'll fog up just like the windows. Say, yeah, then we can rush him. The best we can hope to do is knock him down with a headlong dive until we can get our hands free. Here he comes. Get ready. Yes, sir. All right, gentlemen. Now we'll just relax. Oh, you got the heat on. I told you space patrolmen wear... Hardy souls accustomed to cool. Confound it. Uh, my glasses are... Okay, Happy. I, I 
Get off of me. He dropped his gun, Commander. Take it out of the way. That's it. Oh. Can you handle Boucher with your hands tight, sir? I won't have to. They're loose, Hatton. All right, Boucher. Let go of me. And stop struggling on your feet. I'll take the gun, Happy. Boucher, untie the cadet. Oh. Wait till I get my breath. You knocked all the wind out of me. It's all right, sir. The rope is working loose. Good. Boucher, is there a space to phone in this building? No. There was a portable set on the ship, but I forgot to bring it in. You just have to wait till Stokes returns. You get a nice surprise when he walks in that door. Should we tie Boucher up, sir? That might be a good idea. We won't have to watch him so closely. Boucher, get away from that cupboard. I'll get him, Commander. They're not there. They're gone. What are you talking about? Uh, the anoscope design. Stoke never put them in a the cupboard. I saw him walk over there. He double-crossed me. The dirty rat. What good would they do you if they were there? Don't you see? Stoke isn't coming back, and we're stuck here. He's right, Happy. This puts all of us in a tough spot. Boucher, how far did you say it was to the nearest city? Uh, a hundred miles, uh... Hundred miles of desert? And we don't have any way to call for help. We'll die out here. We only got food for two days. Maybe. But we're not going to stay here. Let's take what food and water we can and start across the desert. On foot? We could never make it. We're going to try it. Now, where's the food locker? Come on, Boucher. You're lagging behind. Don't make me walk anymore, please. You've got yourself into this mess. We're going to keep moving. All right. Uh... I'll try to make it. That's it. Now stop blubbering and save your breath. Uh, hey, these green plants are all around us. They're lichens, Happy. In the Martian summer, they turn rough colored. Oh, stop. Wait. wait. Now what? I feel sick. Something's wrong with my throat. Well, I don't feel so good myself, but we've got to keep moving. Hold on a minute. There's something strange in the air. It's dust coming up from the ground, sir. Every time we step, a little puff of dust. Up. Uh, from the lichens, Happy. They're spores. Spores? Yes, tiny cells from these plants. This kind is poison. What? Well, getting into our throats, uh, lungs. Uh, uh, let's get out of them quick. But we've got to keep on going. The plants stretch for miles in all directions except behind us. Well, then let's go back. We can't go back. Uh, Commander, these spores, what do they do? If we keep inhaling them, they'll paralyze our breathing muscles. We'll suffocate. I'm going back. I'm going back. Boucher, come back here. Grab them, Happy. No. Boucher, keep your head. All this stomping around is making it worse. Stand still, Boucher. Be quiet. Go around examine the terrain. Maybe we can find a bare stretch of ground. Uh, it's hopeless. We're trapped. Trapped on the desert. I said be quiet. Uh, See anything, Happy? No, sir. Except that, that low hill there. It seems to be a tower of some kind. Yes, a power relay tower. There's one every uh, 20 miles. Maybe there's a space phone at the tower. If we can get there, we could call for help. That's worth a try. Come on, let's go. Come on, Boucher. Just a few yards more. I guess I can hardly breathe. I don't see anything that looks like a spacophone, Happy. Neither do I, sir. Just some wheels and gears. And those are to adjust the receiving and deflecting coils at the top of the tower. Uh, you mean we can call for help after coming all this way? I'm afraid not. Uh, then what good is this monstrosity? Well, I'll die here under the tower. Sure, Boucher, lie down uh, and rest a minute and keep quiet. Uh... Well, uh, sir, by looking at the coil, can't we tell the direction to take to Lowell City? Yes, but it's straight across those poison lichens. Now, wait a minute. If we were to turn those wheels, if we'd interrupt the power beam, the beam would miss the next relay tower. Hey, yeah, they'd have to send somebody out to investigate. Well, then do it. Turn the wheels. Cut off the power. Boucher, do you realize that uh, human lives may depend on that power beam? Well, what about our lives? Our lives depend on it, too. Turn it off. Turn well, it what we off. might do, Happy... Turn it off. Might deflect it slightly, just enough to register on the instruments at the monitor station. Well, how could we be sure we weren't turning it too far? See that dial? It points to zero. That means it's right on the beam. The red lines on either side are the danger limits. Here, let's release the holding mechanism. Now we'll turn the wheel carefully. The indicator is still on zero, sir. The control mechanism has a high gear ratio for accurate focusing of the beam. Now it's moving, sir. Halfway to the danger line. That ought to alert maintenance crew. Now we'll spin the wheel the other way, back and forth. Want me to take over again, sir? You must be tired. All right, Happy. Thanks. You've been doing that for half an hour and nothing happened. Turn the beam off. Clear off. That's the only way to make them pay attention. It'll be dark in a little while. Nobody will be able to see us. Commander! Commander, look! 
It's an atmosphere ship. And it's headed right for the tower. Oh, well, wave to them. Make sure he sees us. He'll see us, don't worry. It's the power commission ship, all right, sir. See the big red circle on the hull? All right, Happy. He's coming in for a landing. Set the indicator back to zero. Uh, there it is, sir. I'll lock it in place. Control security. All right, let's get to the ship. We've got an appointment with Stokes in Lowell City. I, I told you and, and the commander how you can pick up Stokes and, and the man who's going to buy the design. Uh, they will go on my record, won't they? Oh, sure, but I'm afraid it's a little late now to start thinking about getting off easily. Happy, I just talked to a Lowell City space control in the pilot's space room putting a guard around Stokes' ship in case he tries to blast off. Fine. Uh, when do we get to Lowell City? In a couple of minutes. We'll turn Boucher over to the spaceport guards and go after Stokes and Stiles. Well, Stokes, the design seemed to be complete. They're all there, Mr. Thought. And now I'd like my money. Of course. I'm glad you and Boucher changed your minds and made a straightforward business deal. Uh, the original plan was just a precaution in case we were being followed. But everything worked out so well. All right, Stokes. I'll take those plans. All right. Get soft, Happy. I'll handle Stokes. Yes, sir. Where do you think you're going? Oh. All right, Stokes. You had enough? Oh, yes, Corey. Let up. I've got Tharp, Commander. Right, keep him covered. I'll get the yeah. scope design. Yes, sir. All right, Stokes. Move over next to your partner. Just tell me one thing. How did you get out of the desert? Well, Commander, why don't we let Boucher explain that to him? It'll give them something to talk about for the next several years they're going to be spending together. <laughs> We'll be back with an action preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story in just a moment. Say, you want to hear something funny? Well, listen to this. That's a word scrambler, gang. A machine that scrambles secret messages sent by space patrollers over the spaceophone. Now, do you want to know what the message said? Well, here, I'll have it unscrambled for you. To get supercharged, eat a good breakfast with instant Ralston. That's one of the most important messages a space patroller ever sent. Yes, sir, when you sit down to a good breakfast with good hot Ralston, well, boy, oh, boy, that's your day to shine. For instant Ralston packs a wallop in every spoonful. It's rich whole wheat. Remember, rich whole wheat. That means it'll warm up your motor, tune up your thinker, help start off your day with a bang. Yes, that's the kind of start Buzz Corey gets. That's the kind of start you need to be a winner just like him. So come on, space patrollers, get supercharged. Eat a good breakfast with good hot Ralston. And now for a preview of next week's exciting space patrol story. Buzz and Happy are on Venus on a farm where food is chemically grown in large tanks. As they walk toward a building where Tonga is held captive, huge sun mirrors atop several tall towers turn ominously toward them. Well, the rocket commander is really getting hot all of a sudden. Yes, waves of heat. Even for Venus, this is unusual. Oh, my eyes. What a glare. Happy, don't look at those reflectors. They'll blind you. Let's run for the building and get out of this sun. Happy, look out. They're focusing those sun mirrors on us. A whole battery of them are pointed right toward us. Maybe we can dodge them. Run back this way. Commander, they've got us surrounded by those heat beams, and they're closing in. They hit us with all those at once. We're finished for good. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Space Shark, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! And now here's a message from Commander Buzz Corey. Here's a little riddle. What is it that is scarce, valuable, and necessary, yet given away free? The answer is blood, the gift of life. Yes, when grown-ups give blood at the Red Cross Center, they don't receive money, but they do receive the wonderful, deep-felt satisfaction of knowing they helped save a life. Now, how would you like to help me get more people to save lives? Join my Space Patrol blood boosters. It's lots of fun, so how about it? Join today. Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production, starring Ed Kemmer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Bela Kovac, Ken Mayer, and Norman Jolly. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol. 
And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston presents Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy are on Venus on a farm where food is chemically grown in large tanks. As they walk toward a building where Tonga is held captive, huge sun mirrors atop several tall towers turn ominously toward them. Smoke and rockets, Commander. It's really getting hot all of a sudden. Yes, waves of heat. Even for Venus, this is unusual. Gee, my eyes. What a glare. Don't look at those reflectors. They'll blind you. <laughs> Let's run for the building and get out of the sun. Happy, look out. They're focusing those sun mirrors on us. A whole battery of them are pointed right toward us. Maybe we can dodge them. Run back this way. Uh, Commander, they've got us surrounded by the heat beams, and they're closing in. If they hit us with all of them at once. We're finished. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Space Shark. It's the serial of the future, the real space serial. The serial that's different from any other serial in the universe. The serial you see on Commander Corey's own breakfast table. Delicious rice check. The cereal with a flavor like no other flavor in all the universe. Delicious rice checks. Swell tasting shredded rice spun in that modern bite sized design for easy eating. A real space cereal. You see, there's space inside those biscuits so they can fill up with milk or cream. Try it today, gang. The only bite sized rice cereal in the universe. Rice checks. The one and only official checkerboard rice cereal. Rice checks. One of the super cereals that helped us supercharge you. Rice checks at your grocer's in the red and white checkerboard package. Get it today. Crisp and delicious. New and different. Golden bite size rice checks. Commander Corey and Cadet Happy have just blasted off from the planet Saturn, where they've been investigating mysterious contamination of chemically grown food shipped from Venus. In the meantime, Tonga, the assistant security chief, is also doing some undercover investigation work on Venus, working as a chemist on one of the farms. Now, through the nose port of Terra 5, Buzz and Happy watch Saturn's shining rings looming up large before them. Raise our vector about five degrees, Happy. Want to clear the rings with plenty of space to spare. Yes, sir. You know, it's too bad anything so beautiful is such a menace to space flight. But by the time you're close enough for them to be a menace, the rings are no longer beautiful. No, because you can see the individual hunks of rock making up the rings. And yet from a distance, they look as though you could ride a surface car around them like on a smooth racetrack. Mm -hmm. Only in this case, it's the racetrack that does the moving. Well, it's 1,100 hours universal star time, Happy. We ought to be hearing from Tonga pretty soon. I hope she found out more about how that food is getting contaminated than we did. Yeah, those samples we examined on Saturn turned bad after they arrived from Venus. So maybe the chemical farm they came from is still pure, huh? Mm, not necessarily. Perhaps a chemical with a delayed action was put into the hydroponic tanks. Tonga calling Commander Corey. Tonga calling Commander Corey. Corey here. Go ahead, Tonga. Commander... How soon can you come to Venus? We just blasted off from Saturn. It'll take at least three and a half hours. Something wrong? Why, no, to the contrary. I found out how those harmful chemicals are getting into the hydroponic tanks. Good. A group of racketeers are trying to force the farm operators to pay for protection. They've bribed workers to put the contaminating chemicals into the tanks. Then, for the owners who pay the price, the tanks stay pure. Who's behind this gang? I don't know yet, Commander, but I think I will by the time you reach Venus. Where are you now? In the woman's dormitory at the farm. I'm just about ready to report for work at the lab. If you leave your miniature space phone in your room, be sure you hide it carefully. I keep it with me, Commander. It's safer. You want us to come directly to the farm when we reach Venus? I'll let you know later, Commander. By the way, I'm working here as Miss Bird. All right, Tonga. Be careful. Corey out. Gee, Commander, Tonga seems to have found out more in a week than all the other agents have in a month. She's a good security department operator, Happy. No, we'll clear the rings. Change vector for Venus. Yes. Sir. 
Ready for the spectroscope check on specimen 28, Mr. Baxter? All right, Miss Williams. Hmm. Negative. Well, this whole group of samples tests pure. I hope we have as good luck on the next group. Oh, never mind that now, Miss Burns. I'll handle it. Oh, but I thought you wanted all these samples analyzed before the morning shift ends. There isn't much more to do. I, uh, I'd like to have you take this report over to the superintendent's office. Why, yes, Mr. Baxter. Come in, Eagle. Where is she? I sent her on an errand. All right, Dad. Space Patrol spy. I wonder how much she knows. Not very much. I've kept close watch on her ever since we found that she's a Space Patrol agent. But that was three days ago. She's been here a week. I'd like to know where she kept that space I had a room search at the woman's dormitory. She's got it hidden, all right. Perhaps it's under the floor. Baxter, you should have put that concealed microphone in her room in the first day she was here. Look, I can't handle everything. Oh, we got to get rid of her. Without exciting suspicion. How can we do that? The Space Patrol will investigate. Mm-hmm. Supposing there was an accident. Supposing she mixed the wrong chemicals and there was an explosion. Oh, she's too careful. Too smart. I, I've got it. This will do fine. What is that? A harmless chemical used by Miss Burns almost constantly. But this bottle... Someone might easily confuse the names of the two chemicals. They're very much alike. Mm. What does this chemical do? A few drops mixed with any acid solution will produce a deadly gas. A gas that soon dissipates. After a few seconds, when it's mixed with air, it's harmless. Mm. But if someone were leaning over a container of it when it first formed... Mm -hmm. Baxter, I can't pronounce the name of the substance, but it's the solution to our problem. Fix it up. I better get out of here before she gets back. The superintendent said he'd check the report later, Mr. Baxter. <laughs> Typical. He hollers his head off for something, then lets it sit on his desk for three days. Miss Burns, would you take over here? Of course. I've got to rush over to tank number five. I'll be back as soon as possible. Right, Mr. Baxter. Mm. Now, let's see. Anetheric acid, 20 cc's. Oh, now where's it? Oh, here it is. <coughs> oh, oh. <coughs> it worked, Eagle. Is the gas dissipated? Do you think I'd be walking around like this if it hadn't? As I told you, it only takes a few seconds for the... Baxter, she's alive. Huh? Look at her. She's moving, tugging at her throat. She must have jerked her head back before it got into her lungs. Now what do we do? And this makes it awkward. Let me think a minute. Well, at this acceleration, we'll reach Venice in half an hour, sir. You want me to take over? <laughs> no, thanks, sir. I'd just as soon bring her in, if I may. Well, fine with me. Listen, I heard something in a miniature space and phone. Well, so did I. I got her, Baxter. We'll load our Miss Burns into the surface car and take her to my hyperdriving farm. Huh? So somebody sees us. Tell them there was a slight accident. We can say I'm a doctor. Take her to a hospital. But, Commander, they've done something to Tonga. Quiet, Happy. Why take her to your farm? When she comes to, we can make her tell how much she knows. We certainly can't work on her here. That's right, Abel. I'll stay here and watch Miss Burns. We got to get a surface car. Go on, get moving. Tonga managed to click on her space phone, so she's probably not too badly hurt. I wish they'd keep talking so we could find out who they are and where they're going to take her. Baxter and Eagle. Eagle has a chemical food farm. Happy you keep listening to your miniature set. I'll contact Venus Space Control and have them check on the location of a hydroponic farm owned by a man named Eagle. Well, our passenger seems to be very quiet back there. Well, apparently that gas just missed being totally effective. Here, pull up in front of this building. What's this place? 
Mm, a couple of storage rooms and a solar mirror control. Quite a layout you have. Yeah, very successful farm, Baxter. And you know, I haven't had a bit of trouble with contaminated food. I wonder why. <laughs> I wonder why. Oh, well, come to think of it, maybe I'd better have some trouble in case the space patrol starts wondering why. Well, come on. Let's get her out of the car. She's still unconscious. We'll have to carry her. Yeah, all right. Let's go. <clears throat> Spaceship. It's landing. Quick, get her inside. It's a space patrol ship. Why do you suppose it's coming here? It's the commander ship. I've seen it a dozen of times on Terra. He must know the whole deal. How could he? Ah, the girl tipped him off. Probably has been waiting for days for some open move on our part. Uh, what do we do with her? Where's one of those storage rooms? Oh, wait. There isn't time for that now. Bring her in here. We got to stop Corey. Stop? How? Oh. Uh, set her down here. Look, why don't we lock her up out of sight? Maybe we can bluff Corey out of it. He can't know anything. Well, he's obviously been to the other farm. And knows the girl was taken away in a surface car. Well, nobody asked us any questions. No, but several people saw us. Why don't we get in the car again and get away from here? And be followed by Corey's spaceship? I'm not anxious to tangle with Corey. We won't have to. Come here. I'll show you something that will take care of Corey. Commander, I'm not sure, but I thought I saw two men carrying Tonga into that building down there uh, when we were landing the ship. That means she's still unconscious. Yes, we've got to be careful, Happy. It's lucky she managed to turn on her miniature spacephone. And even when Eagle and Baxter weren't talking, you picked up the sound of the surface car motor and led us right here. This farm is more than just a front. Looks like a well-run operation. Well, then why does Milton Eagle get mixed up in a gang of racketeers? Well, very likely he's one of the higher-ups, if not the kingpin. This protection racket is his way of controlling competition. Well, what are those big, shiny pieces of metal on top of the towers? Those are solar mirrors, Happy. They can be focused on the food tanks to raise the temperature. Some of them seem to be moving now. Uh, they have to keep pace with the sun. Also, if the mirrors were kept focused on one tank too long, it would scorch the plants, probably boil the water. Oh, I see. I'm not so sure our rival hasn't aroused interest, Happy, so be on your guard. Get the idea now, Baxter? I'm surrounding Corey and the cadet with circles of concentrated sunlight. What do you expect to do? Blind them with the glare? Yeah. Wait till I converge all those beams in one spot. Right on Corey and his friend. Hegel. Well, do you realize the heat those mirrors put out? <laughs> yeah, quite well, Baxter. And I think this will serve to stop the space patrol permanently. Now watch. I'm going to bring the focal points together. Gee, Commander, sure is getting hot all of a sudden. Yes, waves of heat. Even for Venus, this is unusual. Smoke and rockets, my eyes. What a glare. Don't look at those reflectors. They're blind to hey, Let's run for the building and get out of the sun. Happy, they're focusing those sun mirrors on us. There's a whole battery of them. Maybe we can dodge them. Run back this way. Hey, Commander, we're surrounded by heat beams, and they're closing in. They hit us with all those at once. We're finished. We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a moment. Right now, here's the story of a cosmic surface car in trouble. Listen. The trouble? Nothing to go on but ordinary fuel. Do you hear that? The driver's filling up the tank with super fuel. Now, something's going to happen now. Boy, that cosmic surface car is really roaring now. That's because it's supercharged with super fuel. And the same is true with you, gang. What happens when you don't have a good breakfast? You're just a putt-putt. But when you fill up your tank with super fuel, man, you're supercharged. Now, here's how Buzz Corey does it. He eats a good breakfast with a checkerboard super cereal. Rice checks or wheat checks. Wait till you taste them, gang. Boy, are they good. Flavor galore in every crisp, bite-sized biscuit. So get going, gang. Eat a good super cereal breakfast and get supercharged. Get the super cereals today. Rice checks, wheat checks. Buzz and Happy are on the grounds of a chemically grown food plant on Venus in an attempt to rescue Tonga, abducted by two men who've been putting poisonous chemicals in the food tanks of competing operators. The two conspirators, Milton Agel and Richard Baxter, have seen Buzz and Happy approach the building where they're holding Tonga. 
Aegilus focused several sun mirrors toward the two space patrolmen, surrounding them with heat beams. Inch by inch, the circles close in around Buzz and Happy as Aegil tightens the wall of searing heat. Look at them, Baxter. Ha, they can't move in any direction. Grass all around them is burning. <laughs> yeah, and a few seconds ago it was fresh and green. That must be stifling inside those beams. Look at them. Even from here, you can tell they're gasping for air. Well, we might as well finish them off. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, grab her, Baxter. Let go of me. Get your hands off of that panel. Pull her away, Baxter. I'm trying to. Let go of me. How you come away? Let go of me. I've got her, Eagle. Now I'll finish off Corey and... Uh, she cut off the beam. Get them on, quickly. There isn't time. Corey and the cadet are headed toward us. Drag the girl out to the surface car. Quick. Quit struggling, dear. Take your hands off me. Uh, we haven't got time to pamper you, Miss Burns. <gasps> there. Uh, now you can carry her. And hurry up. Into the car. They're getting into the surface car. They've got Tonga. Hurry up. Stop. Hey, come back here. <laughs> No use, Hap. Doggone it. A few more steps and we'd have made it. Back to the ship. We'll blast off and trace them. They won't be able to get far. It was close. Huh? Plenty close. We aren't away yet. They look for us with their ship. Maybe put up a roadblock. Found a girl. Why don't we get rid of her for good? Throw her out of the car. No, you fool. As long as she's with us, Corey won't get robbed. Where, where are you taking me? That's a good question. Where are we taking it? Uh, we're going to blast off for Neptune. Blasting off for Neptune? In the surface car? You must really have knocked your silly angle. <laughs> I got a spaceship in a private spaceport a couple of miles from here. With a little luck, we can blast off before Corey spots us. With a little I luck, think we I've can got him, sir, on the miniature set. Can't you get yeah, that's them all. Out of the surface car? You just leave the driving to me. Watch the girl. Where on Neptune are you taking me? place where the space patrol will never find you? I suppose you've got a hideout in the mountains somewhere. No, not quite. There's a small settlement along the Krolog River, just about 60 views east of Neptune City, where we won't be found. A big city be better. People wouldn't ask so many questions. I know what I'm doing. Well, we know where they're going to take her. Hope we can rescue Tonga before they get her aboard the spaceship. Hey, Commander, there's a surface car down there on the highway. Do you suppose that's the one? Very likely. Let's cut down our speed. The spaceport isn't much further, Baxter. What kind of spaceship do you have? My, such an inquisitive woman. But I'll tell you, I'm rather proud of it. It's a Class B space cruiser, one of the largest private ships made. A Class B space cruiser? How nice. It must be Venus Registry, then. Yes, Venus Registry. Anything else you want to know? Hegel, we're being followed. Uh, by a surface car. Uh, none showing on a highway radar. No, a spaceship. It's pretty high up, but it's hovering. There's some binoculars in the compartment. See if you can make out what ship it is. All right. I don't like the looks of it. Why would a spaceship be traveling so slowly over this part of Venus? Uh, it's changing direction now. I can get these glasses, folks. It's a space patrol ship, Terra 5. Corey again. Uh, maybe he didn't see us after all. Uh, there were other surface cars on a highway near my farm. Wonder how we happened to follow this one. That's strange. Miss Burns, why do you keep playing with that locket? Why, I... I didn't know I was. Give me that... There you are. Oh, rather large for a locket, isn't it? Snap it open. Uh, now, isn't this interesting? Yeah, what is it, Baxter? I mean, it's your space phone. So that's how Corey's been able to find us. We really ought to fix this girl now. Shut up, you fool. Turn that space phone off. Just a minute, Eagle. I know where you are and what you're up to. If either you or Baxter harm Tonga, both of you will regret it the rest of your lives. Our serial name is Tonga, the assistant security chief. That's right. Corey, I, I got a proposition to make to you. What is it? If we turn Tonga loose, will you let us alone? You know I couldn't make a bargain like that. Well, I'm willing to take a gamble, Corey. I know you'll keep after us, but I'll trade Tonga for a few minutes' time. There's a small check a few hundred yards down the highway. I'll leave Tonga there. How about it, Corey? It's your best chance to get her back safely. All right, Eagle. I'll get you anyway, but I warn you, don't try to double-cross me. Uh, cut the space phone off, Baxter. It's off. Uh, here's the shack. We got to work fast. Corey's landing right where I figured he would. 
stay behind the trees until he's out of the ship. Why don't we get in the car and get to your ship? Why waste time? While Corey is in the shack rescuing Tonga, we'll put his weapons out of commission. Why not wreck the control so he can't blast off? Yeah, and have him alert other space patrol units? Our best bet is to have Corey after us himself. Tell me your ship is faster than Terra 5. No, but his ship isn't faster than the shark. The shark? Yeah, it's a cosmic missile with a special view scope device. I have one aboard my ship. And once it's launched at Corey's ship, he can dodge it or outrun it. Yes, and with his own cosmic weapons out of commission, he can't fire at the shark. That's right. He can run all over the solar system. But sooner or later, the shark will get him. Come on, get ready. Corey and the cadet are getting out of the ship. Here's the shack, sir. I sure hope they kept their word and left Tonga here. Eagle and Baxter are putting a lot of faith in a few minutes' head start. It won't do them much good. Try the door, huh? Thanks. Commander, happy. Are you all right, Tonga? Yes, Commander. Oh, they've got her tied, hand and foot. I have to give them more time. They probably would have locked the door if they could. Here, I'll cut those ropes, Tonga. Thank you, Commander. I tried to find out exactly where Eagle's spaceship was. All I know is that it's not too far from here. Happy and I looked for it from the air, but it must have been hidden. Hey, this... The ship blasting off. Probably Eagles. Let's see. By the time we walk through the woods back to our ship, well, they'll have about five minutes start on us. Five minutes? Well, that isn't going to do them much good. They picked us up, Eagle. Good. Now let's give Corey a run for his money. When are you going to launch the guided missiles at them? Well, we'll wait till they get closer. First, we leave Corey out of the regular lanes. I don't want him to call for help when we launch the shark. aren't gaining very fast, sir. They must realize they can't escape. Turn on the space phone, Happy, and I'll order them to surrender. Commander Corey aboard Terra 5 to Milton Eagle aboard Private Cruiser 398. Come in. Eagle to Commander Corey. Is something wrong, Commander? Eagle, the smartest thing you can do is surrender. Head for Saturn. It's the closest planet. Sorry. We have other plans. I order you to surrender. We're armed, you know. Oh, of course. Happy, stand by to fire a warning rocket. Yes, sir. Eagle, I don't want to use force unless it's necessary, but I'm prepared to do it. Commander, something's wrong with the firing mechanism. What? The electronic controls are out of order. What about number two? Well, they're all out of order, sir. That's right, Commander. Baxter and I took care of that while you were rescuing Tonga. We can still overtake you, Eagle. Meanwhile, we can call units from Saturn. You're going to be pretty busy, Commander. Baxter and I are sending you a present. Catch. Eagle, if you fire on a space patrol ship, you'll be blasted out of space. Commander, look at the view scope. Something's leaving their ship not a regular missile, sir. It's too slow. It may seem slow now, Cadet, but wait. Eagle, what did you just release? A weapon with your picture on it, Commander. It's gaining velocity, sir. It's a guided type missile with a cosmic warhead. Have fun. Eagle out. Happy. Change vector for Saturn. For Saturn, sir? Yes, and put on all the acceleration we can stand. Getting closer, Commander. Head for Saturn's rings, Happy. For the rings? Yes. Get on a tangent with the outer ring. All right, sir, but... Well, Commander... Yes, sir. The rings are made up of big chunks of rock. If we get too close... That's the we'll... idea, Tonga. We'll get as close as possible. We're going to let those rocks run interference for us. What an idea. Just like football at technology school. Uh, blocking back, trailing you. Tonga, yeah. bring the forward view scope up to full sensitivity. We'll pick out a nice big rock. Yes, Commander. Missile's awfully close, sir. At this rate, it'll hit us in a few seconds. There's a giant hunk of rock dead ahead. Good. I'll take the controls now, Happy. I'm going to see how close I can come to that rock. Tonga, watch the rear view scope. The missile's awfully close. Fine. We're going to jaywalk right in front of that rock. <gasps> wow. Oh, boy, was that close. Smoking rockets, have you ever seen such fire? Watch the rear view scope. The rock. It blew up right behind us. The guided missile hit it. Luck. Luck, nothing. That was the trickiest spaceship piloting in the universe, Commander. You hit a guided missile with an unguided missile. Now, let's it. take care of some unfinished business. Eagle and Baxter. How are we going to find them now? I don't think it'll be difficult. They figure we're out of the way, so they might go back to their original plan. The Crawlock River place? We'll try it. Take over, Happy. We're clear of the ring. Well, I lined up another ship for us, Baxter. Good. When do we leave Crowlock? In a few hours. 
One of my men is bringing a ship in from Neptune City. Oh, it can't be too soon to suit me. I don't like this place. Ah, what are you so jittery about? We don't have to worry about Corey anymore. I ah, know. I just don't like Neptune. I'm used to Venus. You get plenty of sunshine. Get your hands up, Eagle. You too, Baxter. Corey. Get the weapons, Happy. Yes, sir. Uh, Corey, uh, how did you... The guided missile, you, you couldn't have escaped a shark. A shark, if that's what you call it, stubbed its nose on a rock just off Saturn. As a pet, it wasn't too trustworthy. You were so sure you'd finish, Corey. I told you not to come here. Now, now, Baxter. No recrimination. We gambled and we lost. Take it easy, Baxter. Like me. No, you don't, Eagle. Uh, <coughs> now, Eagle. Are you ready to come along? Yeah. Uh, sure. Oh, okay, Corey. Uh, I'll come along. Yeah. You know, uh, you're not very agile, Eagle. Uh, you'd better stick to taking it easy, like Baxter. Yeah. <laughs> An exciting preview of next week's thrilling Space Patrol story in just a moment. Hey, watch out. Hold everything. Here he comes down the rink so fast his ice skates are melting the ice. Wow, that's a checkerboard kid. He's supercharged. And a good breakfast with a checkerboard super cereal did it. A breakfast with swell-tasting instant Ralston. Uh-oh, here he comes again. Stand back. Jumpin' Jupiter, that boy's a winner. He's got the speed of Buzz Corey himself. And how about you, gang? How about getting supercharged so you can whiz along just like that? Just do this. Have a good breakfast with Instant Ralston, the hot super cereal. The delicious hot cereal that helps to turn on your starter. Makes you bright as a light and helps to keep you right on the beam. That's what it does for the commander. That's what it'll do for you. Uh Uh-oh, here comes the checkerboard kid again on those flying ice skates. Don't wait, gang. Be a winner yourself. Get supercharged. Eat a good breakfast with a delicious hot super cereal, Instant Ralston. And now for a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story. Buzz and Happy and their spacesuits on a tiny asteroid are approaching a criminal who has stolen evidence that's needed to convict a crime syndicate. He's got the metal box, sir, with the evidence. All right, Chora. Come out of that crater and get into our ship. I'm getting into my own ship, Corey. And you're not going to stop me. All right, we'll come down and get you. Take one more step and I'll use this gun on you. All right, have it your way. I warned you. Drop, Happy. Wow, that was close. The gun chipped a hunk of rock loose as big as your head. Stand still, Happy. I think Chora means business. He does. And it isn't funny business either. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Search for Asteroid X, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! And now, an important message from Commander Buzz Corey. Did you ever read in the paper about a boy or girl saving somebody's life? Ever wish you could do something like that? Well, you can. Just join my Space Patrol blood boosters. Now, here's what we do. We try to get more people to donate blood to the Red Cross. When you get somebody to donate blood, you save a life. So, boys and girls, join my Space Patrol blood boosters today. Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmerer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Bela Kovach, Ken Mayer, and Nina Barra. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol! And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston present Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! In today's 
transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy, in their spacesuits on a tiny asteroid, are approaching a criminal who has stolen evidence that's needed to convict a crime syndicate. He's got the metal box, sir, with the evidence. All right, Chura, come out of that crater and get into our ship. I'm getting into my own ship, Corey, and you're not going to stop me. All right, we'll come down and get you. Take one more step and I'll use this gun on you. All right, have it your own way. I, I warned you. Drop, Happy. Wow, that was close. That ray gun knocked a hunk of rock loose as big as your head. Don't move, Hap. I think Chura means business. He sure does. And it isn't funny business either. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Search for Asteroid X. Say, did you hear that, gang? That was the Terra Express train trying to get up speed on ordinary fuel. Not very speedy, was it? But now listen to that same train with super fuel in its tank. Man, that train is really traveling now because it's supercharged with super fuel. Now, gang, without a good breakfast, you can't go very fast either. But with super fuel in your tank, you're supercharged. Here's how Buzz Corey gets up ahead of steam in the morning. He has a good breakfast with rice checks or wheat checks, the super cereals that helped us supercharge you. For taste, they're terrific. For size, they're perfect because they both have that modern bite size design. So, gang, get off to a quick start in the morning the way Buzz Corey does. Get supercharged. Just eat a good breakfast with the checkerboard super cereals and get them today in the red and white checkerboard packages. Rice checks, wheat checks. After months of careful investigation, Space Patrol agents have gathered evidence against the leaders of the notorious Saturn Syndicate. This gang, for months, has been victimizing honest businessmen on the outer planets of the solar system. Commander Corey has been awaiting the arrival of an agent with the evidence that will convict the leaders of the syndicate. Now, Buzz grimly enters his central office on Terra, where Cadet Happy is decoding spacegrams. Lock those messages in the file, Happy. You can work on them later. Well, is something wrong, Commander? Well, it certainly is. I've just received a report that Fraser's in the hospital. All the evidence is gone. What? Somebody jumped Fraser while he was on his way here in a surface car. He was knocked unconscious. Every scrap of evidence was stolen. Documents, microfilm, everything. Do you have any idea who did it, sir? No, I understand the doctors won't let our security people see Fraser yet. Is he badly hurt? Fortunately, no. The loss of that evidence puts us right back where we started three months ago in the Saturn Syndicate investigation. Come on over to the hospital with me. As soon as the doctor's okay, I don't want to ask Fraser some questions. Cut your speed and go lower, Hanley. I think I see something down there. Where? Right near that small pond. Uh, isn't that a building of some kind? Hey, you're right, Chura. Well, I hope it's occupied. Say, uh, there is a man down there by the pond. That's surprising to find anybody in this part of Mars. Set the ship down. We'll load up with food and water. I suppose this guy won't give us any? Well, then he'll get what our friend, the Space Patrol agent, got. Do you think you finished that guy, Chura? Who cares? We got the evidence. Yeah. But I won't rest easy until we get it hit on Asteroid X. Oh, kick on the repeller ray. Repeller ray on. Well, we're down. If we get enough supplies here, we can go into free fall near the asteroid belt till we decide what our next move is. I wonder who this guy is. He <laughs> sure must like solitude. Now, we don't want any trouble if we can help it, Hundley. Let me do the talking. Don't you always? <laughs> all right, all right, let's go. Now the outer hatch. Hi there. Uh, he looks good natured and not very bright. Just what we ordered. Uh, hello, friend. Having trouble with your ship? No, but we're out of supplies, yep. food and water. When we left Lowell City, we thought we had enough to get to Neptune, but looks as though I miscalculated. Well, I got plenty here, gentlemen. Come on in, take what you want. We'll pay you for it. Oh, no, no, I got plenty. Come on in the house and help yourselves. All right, that's mighty generous of you, Mr. Uh... Noonan. Marty Noonan. By the way, I don't believe I got your names. Well, I'm Steve Chura, and this is my friend Wally Hundley. Now about those supplies. Oh, sure. Sorry, you folks are in a hurry. 
But uh, since you are, just come with me, gentlemen. I brought this extra box of rations, gentlemen, just in case of emergency. Here, I'll pass it up to Chura. All right, Hundley. Come aboard. Hey, uh, sure wish you fellas could stay a while. Don't get many visitors. So do we, Mr. Noonan. But we got to get going. Well, I understand. Well, very much obliged, Noonan. Oh, no trouble at all. So long. Take care of yourself. Goodbye. Better stand back and watch our rockets. We're going to blast off. Yeah, sure, a couple of swell fellas. Gee, what's this? Little box. Oh, they must have dropped it. Uh, uh, hey, wait! Oh, this looks pretty important. Microfilm Reel 14B Property of Space Patrol. Investigation Squad Number 3, Space Patrol Headquarters, Terra. Guys, they're Space Patrol agents. I'd better call headquarters right away. Commander, will you take the space phone call? It's something about a can of microfilm a fellow found on Mars. All right, Happy. Corey here. Go ahead, please. Commander, my name is Noonan. Yes, Mr. Noonan? A couple of your agents dropped a can of microfilm on my land. I uh, want to know how to go about returning it. Well, what does it say on the label? Real 14B Investigation Squad Number 3. Oh, just a minute. You say Space Patrol agents dropped it? Yes, sir. I think it fell out of one of the men's pockets. Happy. Squad 3 was on the Saturn Syndicate case. Mr. Noonan... What were these agents doing on your land? They ran out of supplies on the way to Neptune. Did you see their credentials? Uh, no, I didn't. Just figured they were agents when I found the film. Said their names were Steve Chur and Wally Hundley. Did you ever see these men before? Why, no, Commander. Where are you now? At my place. Uh, sector 17H on the Martian Plain. Uh, about four and six tenths DUs directly northwest of Little City. Got that, Happy? Yes, sir. What kind of a ship did these men have? Was it a space patrol ship? No, didn't have any insignia at all. But I don't know what kind it was. Mr. Noonan, hold on to that microfilm. I'm coming after it. Right, Commander. And don't give it to anyone else. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Thanks for your cooperation. I'm on my way. Corey, out. I've just checked, sir. We don't have any agents named Chura and Hundley. Not on Squad 3, anyway. Well, chances are those are the men who knocked out Fraser. At least they have the evidence, or I should say had it. But Fraser didn't get a look at the men who attacked him. Well, I'll blast off from Mars and get the film happy. Maybe we can get some more information from this man, Noonan. I finished decoding the patrol unit messages, sir. Good. Will you read them, Happy? Yes, sir. Quote, the commander-in-chief aboard Terra 5, Jupiter Patrol, searched Mars to Neptune orbit. No suspicious craft sighted. Unquote. From Saturn Patrol, same, negative. Neptune Patrol also replies a negative. Any more? Well, patrol ship 34A, asteroid belt, picked up an unidentified object in their view scope. They're investigating it. Happy? We're going right into Lowell City. And how about the microfilm at Noonan's place? Now, you can go after it in an atmosphere ship after we land. I'll call Noonan, describe the credentials you'll present to him to relieve him of my original order. All right, sir. See how much you can find out about those men he saw. Get a full description. Very likely their right names aren't sure and Hundley. It's almost certain they lied when they told Noonan they were going to Neptune. Shall I bring Noonan back to Lowell City? If you think he can give us any useful information. Yes, sir. Well, uh, we'll reach Mars in 20 minutes, sir. I'd better check Lowell City's face. Get the evidence ready. We're nearly to Asteroid X. All right, sure. <laughs> what a terrific place to hide it. Even if somebody knew it was on an asteroid, how would they know which one? Uh, and I remember, Hundley, when we get to the asteroid, be sure to mark the exact universal star time to the tenth of a second. Why? Well, otherwise, the orbit computer can pinpoint its location when we want to find the asteroid again. Yeah, yeah I get it. Have you got the evidence ready to unload? Yeah, I'll accept. Uh-oh. What's the matter? A reel of microfilm. I had it in my pocket. It's gone. Huh? Uh, what was it doing in your pocket? That spilled out when we took the stuff from the agent's surface car, so I just stuck it in my pocket. Oh, well, probably doesn't matter. What do you mean it doesn't matter? That reel might be just the one to convict the boss. And us. How did you happen to lose it? I don't know. Oh, wait a minute. Back at noon. Huh? Yeah, I may have fallen out while I was bending over to pick up the box of food or water containers. Eh, how could you be that careless? Well, at least noon is alone. We got to go back and look for it. There is nothing else to do. Hi there. Are you Marty Noonan? Yep, that's right. Uh, I'm Cadet Happy. Here are my Space Patrol credentials. Mighty glad to know you, Cadet. 
Commander Corey called me about you. Oh, uh, here's your microfilm. Oh, thanks. Uh, there are several questions Commander Corey wanted me to ask you about these men. Chura and Hundley? Well, I'll tell you what I can. Suppose we go in the house and have a bite to eat while we talk. All right, fine. It's a mighty fine-looking little atmosphere ship. How fast will she go? Oh, probably 1,200. On this trip, though, I averaged about 8.32. From the old city to here, nine minutes and 54 seconds. Hey. Yeah, about that. Let's see. Uh, I took off at... Hey, how did you figure that out so quick? Oh, I don't know. Answers just sort of come to me. Don't have to think about it. It's lucky, too. Because if I had to tell you how to do it, I'd get all confused and come up with the wrong answer. <laughs> I have to figure everything out on paper or use the electronic computer in the ship. Well, first, Mr. Noonan, uh, can you give me a, a description of these two men? Well, Chur is about 45, 6 feet tall, weighs about 210 or standard. Well, Mr. Noonan, you've given me a very complete description of these crooks, and their ship was very likely a Class C private cruiser from the way you describe it. Uh, could you come to Lowell City with me, Mr. Noonan? I think Commander Corey would like to question you further. Why, of course. I'd like to get back as soon as possible. Uh, do you mind if I use your space phone? Okay, I... Noonan. Uh, you two cadet, get your hands out. Sure, and Hundley. That's right. Don't make a move for your gun, cadet, or I'll use this one. Okay. Which one of you has the microfilm? What microfilm? You know what microfilm. Noonan must have found it or you wouldn't be here. Hundley, take the cadet's ray gun and search him for the tape. Sure. The film's in my jacket pocket, and it's going to stay there. You want to play rough, eh, Cadet? You let him alone. You keep out of this, Noonan. Sure, sure, help me. All right, I'm coming. All right, Cadet. He nearly got the gun away from me. Well, after this, don't be so careless. I got him. Here's the microfilm. All right, let's get back to the ship. Uh Uh-uh. The Cadet's coming, too. And I got an idea. We're going to take him with us. What for? Let's finish him here. Oh, not till we find out how much he knows. Come on, cadet. Come on, on your feet. You got a nice long walk. Walk? Where to? To our ship. What about Noonan? Oh, that stupid oaf. Leave him here. Smash his face phone. And the one in the cadet's atmosphere ship as well. Okay. Where are you going to take me? Never mind. But I'll tell you this much. You better enjoy it because this is the last trip you ever gonna take. We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a moment. Gang, this is Space Patroller Dick Tufel, and boy, am I excited. We have a new machine here at Space Patrol headquarters, and it's terrific. It's the flavor meter for testing the flavor of food. Now, I have a plain, ordinary cereal right here, so let's test it. The better it tastes, the louder it'll ring the bell. Now, all I do is place the cereal in this slot and push the button. Hmm, not much flavor there, is it? Uh, Let's put in some other ordinary cereal and see what happens. Why, not even a tinkle. Now, gang, here's a couple of uh, super cereals I'd like to test. I'll put them both in. Wow, that did it. Those cereals really ring the bell for flavor. You bet. They were rice checks and wheat checks. Checks, the cereals with that modern bite size design. Checks, the super cereals that help to supercharge you. Test them yourself, gang, in your own cereal bowl. And believe me, they'll really ring the bell for flavor. Rice checks, wheat checks. <laughs> Commander Corey has sent Happy to Marty Noonan's isolated dwelling on the Martian plain to recover some stolen evidence, a roll of microfilm. Noonan and Happy were surprised by Chura and Hundley when the thieves returned for the film. After smashing Noonan's spaceophone, the criminals have taken Happy to their ship, leaving the unconscious Noonan locked in his house. Meanwhile, Buzz, in Lowell City, has tried in vain to contact Happy or Noonan by spaceophone. Commander Corey to Space Patrol, Lowell City. Space Patrol, Lieutenant Barton here, Commander. Lieutenant, I've been unable to contact my cadet on any of the Space Patrol frequencies. And Noonan doesn't answer either, so I'm blasting off to see what the trouble is. Would you like an atmosphere ship, sir? No, a spaceship in case I need it. I'll go on Terra 5. Keep monitoring those frequencies. If you hear from either Cadet Happy or Marty Noonan, notify me in my private frequency immediately.
Hello there. Are you Marty Noonan? Yes. I'm Commander Corey. Where's Cadet Happy? Sure, and Hundley. They took him away, and they got the microfilm. I tried to stop him, Commander, but they knocked me out. They smashed my space phone, and the one in the cadet ship there, too. Do you know where they took him? No, by the time I came to and broke out of my house, they'd blasted off. They'd locked me in. Did you hear anything that would give us a clue as to where they were going? No. All I remember was that one of them said we ought to be able to get there by 1,500 hours. But I don't know where they meant. How long ago did they blast off? About an hour and a half ago. Say, uh, Commander, I'd like to help you find them. All right, come aboard. Thanks, Commander. Maybe with the astrogation charts and the computer, I can figure out an approximate radius of where Chula's ship might be by 1,500 hours. Well, if they're going to any planet, it'd have to be Jupiter. Well, why do you say that? Well, considering the speed of spaceships and the present positions of the planets, and the approximate arrival time of 1,500 hours, it uh, just has to be Jupiter. Oh, it does? Yes, it wouldn't need that much time to get to any of the inner planets like Earth and Venus, and they'd need much more time to get to Saturn. Oh, you may be right, but as a double check, I'll work it out on the computer. The computer will give us the answer in a few seconds. Now, here we are. Now, let's see. Well, what do you know? What would you say, Commander? Mr. Noonan, this is amazing. Either you made a very lucky guess, or you must know the exact distances and positions of all the planets relative to Mars. Oh, I do. I make a hobby of remembering data like that. Jupiter comes nearer to satisfying the equation than any other object in space. How do you do it? I don't know, Commander. If I know a formula and the data, I can get the result. But if I stop to think how I do it, I get all confused. There's only one thing wrong. They couldn't quite reach Jupiter by 1500. Of course, they may be heading for one of the moons. I'll check the astrogation chart again. Could be Ganymede, Commander. Assuming we're right on the time factor. Yeah, we'll see. Mr. Noonan, you've hit it again. The astrogation chart puts moon number three, Ganymede, very close to the vector. Ganymede's a good-sized moon. There are a lot of places to hide on it. The most we can hope for right now is that we're headed in the right direction. I just talked to the boss. What'd you tell him? Just that we got the evidence against the gang away from the space patrol and that we're on Ganymede. And the boss is going to stay on Saturn now that he's safe from prosecution. How long do we stick on Ganymede? Uh, until the excitement over, the stolen evidence dies down a little. Say, where's the cadet? All right, sitting over there. Nick. He's gone. I told you to watch him. Uh, the space phone. Look in the next room, quickly. And I'm being held on Ganymede, Sector 9J. Hey, Could get away from the space phone. Grab Ganymede, him on the list. Sector 9J. Hey. I'll teach you, cadet. Uh, now, watch him after this. That was happy. He was cut off. Sounded to me like somebody hit him. Sector 9J. That pinpoints location, Mr. Noonan. We'll make a slow glide approach and land with the repeller ray. Maybe Chura and Hundley won't hear the ship. <clears throat> All right, cadet. We could keep this out for hours, but I'm tired of playing games with you. Does Commander Corey know who knocked out the space patrol agent? Now, come on, answer me. Oh, you're wasting your time, Chura. I'm all for getting rid of the cadet right now. After that space phone call he tried to make a while ago, he's too much of a risk to have around. I'm afraid you're right, Hundley. We'll take him away from the building and use the ray gun on him. Well, let's get at it. Get your hands up, you two. Corey! Commander, you got here just in time. Mr. Noonan put me on the right track, then we heard your space phone call. Chura, where's the Saturn Syndicate evidence? It's where you'll never find it. They put it on an asteroid, sir, somewhere in the asteroid belt, but I couldn't tell you which one. There are thousands of them. I'll untie your hands, cadet. Oh, thanks. Oh, look out, Noonan. Too late, Corey. Shoot, Commander. I can't. He's holding Noonan as a shield. So long, Corey. Are you all right, Noonan? I'm sorry, Commander. That's okay. After him, quick. He's locked the door. Hundley, have you got a key to this door? Sorry, Commander. Chura has the only one. Search him. I'll see if I can smash the door. I've got my hands loose now, Commander. I'll help you. All right, Happy. Can't find a key on him, Commander. Just this slip of paper. Uh-oh. It's Chura's ship. He's getting away. <laughs> well, we still have you, Hundley. Hey, Mr. Noonan, don't throw that paper away. That's the coordinates of the asteroid. Oh, all right, Cadet. I'll hang on to it. Once more, Happy. <laughs> the door's giving... <laughs> there she is. Escort our friend Hundley to the ship. Come on, let's get after Chura. No sign of Chura's ship in the viewscope, sir. Hundley, 
You must know where he'd be most likely to go. Really, Commander, I haven't the slightest idea. Probably heading for that asteroid to pick up the evidence. Mr. Noonan, let's see that piece of paper. Here it is, Commander. Yes. His coordinates are for a point somewhere in the asteroid belt. Yes, sir, but the asteroid has moved thousands of DUs by now. Yes, but the time is down here to the second. Oh, you mean the time the coordinates were taken? Yes. So by using the computer, we can tell just where the asteroid will be at any future moment. Commander, look at Hundley. <laughs> hey, get away from that computer! Get him, Happy! <laughs> All right, Hundley. Quiet down or I'll knock you cold. Look what he did to the computer. Put it completely out of commission. Yeah, now let's see you find Asteroid X. Well, what are we going to do, sir? We can't possibly locate that asteroid until we get another computer. I know. There are thousands of asteroids in that belt. Um, Commander, can I see that piece of paper? All right, Mr. Newton. Mm, 16 degrees, 23 minutes, 7 seconds. Sun Arcturus orientation, 123 million DUs from Sun Center. Commander, I think I can give you the approximate location of that asteroid. You can work out that orbit equation in your head? Already have, sir. If you show me an astrogation chart, I'll mark down the coordinates. Smoking rocket. That's impossible. Nobody could solve an equation like that so quickly. Not in his head. I've seen Mr. Noonan work, Hundley, and I think you're in for a surprise. Here's a chart, Mr. Noonan. Center that asteroid in the viewscope, Happy. Yes, sir. The approximate location you gave us, Mr. Noonan. The question is, is that asteroid X? Yeah, there are hundreds of asteroids in this region. Yeah, but look, there's a spaceship circling it. Hey, it's going to land. Mr. Noonan, it looks as though you pinpointed the right one. Sheer luck. Increase our velocity, Happy. You may be able to catch Chura before he leaves the asteroid. Yes, sir. Mr. Noonan, will you go to the locker and get a couple of spacesuits for Happy and myself? Sure will, Commander. When we land on the asteroid, I'll leave you in the ship to watch Hundley. There's Chira, sir, in that small crater. He'll set down between him and his ship. Cut rockets. Rockets out, sir. Hit repeller ray. Repeller ray on, sir. Landing secured, Commander. All right, Happy. Let's get out there and grab Chura. Mr. Noonan, here's a ray gun. Hold it on our friend Hundley. Very happy to, Commander. He's got the metal box, sir, with the evidence. All right, Chura. Come out of that crater and get into our ship. I'm getting into my own ship, Corey, and you're not going to stop me. All right, we'll see about that. Now, take one more step and I'll use this gun on you. I warned you. Drop that. Oh, that was close. That blast knocked loose a hunk of rock as big as your head. Next time, I'll widen the angle, and I won't miss. Shall we rush him, sir? Don't try it. Move one inch closer, Corey, and you're finished. There's nothing we can do. Back to the ship, Happy. Yes, sir. Commander, isn't there any way we can get him? Just get into the ship. Close the hatch. Yes, sir. Well, he can't hold out there very long without food and water, sir. Do we just wait? He'd have to give up eventually. But he destroyed the evidence before he surrendered. I guess there's nothing to do but blast off. Turn your transmitter signal to low output so Chura can't hear us. Yes, sir. All set. Hey, Commander, he'll have to pass right by this hatch to get to his own ship. Yes, there's one weapon that might work. Right here in this container. Liquid air. But but how... Unfasten the bracket. Yes, sir. Now, as he passes the hatch, open it as quickly as possible. And I'll open the valve on the nozzle. We'll squirt a jet of liquid air at Chura. But what good will that do? Is the pressure strong enough to knock him down? No, but the temperature out there in that asteroid is minus 240 degrees. Liquid air freezes at minus 218. Yeah, but I still don't see... There he is. Open the hatch, Happy. Quickly. Good shot, sir. It's hitting him. I'm trying to spray it over his hand. Hey, Corey, what are you trying to do? Fight with a water pistol? There, I got his hand. Turn it off, Corey, or I'll put a blast charge into your ship. Well, I I can't raise my arm. That's right, Chura. Your gun hand is encased Uh, in a mass of frozen air. Yeah, that'll hold him, Happy. Hey, he's just standing there like a statue. Let's go out and bring him into the ship. He's harmless now. <laughs> well, what's funny, huh? He, he thought he was hot stuff, but now he'll have to be defrosted. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back with an action preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story in just a moment. Say, gang, did you ever hear the robot mastermind work? It's the amazing Space Patrol machine with a mechanical brain. It knows the answer to everything. Uh, Listen while I ask it some questions. What's the only hot cereal Buzz Corey ever eats? The hot wheat cereal that helps to supercharge him. Instant roast and 
Right, Instant Ralston, the hot super cereal that helps to supercharge you. And when you want a hot cereal that's really delicious, what do you ask for? Instant Ralston. Right, Instant Ralston. And when the morning's cold and you want to warm up your motor... Instant Ralston. Yep, the robot mastermind is right on the beam. So remember, to get supercharged, eat a good breakfast with... Instant Ralston. Hey, the robot mastermind answered for me. Instant Ralston. I, I can't stop it. Instant Ralston. Instant Ralston. The robot mastermind has the right idea, so get it today. Instant Ralston. Instant Ralston. Instant Ralston. Instant Ralston. Instant Ralston. <laughs> And now for a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story. Buzz and Happy have been locked in a building by two criminals who have blocked their only means of escape by pouring sodium-potassium alloy on the stairs. The liquid metal has burst into flame on contact with the air. Commander, the heat is terrible. We're going to face something worse than heat when the automatic fire extinguishing system starts to work. But, sir, the, the water will put the fire out and we can escape. Not with this alloy, Happy. It burns in air, but when water hits it, it explodes. What? The second that spray starts working, this whole building will be blown to bits. Smoking rockets, unless we find a way out, that means we'll be blown to bits, too. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Lady from Venus, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! <laughs> now, gang, a word from Commander Buzz Corey. Can you answer this question? What group of boys and girls are doing all they can to get grown-ups to donate more blood? These boys and girls are helping their country and having fun, too. They're my Space Patrol blood boosters. And I'd like you to join them today, right now. And here's something else I'd like you to do, too. Tell your mom and pop to buy the Christmas seals that the National Tuberculosis Association mails out. Christmas seals help fight TB. Now just think, TB kills one person every 17 and a half minutes. So join the fight. Buy the beautiful Christmas seals of the National Tuberculosis Association. <laughs> Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmerer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Bela Kovach, Ken Mayer, and Norman Jolly. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol! And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Wheat checks, rice checks, and good hot Ralston presents Space Patrol. <laughs> High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, commander in chief of the Space Patrol. <laughs> In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy have been locked in a building by two criminals who have blocked their only means of escape by pouring sodium-potassium alloy on the stairs. The liquid metal has burst into flame on contact with the air. Commander, the heat's terrible. We're going to face something worse than heat when the automatic fire extinguishing system starts to work. But, sir, the water will put the fire out and we can escape. Not with this alloy, Happy. It burns in air, but when water hits it, it explodes. What? The second that spray starts working, this whole building will be blown to bits. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Lady from Venus. Space Patroller Dick Tufel gang speaking to you from an atomic power plant on Mars. They're having trouble getting power, but I think I've found the trouble. Now, listen to this main power generator. Sounds pretty weak, doesn't it? My guess is this. They've been using ordinary fuel. So let's see what happens when I put in this super fuel. Wow, listen to that power now. Supercharging, does it? And gang, when you roll out of bed in the morning, you're just like this generator. You need fuel because you haven't had any for about 12 hours. But listen, don't settle for ordinary fuel. Get supercharged like Buzz Corey does with a good breakfast. 
eat the super cereals in the checkerboard packages. Now, rice checks and wheat checks are the super cereals with that modern bite sized design for super easy eating. Rice checks is bite sized shredded rice, triple toasted. And wheat checks, wheat checks is bite sized shredded wheat, baked crisper than a cracker, super power in every bite. Now, remember, pulling up to the breakfast table is like pulling into a filling station. So get supercharged every morning. Pick up your cereal bowl and say, Fill out, Mom, wheat checks. Fill out, Mom. Rice checks. In Commander Corey's central office on Terra, a tall, middle-aged man anxiously paces the floor while Cadet Happy checks the Space Patrol search mission reports. There are some magazines on the table, Mr. Stratton. Hmm? Beg pardon? I said if you want to read, there are some magazines. Oh, no, no, thank you, Cadet. Is that clock correct? Yes, it is, Mr. Stratton. Are you sure? It's a uranium clock, sir. It gives the correct universal star time within a millionth of a second. Commander Corey did say 10.30, didn't he? Yes, sir. Huh, 10.40 now. Oh, here's the commander now. Well, sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Stratton. Oh, well, that's all right, Commander. The Secretary General and the staff have gone over your application and reports of the commission. Oh, yes? It's been approved. You can go ahead with that atomic power plant. Oh, splendid, splendid. These papers authorize you to obtain fissionable materials for your atomic breeder reactor. Mm, thank you. I suppose you're blasting off the Venus right away and get your plan into operation. Oh, I have a few matters to clear up first in my terror office. Goodbye, Commander. And, uh, Cadet, thank you for your courtesy. Well, that's all right, Mr. Stratton. Goodbye. Congratulations, Mr. Stratton. Oh? Uh, what can I do for you? Why, Mr. Stratton, you don't recognize me. Why, Miss Bennett, uh, forgive me, but uh, you look so different. Oh, don't tell me I've aged that much in five years. Oh, no, no, it's not that. It's a... I'm a blonde now instead of a brunette. Oh, yes, that's it, of course, your hair. And I dress more expensively than I did when I worked for you. I always thought you dressed very nicely, Miss Bennett. Why so formal, Edward? On Mars, you used to call me Elspeth, the lady from Venus. Uh, what are you doing now, Elspeth? Oh, that's better. Well, right now, I'm in the manufacturing business on my own. Well, we're competitors, eh? No, no, not entirely, Edward. In fact, I'm actually interested in becoming one of your customers. Oh, splendid. We parted on very unpleasant terms, as I recall. I'm glad you're willing to let bygones be bygones. Yes, and I was delighted to hear that the Secretary General gave you the go-ahead for your reactor on Venus. Why, I just came from Space Patrol headquarters myself. How did you know about it so soon? Oh, I know a lot of things about you, Edward. I was one of the people questioned by the Space Patrol security agents. Well, evidently, your replies were favorable. Thank you. How soon will your plant be in operation? Well, it'll take three weeks to get into active production. Good, then I can count on you for a shipment of plutonium in less than a month. <laughs> oh, I'm not joking, Edward. I'm ready to pay you a fair amount of credits for a small percentage of your plutonium output. Do you have a United Planets authorization to buy it? Oh, no. That's why I have to get it from you. But I can't sell it to you. I can sell you power, but not plutonium or other fissionable materials. It's illegal. Stratton, how long do you think you'd be permitted to operate that plant if I should go to the Space Patrol with certain evidence? Evidence of those shady deals on Mars five years ago? You know I had nothing to do with those. You engineered them behind my back. Yes, but the evidence I have still points to you, not to me. I've been keeping it, Edward, for just such an opportunity as this. You know I've got to account for every ounce of plutonium. Surely you can find some way to get around the regulations. You want to keep that plant, don't you? That's blackmail, Elspeth. Blackmail? When I'm paying you for the plutonium? Well, that's unfair. I never thought you'd stoop to anything like this. You'll send the plutonium to the Elbin Company on Mars. There's a fake company I've organized to receive certain illegal materials. So you're operating on Mars, no? No, no. I just want to be sure the plutonium's hard to trace. For your protection as well as mine, I'm still the lady from Venus. So I'll see you in a month. Remember, I'll be expecting my shipment in a month. Goodbye for now, Ed. You know what I'm going to do when we get to Lake Azure, Commander? What, Happy? I'm going to go for a swim, and then I'm going to the club and have a steak that thick. And oh, Wait a go... minute, Happy. There's one thing I forgot to tell you when we blasted off from Terra. What's that, sir? Officially, this is a pleasure trip. Unofficially, 
we're on official duty. Huh? I'm all confused. You remember the man Stratton who was in my office about a month ago, the fellow who was authorized to operate an atomic reactor plant on Venus? Oh, yes, sir. I remember Mr. Stratton. Uh, he ought to be producing by now. He's in some sort of trouble. We're going to Lake Azure and see if we can clear it up. What kind of trouble? Well, he's afraid to tell me by space or phone, so I arranged to visit him at his cottage in the north shore of the lake. Oh, then the swim and the stake are out. And until after we talk to Mr. Stratton, then we'll see about the swim and stakes. Because in the long run, I want to be sure that everybody thinks we're visiting Venus for pleasure. Just a minute. Oh, oh, Elspeth. Yes, Edward. I heard you were resting here at Lake Azure after getting your plant into operation, so I thought I'd pay you a visit. I... Well, aren't you going to ask us in? Mr. Stratton, this is my assistant, Ivan Almond. How do you do? Hello. Shake hands with him, Edward, or Ivan will think you don't like him. He's very sensitive. Yeah. <laughs> Shake, huh? <laughs> oh, easy, Ivan. Mr. Stratton will probably need his right hand to correct a little mistake he made. A mistake? Yes. One of our representatives inside your plan informed us that you shipped a crate to the Elvin Company on Mars yesterday. Well, that's right. I, I did. I, I followed your instructions. Yeah, except you didn't put plutonium in the crate. What a waste of time and money it would be for us to pick up that crate of worthless metal and haul it back to Venus. Oh, worthless metal? Yes. So I brought Ivan with me to persuade you to correct this oversight. You like me to work him over, Miss Bennett? Well, that's up to Mr. Stratton. Yes, I'll, I'll correct the oversight. Good. But the next time you make a mistake, Ivan will uh, work you over, as he calls it. And I'll turn my evidence over to the Space Patrol. It won't happen again. See that it doesn't. Come on, Ivan. All right, Miss Bennett. All right, Ivan. Let's get back to our water cruiser. Miss Bennett, look. There is another water cruiser pulling up to Stratton's wharf. Yes, men in uniform. Quick, get over behind those bushes before they see us. They look like space patrol men. Exactly what they are. Lucky we beached our cruiser down at the cove. What are they coming here for? We're going to find out. Get in the bushes. We can watch from here. Hadn't we better get to the cruiser and shove off? Wait, Ivan. The tall one's Commander Corey. Yeah. I heard at the hotel that he was due in today for a rest. That space patrol high breast has it pretty soft. If he's here for a rest, why would he come directly to see Stratton? It looks very suspicious to me. If he's double-crossed They us, are on the wharf now. Let's get going. No. Wait till they get in the house. Then we'll slip up and see if we can hear what's going on. Oh, Mr. Stratton, we didn't see anybody. And there was no boat at the wharf. Well, they must have come here in a surface car, then. They could have, all right, along the Lakeshore Road. Who were these people? Elspeth Bennett and a man named Ivan Armand. They're the reason I asked you to come here. They're trying to force me to sell them plutonium illegally. I see. One of their spies in my plant found out about a fake shipment I tried to trick them with, so they came here to threaten me. Threaten you? With violence, you mean? Yes. And... Well, Commander, I I'm going to tell you the whole story. It may mean that the government might take my license away, but I'll not be blackmailed into committing a crime. Blackmail? Well, how could they? Your record's clean. Uh, well, let me give you the facts. This uh, Elspeth Bennett worked for me five years ago on Mars. Without my knowledge, she put over several very dishonest deals. Here's exactly what she did. In order to make it look as though I were responsible, she faked a series of offers. Fool, he's blabbing the whole story. Maybe Corey will not believe him, well, huh? The Space Patrol will investigate us, and we can't afford that. At any rate, we can't get any plutonium from Stratton now. Let's get out of here before Corey comes yes. out. If Corey finds our plant, we're finished. Ivan, we've got to take care of Corey, the cadet, and Stratton. I can't handle all three of them. They are armed. I'll fix it so you can take the space patrolman by surprise. You wait in the bushes near the lake shore. I'll pretend to be in trouble. While they're rescuing me, you can jump out and overpower them. You know, Commander, somehow I think Mr. Stratton was telling the truth about being framed. Well, so do I, Happy. If he weren't thoroughly honest, he could have sold radioactive materials illegally. Yet he's willing to risk losing his plant. Help! Commander, listen. It's a woman. She's fallen into the lake. Come on, oh, Happy. Save me. I can't swim. We're coming, lady. 
Here, I'll, I'll jump in, sir. Oh, wait, Happy. She isn't far out. Grab the end of this stick. Uh, that's it. Uh, get a good grip. You're going to be all right. Just hang on. We'll pull you in. Oh, thanks, goodness. You're hurting me cold. I've got her, sir. Yeah, watch the edge of the bank, Happy. It's not very solid. That's, that's how I fell in. Here, I'll give you a hand, Happy. We'll have you out in just a second. Oh, I, I didn't realize the water was so deep, so close to the shore. There. There you are. Now, don't try to get up for a while. Just rest. And you rest too, Kobe! Hey, what's the big idea? <laughs> I got them both, Miss Bennett, just like you said. Well, there's no time for gloating, Ivan. Go into the house, get Stratton, and bring him out here. Well, maybe I'd better finish Cody and the cadet now. Hmm? Give Stratton a chance to get away? No. Somebody's going to find three bodies here by the lake. Corey, the cadet, and Stratton. And they'll find the evidence against Stratton in Corey's pocket. Yeah, but the evidence is fake. Well, of course it is, but no one will suspect it. It'll be obvious to everyone that Stratton did away with him to keep from being exposed. How are you going to explain Stratton? Why, Corey wounded him in the fight. Now, get Stratton. Uh, suppose the cadet come to while I'm gone. Either one of them moves, this heavy stick will take care of them. We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a moment. Say, gang, what do you need for a good, good morning and a good, good start? A nourishing breakfast with rice checks or wheat checks. That's what. The super cereals that helped us supercharge you. Uh-oh, here's a chance to show you exactly what I mean. Some of the fellows here in the neighborhood are having a race. They're running right in this direction, and way out in front is Jim Bridwell, a boy that makes it a rule to eat a good breakfast with the super cereals. Listen, here they come. And let me tell you, Jim is going to win because he's supercharged. I won! There, Jim did win, which just goes to show you that to be a winner, you have to eat a winner's breakfast. So latch on quick, gang, to rice checks and wheat checks, the super cereals that helped us supercharge you. Hi, Space Patrol. Hi, Jim. Nice job of running you did there. Supercharged, that's me. That's what I was telling the gang, that you eat the super cereals. I sure do. Rice checks and wheat checks. You just can't find another cereal like them. Right you are, because they're the only modern bite-sized cereal anywhere. And talk about delicious. Mmm, boy. Get them today, Space Patrollers. Rice checks. Wheat checks. Edward Stratton, operator of an atomic reactor plant on Venus, is being blackmailed by a former employee, Elspeth Bennett, into selling plutonium illegally. Buzz and Happy went to Lake Azure on Venus to get Stratton's report and were knocked unconscious by Elspeth's assistant, the burly Ivan Amon. Now, while Ivan goes to bring Stratton out of his lakeside cottage... Buzz and Happy regain consciousness to find Elspeth standing over them with a heavy club. Don't get any ideas about rushing me. I've got you covered. Commander, look. She's holding the same stick we used to pull her out of the water. If you think I won't use it, just make a move to get up. Oh, Cadet, what are you looking so pop-eyed about? Look, right over your head. There's a snake hanging from that tree limb. Oh, now, really? Don't try any childish tricks on me. He's right, Miss Bennett. It's a poisonous snake. Oh, who do you think you're fooling? We're not fooling. You'd better move, Miss Bennett. And you'd better not, Commander. It's ready to strike. And so am I. L- look out, Commander. I <laughs> warned you, Commander. <laughs> Let go of that stick. I was hoping Let you'd go. swing at me. Now give me that towel. I don't want to hurt you. There. You were... If you hadn't ducked, I'd have fixed you good. Yeah, and if the Commander hadn't yanked you forward, something would have fixed you for good. Look what's on that branch. It is a snake. Oh. I've got her hat. Oh, one minute she's swinging a club at us, and the next she faints dead away. Mm, women are sure temperamental. At least this one is. You know, Commander, if that snake had bitten Miss Bennett, I'm afraid it would have been one sick snake. Yeah, this is yeah. no time for jokes, Happy. We've got to save Stratton. Come on. I hope we're in time. Commander. Stratton, are you all right? Yes, I, I'm all right. Where's Ivan? Oh, he saw you coming, hit me, and then ran out the back door. Stratton, Miss Bennett is out by the lake. Watch her till we get back. Come on, Happy, let's see if we can pick up Ivan's trail. Wait, Ivan. Miss Ben, I thought they captured you. I saw Cory and the cadet run toward the cottage. No. Corey struck me and thought I was unconscious. Ivan, did you finish Stratton? No. I didn't have a chance. Corey and the cadet arrived too soon. 
Miss Bennett, we'd better get in the boat and shove off. Corey may have trailed me through the brush. All right, let's get across the lake to our spaceship. Help me into the boat. This brush sure is thick. Yes. Some of these small branches are broken. Ivan's heading for the lake. Do you think he'll try to swim it, sir? He might. He might have had a boat beached along here. Commander, look at these footprints. They lead right out to the water. There's two sets, a man's and a woman's. Uh, Miss Bennett must have come out of her faint. Hey, look out there, halfway across the lake. A water cruiser with two people in it. They're going at full speed. By the time we got to our boat at the wharf, well, they'd be out of sight. Get back to Stratton's cottage and space a phone and alarm. I'm sorry that Bennett woman got away. When I got to the lake shore, she was gone. Don't worry, Mr. Stratton. The commander's alerting the lake patrol. She won't get very far. I don't think she was planning to destroy us all in cold blood. Elspeth's always been a determined woman. But I had no idea she was so utterly ruthless. I just talked to the manager of the Lake Azure Hotel. Neither Ivan nor Miss Bennett were registered there. But the manager recognized their descriptions. They've been hanging around there the last couple of days. They must have been picking up information. I've alerted the lake patrol in Venus City headquarters. Mr. Stratton, do you have any idea where Miss Bennett's factory is? No, other than she hinted it somewhere here on Venus. So what's the name of it? I don't even know that. I was supposed to ship the plutonium to the Elbin Company on Mars. It's a fake outfit she uses just to acquire illegal materials. The Elbin Company. Chances are she must do quite a bit of business under that name. I'll have Space Patrol units contact all spaceports and shipping centers to see if there's any freight on hand for the Elbin Company. Mr. Stratton, you'd better come with us to Venus City. Until we capture Elspeth Bennett and Ivan, your life is in danger. Miss Bennett, the plants are in the other direction. You are way off, Vector. We're not going to the plant right now. We're going to Venus City to pick up some freight. What for? There's an electromagnetic pump waiting to be picked up, and it's got the Elbin Company name on it. Sooner or later, Corey's going to trace us through the Elbin Company. But, Miss Bennett, we can't get a magnetic pump in this ship. It's too small. We'll hire a surface truck from the warehouse and drive to the plant. There's another ship there. We'll pick up some documents I need and then blast off for Jupiter. Corey will never find us. We're about two minutes out of Venus City, sir. Shall I contact Space Control? I'll handle it, Hat. Space Patrol Headquarters, Venus City, calling Commander Corey. Corey here, go ahead. Uh, Commander, we've already got a development on that Elbin Company checkup. Good, let's have it. Warehouse number three has had a large piece of machinery on hand assigned to the Elbin Company. An electromagnetic pump was picked up just a few minutes ago. Does anybody at the warehouse know where the Elbin Company is located? Uh, not exactly, but from other dealings, they think it's southeast of Venus City, out toward the Topaz River. A man and a woman rented a big Atomo surface truck from the warehouse. Get the Atomo truck registration number. Alert all highway patrol units to watch for it. And not to stop it, just report its location and direction. Yes, Commander. Corey, out. Well, we won't land at Venus City, Happy. We'll cruise around till we get a report on that truck. I've got the Atomo truck in the viewscope, sir. It's the only vehicle on the highway for miles. Yeah, that must be it, then. Check that chart of the Topaz River region. Yes, sir. What manufacturing concerns are marked there? Well, there's only one, sir, but it doesn't say what it is. Well, when the truck arrives, we'll be there. You know, Miss Bennett, I've got to admit I didn't think much of this plan at first. But we sure got Corey off of our trail now. With that electromagnetic pump out of the warehouse, there's nothing on Venus to give him a hint where our plant is. Uh, what about the spaceship we left at the freight yard? And the false registration will throw Corey even further off the trail. Do you want to go to the administration building first and get those papers? No, stop here, by the reactor equipment building. What for? Just stop the truck. I'm going to leave orders for my men to get rid of all equipment which might connect this plant with illegal radioactivity work. We'll go in here and take a quick inventory. Well, I can tell you what is in there. A container of sodium potassium coolant, heat exchanger, a receiving... Yes, test. yes, I know, but I don't want any slip-ups. Come on, get out. Well, it's going to be a job to dispose of all that, and a real shame to destroy it. It'll just be hidden. A few months from now, I'll set up a plant on another planet. Nobody's going to stop the lady from Venus. I can promise you that. Now, come on. All right, Miss Bennett. Ivan, stay where you are. Corey! Quick, into the building. Stop! Quick, open the door. 
Up the stairs. We can cross to the next building with a catwalk. There they go, sir. Up the stairs. Come on, let's get them. Ivan, open the door of the catwalk. It's dark. We're coming up the steps. Stop. You're cornered. Better come down. Ivan, those thick containers. Roll them down the stairs. Okay. Uh, better get off the stairs. Who oh, watches, Commander? Duck Captain. <laughs> Shall I roll this one now? Ivan, wait. Don't roll it. Open the valve and let it pour down the stairs. Huh? Tip it over and point the valve toward them. Hurry! Commander, what do you suppose she's up to? I don't know. Corey, this drum contains sodium potassium coolant. It's used in atomic breeder reactors to carry off heat from the reactor core. When it's exposed to air, it'll burst into flames. Turn the valve, Ivan. There it goes. Stand back, Happy. No! Stairs. Commander, the heat, it's awful. All right, Ivan, get that door open. Yes, Miss Bennett. Happy, we can't get up through that flaming liquid, and they can't get down. We'll go outside. I'm sorry, Commander, you won't be leaving. She's closed the door. The electronic control switch is up here. Oh, uh, it's no use, Cadet. You can't open that door. I got this one open, Miss Bennett. We're leaving you now, Commander. Oh, by the way, there's an automatic fire extinguishing system in here. In a minute or two, water will be sprayed all over that sodium-potassium alloy. And that's your life. Come on, Ivan, we haven't got much time. Hey, did you hear that, Commander? The sprinkling system will, will, will put the fire out. And if it works if quickly... the sprinkling system starts, we're finished. Huh? This coolant has to be kept in a closed airtight system. It burns in there, but when water hits it, it explodes violently. All these containers will blow up. But, Commander, we've got to get out of here. Now look, there's an electronic hoist. The chain runs up to that pulley, fastens the beam. That hoist will lift us high enough. We can swing over to the balcony and get out the way they did. Grab the hook. I'll throw the switch. Yes, sir. Get a good grip. I'll hold the chain and kick the switch with my foot. Hey, it's working, sir. We're going out. Start swinging. When we're level with the balcony, jump. Yes, sir. Hey, the sprinkling system. It started to work. Let's hope the water doesn't hit that coolant until we get out of here. Jump, Happy. <clears throat> Quickly, out the door across the catwalk. There it goes. Three whole buildings blown to bits. Yes, and Commander Corey along with them. Now, come on, let's get to the ship. Let's use my ship. It's close. Corey! Hold it, Ivan. Corey, you couldn't have escaped. Uh, but we did, which is something that's never going to happen to a certain lady from Venus. Yes, sir, Commander. When she teamed up with Ivan Amon, it sure was an evil omen. <laughs> <laughs> We'll be back with an action preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story in just a moment. Jump and Jupiter, gang. Here's a five-star bulletin from Buzz Corey. It's coming over the teletype here in the newsroom of Terra's biggest newspaper, the Outer Space Dispatch. Here, I'll read it to you hot off the news tape. It says, Gang, don't take a chance those cold winter mornings. Get a start for the day that keeps you moving. Eat a breakfast that whips you into action. A good breakfast with good hot Ralston, the hot super cereal that helps to supercharge you. That's instant Ralston, the delicious wheat cereal. Remember, I can't take a chance. I have to get supercharged every day. That's why I eat a good breakfast with instant Ralston, a breakfast that supercharges me. You can't take a chance either, boys and girls. So my advice to you is this. Get supercharged every day. That's it, gang. That's Buzz Corey's message to you. So do what your commander says. Eat a good breakfast with good hot Ralston and get supercharged. And now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story. Buzz and Happy are in the lower shaft of a secret mine on Saturn's sixth moon. As they wade through the water of the partly flooded shaft, the sound filters down through the mine. Happy, listen. Yeah, sounds like a motor of some kind. It must be back outside the opening. The mine's pump engine. Pump? Oh, automatic, I guess. Yeah. When the water reaches a certain level, it cuts on. Hey, wait a minute. Look at the water level against the wall of the shaft. Watch it. It looks like it's rising. Oh, that pipe. It isn't drawing water out, it's forcing it in. 
Pappy, somebody at the mine opening reversed the pumps. They're trying to drown us. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Last Voyage of Lonesome Lena, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again brings you Space Patrol! And now, a message from Commander Buzz Corey. Boys and girls, to donate blood, you have to be at least 18 years of age. But to be a Space Patrol blood booster, well, age doesn't matter. I need all of you, and all of you can join. Our job is to get more people to donate blood to the Red Cross. It's a swell way to help your country, and we have a lot of fun doing it. So how about it? How about joining my Space Patrol blood boosters today? Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Baylor Kovach, Ken Mayer, Virginia Hewitt, and David Duval. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol! And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston present Space Patrol! Transcribed high adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! Buzz and Happy are in the lower shaft of a secret mine on Saturn's sixth moon. As they wade through the water of the partly flooded shaft, a strange sound filters down through the mine. Happy, listen. Sounds like a motor of some kind. The mine's automatic pump. When the water reaches a certain level, it cuts on and draws off the water. But, Commander, look at the water level against the wall of the shaft. It's rising. You're right, Happy. That pipe isn't drawing water out. It's forcing it in. Someone reversed the pump. They're trying to drown us. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Last Voyage of the Lonesome Lena. <laughs> Presenting the story of a young boy who didn't like any of the cereals his mom brought home. First, he'd say... I can't eat that stuff, Mom. Sometimes he'd say... Oh, gee, no flavor. And then again... Don't like it, Mom. I just don't like it. So she tried cereals in white packages, yellow packages, blue packages. But no luck. No flavor. Then one day she brought home a pair of cereals in red and white checkerboard packages. Wow, that's good. Oh, boy. Hmm. That's what he said when he tasted one of them. Jumping Jupiter. Great day in the morning. This is it. That's what he said when he tasted the other. The cereals? Rice checks and wheat checks, gang. Man, oh, man, they're my cereals. Buzz Corey cereals, too. The bite-sized super cereals that help to supercharge you. Best tasting cereals in the universe. And the only official ready-to-eat cereals of the Space Patrol. Fill her up, Mom. Rice checks. That's what our friend says now. Fill her up, Mom. Wheat checks. So, gang, if you want a cereal that's right on the beam for flavor, get the cereals in the red and white checkerboard packages. Rice checks. Wheat checks. Saturn's number six moon, Titan, has become increasingly important to the commerce of the outer planets. However, rumors of illegal activity on Titan have caused Commander Corey to send Tonga, his assistant security chief, to the Saturn satellite to investigate. Now, Buzz and Happy, aboard Space Patrol battlecruiser Terra-5, headed for Titan, are talking to Tonga by spaceophone. As she reports from the satellite's chief settlement, Titan Center. So you find that the chief black market items are processed foods and medical supplies, huh? That's right, Commander. What about those reports we received in the uranium mine? Was there anything to the sabotage rumors? Well, there was no actual sabotage, but about two weeks ago, a couple of men did try to get inside the guarded area. Were they captured? No, they got away. But there haven't been any recent incidents. 
Have you found out who's behind this black market food situation? No, but there's a lot of talk about a Captain Kruger. Captain Gustav Kruger? Yes, he's the one. He's quite a legend in this part of the solar system. I think I've heard of him, Commander. Isn't he that old-time space pilot who has the broken-down cargo ship? Yes, Happy. Lonesome Lena, he calls it. He's been shuttling back and forth between Saturn's moons for years. I've never heard of him being mixed up in anything dishonest. Who gave you this information? A man named Sherwin McCurdy, for one. He's behind a lot of this new development in Titan. Kruger has given McCurdy some trouble, but uh, I don't think McCurdy takes the old gentleman too seriously. Have you met Kruger? No, not yet. He just got back from Saturn. He's a Titan sent to spaceport repairing his ship. We'll have a talk with him when we land. Meet us at the spaceport and we'll go over together. Yes, sir. Corey out. Well, stand by for landing, Happy. Standing by, sir. Kill rockets. Rockets out. Hit repeller ray. Repeller ray on, sir. Now, let's button up the ship, and then we'll have a chat with Captain Kruger. So that's the lonesome Lena. Boy, that ship must be a hundred years old. Well, not quite happy, but it has seen a lot of service. It's so patched up. And look how it's pitted with meteor hits. Mm, Only a real space pilot could keep it in operation. Is that Kruger coming down the ladder? Yes. Captain Kruger! Oh, Captain Kruger! He looked right at us and then turned away. I told you he was independent. Let's get over there. He's checking the hatch. Well, how's the ship, Captain? Mm. Good for another 50 billion GUs. With you handling it anyway. Remember me, Commander Corey? Yeah, I recognized you. This is my cadet, Happy. Very glad to know you, Captain. Ah. Have some callium seeds, cadet? Some what? Callium seeds. <laughs> Great unraveled orbits, Commander. Don't tell me this new crop of space cadets doesn't know what callium seeds are. Never heard of them, Captain. <laughs> Your education sure has been neglected. Well, they grow on Venus, Happy. They used to be very popular on space flights. Yeah, you never get space sickness if you chew callium seeds. Not only that, but they keep you from blacking out at high acceleration. Oh. And out in space, you never mind the absence of gravity as long as you chew callium seeds. As you can see, Happy, Captain Kruger is a pilot of the old school. He's the only pilot I know who still chews raw callium seeds. Yeah. People nowadays won't touch them. Just because they stain your hands purple when you crack them. Huh. Well, Commander, you didn't come over here for a lecture on callium seeds. What's on your mind? Oh, just a few questions about business. Ah, I see. I suppose you've heard rumors that I'm hijacking food and selling it on the black market. Is that it? There are a lot of rumors in Titan these days, Captain. Yeah. And a lot of upstarts. They come in here with shiny new ships and big ideas. They act like I don't belong. I'm getting shoved around, Commander. But I'm not going to take it. I never have. I'm not going to now. Well, now, if you'll excuse me, I got some repairs to make. Lonesome Lena's in pretty bad shape. All right, Captain. Come on, Happy. Let's find Tonga. You can tell them for me that if Sherwin McCurdy promised delivery, they'll get it. We're a little short of spaceships here on Titan right now. Hey, look, stall them off. Promise them anything. I'll call you back later. Come in. McCurdy, I want to work with you. Well, Captain Kruger, glad to see you. Put your hand back in your pocket, McCurdy. Why, what's the matter, Captain? You seem angry. Why wouldn't I be? For ten years, I've been setting the old lonesome Lena down on Titan any place I wanted, or on any moon in the Saturn system. Folks were mighty glad to see me whenever I rocketed in, until your crowd got here. My Proud, Captain? One of your hired flunkies just told me I can't sit down on the Titan Center spaceport anymore. Oh, what kind of high-handed nonsense is that? It isn't nonsense, Captain. You can't put the Lonesome Lena down on this port. Well, that old bucket of bolts you call the Lonesome Lena is a menace. If I had my way, I'd report you to the Space Patrol. They'd melt up that old hulk. Oh, you would. You'd melt up a ship that has helped keep people alive for the last 40 years out here on these moons. Ship's out of date. It's served its purpose. Now it's finished. Who are you to decide whether the lonesome leaner's finished? Why, one patch on that old battered hull is worth 10,000 of you. Melt her up, would you? I warn you, McCurdy, if you ever say that again, I'll slap you. Take space. your hands off me. Take your All right, hands Captain, off that's me. enough. Uh, 
Commander Corey, this man attacked me. You got here just in time. What's the trouble here? I was merely pointing out that his spaceship violates Space Patrol safety regulations. That's a bald-faced lie, McCurdy. The Lonesome Lena's safe as any ship in the space lane. Does it have repeller ray equipment? Well, no. Does but... it have infrared view scope equipment? I don't need it. I can land it blindfolded on any spaceport in the solar system. Does it have Class A radiation shielding on the space drive? Ah, her shielding's good enough. I ought to know I built it. I see, Commander. Obviously, he can't be permitted to land here at Titan Center. Those are regulations. Commander, I've always respected you. Are you going to side in with this planet lubber? I'm sorry, Captain Kruger, but I don't make the regulations. My job is to enforce them. There are thousands of people here in Titan Center. Their safety comes first. They're safer with Lonesome Lena than with half the amateur pilots in these new ships, and you know it. Captain, if we made an exception in your case, we'd have to do it for everyone. However, we won't be concerned if you have these safety devices installed. But that takes money, Commander. I haven't got it. I'll never be able to get it if I can't land here to load and unload freight. Well, perhaps you can work out some arrangements to land outside a ten-mile radius of Titan Center. Ten miles? Uh, might as well be ten DUs out in space. I'm sorry, Captain Kruger. There's nothing I can do. Uh, you win, McCurdy. Have some callium seeds. I won't be needing them anymore. Well... Captain is very dramatic, isn't he? I don't find it amusing, Mr. McCurdy. That old ship of his means more than his livelihood. It's his life. Well, Commander, I wouldn't let my sympathies blind me to Captain Kruger's uh, sharp practices. What do you mean? Kruger's lived by his wits. He's been a lone wolf. Now he's up against the rules of society, and instead of abiding by the rules, he takes the attitude that everyone's against him. Watch him, Commander. I confess I'm rather afraid of what he might do. I'm here in Titan to prevent trouble, Mr. McCurdy. That's why I came to see you. I'd like to talk to you about conditions here. Of course. Sit down. All right, now, I just want to make an appointment. I have a few matters to talk over first with my assistant security chief, Tonga, back at our temporary headquarters. I see. How about later today? That'll be fine, Commander. I'll look forward to it. So the captain is really sore, huh? Yeah. In a way, I can't blame him. Oh, Tonga, did you tell the commander about the uranium mine? Uranium mine? Yes, the big one, halfway around Titan. Someone is planning to tap the mine, dig into it from a natural cavern on the other side of the mountain so they can steal the ore or sabotage the mine. Who's behind this? I don't know. But I do know that some mining equipment has been hidden in the cavern. And I know the location. They are being very careful. The crust tunnel is being worked only when the cavern is on the night side of Titan. It's daylight there now. I think Happy and I ought to take a look at it. Do you want me to go too, Commander? No, you stay here in Titan Center. Call Sherwin McCurdy. Tell him I won't be able to keep that appointment. May not be back in time. There's the mouth of the cavern, sir. Uh-huh. There's been plenty of activity around here, too, by the looks of the ground. Yeah, there's a pipe leading from the cavern. A drainage pipe. Machinery right inside the cave. Looks like a pump. A pump? Apparently they have to keep pumping water out of the shaft inside the cavern. Get your atomic light hat. We'll have a look inside. Don't bump your head when you go through this opening, Happy. I wonder how close we are to the regular mine. It's hard to tell. Hey, we're in water over our ankles. Uh -huh. oh, the shaft can't go much farther. We must be halfway into the mountain by now. The water's getting deeper, sir. It's nearly up to my waist. Yeah. Listen. Sounds like a motor of some kind. Must be back outside the cabin. The automatic pump engine. When the water reaches a certain level, it cuts on and draws off the water. But, Commander, look at the water level against the wall of the shaft. It looks like it's rising. You're right, Hap. That pipe isn't drawing water out, it's forcing it in. Someone reversed the pumps. They know we're down here and they're trying to drown us. We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a minute. They call him Whizzer, and there's not another boy in the neighborhood who can play basketball half as well. <laughs> What's your secret, Whizzer? No secret. I just get supercharged every morning. You mean you have a good breakfast with a checkerboard super cereal? You bet. Rice chicks, wheat chicks, or instant Ralston. That's how Buzz Corey gets supercharged. That's how I get supercharged. Say, how about those checks? They're plenty delicious, right? I'll say. 
And they're bite-sized. And they're the only cereals in the universe that have that modern bite-sized design. And there's only one cereal in the universe like Instant Ralston. I love it. That's the hot super cereal. Helps you to think fast, act fast. And play basketball fast. You said it. Instant Ralston is a cereal for winners and whizzers. That's what you are, a winner. How about you, gang? Wouldn't you like to be whizzer? Get supercharged. Eat a good breakfast with a checkerboard super cereal. Don't wait. Get them today. Rice checks, wheat checks, good hot Ralston. <laughs> Buzz and Happy have entered a cavern on Titan, sixth moon of the planet Saturn, to investigate a hidden shaft that they believe leads to a uranium mine. After crawling through a narrow opening far under the ground, they suddenly noticed that the water in the bottom of the shaft seemed to be rising. Then they heard the sound of the pump echoing down from the cavern opening and realized that water was being deliberately pumped into the mine shaft to drown them. With the water up to their chests, they flashed their atomolites around them, searching for a way to escape. Hey, wait, half. Listen. I don't hear the pump anymore. Maybe it's been shut off. No. The water's still gushing in from that pipe. We don't hear the pump because the water is over the narrow opening. Well, then how are we going to get through? We'll dive under long enough to get to a place where the water doesn't fill the shaft. All set, Happy? Yes, sir. Dive deep. Come on, Happy. Let's get out of this place. I'll shut it off. Well, there's no sign of a ship around here, sir, except ours. Whoever did this has certainly finished us off. I'd sure like to find out who it was. Happy. Look there on the ground. See what's scattered around the pump? Callium seeds. Right. Well, I guess we know who turned the pump on, sir. I've known Captain Kruger a long time. I can't imagine him doing a thing like this. Shall I pick up some of these seeds, sir, for evidence? Yes. Then let's get back to Titan Center. I don't understand it, Commander. I don't see how Kruger or anyone else knew that I told you about the secret mine. Well, he could have seen our ship headed that way and followed us and Lonesome Lena. Well, if he did, he must be working with a gang. While you were gone, something happened here. Oh? Some antibiotics were stolen. Several thousand credits worth. The worst part of it is they're urgently needed at a hospital on Saturn. There's an epidemic of Zeta virus in Saturn City. Well, can't they send medicine in from some other planet? Well, this particular antibiotic is made here on Titan. There is some on the other planets, but there isn't enough time to get it. And if a supply of the medicine isn't taken to Saturn very soon, the doctors say a lot of cases will prove fatal. Yeah, there must be some more of that medicine here on Titan. Maybe McCurdy can help us out. I've already talked to McCurdy. He said he's contacted every possible source. The thieves stole every bit of it and will now hold out for a fancy prize. Well, they won't have to hold out long. Commander, do you think Kruger's mixed up in this, too? We're going to find out, Happy. Let's find the lonesome Lena. Corey! Captain Kruger! I won't be persecuted. Not by the Space Patrol or anybody else. I'm getting a raw deal. And if you're as fair-minded as I think you are, you'll agree with me. Is the raw deal you're getting as bad as being nearly drowned in a flooded mine? Huh? What are you talking about? Show him the evidence, Happy. Yes, sir. Recognize these, Captain? Well, of course, they're callium seeds. We found them by the pump, Kruger. Pump? What pump? In the opening of the secret shaft near the uranium mine. I'm not interested in any uranium mines. I want justice. Commander... Look what that McCurdy has done to me now. You see this paper? It's a doctor's order telling me I can't make any more commercial space flights. McCurdy has been trying to get the official doctors on me for months. We finally succeeded. They gave me a checkup, and I'm grounded. Let me see that. For six hours, they gave me tests. Heart, blood pressure, metabolism, the works. This is Dr. Greer's signature, all right? Yeah. Just read what he says. Captain Kruger's condition makes any further space flights extremely dangerous. As a space physician, I deem it inadvisable for Captain Kruger to be permitted to operate any commercial spacecraft for reasons of his own safety and the safety of others. 
Signed, Dr. Melvin Greer. What am I going to do now, Commander? I'll starve to death. I'd rather go quick, blasting off on a spaceship. Now, just a minute, Captain. This physical examination must have taken several hours. I just told you it did. Then you couldn't have been at the mine. Mine? I haven't been near any mine. I haven't been anywhere but in a doctor's office getting needles stuck in me. And that isn't all. While the doc was working on me, there was a gang of inspectors checking over Lonesome Lena. Official Space Patrol inspectors? Yeah. That's another thing McCurdy's been trying to arrange for months. I admit I've been dodging inspection because I knew what they'd say. Me and Lonesome Lena were both out of commission. I'm sorry about that, Captain Kruger. Yeah, you're sorry. But you can be thankful for one thing. This examination clears you of suspicion. Someone has been trying very hard to implicate you in a serious crime. Well, that's not news to me, Commander. I have an idea who it might be. You mean McCurdy, sir? Uh, now, wait a minute. I know McCurdy has it in for me, but I'd say this for him. He tried to get Dr. Greer to postpone the physical examination. Oh, he did. After trying for months to bring it about. Yeah, but it didn't do any good. The doc said I was too slippery an old cuss to take chances with. So I was stuck. Happy. Tonga, we're going to find McCurdy. Captain, you stay around close in case I need you. Uh, don't worry, Commander. I won't be going anywhere. There he is, sir. Uh, heading for that atmosphere ship. He certainly seems in a hurry. Tonga, wait here. Come on, Happy. Curdy, wait a minute. He's running for the ship, sir. Well, Curdy, hold it. I want to talk to you. What is it, Commander? I've got a few questions I'd like to ask. Of course. We've just come from your office. From the looks of things, you left in a hurry. In fact, it looks as though you didn't intend to come back. Should that concern the Space Patrol, Commander? Possibly. Where were you going? I happen to have business at Torquemont on the other side of Titan. Now, if you'll excuse me... Not until you explain that purple stain on your hand. What? That purple stain on your hands. Could it be from callium seeds? Callium seeds? Why, what would I be doing with callium seeds? Scattering them around a pump, maybe? That package you're holding, what's in it? This has gone far enough. Stand back and get your hands up. You ought to be quicker than that, McCurdy. Oh. Oh. Let go of that ray gun. That's it. Now, don't try anything like that again. Commander, this package he's got. Look at the label. Acro Laboratories, Titan Center, antibiotics. This must be the medicine that was to go to Saturn. Take it back to Tonga. We'll blast off for Saturn right away. You won't get off Titan in your ship, Corey. Why not? I put your controls out of commission so you couldn't follow me. And there isn't any other ship on the satellite except my atmosphere ship. And that won't take you there. I'm afraid he's right, Commander. You'll have to space a phone to Saturn for a ship to come and get us. Oh, but that will take hours. And the situation on Saturn is critical. Commander! Oh, yes, Captain. Well, I see you got McCurdy. Yes, and the medicine. Yeah, but McCurdy's wrecked our ship. There's no way to get off of Titan. Well, how about the lonesome Lena? Uh, but Lena's grounded. Ah, just a lot of official space jabber. She'll still fly. And by Jupiter, I'm taking you all to Saturn. You'd better let me take your ship, Captain, after what the doctor said. Uh, Commander, I know you're the best pilot in the solar system, but uh, Lena's sort of, well, temperamental. She's got a lot of quirks and things. If she isn't handled just right, well, uh, she just might go all to pieces. Are you sure you're willing to risk a blast off in Lena after what the doctor said? Commander, I'm safer in Lonesome Lena than anywhere in the universe. And let's go. Come on, McCurdy. We're taking you with us. Not in that pile of junk. It isn't safe. Get going. The ship's condemned. You have no right to endanger my life. Why, you low-frequency crook. As though your life was worth a allium seed. Let's go. Bring the medicine, Happy. All right, everybody. Sit tight. We're going to blast off. Look at those controls. Why, well, they're just patched together. Keep quiet, McCurdy. All right, Captain, when you're ready. Uh, wait, wait just a minute. i got a few more adjustments to make here. Like I said, Lena's temperamental. You sort of got a sense what to do. Oh, I admit I've never seen a control set up like this. Ah. Are you ready, everybody? Yes. All set. Let her go. And here we go. Excellent blast off, Captain. Yeah, just like I said. I... Captain, what's wrong? My, my heart. I'm going to get the first aid kit if there is one. He's passed out. 
Now, what are we going to do? Happy. Yes, Commander? Help me lift the captain out of the pilot's seat. Yes, sir. There. Happy, you and Tonga see what you can do to make him comfortable. I'll take the lonesome Lena into Saturn. How you doing, Commander? All right, so far, Happy. We're two minutes out of Saturn City Spaceport. How's the captain? He seems to be coming out of it, sir. Tonga's trying to make him lie down back aft. He had me worried for a while. I hope he can take the landing. It'll be just as bad as the blast off with this antiquated equipment. Have you space phone the hospital, sir? Yes. The chief physician says that if we get the medicine there in half an hour, we'll be in time. Oh, we can do that easy. Yes, I can land this hulk without crashing. Stand by for landing. Commander! Captain Kruger! I just couldn't make him stay in the bunk, Commander. Oh, I'm sorry I conked out on you, but well, I see you got everything under control. Uh... You think you can handle the landing, Commander, or do you want me to... I'd better take her in, Captain, in case you... Oh, sure, sure. But if I just might make a suggestion... But that's it, that's it! Thunder and Comets, Commander, you sure know how to handle Lonesome Lena. Here we go, brace yourselves. That's it! That's it! You got it! You got it! We made it. Captain, are you all right? Oh, just fine. That was a great landing, Commander. I couldn't have done better myself. Say, you took that pretty well. Oh, I found some calium seeds back there. <laughs> Nothing like them for space flying. You have some, Cadet? This time you've got a customer, Captain. I... I don't feel so well. <laughs> this is Commander Corey. And Marvin Miller. Reminding you that pulling up to your breakfast table... Is like pulling up to a filling station. Give him our example, Marvin. A jet cycle has just pulled into a filling station to get its tank filled. The man has it filled with ordinary fuel. Listen. Not much go in that jet cycle, is there? Now listen to the same jet cycle filled with super fuel. <laughs> that cycle's flying like a rocket now because it's supercharged with super fuel. Same thing is true for you, gang. To get going in the morning, you need super fuel, too. So get supercharged the way space patrollers do. Eat a good breakfast with Instant Ralston, the hot super cereal. Instant Ralston helps you to think fast. And act fast. So remember, when you pull up to your breakfast table, it's just like pulling up to a filling station. You're there for fuel. Super fuel. So you can get supercharged. Now take a tip. Eat a good breakfast with Instant Ralston and get supercharged. Get it today in the red and white checkerboard package. Good hot Ralston. And now for a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story. Buzz and Happy have gone to the offices of John Crozer to rescue a noted scientist abducted by Crozer. I know Professor Hegman is somewhere in this building, Crozer. Take us to him. Why, Commander, you're mistaken. Oh, no, we're not. Don't sit there under that sun lamp. Take me to Hegman. Well, all right, Corey. If you insist. Hey, my eyes. Turn that lamp off. Get him, Happy. I can't see. Uh, here's yours, cadet. Now, Corey, I'm going to finish you off permanently. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Brain Bank and the Space Binocular, when wheat checks, rice checks, and good hot Ralston again bring you... Space Patrol! And now, gang, here's a word from Cadet Happy. Boys and girls, this is Cadet Happy. Do you know how life-giving oxygen is carried to the cells of the body? By the bloodstream. So when a person loses a great deal of blood in an accident or in sickness, there's not enough blood left to do that job. Result? The person dies. So will you help me save lives by joining the Space Patrol Blood Boosters? It's fun. It's patriotic. So join the Space Patrol Blood Boosters today. Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production, starring Ed Kemmer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. 
Other players were Marvin Miller, Nina Barra, and Norman Jolly. <laughs> Don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol! <laughs> Be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story on your local ABC television station. Consult your local newspaper for time and channel. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston present Space Patrol! <laughs> High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol. In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy have gone to the offices of John Crozer to rescue a noted scientist abducted by Crozer. I know Professor Hegman is somewhere in this building, Crozer. Take us to him. Why, Commander, you're mistaken. Oh, no, we're not. Don't sit there under that sun lamp. Take me to Hegman. Well, all right, Corey, if you insist. <laughs> My eyes, turn off that lamp. Get him, Happy. I, I can't see. Oh. <laughs> yours, Cadet. I... Now, Corey, I'm going to finish you off permanently. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Brain Bank and the Space Binoculars. Wow! Man, oh man, oh man! Yummy! Ah, that boy sounds excited, doesn't he? Well, no wonder. He's just had his first taste of Rice Chex, the delicious bite-sized super cereal. Wow! Man, oh man, oh man! Yummy! Same boy, yep, and the same cereal, only it's his second bowl. Try Rice Checks yourself, gang. You'll love it. I'll say. And when you eat a good breakfast with Rice Checks, you're supercharged. Absolutely. So, gang, try it today. Delicious Rice Checks. And, hey, today's the day for the biggest news ever announced on Space Patrol. So stand by, and I mean with pencil and paper, for the most sensational message you ever heard on Space Patrol. <laughs> Not far from Space Patrol headquarters on the man-made planet Terra is the Crozer Building. From his spacious offices on the top floor, John Crozer directs his far-reaching enterprises. It is Crozer's proud boast that his payroll list is virtually a scientific hall of fame, an interplanetary who's who of distinguished men and women in every field of science and technology. His rugged features and penetrating eyes are reflected on the polished surface of his mammoth endorium desk as he confers with his director of plant operations, Erla Becker, and the noted physicist, Professor David Hegman. Uh, Miss Becker, is there anything else on the agenda which concerns Professor Hegman? Yes, you wanted me to remind you to congratulate the professor. Oh, yes, uh, the Kleinhurst Medal. I understand you're to receive it at a banquet this evening. That's right, Mr. Crozer. Uh, congratulations. You're upholding the Crozer tradition. The Crozer tradition? Of course. Uh, for the past three years, every winner of the Kleinhurst Medal for Scientific Achievement has been associated with Crozer Enterprises. Oh, I understand that the medal is given for work, uh, which I did before I joined your organization. Well, I, I speak in jest, uh, more or less. Well, uh, that completes our conference, Professor. I have something to tell you, Mr. Crozer. Yes? I am forced, uh, with regret, of course, to submit my resignation. Your resignation? I don't understand, Professor. Well, it's my doctor's orders. He says my health won't permit me to continue my work for your company. But you're under contract. You're absolutely necessary to this project. I am very sorry. But my doctor tells me that unless I retire, I may not last for more than a few months. Uh, this puts my company in an awkward position, Professor. I won't tolerate it. I regret this as much as you do, Mr. Crozer. But I don't see what I can do about it. See here, Eggman. It'll take us three years to complete construction and install equipment. Your contributions are useful now in our present stage, but they'll be absolutely essential in three years from now. Oh, Mr. Crozer, no one individual is absolutely indispensable. There are other scientists in my field. Eggman, I hired you because you're the only man alive today who can see this particular phase through to a successful conclusion. This whole operation is geared around you. 
You can't resign. Well, my doctor tells me that I have no choice. Surely you don't expect me to endanger my life. I'm going to have a talk with that doctor of yours. I'm afraid it won't do you any good, Mr. Crozer. Two other doctors have confirmed his diagnosis. Very well. We shall see. Our interview has ended, Hagman. I have other matters to discuss with Miss Becker now. Goodbye, Mr. Crozer. Goodbye, Professor. Observe of that man. Trying to walk out on me, John Crozer. I understand how you feel, but as the professor says, it can't be helped. Well, I'll hold him to his contract. He's got to keep working for me. That project must be finished as I planned. You can't force him to disobey his doctor's orders. Contract or no contract. Look here, Miss Becker. Your director of plant operations is up to you to find a way out of this. Well, let's face facts. Hegman's brain will be a most value to us three years from now. But he's got to retire immediately, so he's out of the picture. If there were only someone else with his knowledge. There is one possibility, but it's not legal. Uh, well, let's hear it. Suppose Professor Hegman were to be put in suspended animation for three years. Then, when he's revived, his health will be exactly as it is now. He'll be able to do a few months of work when he's most needed. Of course, Hegman wouldn't consent to it. Well, that's immaterial to me. We'll do it by force. That's an admirable idea, Miss Becker. We'll literally be establishing a brain bank. We'll put Hegman's brain on ice till we're ready to use it. There's only one catch. How are we going to explain his disappearance? Uh, leave that to me. You locate some suspended animation equipment and get it here. When we get it set up, we'll bring Hegman to my office for one more conference. Well, nobody seems to know where the professor is, Commander. I've even checked with his doctor. I've just phoned Crozer. He hasn't seen him either. Well, maybe the professor forgot about his appointment with you. He could be out with friends celebrating. After all, he's just received the Kleinhurst Medal. Well, I doubt that he'd forget the appointment, Happy. He seemed very anxious to talk to me. You knew, didn't you, that the professor has to retire? No. Why, sir? Well, his doctor warned him that he can't keep up the pace. Oh, by the way, there's something I've been wanting to show you. Yeah. Have a look at this new space patrol equipment. Binoculars? Yes. Not just ordinary binoculars, Happy. They're space binoculars. Can I try them out, sir? Sure, they're yours. Gee, they've got a band on them so you don't have to hold on to them. Yeah, the band fastens them around your head. Right, it leaves your hands free. Now, take a look over the city with them, Happy. I'll take the polarization off the windows. Wow, these are great, sir. Well, why, I can even read a small sign on the space terminal building. A sign I can't even see without the binoculars. We're going to get out in space, out of the atmosphere of terror. Then you'll really see something. You mean they're even better out in space? They're so sensitive, they'll pick up very small objects many miles away. They're designed especially for pilots on search missions. Within a planet's atmosphere, they're good four-power binoculars. Wow. Hey, look, there's some people walking five blocks away, and it looks as though I could almost reach right out and touch them. Hey, from what you say, Commander, I'd sure like to take a look through them out in space. Mr. Crozer, this is the most outrageous thing I have ever heard. I refuse to let you do it. Professor, I'm afraid there's nothing you can do about it. Well, don't you know that even if I gave you my consent, it is still illegal for private persons to use the suspended animation process? Now, if you'll unlock the door, Crozer, I'll leave. Eggman, my friend, you're not leaving. Miss Becker, we might as well get started with the process. Give him the preliminary injection. All right, Mr. Crozer. Get away from me. Eggman, get away from that window. I wouldn't advise jumping out, Professor. It's a long way to the street. Yes, and it wouldn't be suspended animation. It would be terminated animation. Go on, Miss Becker. Give him the get electronic the, injection. Get away from me. I've got my hand over his mouth. Quickly, Miss Becker. Well, hold him still. Quit struggling, Eggman. Oh, you really get hurt. There. How long does it take for the electronic ejection to knock him out? Just a few seconds. Good. Yeah, he's losing consciousness. All right, Miss Becker. Let's carry him into the suspended animation chamber and finish the process. Commander, look. I can see the lettering on the windows of the Crozer building. These binoculars are fantastic, even in the atmosphere. Take a look at Terra Park, Happy. You can probably see the ants from the rose bushes. Yeah, they aren't that good. <laughs> but I can see people inside the Crozer building. Look, sir, on, on the top floor, there's a man standing in the window. I can see him just as plain. Here, sir, try him. All right, I'll take just one look, but then I think we'd better get to work. Yes, sir. It's the fourth window from the corner of the building, see? Yeah, it is clear. Well, that's Professor Hegman. Huh? At least I think it is. Oh, he's gone now. wonder why Crozer didn't have the professor call me. 
Uh, I suppose Hagman's busy closing up his work with Crozer. Yeah, I think he'd at least phone you. I'll tell you what, Happy. I've got an errand to make right near the Crozer building. Let's drop in and see the professor on the way over. I've checked the suspended animation equipment. Everything's working fine, Mr. Crozer. How long does it take? Another hour and we'll be through. Oh, good. You aren't going to keep him here in the building, are you? No, no. In a day or so, we'll take him to Mars. We'll have to take the equipment there, too. We have to give him booster treatments every three months. Say, haven't you been under that helio lamp long enough? Oh, I've got it on low setting. You ought to try it, Miss Becker. It's uh, really very relaxing. Not as relaxing as that treatment we're giving Hegman. <laughs> yes. He'll be relaxed for three years. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Hegman, did you see him throw anything out of the window when you were struggling with him? I know. Did you? Well, he made a sort of throwing motion with his hand. I think I'd better go down the street and check. Yeah, that's right. He certainly didn't have time to scribble any note. But let's not take any chance. Come in. Hello, Mr. Crozer. Oh, Commander Corey. Nice to see you. Thank you. This is Cadet Happy. How do you do, Cadet? How do you do, sir? Uh, sit down, gentlemen. I hope you don't mind if I go on with this lamp treatment. I'm acquiring a tan for myself. I see you are. Unfortunately, I don't have the opportunity to get it the natural way as you space patrolmen do. That's <laughs> quite a high-powered lamp. Yes, it can be if it's turned up. I have to know how to handle it. The reason I came over, Mr. Crozer, is to see Professor Hegman. No, well, the professor isn't here. Uh, remember, I told you I'd ask him to call you if he showed up. We saw him standing by the window of this office just a few minutes ago. You saw him in the window? Happy and I were testing some new space patrol binoculars. We thought we saw Hegman. Hegman? You must be mistaken. Oh, I know. One of my attorneys was here a while ago. He, he's about the same height and build as Hegman. Yes, come to think of it, there is a resemblance. Funny, I never thought about it before. Well, apparently we made a mistake, Mr. Crozer. Sorry to have bothered you. Uh, no bother at all. No bother at all. The old fool threw this out of the window. I, I didn't know there was anyone in here. We were just leaving, but I've changed my mind. May I see what you have there? Oh, it's, it's nothing at all. Oh, no, no, Commander. Just a little promotion gimmick one of our companies is putting out. <laughs> May I see it? Yes, of course. The Kleinhurst Medal. A promotion gimmick? The Kleinhurst Medal? There's only one man who would have that medal on his person at this time. That would be Professor Hegman. What are you getting at? This young lady just said it was thrown out of the window. Well, why would anyone throw a valuable award like this out of a window unless they wanted to attract attention? Give it to me straight, Crozer. Where is Professor Hegman? You're jumping to conclusions, aren't you, Commander? That was Hegman we saw. If you're not trying to hide something, why are you and this woman so evasive? Why did you lie about the metal? You've got Hegman somewhere in this building. I suppose you won't be satisfied until you search the place. That's right. All right, then. Come on. I'll just turn this lamp on full power and right in your eyes. Turn it off! My eyes. Get him, Happy. I can't see him. No, oh, but I can. Grab that book in, Miss Becker. Uh, nice work, Miss Becker. And now, Cadet! Uh, that'll hold them for a while. It was a smart trick, Mr. Crow, to shine that helio sun lamp in their eyes. I had to do something after that four pie you pulled. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know they were here. We've got to move fast. Arrange for a spaceship. We'll get Hegman aboard. What about these two? We'll lock them in the next room till we get Hegman out of here. Then I'll come back and finish our space patrol friends for good. We'll be back with space patrol in just a moment. Oh, come on, Captain Twofeld. Tell me what Buzz Corey's big new surprise is for all his kids. Won't you, huh? No, I can't tell you. Please? No, nope, it's a secret until the end of today's program. Is it something the commander himself uses? Oh, you bet it is. It's official space patrol equipment. Can't you really tell me what it is? No, nope, it's a secret. Well, then, how about a little hint? Well, I'll tell you this. It's something absolutely new and different. Oh, man, oh, man. I just can't wait. Well, you hurry now. Get a pencil and paper ready and keep listening because in just a few moments, I'll tell you what the big surprise is and how you can get it. And all you boys and girls listening in, you do the same thing. Get pencil and paper ready and be all set to take down the information you need to get that wonderful new surprise Buzz Corey has for you. So long for now. See you at the end of today's program when I'll tell you all about the biggest, the swellest, the most exciting value ever offered on Space Patrol. <laughs> John Crozer and his assistant, Erla Vecker, have placed Professor Hegman in suspended animation, intending to revive him three years later to finish vital scientific work on a vast project Crozer is managing. 
When Commander Corey and Cadet Happy decided to search the building for the professor, Crozer blinded them with a beam from a high-powered helio sun lamp and then knocked out the virtually defenseless space patrolman. Buzz and Happy have just regained consciousness and their vision and find themselves locked in a room. <coughs> no, that's no use, Happy. We can't break down that door. Uh, we must be in the Crozer building, judging by the view from the window. Yeah, on the top floor. And Crozer's probably miles away by now with the professor. Mm, I doubt it. He wouldn't go away without being sure we'd never be able to report him. He'll be back. And then I've got a feeling we'd better get out of here before he returns. Let's take a look out the window. Say, maybe we can attract the attention of somebody in another building. Oh, it's locked, too. Yeah. Hey, there's a ledge out there. If we break the window, we could crawl on the ledge to another window. And that's not my idea of a pleasant stroll, 50 stories out. Well, it's not mine, either, but it's a lot safer than what Crozer has in mind for us. Yeah, this chair ought to do the trick. Turn your head, Happy. Watch out for the glass. <coughs> All right. You want me to go first, sir? Uh, wait till I knock these sharp splinters loose. Uh, hey, let's go. I'll boost you up. <coughs> I can make it now, sir. Wow, what a long way down to the street. Don't look down, Happy. Lie flat on the ledge and crawl. Yes, sir. I hope we can find another open window along here. I wish this ledge was wider. I, I feel like a tight rope walker. Oh, easy, Happy. Oh, my knee slipped off. For a minute, I thought I was a goner. Don't try to hurry. Hey, Commander, we're in luck. Is that window unlocked? Yes, sir, and it's part way open. All I have to do is push it. Easy now. Don't push yourself off the ledge. Anybody inside? I don't see anybody. Well, here goes. Nobody in here, sir. Watch the door. How are you going to do away with Corey and the cadet? You unlock the door. Swing it open. I'll blast them with this gun before they have a chance to rush us. Open the door and be sure and stand back. Don't worry. All right, Corey, we'll... They're gone. Gone? Yeah, this room's empty. Look at the window. Well, they couldn't have climbed down the side of the building. Yeah, they certainly wouldn't jump. The ledge. They use the ledge. By now, they've probably given an alarm. This whole building will be swarming with space patrolmen soon. Well, what'll we do? We've got to get out of here. We'll have to forget about the equipment. We've got to get to the spaceport and blast off right away. Hurry, Ola. We haven't a second to spare. Take it easy, Happy. All right. Open the door. Well, there's nobody in here either. Just some equipment of some kind. Uh, some men's clothing, coat and a hat. What kind of equipment is this, sir? Suspended animation equipment. Oh, that's what they use in criminal rehabilitation centers to help cure criminal tendencies. Yes, but how did Crozer get hold of it? And what for? I thought it was against the law for private individuals to have these. Well, that wouldn't stop Crozer. Why would he want this equipment? Why would he want to put under... Professor. What? That must be it. With the professor in suspended animation, he'd be easier to conceal. Well, sure, but what good would the professor be if he was unconscious? Crozer could revive him whenever he needed him, even months or years from now. I wonder what Crozer did with him. He'd try to get him off Terra. Let's go to the spaceport, Happy. Happy, I've just checked with the space control dispatcher. There was a slip-up. Crozer blasted off. Didn't they try to stop him? The order to hold him wasn't relayed to the dispatcher in time. How long ago did Crozer blast off? Uh, about 15 minutes ago. But I've got a description of his ship. Come on, Happy, let's get aboard Terra 5. We're going after them. Uh, that was luck. I was afraid they'd stop us at the spaceport. Look in the view scope. There's a ship following us. Oh, the space patrol. Now we are in a spot. We can't outrun that ship. No, no, but we can get rid of the professor. Corey doesn't find Hegman on the ship. He can't prove anything against us. Well, what do you intend to do? Just shove the chamber out into space? Oh, yeah. Chances are the professor will never be found. Come on, we've got to get rid of Hegman, and then we'll take our evasive action. Corey won't stand a chance of locating that box with Hegman in it. Gaining on them, sir. All that crazy flying Crozer's doing isn't getting him anywhere. He's trying to delay the inevitable as long as possible. Maybe I can talk some sense into him. Turn on the space phone, Happy. Yes, sir. Commander Corey aboard Terra 5 calling John Crozer in private cruiser T-431. Commander Corey calling John Crozer. This is Crozer. Go ahead, Corey. Go ahead. <laughs> this hide-and-seek isn't getting you anywhere. It's just a matter of minutes. Play it smart and give up. You talked me into it, Corey. But at least I gave you a run for your money. Uh, what do you want me to do? 
We'll pull alongside and join airlocks. All right, Corey. Just a warning, Crozer. Don't try anything. Corey, out. They've joined airlocks with us. All right. Have you got the electronic injection? Yes, it's right here. Yeah, they won't suspect anything from you. Watch your chance and use it on Corey. I'll jump the cadet. He won't be in your way. And then when they're unconscious, they can join Professor Hegman out there in space. All right, Earl. Here they are. Careful. Don't make any slips. All right, Crozer. Get your hands up. Of course, Commander. Search him for weapons, Happy. Yes, sir. Where's Professor Hegman? Professor Hegman? Why, we haven't the slightest idea. Come on, quit stalling. What did you do with him? We haven't got him. Search the ship if you don't believe me. That's just what we will do. He doesn't have any weapons on him, sir. All right, keep your gun on them, Happy, while I search the ship. All right, lady. Get over there next to Crozer. My name is Erla Vecker, and I'll be glad to. Oh, excuse me. Commander! Oh, no, you uh, don't. What have you got there? Let go of me. In your hand. Come on, Erla. That's it. Well, electronic injector. I'll take that gun, uh, Cadet. Oh, no, you don't. Uh, All right, Crozer. Uh, hey, nice one, Commander. Don't try anything like that again, Crozer. And no tricks from you either, Erla. It's lucky you saw her with that electronic injector, sir. You should have had us in deep freeze. That was a very foolish move on your part, Erla. Now you're in this just as deep as Crozer. Now, let's have it. Where's Hegman? All right, I'll tell you. But you'll never find him. He's somewhere out in space. What? You threw him out of the ship? That's right. All sealed up in a nice cozy box. Chances are he'll float forever in space in suspended animation. Have to get these two into our ship. We'll cut loose and start a search. They're going to stay right with us till we find them. Nothing, sir. That blip turned out to be a small meteor. You're just wasting your time, Corey. That box with Hegman in it is just a speck in space. Your view scopes won't show it unless you happen to be very close. We'll just keep looking. I've got the view scope on full sensitivity and wide scanning, sir. I'm afraid the view scope isn't much help. Well, here. Let's try these. The space binoculars. It's a long chance, but it might work. Scan in a slow arc, Happy. There's something. Oh, no, it's just another meteor. Let me have a look. Hey, wait a minute. It's a rectangular shape. Check it, Happy, about ten degrees high. I see it, sir. Yeah, it's a box, all right. That's it, we found it. Change back to Hap. Let's hope we're not too late. There it is, Happy. Yeah, I can see it now through the view scope, even without the binoculars. Stand by to fire forward breaking rockets. Standing by, sir. Fire rockets. Yeah, that'll stop us, Happy. All right, get the spacesuits. We'll pull the box into the ship. And Crozer, we'll just lock you and Erla in a compartment till we get the professor aboard. Why don't you sit down and relax, Crozer? You'll wear out the commander's carpet. Why don't we hear from the hospital? Yeah, you're pretty worried now, aren't you, Crozer? You know, if Professor Hegman doesn't come out of that deep freeze, it's going to go mighty hard on you and Erla. Oh, well, they should know by now. Oh, for Saturn's sake. Sit down and stop that pacing. Oh, here's the commander. Crozer, look who's with him. Professor Hegman. That's right. It's certainly lucky for you two that the professor pulled through that treatment. Yes. And Mr. Crozer... It will give me a great deal of pleasure to testify against you. Well, then show me with more of his work than the doctor first thought. Well, in that case, we actually did you a service, Professor. Uh, Commander, that should be taken into account. Don't you... think you're going to get off easy on that account. It's just luck and the fact that we had these space binoculars that saved the Professor. Yes, Happy, I had no idea that the binoculars would actually help us save a life. Well, you sure were right about their being terrifically powerful out in space. And they're great in a normal atmosphere, too. I'm not going to lose any time in issuing them to all space patrol personnel. Uh, sir, did you know that when you look through the binoculars the wrong way, you can see into the future? Oh, I was under the impression that they just smallify. But if you say so... Oh, that's ridiculous. It just makes objects look far away. Uh-huh. And far away, I see a criminal rehabilitation center with two people in it. John Crozer and Erla Vecker. And they're getting the same kind of treatment they gave Professor Hegman. Suspended animation. You want to have a look? Uh... <laughs> In just a moment, we'll give you an exciting preview of next week's thrill-packed Space Patrol adventure. But first, gang, 
Oh, boy, first of all, here's that big, wonderful surprise we promised you. Get your pencil and paper, get all set to go. This is the greatest value we've ever offered on Space Patrol. Commander Corey, you tell the gang what this terrific new item is. Boys and girls, our surprise for you is a pair of those wonderful new Space Patrol space binoculars. Binoculars like the ones I used today when I spied the professor floating in that box way, way off in the distance, remember? Gang, you'll be able to see way, way off in the distance with the Space Patrol binoculars you get, too. Yes, sir, these binoculars are four power binoculars with four lenses. And when you look through them, they make people, houses, buildings, cars, everything else, blocks and blocks away, look bigger and nearer and clearer. No adjusting necessary. The lenses are fixed focus lenses. Why, you don't even have to hold these wonderful binoculars up to your eyes. You wear them like official outer space headgear. They have a strong elastic band on them, and when you slip it over your head, it holds the binoculars in place and leaves your hands absolutely free. Makes you look like a man from Mars, because these binoculars stand out from your eyes a full three and a half inches. That's right. These are not flimsy little celluloid goggles or a mask. These are real, full-size binoculars. Overall, they're five inches wide, five inches long, and they're made of solid plastic. Beautiful, long-lasting, black solid plastic with bright red leather-like trimming that makes them look terrific. Now, don't forget, you can see way off in the distance with them. You can spot your dad coming home from work, spot the mailman coming blocks away. You can watch birds in high trees, study animals, identify people in the distance, read signs way, way off, and see airplanes way up in the sky. And when you look through the other end of your space binoculars, they do a switcheroo. They make close-up things look like they're far away from you. Yes, sir, gang, these powerful Space Patrol space binoculars are the greatest value we've ever offered on Space Patrol. To get a pair, do this. Buy a box of Instant Ralston. Then with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and an Instant Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in continental USA and may be withdrawn at any time. If you don't agree that your box are absolutely tops, Return them, we'll return your money. That address again is Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. Buzz and Happy are approaching a building where the Secretary General's daughter, Carol, is held captive. Suddenly, they became aware of a tingling, painful sensation and a ringing in their ears. <laughs> It's getting hard to walk. I, I feel like I had a big weight on me. I can hardly move either, Happy. Nora must be using some kind of ray on us. A paralyzer ray? I think it may be worse than that. They're undoubtedly in an ultrasonic beam. Get back to the ship. Get out of range quickly. I, I can't. I, I can't make it. Happy, get up. You've got to get up. Here, I'll help you. I, I can't even crawl. My head, there's a thousand needles in it. If we don't get out of this beam, it'll tear us to pieces. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Sleepwalker, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! <laughs> Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Virginia Hewitt, Ken Mayer, David Duval, and Bela Kovach. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol! And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston present Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! 
In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy are approaching a building where the Secretary General's daughter, Carol, is held captive. Suddenly, they become aware of a painful, tingling sensation and a ringing in their ears. It's hard to walk. It feels like a big weight on me. Yeah, I can hardly move. Happy. Nora's using some kind of a ray on us. A paralyzer ray? It's worse than that. With an ultrasonic beam. Run back to the ship. Get out of its range quickly. I, I can't. I... Happy, get up. Here, I'll, I'll help you. I can't even crawl. I, my head, there's a thousand needles in it. If we don't get out of that beam, it'll shake us to pieces. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Sleepwalker. And now, gang, here's some terrific news. Here's how to get a pair of the Space Patrol Space Binoculars, the most unusual binoculars ever designed. You wear them like official outer space headgear. That's right, a strong elastic band holds them snugly to your eyes, leaving your hands absolutely free. Now, these are not flimsy celluloid goggles, not a mask. They're the real McCoy. Big, full-size, solid plastic binoculars you can see way off in the distance with. Overall, they're a complete five inches in width, a complete five inches in length. And when you wear them, they stand out a full three and a half inches from your eyes. Powerful? Ah, you bet. These are four power binoculars with four fixed focus, pure lucite lenses. You can spot airplanes in the sky, watch for your dad coming home from work, read signs way off in the distance. Truly, the greatest space patrol value in all our experience. The most sensational offer we have ever made. Now, here's how to get a pair. Buy a box of Instant Ralston. Then, with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and an Instant Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. If you don't agree that your space binoculars are absolutely tops, return them and the Ralston Company will cheerfully refund your money. The address again is Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. Two hours ago in the Neptune City office of Interplanetary Transport Service, a small white light on a control panel flickered and changed to red. A few seconds later, the traffic supervisor of the big private passenger service clicked on his spaceophone. Space Patrol Search Command, this is the Interplanetary Transport Service, Neptune Office. Our ITS passenger ship N-157 is overdue on two quarter-hour message to base reports. This ship last reported at 1745 Universal Star Time on regular Terra Neptune space lane. 900,000 BUs out of Neptune and has not reported to Space Control Terra. This office requests... Within minutes, Space Space Patrol Search Search Command ships fanned out from Neptune, sensitive view scopes scanning space for the missing passenger ship. Ninety minutes later, in Commander Corey's central office on Terra, Cadet Happy sits before a spaceophone, tensely waiting a report from Neptune. Happy. Nothing new so far, sir. Uh, Cut down the amplifier, huh? Thanks. I've just got a report from the communications center from the Space Patrol search unit. They found the N-157 out beyond the Neptune orbit. What was wrong, Commander? Passengers and crew had been mysteriously put to sleep. To sleep? Why? To cover a robbery, it seems. Was the thief still aboard? No, we don't know yet. Chances are he was working with a confederate who met the passenger ship out in space and took the thief aboard. But we know what's missing. One of the passengers who was the first to revive is making quite a disturbance about it. Can't say that I blame him. He lost half a million credits. Half a million? Wow. That's partly his own fault. He had them packed in an ordinary suitcase and didn't even ask for a guard. Well, why in the universe was he carrying that much money around? He's a space construction contractor named Reese Bixby. Took over the government artificial satellite job after the other contracting firm defaulted. Oh, yeah. He's the man who boasted he could finish the satellites within six months. He can probably do it, too. Fortunately, he's a much better space engineer than he was a guard of his money. Well, the money isn't hit aboard the ship, then, huh? Apparently not. The ship has been searched. The only clue so far is that two passengers are missing. We don't know who they are until all the passengers revive, so interplanetary transport can check the passenger list. And then we'll know who's missing and who took the money. Unless the thieves were traveling under assumed names, which they probably were. To me, this looks like the work of the sleepwalker. Oh, the crook who's been stealing plant payrolls by putting people to sleep. Right. 
But up till now, at least he hasn't committed any other form of robbery. Yeah, it seems that this sleepwalker walks in other people's sleep. Yeah, that he does. In a planetary transport service, Neptune office calling Commander Corey, Space Patrol Headquarters, Terra. Corey here, go ahead. Well, this is interplanetary traffic supervisor Jenkins, Commander. The two missing passengers are a man and a woman. The man is listed on the roster as William Knight. And the woman? Uh, my assistant is checking the names now, Commander. You hurry with that, please? William Knight. Make a note of them, Happy. Yes, sir. I have the other name, Commander. Oh, I can't believe this. What is it, Jenkins? The missing woman is the, the Secretary General's daughter, Carol Carlyle. What? It was on the amended passenger list, a last-minute change transmitted from Terra, which is why we were so long in finding out. Jenkins, stand by for further instructions. Yes, Commander. Happy, get the ship ready. We're blasting off for Neptune immediately. I wish we'd get a report from the Neptune Search Command, sir. Well, by this time, the other ship could be thousands of DUs away, huh? Yeah, and we haven't the slightest idea of what kind of ship to look Carol for. Carol shouldn't have made a trip without notifying the Space Patrol. Carol calling Cam- Commander Corey. Carol calling Commander Corey. The miniature space phone channel. Carol, thank goodness you're safe. Oh, Buzz, I was taken off of a passenger ship inside the Neptune orbit. Yes, we know that. Happy and I are headed for Neptune now. Where are you? In the aft compartment of a private cruiser, Class C. Do you know the registry number? Yes, it's PCV-85. I got a look at it when it joined airlocks with the passenger ship. Then you weren't affected by the sleep gas. No, I was in my compartment. When I came out, a man grabbed me and forced me near the other ship. Well, what man? What's his name? Well, he was one of the passengers. His partner calls him Woody. Woody Knorr. Who's his partner? He was piloting a private cruiser. His name is Bob Morgan. You know where they're taking you? No, all I know is that... Buzz, someone's coming. Hide your miniature space phone, Carol, but leave it on. Corey, out. I've changed vector toward their position, sir. Good, Happy. Increase our acceleration to four Gs. came in to have a little chat with you, miss. What's your name? You mean you don't know? Why should we? It was the money we were after. Yeah, it's too bad you weren't in the lounge with the rest of the passengers. Or maybe it's a good thing. How would you like to join up with us? Yeah, we can make it very profitable for you. Nice-looking kid like you would go far in our organization. Why, of all the insulting... <clears throat> Well, you want to play rough, huh? Well, I'll be glad to oblige you. Let go of me. Let her alone, Morgan. Just get her identification. No dame's going to slap me and get away with it. Hand me her purse. All right, Woody. Hey, hey, look at that bracelet on her arm. Jupiter Emeralds. I'll bet they'd bring in a few credits. She must be some big shot's daughter. (laughs) I've changed my mind, Woody. This dame is an extra bonus. Shut up, Morgan. Do you know who we got here? It's the Secretary General's daughter, Carol. Of all the passengers in that ship, we have to grip the one who could give us the most trouble. Let's go back and take her out front so we can watch her every second. They've left the compartment. You can hear the sound of their rockets in the space phone. The ship will be easier to follow on our view scope finder. I've got a rough three-point fix on their trajectory. If they keep on that vector, it'll bring them close to Venus. Got to cut down the distance between their ship and ours. If we don't get them in the view scope before they land and cut their rockets, we'll lose them. Morgan, send her down. It's Venus. By the looks of the landscape, we're near the Southwest Sea, close to the Tycho Mountains. That's right, Miss Carlyle. Nobody will ever find this hideout. Cut your rockets, Morgan, and don't overshoot the rocket port. You take the money, I'll handle the gill. Come on, we got to decide what to do with you. All right. Just sit down and relax, miss. Yeah, you can watch us count the money. (laughs) We got to reach a decision right away. What do you suggest? Well, we can't keep her here and we can't turn her loose. She knows too much. That leaves only one thing. Do away with her. Yeah. But so far, we never had to resort to anything so drastic. That's our own fault. My fault? And just how do you figure that? You just keep out of this. Just leave it to a woman to spoil a man's perfect record of crime without violence. Me, Woody Nord, the sleepwalker. I pulled off dozens of robberies and never even had to slug anybody. I've got it. 
can take some of this money and hire somebody else to take care of her. Morgan, have you no code of ethics? The principle is the same. Ethics. Hey, listen. The spaceship. It's a space patrol ship. It's Terra 5, Commander Corey's ship. Blast him. How did he train us here? What are we going to do? Take it easy. I'll turn on the ultrasonic beam. What will that do? Just watch. I got a scanning device on the roof. It revolves slowly. And when a beam is interrupted by a moving object, ultrasonic waves are focused on it. Ultrasonic waves? What do they do? Well, first they affect the nervous system. They paralyze any living thing within range. The more the victim moves, the more intense the vibration becomes. There is no escape. Oh, no. Finally, the vibration act on the flesh like a million tiny scalpels. I won't use it, except that I'm forced to in self-defense. Stop showing how much you know. Let's get this over with. All right. Come to the window if you'd like to watch. I thought I saw somebody at the window up there in the hideout, Commander. They've seen us. Keep your ray gun and that's horse for happy. Suppose they start firing at us. You may be taking them by surprise. If not... Well, Woody Nor has never used physical violence before in his other crimes. Let's hope he doesn't start now. If he come up here ready to shoot, he may get panicky and harm Carol. He probably figures his own best chance uh, is hey, to... Hey, Commander, I, I feel sort of funny. So do I. I. A tingling sensation. Well, there's a ringing in my ears. Do you notice it? Yes. It's not exactly a sound, yet... Hey, is, is this a pill or something? It's hard to walk. It feels like a big weight was put on me. I can hardly move. Happy. Nora's using some sort of ray on us. A paralyzer ray. Oh, it's worse than that. Look up there on the roof. See that big metal cone? It's following us. We're in an ultrasonic beam. Get back to the ship, Happy. Get out of its range quickly. Happy, get up. Here, I'll help you. Oh. Commander, I can't even crawl. My head, it feels like it's got a thousand needles in it. If we don't get out of this beam, it's going to shake us to pieces. We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a moment. Say, gang, listen to this. Poor old motor. It's got nothing to go on but ordinary fuel. I say, but listen to this. Wow, there's a motor that's supercharged. Got super fuel in it, that's why. Now, gang, you know the same is true of you. When you have ordinary fuel for breakfast, what are you? Just a putt-putt. But when you have super fuel for breakfast, well, that's when you can be a super somebody because you're supercharged. So, gang, eat the super fuel Buzz Corey has in the morning. A power breakfast with wheat checks or rice checks, the bite-sized super cereals. Good? Ah, uh, wait till you try them. The swellest tasting cereals in the universe. And the only cereals in the universe with that modern bite-sized design. So don't be a putt-putt. Be a super somebody. Eat a breakfast that supercharges you. A power breakfast with the super cereals Rice Checks and Wheat Checks. <laughs> Woody Knorr and Bob Morgan have stolen a half million United Planets credits from a passenger ship and abducted the Secretary General's daughter, Carol, because she was the only person aboard the spaceship who could identify them. However, Buzz and Happy were able to follow the thieves' spaceship by tracing through Carol's miniature spaceophone. As the commander and his cadet walked toward Knorr's hideout on Venus, Knorr turned on an ultrasonic beam. The beam could first paralyze and then destroy them. Right now, barely able to move, Buzz and Happy lie on the ground as the high-frequency sound vibrations rack them with pain. Maybe, maybe we can roll away from the beam, sir. It's getting more intense. In a few seconds, we'll be completely paralyzed. Our, our ray guns, maybe we can hit the cone. Our ray guns wouldn't affect it. Wait a minute. That cone tracked us, followed us. Yes, sir. It must be controlled by an electric eye. If we can blind that eye. Blind it? You mean throw something at it? No, our atomolites. Shine your atomolite on the round unit on top of the cone. I'll use mine, too. If, if I can move my arm. Got to, Abby. Quickly, while we're able to move at all. I, I'm getting it good. My hand is shaking so much, I, I can't hold the beam steady. It's working, though. My beam's in focus. Yeah, I've got it, sir. 
The cone's turning all around, back and forth and up and down. We've confused it. Keep your atomic light on. Oh, it'll find us again. Can you get up, Happy? I'm pretty shaky, but I'll try it. Keep your light steady. That's it. Wow. I'm as wobbly as a burned-out rocket. Come on. We've got to get in there before Noah thinks up something else. This time we won't hesitate to use our ray guns. They're getting up. You might as well give up. Buzz and Happy are more than a match for you two. Shut up. We're not through yet. Morgan, you hold him off. I'll take the girl into money. We'll slip out the back way. Oh, sure. Leave me to face the music alone. Nothing doing. Well, we both can't get away. And if I have the girl, I can force Corey to let you go. How do I know you'll do it? Don't argue, you fool. Corey and the cadet are pretty shaky from the sonic beams. You can handle them. I'll take Corey's ship, and when you get out, you take mine. There they are. Hold them off. All right, miss. Let's go. Come on. Hey, stop it. Let go of me. I said come on. Oh. Hey, Woody, you got a rig up. Now, use that iron bar and lock this door behind us. Once more, Happy. <laughs> that did it. Wow, I'm so weak I can hardly stand. Take it easy, Hap. They're probably hiding down this hallway. Hey, I think I hear somebody in this room, sir. I'll open the door. You cover me from the side. Yes, sir. Empty. Mm. Try the next one. Oh, happy. I'll continue searching the house. You go out and see if there's a back door. They may try to speak. Smoking rockets were too late. They made it to their ship. Their ship, nothing. Look out the window. Terrified. They took our ship. Then we'll take theirs. I don't think you will. Commander, look out. <coughs> Why, you give me that bar. Stand back, Oh, my shoulder. Next time it'll be your head, just like the commander got, only not so easy. All right, now I'll take those guns. Hey, the commander's hurt bad. He'll be all right. Well, Cadet, let's carry out the commander's order. Huh? He wanted to get in our ship, so pick him up. Come on, you're going to have to carry him. Morgan to Nor. Morgan calling Nor. Nor here? What happened? Everything worked out fine. I have two passengers. They're uh, resting secured back aft. Ah, good work, Morgan. You blasted off without any difficulty then. A little. Everything's fine now. What's next? Say, if we're going to talk business, switch over to the scramble circuit. Okay. Go ahead. Well, we'll rendezvous near the uncompleted artificial satellite. What about our passengers? Well, unload yours on the satellite and spacesuits. And without the jet packs. Then I'll transfer to our ship. What about the girl? I'll leave her in Terra 5. All comfortable and secure. Except for one little thing. All right, Corey, cadet. Get into the airlock. You aren't going to drop us off in empty space. If I was going to do that, I wouldn't have shut off the rockets. When you open the outer hatch, you'll step right off onto the unfinished artificial satellite, the one swinging around Venus. What about Carol? Is Nora going to leave her with us? She won't be far away. Now get out. Close your helmets and step out. I want to know what you're going to do with Carol. You're going to get a blast of this ray gun if you don't move. I'll tell you about Carol when you're outside the ship. There's Terra 5, sir. But why is Nor stopping it so far from the satellite? Happy, stand clear of Morgan's ship. I think he's getting ready to blast away from the space platform. That's right, Corey. We're going to pick up Nor and we'll be on our way. What about Carol? We're leaving her in Terra 5, several hundred yards away. But we're leaving a time bomb in the ship with her. What good is that going to do you? If the ship's destroyed, there'll be no chance of it being sighted by another ship. No one will look for you, too, on this unfinished space platform. Not for weeks. Why can't you give Carol a chance? Put her here with us. Wouldn't you prefer to have her go quickly instead of suffering from hunger and thirst? Besides, Nora and I like to think of you two watching, waiting for that explosion. <laughs> It'll give you something to think about while you wait for your own finish. Nora's ship is nearly out of sight, sir. Yes, the contemptible cowards. And there's Terra 5, so close, and yet it might as well be several DUs away for all we can do about it. Commander, this is Woody Nora. With just a final fond word of farewell. Nora, listen. Did you really leave a bomb in our ship? Well, you just wait and see. Uh, incidentally, I can barely hear your signal from the spacesuit transmitter. I doubt that a spaceship could hear you or reach you in time to save the girl. Oh, yeah. Uh, don't forget to keep your magnetic boots turned on full or you'll float off into nowhere. Uh, goodbye, Commander. Nora. Oh, the dirty rats. We're about as far from the regular space lanes as we could be. Yeah, that's why the satellite is being built here. If we only had our jetpacks. 
but here we are with no way of moving off this platform in a set direction. Sitting here in a scrap pile of tied-down metal, waiting for that bomb... Abby, wait a minute. That's not a scrap pile, not to us. It's rocket fuel. Rocket fuel? Why, it's just chunks of metal. Uh Uh-huh. Here's a big, broad plate of endurium. That'll serve as a space raft. Space raft? Get busy and pile some of these scraps on the plate. Well, sure, sir, but I don't get it. They're going to make a man-powered rocket. A man-powered rocket? Remember that summer on Lake Azure when you stood up in the canoe and threw a rock at a leaping fish? Do I? I went over backwards out of the canoe into the lake. Exactly. You demonstrated Sir Isaac Newton's third law of motion. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Sure. That's the principle that rockets and all spaceships operate on. Right. Spaceship moves forward because molecules of fuel are forced out of the rocket engines. This big flat endurium plate is our ship. You and I are the engines, and these chunks of metal are the fuel. Hey, I get it. We toss the chunks off our raft in the opposite direction from where we want to go. Right. Let's get busy. Don't know how much time we've got left. There. That's enough scrap metal, Happy. Get on the raft and brace yourself firmly. Yes, sir. Now, let's throw together and smoothly or we'll zigzag. Now, give us a start by pushing away from the satellite with my hand. Make sure your magnetic boots are firm on the raft or you'll be in trouble. We're moving. <sighs> hey, just like pushing away from a pier in a boat. That's not very fast, but we'll gain speed. Now, start throwing. One, two, three. <clears throat> One, two, three. <clears throat> It's not going much faster. No, but with each throw, he gain acceleration. One, two, three. One, two, three. Gee, sir, l- look how close we are to the ship. Yes, but we're not heading for the airlock. Throw off the right corner this time. That'll turn it. One, two, three. Yeah, that heads are right, sir. Yeah, we can stop now. Raft will coast at this velocity. We don't want to hit the ship too hard. It's going to be quite a bump as it is. If that bomb goes off now, it's just too bad for all three of us. Brace yourself, Happy. Wow. All right, open the outer hatch. Let's hurry. Quickly into the airlock. Now close it so we don't let the air out of the ship. Into the ship. Carol. Carol, where's the bomb? Open your faceplate, Happy. She can't hear you. Oh, Oh, Buzz. Happy. Oh, where's the bomb? It's in the next compartment. I've been trying to get loose from these ropes. I'll get it. Here it is. You want to heave it out the airlock, sir? That won't be necessary, Happy. I've cut off the time mechanism. Oh, what a relief. I've been lying here expecting every second to be the last. Now we've got to get Nor and Morgan. Do you have any idea where they're headed? Well, I remember Woody Nor saying something about taking part of the money to a place in Lowell City on Mars. You remember where in Lowell City? Well, uh, let me see. I, I, I think I can, but I, I'm so upset right now. All but... right, Carol, you relax. Happy now, blast off for Lowell City. All right, pull the surface car up here, Morgan. Okay. Now, Lowell City sure looks good to me. Hey, you sure this guy can get rid of these credits for us without getting caught? Oh, yeah. He's got a perfect setup. He spreads the stolen credits among the bank's funds, gives us other money for the hot stuff, less than percent for his services. Okay, let's get out of the car. I'll bring the loot. Help you with your luggage, gentlemen? Glory. Uh, run for it, Margaret. Oh, no, you don't. Hey, let go of me. And this one's for that sonic beam. If that's a gun you're reaching for, drop it. <laughs> I've got Morgan, sir. Hang on to him, Happy. Get up, Noir, on your feet. All right, all right. Don't leave me anymore. You got off that space platform, but how? Didn't the ship explode? No. We got to the bomb about two minutes before it was set to go off. Somebody rescued you. It's impossible. There wasn't a ship near enough to get you in time. No living person could help you off that satellite. Yeah, you're right, Noir. No living person did. But somebody did help us. One of the greatest scientists who ever lived. A man whose name was... Sir Isaac Newton. An exciting preview of next week's thrilling Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. But first, this is your commander... Cadet Happy. ...and Captain Dick Tufel, gang. We're going to tell you how to get a pair of those sensational new Space Patrol space binoculars that you can see way off in the distance with. Now remember, you don't have to hold these binoculars up to your eyes. You wear them on your head like outer space headgear. They're form-fitted to your eyes, and a strong elastic band holds them snugly on. Now, these are not flimsy little celluloid goggles or a mask. They're real, full-size, 
Four power binoculars with four pure Lucite lenses. Real binoculars five inches long, five inches wide, made out of solid black plastic with a bright red leather-like trimming. And when you wear them, these big, handsome space binoculars stand out from your eyes a full three and a half inches. Remember, these are four power binoculars. This means they make objects way off in the distance look four times closer. You can spot airplanes in the sky, boats on the water, far-off objects on land. Your space binoculars will smallify, too. Yes, sir, when you reverse them, they make things look real little and far away. Lots of fun, right, Hap? You bet. And boy, oh boy, these binoculars have that real outer space look. Gosh, when people see you wearing your space binoculars, why, they'll think you just stepped out of a rocket ship from Mars. Gang, send for these valuable Space Patrol space binoculars today. Without a doubt, the greatest value we have ever offered on Space Patrol. To get a pair, do this. Buy a box of Instant Ralston. Then, with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and an instant Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in USA and may be withdrawn at any time. If you don't think your space binoculars are really tops, return them and the Ralston Company will refund your money without question. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. <laughs> And now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story. A strange fever, the wandering fever, has struck the planet Neptune, and people are leaving by the thousands. Happy, who's been on Neptune with the commander, has caught this strange fever and taken off alone in a spaceship. As he flies under the influence of the fever, he mutters to himself and is unable to heed the voice of Commander Corey coming over the ship's spaceophone receiver. It's beautiful out here in space. All the planets of the solar system and the stars beyond. Commander Corey calling Cadet Happy. Listen, Happy. There's that voice again. Over and over. So far away. So far away. Happy, this is urgent. Listen. The ship you're flying has no landing control unit. Oh, why don't I go to Pluto? Yes. Yes, I'll head for Pluto. Happy, listen to me. You're in serious danger. If you try to land that ship, you'll crash. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story... The Deserted Planet, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmerer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Ken Mayer, Virginia Hewitt, and Bela Kovach. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again presents the new exciting Space Patrol. And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol program on your local ABC TV station. Consult your paper for time and channel. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. We check, life check, and good hot Ralston present Space Patrol! <laughs> High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! <laughs> in today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy are in the mountains of Venus approaching a cabin where three criminals are hiding. They're walking toward a metal bridge across a deep chasm. I wonder if they've seen us, Commander. They may have. This way they won't have as much warning as if they'd landed our ship near the cabin. All right, quickly, across the bridge. <laughs> oh, this is a deep bridge. At least 300 feet. Commander, the bridge is giving way. Run for the other side. My feet are slipping. I'm going to fall. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Scavenger of Space. 
Hi, gang. Captain Dick Tufel reporting. And Captain Jack Nars reporting. We're going to tell you all about those wonderful new Space Patrol space binoculars. We're going to tell you how to get them, how to use them, what they look like, what they do, the fun you can have with them, the thrills you can have with them. Space Patrol space binoculars. Gang, you can see way, way off in the distance with them. People, houses, and cars, blocks and blocks away, look nearer, bigger, clearer. You'll wear them on your head just like outer space headgear. They stick out from your eyes a full three and a half inches. Makes you look like a strange person from another planet. Wear them when you're watching sports and when you play Space Patrol. Spot airplanes in the sky. Spot your dad coming home from work while he's still way, way down the block. Have fun with them no matter where you go. One end magnifies. Makes faraway objects look close. The other end does a switcheroo. Makes close objects look far away. Not flimsy celluloid goggles or a mask, but real solid plastic binoculars with a beautiful leather-like trimming. Giant size, too. Five inches wide, five inches long. The greatest value ever offered on Space Patrol. But we can only offer it for a limited time. Now, to get a pair, do this. Buy a box of Instant Ralston. Then, with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and an Instant Ralston box top to Space Patrol. Box 6, 8, 6, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in the USA and may be withdrawn at any time. That's Space Patrol, Box 6, 8, 6, St. Louis, Missouri. In Lowell City, on the planet Mars, is the head office of Carlisle McCray, president of a very profitable interplanetary business, the business of reclaiming and repossessing metals and chemicals. At this moment, he's sitting at his desk, looking over reports from his branch superintendent from the various planets. The door of his office opens, and a young man enters. Immediately, Carlisle McCray's frown turns to a deep scowl. Larry, what are you doing here? Ah, my big business brother, Carlisle. <laughs> How's the old junk man? Don't use that expression to me. Why, Carlisle, everybody calls you the junk man. That is, except those who call you the scavenger of space. It's a term of respect for your great business abilities. Get out of the office. Ah, I'll take it easy. Let me show you something. Have a look at this. I feel so list of your debts. Oh, that's unkind. No, brother, it's an itemized catalog of intended purchases. Materials which the United Planets government will be buying from private firms during the coming year. Huh? Classified information. You stole it. Of course. Well, if you don't want it, I'll take it back. Wait a minute. You deliberately took these secret papers out of the park. Now you will be in again. Oh, no, I won't. Fool, you're an employee. When they find out it's missing, you'll be the first one they'll suspect. And then I'll be ruined. Brother of a thief, Carlisle. Why don't you shut up for a change and just listen? In the first place, I didn't take him out of the file. And no one will suspect me because I went on leave of absence from the commission office three days before the papers were taken. Then how did you get them? I'm trying to tell you. The head of my department an incompetent character named Donald Hall. Yes? He can't keep up with his work during office hours, and he, he doesn't want the higher-ups to find out. So he's been taking some of his work home over the night. You hijacked him one night and took the paper. Yeah, you catch on quick. Did you know you did it? No. If ever gets out that my brother's a crook, I'll never get another government contract. It can't get out. Paul himself won't let it. How do you mean? That's the see. It's against security regulations to take secret documents out of the building. Now, Donald Hall isn't going to admit he violated regulations, so he'll cover up the theft somehow to protect himself. Mm. You know, Larry, perhaps I misjudged you. Thanks, Carl. Now, if you uh, think this information can be of use to you. Of use? Oh, why, well, we can clean up. Now, I suppose you'll be needing a little money. Sit down and let's work out the deal. Donald Hall's office is over there, Happy. Oh, thank you, Commander. United Planet Purchasing Commission. Mr. Hall seemed very upset about something, but he wouldn't tell me what it was over the phone. <laughs> Mr. Hall? Commander Coy, something awful has happened. Oh, uh, can I speak to you? It's all right, this is Cadet Happy. How do you do, Mr. Hall? Uh, fine, fine. Uh, Commander, I want to show you something. Will you come this way, please? All right, come on, Happy. Uh, the filing cabinet. Uh, this morning, I opened this one to get some documents and found this. Oh, it's sort of a spooky coat. Exactly. What is it? 
This drawer is supposed to contain classified information. Somebody has apparently poured acid in here and converted all those papers to this foggy, indistinguishable mess. Who has access to this file? Uh, why, uh, all of the employees in my section. Eighteen to be exact, uh, including myself. Well, why would anyone do a thing like this? Well, it's obviously sabotage. A deliberate destruction of these documents. Perhaps. We'll find out quick with the brainograph. Uh, brainograph? Yes, I'll put all of your employees through a brainograph test. If they know anything about this, it'll show up. Are they available for a test? Why, yes, yes. Uh, except one. He's away on a leave of absence. He's been gone for several days. We'll test him anyway. If he's innocent, he hasn't anything to worry about. Who is he? Larry McRae. I believe he went to Mars. Lowell City, to be exact. We'll look him up. All right, now if you'll show me an index of those destroyed documents and a list of your employees. All right, Larry. Here's an advance on the money they agreed on. Thanks, Carlisle. Now listen, don't spend it. Don't do anything to arouse suspicion. When the leave is over, go back to Terran, your job with the purchasing commission. Understand? Sure, sure. Look, I'll pick up a couple of things in the next room. Be right back. Now, don't worry about a thing. McRae, go ahead. Mr. McRae, you don't know me, and please don't ask any questions. I have some vital information concerning your brother, Larry. My brother? Yes, oh, sir. Let's have it. Uh, he is to be questioned about some documents which were destroyed in the office where he worked on terror. Documents? What documents? Please, no questions. Just listen. I happen to know that the space patrol is putting all employees of the purchasing section to a brain of rat test. Why do you think my brother would be concerned? Just who is this? Uh, naturally, Mr. McRae, I don't suspect your brother of any wrongdoing. This is just a friendly tip. For all I know, he may welcome a brain of rat test. I have no doubt that he will. Well, in that case, he can get a free trip back to Terra. So Mr. Corey is coming to get him. Right away. Uh, goodbye, Mr. McRae. Who is that? I don't know. But you're in a jam. Corey's coming here to give you a brainograph test. What? I can't face that. The, the whole thing had come out. I've got a place on Venus where you'll be safe. You can take one of my ships. I'll blast off right away. Wait. you need some more money. It's in a safe at the chemical lab near the spaceport. I'll give you the address and the combination to the safe. Take the diagonal ramp at the next corner, Happy. The surface car cutoff lane to Sector C of Lowell City. Right, Commander. And Carlisle McRae's company's on Avenue R? That's correct. Well, if Larry McRae is involved in this sabotage, he wouldn't have gone right to his brother's place of business. Well, maybe not. At least he hasn't made it difficult for a Martian agent to locate him. But Larry may have some subconscious knowledge of subversive activity in the purchasing section. The brainograph will reveal it. Well, we certainly didn't get anything from the other employees. Base Patrol Unit Headquarters, Lowell City, Mars, calling Commander Corey and Surface Car 294. This is Commander Corey. Go ahead. Agent L-47 has just reported that Larry McRae has left his brother's office and is headed down Lowell Freeway toward the spaceport. Do you have McRae's vehicle number? Yes, Commander. LP-145H92. Uh, I've just been handed a new report. McRae's surface car has taken lane 7 on the Civic Center, Cloverly. That would take him west of the spaceport. Dispatcher... Inform Agent L-47 that I'll follow through personally on McCray. Relieve all other agents on McCray case until further notice. Hurry out. Turn off the ramp to the next cutoff, Happy, and it'll take us into lane 7 south of the Cloverleaf. I've sighted Larry McCray's surface car, Hap, through the space binoculars. It's the blue one, a quarter of a mile ahead of us. Oh, Oh, yeah, the one turning off the main lane? Yes. It leads to an industrial plant of some kind, a very small one. Our friend Larry McRae could be running an errand for his brother. Okay, Happy, follow him into the plant yard. Well, let's go, Happy. I just went inside the building. Yes, sir. Well, this plant doesn't seem to be in operation, Commander. One of Carlisle McRae's properties, all right. McRae's synthetic, the sign says. Well, I thought he was chiefly in the junk business. Only in a very general sense. Well, he's not in this room. He's gone through toward the rear of the building. Larry McRae? Uh, yes. 
I'm Commander Corey. What do you want with me? Mr. McCray, a file drawer full of documents has been destroyed at the purchasing commission offices back on Terra. I, uh, I don't know anything about it, Commander. Your department head, Mr. Hall, told us you'd left Terra before the sabotage occurred, but we'd like to give you a brainograph test. What for? Uh, if you don't think I had anything to do with it, all the other employees have taken the test. There's a possibility that subconsciously you might have a slight clue that would point to the guilty party. Uh, what if I refuse to take the test? If you're innocent, why should you refuse? But in a case of this kind, I'm afraid you don't have any choice, McCray. Oh, yes, I do. Commander, he's got a ray gun. I'll take that gun, McCray. You need some help, Commander? No, oh, thanks, Pappy. <clears throat> oh, what a spot, Commander. I'd say that McCray had a lot more to do with those destroyed documents than Hall thought. Yeah, I remember what you said in Hall's office about the sabotage being used to cover up a thing. Looks like you sure were on the right vector with that one, sir. Keep an eye on him, Happy. I'm going to phone Space Patrol headquarters here in the city and arrange for them to take Larry back to Terra right away. I'll watch him, sir. Oh, oh. You'll be okay, Larry. Uh, you can get up if you want to, but don't try anything. Look, get this straight. I didn't destroy any documents. Yeah? Then you were a chump for pulling that gun on the commander. You sure look guilty now. I'm being framed. Donald Hall is, is trying to put the blame on me to cover up for his own mistake. That's it. What does that mean? Who else is in this building? Nobody. Sounded like a door. Who's there? It's me. Oh. All right, Liz. Go out the other door. Who Quick are you? Where, where the mask? It would be inconvenient if I were recognized. I know my brother sent you. Yes. All I got a tip that the space patrol was on its way here. Get ready to run when I break this bottle. What is it? A very powerful gas. A few whips of this and the cadet will be taken care of for good. Uh, hurry up, come here. Stand back. Come on, Larry, let's go. <coughs> Commander... We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a moment. Here's a secret Buzz Corey wants you to know about. The secret of how space patrollers get a lit roaring start in the morning. Here's what they do. They eat a breakfast that supercharges them. A power breakfast with one of the three checkerboard super cereals, rice check, sweet check, and instant Ralston. Check. They're the super cereals with that modern bite-sized design. The cereals with a swell new taste that you'll like right off the reel. Now, to warm up your motor, there's Instant Ralston, the hot super cereal. Has a heart of wheat flavor you'll really go for. So now you know how space patrollers get that rip-roaring morning start. Gang, get a flying start yourself every morning. Sit down to a nourishing breakfast with a checkerboard super cereal and get supercharged. Rice check, wheat check, and good hot Ralston. They're the super cereals that help to supercharge you. Larry McRae, an employee of the United Planets Purchasing Commission, has waylaid his office manager and stolen some secret documents. The minor executive, Donald Hall, has not reported the theft, but has told Commander Corey an entire drawer full of documents has been destroyed by acid. When Buzz Corey and Cadet Happy stopped Larry McRae for routine questioning, he resisted arrest and was knocked out by the commander. But while Happy was guarding Larry, a mysterious masked man attacked the cadet and after bursting a bottle of poisonous chemicals, helped Larry McCray escape. Right now, Happy is lying on the floor, nearly overcome by the deadly fumes. Commander. Okay, Happy, bring McCray up. Happy! <laughs> Commander, don't try to talk now. Wait till we hit the fresh air. <laughs> Take a few deep breaths before you try to talk. 
Well, what happened in there? How did Larry get away? Somebody shocked me. I think he was wearing a mask. And then that gas started burning my lungs. Somebody must have been tipped off that we were after Larry in the play. I think I can stand up now. Good. We'll broadcast an alarm for Larry. Then we'll have a talk with his brother. I don't know who you are, but thanks for the help. Just keep driving. And don't look around toward the back seat. I'm keeping my head down so no one will see this map. Hey, did my brother give you any new instructions about what I'm supposed to do? I, uh, what did he tell you before? To take one of his spaceships to a place on Venus, the Zarkran Mountains. You know, the hunting lives near Lake Nazar. Oh, yes. You go ahead and do that, just as your brother said. Oh, fine. Sure lucky you rescued Mason Corey. The brainograph test would show right off that I slugged Hall in his apartment and stole the documents. You? Slugged Donald Hall? Didn't Carlisle tell you that part? Hey, maybe I'm speaking out of turn. I thought you knew. Uh, yes, I know. I know the whole thing. Larry dug down the side street and into an alley. I'm getting out. I get it. You don't want anybody to see you when you remove that map. Sure. Can't take any chances. You. I want you to return a favor I just did you and your brother. Uh, what do you mean? I just rescued Larry McRae from Commander Corey and the cadet. You aren't referring to a phone call tip-off by any chance? Something else, too. Larry was under arrest when I interfered. Uh-huh. And what favor do you want? The documents Larry stole from a certain Donald Hall. Are you crazy? Why, those are worth a fortune to me. They're worth more to me. My good reputation. I don't get it. Who are you? I am Donald Hall. What? Then this yarn you told the space patrol about a lot of documents being destroyed. Yes, it was just merely to cover up the loss of papers your brother took from me. I had no idea he was the guilty party until a few minutes ago. Now, Hall, I'm sure we can work out a deal together. Give me those documents. You wouldn't use that gun, Hall. I didn't hesitate to get rid of a space patrol cadet. Why would I hesitate to eliminate a character like you? Now get the papers. All right, Hall. They're locked in this cabinet. No tricky stuff, you know. No, don't worry. Hurry. I-, I haven't much time. They're right in here. By the way, my brother must have been surprised when you appeared to rescue him. He didn't know who it was. I wore a mask. A mask? Yes, this one. Uh, not taking any chances, are you? The papers, if you please. Uh, sure. Well, here they are. Thanks. Uh, yeah. yes, these are the ones, all right. Now, you read a little script. I warn you. <laughs> Try to add parts to the radio. Now I'm going to win it and really take care of it. Who's there? Thanks, Mr. Paul. Oh, come in. Mr. Gray, I'm Commander Corey. This is Cadet Hatter. Yes, Commander. Oh, look at his head. What happened? Uh, uh, nothing. Just the fall, but very clumsy. Seems to be a lot of clumsiness lately. You didn't get that many dizzy from one fall. Who did it? As I tell you, I fell on I get dizzy spells. All right. I'll get you away. We came here to find out where your brother was headed after he left that chemical plant of yours near the spaceport. My brother? I, I haven't the slightest idea. Did he come back here? I told you. I, I don't know. Commander, look at this. I found it on the floor. Oh, man. Are you aware this at work, Carla? It's a dust rag. A dust rag with eye holes. Hand it here, Hanson. Yes, sir. It has a strange, pungent odor, very powerful and unpleasant smell in there. Ooh, that's the same smell as that chemical back there where I got slugged. Exactly. Carlisle, either you rescued your brother or the man who did came here afterward and dropped that mask. Probably in a fight with you. I don't know anything about it. Uh, the mask, I mean. All right, Carlisle. You don't want to press charges against the man who attacked you? That's your affair. Come on, Happy. Yes, sir. Sorry to have bothered you, Mr. McRae. Goodbye, Corey. I could, on suspicion. Did you notice that open file cabinet with the papers disarranged? Yes, sir. Whoever dropped that mask could have come to Carlisle's office and some papers. Probably the papers Larry stole. Mm, and by the looks of Carlisle, the other guy got him. I think I know who that other guy might be. Huh? Who? While I was talking to Lowell City Space Patrol, I learned that Donald Hall is here on Mars. Oh? 
has seemed to seem to consult a certain doctor. Well, what's our next move? Well, for one thing, we'll just keep an eye on Carlisle and Frey. If he makes a move, we'll follow him. Any reports since I've been out of the office, Happy? Not on Carlisle McRae, sir. He's still at his office, according to the last report from our agent five minutes ago. Space Patrol calling Commander Corey. Corey here, go ahead. Carlisle McRae is preparing to leave Mars, Commander. Our agent at the spaceport reports that McRae's private cruiser is being given a free flight check by his chief engineer. We'll blast off ahead of him and pick him up after he leaves Mars. Corey out. Let's get to our ship, Happy. Pick him up to let him get on his vector. Then we'll trail him. He's setting his ship down about a mile from Lake Nazareth. Carlisle sure picked a good hideout for his brother. If we hadn't trailed him here, we never could have found him. There are two other ships down there, near what looks like a mountain lodge. Two ships? Yes. There's a deep gorge near the lodge with a bridge across it. We'll set our ship down the other side of that hill and sneak up on them across the bridge. Just a minute, Carlisle. Come in. I recognize the ship. Hey, what's wrong? Plenty. What's that other ship doing out there? Oh, that. Uh, I've got a guest. Donald Hall. Of course, sir. Came to my office, got the documents, and marked me out. Where is he? Tied up in the back room. He came here to be sure I'd never be able to expose him in a brainograph test. But um, I managed to get the first blow. And he's got to get rid of Hall. He's as dangerous to us as you are to him. I suggest... Larry, look out the window. Huh? Two space patrolmen. Like that Corey and the cadet. They were smarter than I gave him credit for. Well, what are we going to do? Now, don't get panicky. They're still on the other side of the board. The bridge control. Drop the bridge so they can't get across. Now let me handle it. Wait just a few seconds more. I wonder if they've seen us, Commander. They may have. But this way they won't have as much warning as if they'd landed a ship near the lodge. All right, quickly, across the bridge. Oh, the sure deep gold. At least 300 feet. Commander, the bridge is giving way. Run for the other side. My feet are slipping. I'm going to fall. I've got you, Happy. Grab the railing. Hang on tight. Now I, I'm sure I'd lose my grip. You're lucky you grabbed them. Both for both of them. The bridge is hanging straight down. Climb up the railing hand over hand. Use the braces as a ladder. All right, sir. We're about ten feet from the top. Well, that takes care of them. Yeah. They'll never survive that 300-foot drop to the bottom of the gorge. Neither will Donald Hall. Oh, is that what you're going to do with him? Yes. There isn't time for anything more fancy. Let's get him. Okay. I'll have to get you a new hiding place. Ah, oh, the McCray brother. Corey! That's right. You're both under arrest. We'll see about that. Happy take care of Larry. Get her try this for size, Larry. And now, Carl, let's see how tough you really are. Ooh. 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 Oh, God. That's enough, Corey. I've had enough. Okay. We got Donald Hall here? Yes. This is in the back room. You can see it. I'll do it, sir. Uh, he's here all right, sir. All tied up. Commander, you've got to listen to me. I didn't steal any documents. Honest. I merely took them home to catch up. You could have kept yourself out of the worst jam by telling me that at first. Now there are quite a few counts against you, including freeing of an official prisoner and an attack on the cadet of the space patrol. Hey, you know, Commander, as a cadet, I can say that this is probably the only time I ever heard of anybody getting into trouble by doing too much homework. Ah! <laughs> An exciting preview of next week's thrilling Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. But first, gang, this is Captain Dick Tufeld. And Captain Jack Nard. And we're going to tell you once again how to get a pair of those wonderful new Space Patrol Space Binoculars that you can see way off in the distance with. A pair of space binoculars exactly like Commander Corey uses. Now, you don't hold them in your hand. You wear them on your head like outer space headgear. You'll look like a boy or girl from Mars because 
space binoculars stand out from your eyes a full three and one half inches. Yes, sir, space binoculars are not just little goggles made out of flimsy celluloid. And they're not just a little mask made out of cardboard. Space binoculars are big, full-size, four-power binoculars. Five inches wide, five inches long, made out of solid black plastic with a bright red leather-like trimming. Remember, they make objects blocks and blocks away look clearer and closer, four times closer. You can watch airplanes in the sky, study birds in the trees, watch squirrels at close range, watch your dad coming home from work, and do hundreds and hundreds of other things with them all year long. Absolutely the greatest value ever offered on Space Patrol. But we can only offer it for a limited time. Now, here's how to get a pair. Buy a box of instant Ralston. Then, with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and an instant Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. Gang, if you don't think your binoculars are top, return them and we'll return your money. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. <laughs> And now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. Two criminals are holding Tonga in the sub-cellar of a Venus skyscraper. As Buzz and Happy advance toward the men, they pass a large ventilating tunnel covered with a metal screen. One of the men throws a switch, and behind the screen, the blades of a giant fan start to whirl. They turn the ventilator fan on, rush them, Happy. I can't stay on my feet. Keep away from the grating. Move. The air blast pulled me against the grating. Got me too. Try to pull loose, Happy. The wind's too strong. Commander, the grating is sliding up. Pull, Happy. Pull hard. If you don't get out of this tunnel, you'll be pulled into the fan. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Top Secret D-Ray. When we check, life check, and good hot Wilson again present Space Patrol. <laughs> Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmerer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Ken Mayer, Norman Jolly, and Bela Kovac. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Check, Rice Check, and Good Hot Wilson again present the new exciting Space Patrol! And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol program on your local ABC TV station. Consult your newspaper for time and channel. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston present Space Patrol! <laughs> High adventure and the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol. In today's transcribed adventure, two criminals are holding Tonga in the subcellar of a Venus skyscraper. As Buzz and Happy advance toward the men, they pass a large ventilating tunnel covered with a metal screen. One of the men throws a switch, and behind the screen, the blades of a giant fan start to whirl. They've turned the ventilator fan on. Rush them, Happy. Yes, sir. I can't stay on my feet. Keep away from the grating. I, I, I can't move. The air suction pulled me against the grating. It's got me, too. Try to pull loose, Happy. The wind's too strong. Commander, the grating is sliding up. Pull, Happy. Pull hard. If you don't get out of this tunnel, we'll be pulled into the fan. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Top Secret D-Ray. Boy, oh boy, gang, here's something I'll bet you just never dreamed you could own. I mean a pair of those amazing new Space Patrol space binoculars. A pair just like the commander uses himself. Now, you know how he can look way off in the distance with his space binoculars? Well, kids, you can do the same with yours. You can read signs blocks and blocks away, watch far-off traffic, study birds in high trees, and do lots and lots of other things with your space binoculars all year long. 
Now, these are not flimsy goggles or a mask. These are great big plastic space binoculars that stand out from your eyes a full three and a half inches. Why, you don't even have to use your hands when you're looking through space binoculars. They have a strong elastic band that holds them snugly to your eyes. It's swell for playing space patrol because then your hands are free to drive your rocket ship or to hold your cosmic smoke gun. Now, remember... These are real, fixed-focus, four-power binoculars with four pure Lucite lenses. Real binoculars, five inches long, five inches wide. The greatest offer we've ever made on Space Patrol. But, gang, the offer soon ends, so don't miss out. Send for your Space Binoculars today. Just buy a box of Instant Ralston. Then, with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and an Instant Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. If you don't agree that your binoculars are tops, send them back and we'll return your money. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. Commander Corey and Cadet Happy have just blasted off from Terra and have set their vector for the lunar fleet base on the Earth's moon. One of the busiest spaceports in the solar system, the fleet base is also the center of scientific research into the development of space flight. For the past week, it's been open house at the base, with guided tours for throngs of visitors from Earth and many of the other planets. Tonga has been assigned to special duty at the base to see that security regulations are observed. Buzz and Happy plan to spend two days at this moon spaceport and then bring Tonga back to Terra. Mind if I tell you something, sir? What, Happy? Well, I didn't say anything one way or the other, but... Well, I'm certainly glad I wasn't assigned to duty at the fleet base this week. Somehow I get the impression that you don't exactly care for the idea of herding tourists around. Oh, it might have been fun for a couple of days, but gee, a whole week. Why, I'd rather fly through the meteor belt in a bird cage. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. Just the same, Visitors Week at the Lunar Base has been fine for public relations. You'd be surprised at the number of people who are on the moon this week who've never made a space flight before. Tonga, Lunar Fleet Base, calling Commander Corey aboard Terra 5. Tonga, calling Commander Corey aboard Terra 5. Corey here. Go ahead, Tonga. Commander, I have an emergency message. I'm cutting to scramble circuit code 5. All right, Tonga. I'll adjust the receiver. Code 5 circuit cut in. Go ahead. There has been a security leak on the D-Ray project here at the base. The D-Ray project? Yes, Commander. A strip of microfilm containing the basic designs has been taken from the files. Do you have any idea when the theft occurred? Within the last three days. Order the base commander to declare condition red and ground all spaceships. The thief may still be on the base. Condition red is already in effect, Commander. Colonel Jacobson issued the order 20 minutes ago. Good. That film must not be smuggled off the base. Tonga, cut on your tape recorder and take this message. Feed it through the public address system at the spaceport every 10 minutes. Ready, Commander. Uh, here's the message. Attention, everyone, base personnel and visitors. No film of any kind is to be taken from the base until checked by security officers. Film that is cleared will be sealed and returned to passengers after they're permitted to board their ships. Film not surrendered to security officers will be automatically blanked out by cancel ray machines as passengers and luggage pass through the gates. To preserve your personal films, follow these regulations. End of message. I have it recorded, Commander. It will be put on the base PA system immediately. We don't want to keep innocent people on the base longer than necessary, so run the films through inspection as rapidly as full security methods permit. Yes, Commander. Happy and I will arrive at Lunar Fleet Base in approximately three hours. We'll contact you upon arrival. Corey, out. Commander, what is this D-ray project? Mm, the D-ray is a new defense ray. It can make any unfriendly spaceship completely powerless, even at great distances. It neutralizes all electrical fields. Hey, yeah, it would cut off all controls so you couldn't maneuver the ship or fire weapons. You couldn't even use the spacerphone or view scope. Oh, and those are the plans that have been stolen? Yes, and that means that somebody could build a D-ray to use against space patrol ships if they got away. That's why we have to get that microfilm back. Smoking rockets. I want to space a phone Major Robertson and have him transmit the pictures and records of everyone suspected of espionage to the Lunar Fleet Base. Take over the controls, Happy. Yes, sir. And keep it on vector. Yes, sir. Your film has been cleared, sir. It will be returned to you aboard your ship as soon as transportation is available. Next. 
Your name, please? Bob Morgan. You have some film to declare? Yes, ma'am. It's in this can. It's a home movie of my family and some friends. Only a couple of shots of the fleet base. The guide said it was okay to take them. I'll have to run them off, Mr. Morgan. If you'll step into the projection room with me. Sure. You'll probably find them pretty dull. I'm not much good at taking pictures. Now, this is about the last of the shots I made on Venus. That's my wife and our youngest daughter, Susie. Oh, what a cute little girl. Thank you. Oh? Uh, is this what you filmed here in the base? Yeah. Oh. Yes, that's rocket shoot number one. I'd have got a ship blasting off, but I didn't have the camera aim right. Well, that's the end of the reel. I guess you're glad that's over. Unless you know the people involved, home movies are pretty dull, usually. Well, I'm sure you and your family will enjoy these when you get back to, uh, uh Mars, isn't it, Mr. Morgan? Yeah. The films are all right, then? Oh, perfectly. I'll give you a clearance check, and they'll be returned to you aboard the Mars Express. Well, thanks, miss. Hope you find what you're looking for. Ladies and gentlemen, please. We're checking your films as rapidly as we can. Just wait your turn and, and be patient, please. Now, who's next? Is the crowd giving you much trouble, Tonga? Oh, Commander. No, I haven't had any trouble, but the people have had their holiday and they're impatient to get home. The Thief or Thieves must have planned to take the microfilms when we had thousands of visitors on our hands. Can we go somewhere where we can talk? Well, we can use the room next to the projection room. Fine, let's go. Happy will be with us in a few minutes. I have him waiting for some pictures and data Robbie's sending us by viewscope facsimile. Oh, in here, Commander. Any trace of microfilm, Tonga? No. The only microfilm any of the security officers have found is of a regular business record nature. Any indication of blow-ups of microfilm to regular amateur size? None. Wow, what a mob. I thought I'd never get through. Cadet, how much longer do I have to wait? Cadet, why is the Space Patrol interested in pictures of my daughter's wedding? Oh. <laughs> it's understandable, Happy. Got the pictures? Oh, yes, sir. Quite a batch of them. And uh, background data as well. Look through these, Tonga. See if you can recognize any of these people as having been here at the fleet base. All right, Commander. <sighs> Anything in the D-ray films, Commander? Mm, not yet, Happy. Commander, this man looks familiar. I think I've seen him here. Which one? Uh, this one. He had some amateur movies of his family. A reel he'd taken on Venus. Uh, Morgan is his name. Bob Morgan. Very interesting. According to the record, Morgan was picked up on Mars last week. He was suspected of violating security regulations there and released for lack of evidence. Well, there was nothing wrong with his films. Just his wife and daughter Susie and, well, a couple of harmless shots of the base. Yes, but look at this. Morgan was also questioned on Venus with a certain Art Robertson, also released for lack of evidence. Say, Morgan doesn't have any children. In fact, he isn't married. What? Now, why would a man lie about a perfectly harmless amateur film? Tonga, have you got someone who can take over your duties here? Well, Captain Thornson has been working with me. He will assume your duties. You're to blast off for Venus City and try to get a line on Morgan's friend, Art Robertson. Happy and I'll head for Mars to check on Mr. Morgan. As soon as you have any information, relay it to me through Space Patrol Unit Headquarters on Mars. Can't you speed up that projector, Morgan? I'm tired looking at these phony home movies. You're tired of them. I've seen this film a dozen times while I was editing and doctoring it at the fleet base. And I had a look at it again at security. Okay, I'll speed it up. Well, the place where I dubbed in the documents is coming up shortly. You must have done a good job if the assistant security chief passed it. It's lucky I took all that trouble out. Even though we thought we could get off the fleet base before anyone discovered the D-ray plans were gone, it didn't work out that way. Now, what happened? Uh, some eager beaver engineer started his shift three hours early. Now, we're getting close. Watch this, Art. There. I've stopped the film on a frame of the little girl. I don't see anything unusual? No. Neither did security. Watch now. I'll switch to the microfilm lens on the projector. Mm, all I see is a plain white space with a blue border. Now, that's a blow-up of one of the white checks on the girl's skirt. The blue border is made by the adjoining blue squares. You mean one tiny square fills the whole screen? Oh, I still don't see anything. You will. Well, I cut off the regular lamp and turn on the infrared. Jump on Jupiter, the D-ray plans. Right. That's page one. 
Next 20 frames, there are other pages concealed in squares of the girl's skirt. Great job, Morgan. Terrific. Yeah, nearly went nuts. First, I had to project the original microfilm, photograph it in infrared on another microfilm. Then came the tough part. I had to superimpose the plans on the regular size film inside one of those tiny squares. You did a great job, Art, and take the D-ray strip to Venus. Now, will we collect? Yeah. But it'll take me a couple of days to establish contact with the man who pays off. Naturally, he's... Four minutes out of Lowell City, sir. Take over for the landing, Happy. Tonga at Venus City, Space Patrol Headquarters, calling Commander Corey aboard Terra 5. Tonga calling Commander Corey. Corey here, go ahead. I've been checking on Art Robertson, Commander. He got the word earlier than I thought I would. Well, let's have it. He left here for Lowell City about five days ago. Then there's a good chance he came to Mars to meet Morgan. One of our agents at Lowell City has found Morgan's location. Well, stay in Venus City, Tonga. Find out who Robertson's friends are. See if you can run down any definite contacts or connections between Robertson and Morgan. Yes, Commander. Happy and I'll handle things at the Lowell City end. Corey out. Yeah? Mr. Robert Morgan? Oh, why, yes. I'm Commander Corey of the Space Patrol. This is Cadet Happy. We'd like to talk to you. Uh, sure. Come in, gentlemen. After you, sir. Mr. Morgan, you brought back some film from the Lunar Fleet Base, I believe. Yeah, that's right. I have the clearance certificate from your security officer. Like to see it? We'd like to see the film. We want to examine it again. Uh, sure. I have it right here on the table. Thank you. Here, Hap, take care of this. Yes, sir. Anything wrong, Commander? I mean, with the film? I hope not. Oh, by the way, is your wife home? My w oh, she's uh, visiting her sister in Jupiter City. I see. And your daughter Sally is with her, I suppose. Yeah, and Sally's with her. Mr. Morgan, unless I'm mistaken, when our security officer was running the film at the base, you told her your daughter's name was Susie. Why, well, we uh, call her Sally as a sort of a nickname. In our files, Mr. Morgan, you're listed as being single. Well, uh, I'll tell you. Uh, actually, that film belongs to a friend of mine. I thought I could get it through inspection quicker if I acted as though it were mine. I realize now it was foolish and unnecessary. We'll give the reel a very thorough examination at the security lab. You'll hear from us then. Fine, Commander. Say, that's a pretty fancy projector. I was just noticing that, Happy. An expensive professional model, isn't it? Uh, yes, a uh, hobby of mine. Yeah, it's got a lot of extra gadgets on it, too. And they seem to be similar to those in the security lab. Mm -hmm. A turret with several different lenses, including one for a microfilm... And with an infrared attachment. Hey, we could run it off right here. Say, Morgan. I Get him, Robertson. It's a space patrol. Hey, look out, Commander. Oh. Commander. You warned him too late, Cadet. Oh. He got here just in time. Get the film. What do we do with Corey and the Cadet? We've got to get him out of here. We'll have to take him to Venus with us. Maybe on the way we'll finish him off without leaving the clue. We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a moment. But in the meantime, here's a quick three-act play. Act one begins with a boy and his mother in a house in a kitchen in the morning. Fill her up, Mom. Rice checks. Now there's a boy who knows what he's talking about. He wants a bowl of delicious rice checks for breakfast. Rice checks, the shredded rice super cereal, spun in that modern bite-sized design. Act two, next morning, same house, same boy. And in the kitchen, he's lifting up that bowl again. Fill her up, Mom. Wheat checks. Yep, today he wants wheat checks. Power packed wheat checks. Swell tasting shredded wheat biscuits in that same modern bite sized design. Third act, third day, same kitchen, same boy. Fill her up, Mom. Instant Ralston. Yes, sir. Today he wants to warm up his motor. So for him, it's Instant Ralston. The cereal with flavor galore. Good hot Ralston. And so ends our play. And gang, here's the moral. For a super breakfast, eat a super cereal. Rice checks. Wheat checks. Good hot Ralston. <laughs> 
Bob Morgan has stolen a set of microfilm plans for the secret D-ray from the lunar fleet base by superimposing them on an innocent-appearing film of regular size. Buzz and Happy, suspicious of Morgan because of discrepancies in his story, found the film containing the defense secret. But before they could examine it, Morgan's accomplice, Art Robertson, arrived, and the two men overpowered the space patrolman in a fight in a darkened room. Right now, with Buzz and Happy locked in a compartment, Morgan and Robertson are in a spaceship approaching Venus. We aren't going to land in Venus City with Corey and the cadet aboard, are we? No. Now we'll set the ship down at my place on the Turquoise River and get rid of them then. Get the ozone cylinder, hook it up. We'll turn it on just after we land and leave Corey's compartment unlocked. I'll land the ship. Commander, they've landed. I wonder where we are. Listen. They're out in the corridor by the door. Watch your chance. If they open it, we'll jump them. Yes, sir. Leave them in there, Morgan. We'll attend to them when we come back. Okay. Sounds like they're leaving the ship for something. Yeah. Did you hear a click just then? I don't think so, sir. I think one of them was about to open the door when the other one called him away. Try the handle. Right, sir. It's unlocked. Open the door, little. Listen. Hear anything? I thought I heard the hatch close. Let's get out of here. Happy, look out the viewport. There they are. Yeah, heading for that little building. By the looks of the landscape, we must be on Venus. And if I'm not mistaken, there's the Turquoise River. It sure looks like it. I wonder what they're up to. I've got our weapons where we could rush them. Yeah, well, maybe we could take them by surprise when they come back. With those D-ray plans at stake, I don't want to risk failure. We'll blast off in their ship and space a phone to Venus City for help. It's a great idea, sir. They can't get very far away, even if they do try to escape. And we can watch them from the air. Come on, let's get to the cockpit. Boy, this, this is really a break. And we needed one. I have an idea that Morgan and Robertson were ready to see that we didn't get out of this. There. All secured for blast off, sir. And let's go. <laughs> There they go. Yeah, just the way you planned it. How long will it take for that ozone to take effect? Ah, oh, just a couple of minutes. After a few lungfuls of that contaminated oxygen, they'll get sick and dizzy. Before they can land, they'll black out. <laughs> and there'll be a terrible tragedy on the Space Patrol records. <laughs> Where's your submarine? Uh, it's hidden under the wharf on the river. Come on, let's get down to it. We'll maintain this altitude, Happy, and keep circling over them. I can see them in the viewscope, sir. They're heading for the river. Do you see any boat they could escape in? I, uh... uh... What's the matter, Hap? Oh, nothing, sir. My eyes blurred for a minute, that's all. Uh, no. No, there's no boat near the wharf. I'll put that space phone call through now. Commander Corey aboard Private Cruiser VP-784, calling Space Patrol Venus City. Commander Corey aboard Private Cruiser V... What was that number, Hank? Well, it's on the panel, sir. Hey, smoking rockets I can hardly see. Commander Corey calling Space Patrol Venus City. Hey, Commander, the controls. Uh, oh, thanks, Hank. Yeah, I feel sick. Something's wrong with the air in this ship. Happy, quickly. See if you can find a couple of spacesuits. Yes, sir. Hurry. hard to get on. I feel so weak. I'll help you, Happy. There. Now close the face piece. Let's, let's hope the oxygen supply works. Is your suit receiver working, Happy? Yes, sir. I read you. Take several deep breaths. My, my head's clearing already. So is mine. I checked the view scope. Do you see Morgan and Robertson? No, sir. Last I saw of them, they were headed for the wharf. Hey, do you suppose they're swimming across the river? I'll keep watching, Happy. I'll check the air analyzer and see what's wrong. Of course, they might have gone back to the building while we were putting on our suits. Boy, I sure thought I was going out there for a while. No wonder. The ship's air indicator's in the red. A few more breaths and we'd have been finished. Hey, there is a boat down there. It's coming out from under the wharf. It's an odd-looking craft. Hey, now it's gone. It, it sank. Submerged is more accurate. 
A miniature sub. Right. I'm afraid we fell into a trap. They wanted us to blast off on this ship. Have me check the air system to see what they rigged up. I'll notify Venus River Patrol to take soundings up and down the river for that sub. Where are we now? Right where we want to be. Pier 7, Venus City Dock Area. Eight fathoms deep. Safe to surface here? Sure. We come up under Pier 7. There's a ladder that leads up through a trap door into a tool shed. A few minutes from now, we'll be in the streets of Venus City, ready to sell the D-ray plans. Yeah. No one able to trace us. I'll cut the motors now. We're going to the surface. We hit Venus City at just the right time. The streets are deserted. Yeah. Uh, turn left at this corner. We'll walk over to the business section and hail a surface taxi. <gasps> oh. No. Sorry, lady. Why don't you look where you're going? I beg your pardon, but you came around the corner. Yeah, yeah. I... I, I fault. We're sorry. Wait. Wait, you're Bob Morgan. We're in a hurry. Wait. You're under arrest, both of you. We're bumping into you. Don't be stupid. She's from the fleet base, a security officer. That's right. And you have to come with me to headquarters. That's what you think. Let go of me. Put your hand over her mouth so she can't yell. Okay. Oh. Hold still, you. We can't ever spread the news we're in town. Uh, drag her into the alley. Leave her there? No, no. The new building my company is moving to is a block from here. There won't be anybody there this time of night. I'll guard her while you go get a surface car. Surface car? Yeah, so we can haul her to the river. Come on, I'll help you carry her. Where am I now? Told you before, you're in the basement of the Marcab Building, 4th Avenue and Venus Boulevard, Venus City. Ah, here's Morgan. Hey, what took you so long? I had trouble renting a car, but I got one. Come on, let's get her out of here. Okay, Tonga, here we go. All right, Morgan, Robertson. It's Corey and the cadet. Let go of Tonga and get your hands up. Quick, Morgan, down this corridor toward the ventilator intake. Take the girl. Corey won't dare shoot. Let go. Come on. They're getting away, Commander. After them, Happy. Robertson. It's a dead end. Go to the firewall. We'll make a stand there. Come on, you. Commander! We haven't got a chance. With the girl here, we can bargain with Corey. All right, press back into this corner, under the switch box. You might as well give up, you two. Come and get us. Come on, Happy. Are you crazy? We left our ray guns in the sub. Corey will have to pass in front of that big grating. When he does, I'll throw the switch. Well, let to. There's an eight-foot ventilator fan back there. It'll create a vacuum strong enough to pull him right up against the grating. Come Shut up, shut up. Morgan, pull the switch. Watch them, Happy. Yes, sir. Turn that off. Hey, Commander. Commander, I can't, I can't move. Come on I... and get us, Corey. That suction. Now, Corey, I'm going to release the grating. Happy, if we can slump down, maybe we can crawl away from the vent. Commander, the grating is sliding up. We'll be pulled back into the fan. I can still move my arm. I can throw my gun and hit that switch and short it out. Aim straight, Commander. Here goes. <laughs> You did it, sir. A bullseye. Quickly, Happy, rush them. They hit the switch. Morgan, pick up that ray gun. No, you don't. Get away from it, Morgan. All right, Robertson. No No more. No no more. I've had enough. How about you, Morgan? Uh, Sorry, Commander, but Mr. Morgan is out. Are you all right, Tonga? Yes, Commander. I I guess you heard my miniature spaceophone. Yes, and Robertson's ship. Good thing you had it on. It was lucky Morgan had trouble locating a surface car. All right, Robertson. Where's that film strip? Right here, in my pocket. Hand it over. Happy, see if you can revive our fleet-based tourist, Morgan. Oh, he's not a tourist any longer. Where he's going, he'll be a permanent resident. (laughs) We'll be back with an action preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story in just a moment. Hey, gang, have you sent for your Space Patrol space binoculars yet? Well, you better hurry, because this offer is soon going to end. Now remember, space binoculars are real binoculars. Big, powerful binoculars you can see way off in the distance with. And when I say they're big, when I say they're powerful, I mean it. Space binoculars are five inches long, five inches wide. They're four power binoculars, and that means they make people, cars, buildings, everything else in the distance look four times closer. Now, they're not old-fashioned binoculars that you have to hold in your hand. They're sleek, new, modern plastic binoculars with an elastic band that holds them snugly to your eyes. 
Just think of the fun. You can spot planes in the sky, watch birds and squirrels in the trees, identify cars blocks away, read signs way off in the distance, and do lots and lots of other things with them day and night all year long. Absolutely the greatest value we've ever offered. But don't forget, this offer soon ends. So hurry, send for your official Space Patrol space binoculars today. Just buy a box of Instant Ralston. Then, with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and an Instant Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in the USA and may be withdrawn at any time. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. And now, an exciting preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story. Buzz and Happy have conceived an extremely daring and dangerous plan to surprise two criminals who are holding Carol captive in the Martian hills. Right now, they're nearing the hideout in a small atmosphere ship. We're getting close, sir. Fasten your safety belt, Happy. Here's where we would develop power failure intentionally. I'm all set, sir. Hang on. I'm about to make the worst landing of my career. The ground's coming up awfully fast. You gotta make this look like a disastrous crash. Okay, but it's beginning to look too realistic. Brace yourself. It's beginning to look like a real thing to me, too. We're losing control. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, Crash Landing, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present Space Patrol! Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Norman Jolly, Ken Mayer, Nina Vera, and Stephen Robertson. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol. Be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston present Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Visions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy have conceived an extremely daring and dangerous plan to surprise two criminals who are holding Carol captive in the Martian hills. Right now, they're nearing the hideout in a small atmosphere ship. We're getting close, sir. Fasten your safety belt, Happy. Here's where we intentionally develop power failure. I'm all set, sir. Hang on. I'm about to make the worst landing of my career. That ground's coming up awfully fast, Commander. Got to make this look like a disastrous crash. Okay, but it's beginning to look too realistic. Now brace yourself. It's beginning to look like a real thing to me, too. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, Crash Landing. <laughs> Yes, it's Space Patrol, but first, a direct broadcast from the yard of public school number 10 on the planet Terra. It's recess here, gang, and I've got my eye on a fast-moving boy named Jeff Fisher. Man, is he supercharged. Hey, Jeff, come on over here and tell the gang how you get supercharged every morning. I just do it the way Buzz Corey does it. I ate a good breakfast with a checkerboard super cereal, like Rice Chex. Rice Chex? Say, that Rice Chex is real swell eating, right? I'll say, and it's bite-sized, too. Only bite-sized rice cereal in the universe. Only rice cereal for me, boy. It's plenty keen. You betcha. So, boys and girls, don't you think it's about time you tried Rice Chex? 
Remember, to think fast, to act fast, you have to eat a breakfast that supercharges you. A power breakfast with a checkerboard super cereal. So today, make it Rice Chex, the delicious bite-sized super cereal that helps to supercharge you. For several weeks, Commander Corey and Cadet Happy have been on the planet Venus, conducting an undercover investigation into a plot to defraud the United Planets government and Venus businessmen. Now, in civilian clothes, Buzz and Happy are in a surface car in Venus City, headed for the Venus City spaceport. Between them is a sealed pouch containing the results of their intensive work. There's a private space cruiser waiting for us just inside the east gate. Well, sir, do you think Vio knows that you've been investigating him personally? Uh, I can't be sure, but by using private ships instead of Terra 5 or other official ships, we stand a good chance of not being detected. Well, it sure was a bad break running into Carol last night in the lobby of the Venus Hotel. Well, luckily, I don't think anyone overheard when she called out our names. I looked around very carefully. You told her why we were in civilian clothes. Mm-hmm. She may be able to help us now that she knows the facts. Yeah, it looks like we picked a good time to blast off from Venus, Commander. The whole east end of the spaceport is deserted. We're in luck, Mr. Veal. Corey's car is the only one on the side road. Well, we'll need a lot more luck to get that evidence away from him. That's a break for us that he picked this deserted end of the port. Speed on, Bob. We can pass him before he gets to the gate. And then inside the gate, I make a quick turn, slam on the brakes, and you tumble out of the truck. Yeah. Chances are Corey won't suspect anything. Then he sees that this is a regular space patrol maintenance truck. They're usually in a hurry anyhow. Pour on the power, Bob. Car behind us, sir. They're blinking their lights to pass. By the way, they're closing in. They must be in a hurry. Slow down a little and pull over. Yes, sir. Be on your guard in case they try anything. Wow, that guy drives like a maniac. Did you see him whiz past us? It's a maintenance truck. Yeah, I'll bet the driver's another one of those washed out space pilots. They always drive like they're sore at the universe. Hey, look at him barrel through that gate. Commander, the fool's gonna turn. Abby, stop. Somebody fell out of the truck. Smoking rockets. What a spill. He turned so fast it tossed the other guy out. At least the driver stopped. Come on, Hap, let's see if the man's hurt. Yes, sir. There's no excuse for that kind of driving. It's lucky we weren't going much faster. We might have run over him, Commander. I dropped the Commander, Hap. Oh, oh, sorry, I forgot. Hey, the fall must have knocked him cold. I'll turn him over gently. Okay. He didn't know I was going to turn. I slammed on the brakes just as he pitched out of the truck. Yes, I saw it. His head doesn't seem to be injured. I hope there are no bones broken. Well, let's have a look at him. It's none of my business, friend, but you shouldn't make a turn at that speed. Yes, I, I know. I, I was in a hurry to get to the other end of the uh, spaceport. Uh, my leg. Yeah, just take it easy now. You'll be all right. Now, don't move. Let's have a look at that leg. Yeah. Have a good look. Hey, put down that wrench. <coughs> hey, what do you think you're doing? Grab you're... the cadet, Bill. I got him. Slug him, Henry. Let go of me. <coughs> hurry. Get to the surface car and grab the evidence. Okay. And there is a dispatch case in the seat of the car. That must be it. Take a look in the back, just in case. We went to get all of it. Uh, there's nothing back there, Veal. All right, come on. Let's get to the truck. Look down the road. Here comes another surface car. Uh, it's headed right for the gate. We'd better get the truck rolling before they get here and start asking questions. Oh, we won't stand a chance in that truck. Let's take a spaceship. Huh? Hurry. We can blast off before the car gets here. Happy. Happy. Oh, my head. Happy, our, our car and their truck are still here, but our spaceship is gone. I thought I heard a blast off, but I figured it was inside my head. I heard oh. another car approach, but it didn't come through the gate. It must have turned down the road paralleling the fence. Hey, the evidence, sir. Did they get it? Yes, it's not here. I guess our undercover work wasn't so undercover after all. That must have been Vio, and he and his partner have taken our private cruiser. Well, maybe we can get another ship and blast off after them. First, let's go to local headquarters and spread an alarm. You drive that truck, and I'll take the surface car. Commander, an all-planet space patrol bulletin on Vio is being space phone now. Good. I hope our units can intercept him before he has a chance to change ships. We aren't going to stay here at Venus City headquarters, are we, sir? All right now, there's nothing we can do that the search units can't handle. Besides, I want to investigate this gadget we found in the truck Vio was using. Oh, that funny-looking electrical device. What is it? 
It's a stimutron. A stimu what? Stimutron. It's a high frequency electrotherapy machine used to treat advanced cases of venous fever. Oh, you mean the blood condition that some people get from being in the venous swamps too long? Yes. This machine is the only successful cure. There are only about six stimutrons in the, in the solar system, all in hospitals or clinics. No private individual has one. Well, then what was this one doing in the truck? Stolen, probably. Stolen by someone who needs the treatments and who doesn't dare go to a regular hospital. You mean Vio has venous fever? Or one of his gang. I'm notifying all doctors to report anyone applying for stimutron treatment. Hmm. Well, uh, didn't Vio spend a lot of time around those Zyrola plantations in the swamps uh, arranging crooked deals? Yes. If he's got venous fever, he made a bad bargain when he traded that evidence for the stimutron. Oh, by the way, sir, did you get that message from Carol? Yes, she called two hours ago. I guess she thought we'd be on our way to Mercury by now. But she checked out of the hotel. I just contacted the manager. Checked out? I thought she was going to stay here a week. I guess she suddenly changed her mind. She left orders for the hotel to forward her luggage to Mercury. They don't have any idea where she is. I wonder why she decided to go to Mercury all of a sudden. Well, I hope it isn't her plan to follow us. Well, if it is, she's going to get a surprise when she lands on Mercury and finds out that we aren't there. We'll be on Mars in a couple of hours, Mr. Veal. That was a great idea of yours, taking Corey's space cruiser. Well, I've been checking over this evidence, Corey Catterd. You know, if this ever got to court, I'd be finished. Well, there's nothing to worry about now. All we've got to do is lay low... Henry! Oh, no. What's the matter, Mr. Veal? Oh, the stimulatron. I left it in the truck. Oh. oh, well, there's probably one in Lowell City Clinic on Mars. I can't just walk into the clinic with every space patrolman in the universe looking for me. I got to have those treatments. You know what that Venus fever does to me. Makes me helpless as a baby. Well, what are we going to do? We can't go back to Venus. Of course not. Henry, this is awful. I, uh, listen. What? Uh, I thought I heard the compartment door close back out. Oh, you're just nervous. Relax, Mr. Veal. You'll think of a way to get those treatments. Yeah, sure, sure. I got to. I just got to. Buzz, Happy, I hope you won't be angry with... What are you doing aboard? Well, I... I thought Mr. this Veal, was... Mr. Veal, it's the girl we saw at the hotel talking... Shut up, Henry. All right, miss. What are you doing aboard our ship? Your ship? This is Commander Corey's ship, Mr. Veal. Oh, uh, you know who I am. You have the advantage of me, Miss... Uh, uh, Miss... Carlyle. Carol Carlyle. The Secretary General's daughter. That's right, and I demand you return this ship to Venus immediately. Uh, that's impossible. We can't keep her with us, Mr. Beale. She's dynamite. The smartest thing for us to do is drop her off somewhere and be sure she's safe. Yes, I know. You're right, Henry. But if we do, we're running a good chance of being captured. Why did you have to spoil everything by being aboard? I had some information to give Commander Corey about you, Mr. Vio, and your friend Bob Henry. I was going to tell them where they could find you. Well, your attempt at playing detective has put you in a delicate position, and me in a dangerous one. Can't let anything happen to her, Mr. Vio. I'd say it's worth the risk to see she's returned safely. Wait a minute. Maybe this is a break for us after all. Yeah, some break. We can get this girl off our hands and still have a chance to avoid being captured. Henry... We'll go on to my hideout on Mars. I know how we can contact Corey without the risk of being captured. Commander, communications picked up Carol's voice on spacephone channel 87. What? Yeah, it's being taped, sir. Channel 87. Perfectly the, safe. The... I can't tell you where I am, but Don Veal and Bob Henry intend to release me. That's her, sir. This is Don Veal, Commander. Veal's got her. Don't try to contact me, just listen. I've got Carol Carlisle... But it's her fault, not mine. That's true. I was aboard your private cruiser at Venus City Spaceport. After the ship blasted off, I came out to give you some information about Vio and found him and Bob Henry at the controls. Just keep listening, Corey. Carol's voice and mine are on a microtape, automatically repeated from a robot-controlled rocket. It won't do you any good to locate the rocket. He's a tricky crook, all right. Get this, Corey. I want to get Carol off my hands. All I ask is a break. I've got Venus fever. If I don't get that stimutron back, I'm finished. Here's my proposition. Put a man in a spacesuit and drop him off in space at a point which I will give you in a moment. Withdraw your ship 10,000 DUs and wait two hours. I will pick up the stimutron from your agent and leave Carol near him. Also in a spacesuit, of course. Now get this. Carol's suit will be equipped with a cartridge that can be exploded by an electronic signal from my ship. Why, that space train. Quiet, happy. If any attempt is made by your men to space a phone, you, before the two-hour limit is up, I'll detonate the cartridge. 
Now, here's the point to drop off your men. Write this down, Happy. Yes, sir. Sector 4, Jupiter orbit, at intersection of celestial meridian 22, sun ecliptic angle 2 degrees, 23 minutes, 15.84 seconds. Got it, sir. If you agree to these terms, space phone your answer on 139 megacycles. I'll be listening. Stand by for a repeat of this tape. Be out. Well, cut it, Happy. The tape is on automatic rewind. What are you going to do, Commander? Give him the stimulatron? Of course. I want Vio, but I want him alive. When we get Carol back safely, we can go after Vio with everything we've got. Switch to 139 megacycles, Happy. As I computed, Happy, this is the location Vio specified. I'll reverse rockets and stop the ship. Right, sir. I'll get into my space suit. Now, there's the stimulatron. Well, what about that gadget I'm supposed to attach to Vio's ship? Oh, right here. Well, it's a miniature spacophone transmitter. Uh huh. With a magnetic attachment to hold it to the hull of the ship. It's set to start sending a signal two hours after it's fastened to the ship. All right, into the airlock, Happy. Don't waste your spacesuit transmitter until I contact you. Remember that explosive cartridge in Carol's suit. Commander Corey aboard Terra 5, calling Cadet Happy. Come in, Happy. Happy to Commander Corey. Are the two hours up? Yes. Did B.O. show up? Yes, sir. Everything worked fine. He dropped Carol out quite a distance from me, and I've been using my jetpack to get over to her. Is she all right? I don't know, sir. She hasn't moved. She's just floating. I haven't been able to contact her by space or phone. I'll come and pick both of you up. I've reached her now, sir. I, I... Why, that sneaking crook. What's the matter, Happy? Carol isn't here, Commander. The space suit is empty. We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a moment. Hey, you want to have some fun, gang? Listen to this jet cycle. Why, it's just a putt-putt, that's all it is, because all it has to go on is ordinary fuel. But pour in some super fuel and then see what happens. Wow, that jet cycle is supercharged now. Yes, sir, when it comes to supercharging, there's only one answer, super fuel. And the same thing holds true for you, especially in the morning when you haven't eaten for hours. To really get going, you have to get supercharged. Now, here's Buzz Corey's way of doing that. He eats a power breakfast with rice checks or wheat checks, the super cereals. And boy, oh boy, you ought to see how the commander dives into that checks. Yes, sir, gang, checks are really good. They're so good, you grab the biggest bowl you can find, you shake in the checks, pour on the milk, sprinkle on the sugar, and that's it. You're eating the best tasting cereal in the universe. And to make a good thing even better, rice checks and wheat checks have that modern bite size design for easy eating. Zip, zip, zip. That's how easy it is to eat checks. Now remember, gang, a rip roaring breakfast with checks is Buzz Corey's way of getting supercharged. So get going in the morning the way he does. Get out a big bowl and fill it with rice checks or wheat checks, the super cereals that help to supercharge you. <laughs> Commander Corey and Cadet Happy have followed to the letter the agreement with Don Vio, who promised to return the Secretary General's daughter Carol at a prearranged point in the Jupiter orbit. But instead of Carol, Vio pushed an empty spacesuit out of his ship. The commander has arrived at the scene of the rendezvous, and Happy, now aboard the commander's ship, is removing his spacesuit. That double-crossing, underhanded space rat. Mm, Vio is all of that, but now we've got to help Carol. He must have done something to her, and now he's got the stimulatron. He's also got a miniature spacophone attached to his ship. Hey, that's right. Do you think we can pick up the signal yet? I'll turn on our receiver. Hey, it's working, sir. Now we can track him down. Yes, we've got to be careful. As long as Carol's in his hands, we can't take a chance in closing in on him. <laughs> oh, doggone it. Cosmic ray interference. See if you can filter it out, Happy. Yes, sir. All the times for that to happen. Well, it seems to be getting worse. We'll keep on this vector. Maybe we'll pick up the signal again. I got it, Henry. The steamer from. Oh, good. Any trouble? No, not a bit. Corey and the cadet were as good as their word. Have you found Carol yet? No. Frankly, I haven't looked. If she was stupid enough to crawl out the back room window, let her take the consequences. Uh, don't you understand? If she's not found, we'll have to take the consequences. Oh, all right, Mr. Veal. Come on. We'll look for her. No. You'll look for her. 
I got to hook up the Stimutran and take a treatment. I'm getting an attack of venous fever. The interference is gone, sir. And I've got a fix on the signal. Good. It's coming from the direction of Mars, and the source is stationary. Then Vio has landed. We'll head for Mars and locate the ship. I've got it, sir. The ship's down in the Tharsis Hills. Let's scan the terrain with the viewscope, Happy. Yes, sir. There's the ship. Shall we come in lower, sir? No, not in this ship. We can't let Vio know we've located him. How about notifying other units and swoop in quick and surround him? Remember, for all we know, Carol's still safe. If Vio's cornered, there's no telling what he might do to her. Uh, well, then we're stymied. No, not quite. There's one way we can land a ship fairly close to his hideout without making him suspicious. What's that, sir? Commercial atmosphere ships fly over this part of Mars. So we'll head for Lowell City and borrow one. Well, wouldn't Vio get suspicious if a commercial ship landed in that deserted section? Sure. If it was an ordinary landing... That's why I'm going to space a phone ahead and order a couple of crash suits. Crash suits? Uh-huh. We're going to stage an accident right in V.O.'s front yard. Carol! Miss Carol, I see you. Don't try to get away. Come here. You little fool. Where do you think you're going? I, I thought I could get to a relay station. There isn't one for miles. Besides, you're heading the wrong direction. Now, come back to the shack. And if I refuse? Then I'll carry you back. Why don't you be sensible? When the sun goes down, you'll freeze out here. What was the idea of running away in the first place? Vio was going to return you to Corey. I don't trust him. Well, one thing's certain. You won't survive the night out here in this hill. So you might as well trust us. It's to our advantage now to get you back safely. Well, all right. Well, now you're showing some good sense for a change. Getting close, sir. Yes, we can cut the signal now. Well, fasten your safety belt, Happy. Here's where we develop power failure. I'm all set, sir. I, I guess. You know, Happ, here's where I make the worst landing of my career. Nervous? When I put the shock suit on, I thought I could jump off a skyscraper in it, but now I'm not so sure. Not near that knoll, Happy. 100 yards from B.O. Brace yourself. Here we go. Here we are. Everybody out. A very realistic crash, sir. Are you all right? I guess so. Except I can't move my right foot. It's caught in the wreckage. Does it hurt? No, sir. The padding of the suit protected it. It's just wedged in. Vio or his partner will be running out here very soon. Maybe I can pry that bent Dura alloy apart and get you out before they get here. But why don't we go ahead with our original plan? Leave me here in the ship while you circle around to the shack. Our original plan didn't call for you to be helpless. Well, that'll make it look all the more like a real crack-up. Uh, besides, Carol may be in danger. Well, you may be right, Hap, but you'll be safer if you pretend to be unconscious. Yes, sir. I'll climb out the port. Hey, we did a good job. What a mess. If you're in trouble, use your miniature spacer phone. I'll keep mine on. Here, where are you going? To the shack. Oh, no, you don't. I'll get back to the shack. But somebody might be hurt. We've got to help them. Nobody could be alive in that mess. Well, I'm going to see anyway. Carol, come back here. We've got to get Vio and blast off before the rescue ships arrive. Get Vio if you want. I'm going to help. Carol, come away from that wreck. It might explode. Oh, that poor pilot. I have to get him out. Sorry, right, Phil. Happy. How are you hurt? No, no, I'm okay. The commander and I planned it. Miss Carroll, get away from that wreck. That's Bob Henry, Veal's partner. Pretend you don't know me. Miss Carroll, you don't get away from here. Oh. Pilot's unconscious. Uh, uh, why don't you go get Mr. Veal? Yeah, now, isn't it lucky he was wearing a crash suit? Stand back, Carol. Let me have a look at him. Oh, Corey's friend, the cadet. All right, snap out of it, cadet. Leave him alone. Quit playing possum. I heard you talking to Carol. All right, all right. Quit shaking. I'll get out of the ship. I can't. My foot's caught. Oh, it is. Well, I guess you won't be much trouble. But just to make sure... What are you going to do? Give the cadet an anesthetic. Don't hit him. Oh, oh my hand. That blow never even phased him. It's the shock suit, stupid. And if you come near me, I'll clout you into the next sector of Mars. Now, there's no use bothering with you. Commander's probably around here somewhere. I've got a way to handle both of you. What are you going to do? Plant this cartridge in the wreckage where the cadet can't reach it. No. 
Give me that. Get away. Hey, don't shove her around like that. She'll get worse than shoving around in a minute. There. Now, if I have to detonate that cartridge, cadet... Well, with all these metal fragments and the remaining fuel trickling through the wreckage, there ought to be quite an explosion. Henry, you can't do that. Then it's up to you to see that I don't have to. Come on, Carol. I'll get V.O. and the detonating control. And, Cadet, if Corey's smart, he'll let you stay alive to see us blast off. All right. Go on in, Carol. Hurry up. Yeah, good work. You found her. Did you hear that crash, Vio? Yeah, I saw the ship hit the other side of the knoll. I was going out when I saw you and Carol run over. No survivors, I suppose? Too many. Vio, we've got to get out of here. Corey and the cadets staged that crash. What? The cadets pinned in the wreckage. Corey's probably around somewhere. Come on, then. we got to get to our ship and blast off. Wait a minute. Where's that detonator unit? The one that explodes these cartridges. It's on the shelf. What do you need that for? Let's get out of here. I planted a cartridge in the wreck to take care of Corey and the cadet. Okay, now let's go. We'll have to take Carol with us for protection. Corey will send a flock of patrol ships after us. Come on, Carol, let's go. Take your hands off of me. Let go of her, Vio. Get your hands up. You too, Henry. Oh, boss. Corey, we're blasting off. Put that gun away and step aside. If you don't, I'll fix that cadet of yours for good. Buzz, he means it. Henry put one of those electronic cartridges in the wreckage. And all I've got to do is press this button and transmit a signal that'll blow that wrecked ship to bits. Play it smart, Corey. Give me that gadget, Henry. I warn you, don't come any closer. One more step and your cadets are gone. We'll see. All right, press the button, Henry. All right. Oh, boss. Corey, I didn't think you'd make me do it. Oh, well, it was a wreck anyway. Uh, Happy, I, I thought that you... Carol, stand back. Rush them, Henry. <laughs> Carol, get out of the way. Uh, Henry, get the gun. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> Oh. Have any more ideas, Vio? No. My job. Oh, Buzz, I nearly died when that wreck exploded. I thought that Happy would be blown to bits. I caught a glimpse of Happy through the window. He'd already gotten out of the ship. I couldn't tip you off in front of these two. I pried myself out of the wreck with a hunk of loose metal. Happy, let's get these characters into their ship and take them to Terra. Yes, sir. Come on, Henry, on your feet. Vio, where's that pouch full of evidence you stole from us? They destroyed it, Buzz. They burned it. Yeah, at least we got ahead of you there, Corey. Now you can't convict us of larceny and fraud. That isn't going to help you, Vio. No, compared with what we've got on you now, larceny and fraud are going to sound like flattery. (laughs) (laughs) An exciting preview of next week's thrilling Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. But first... Hi, boys and girls. This is your commander reminding you to send in today for a pair of space binoculars. Send in today because this offer is soon going to end. You see, I don't want you to get left without one of these swell new binoculars. They're an item I want every single one of you to have. I just couldn't get along without my space binoculars. And for you to be a real space patroller, for you to be one of my own gang, you should have a pair of official space patrol space binoculars too. So don't get left out. Send for your space binoculars today. They make everything in the distance look bigger and clearer. You don't even have to hold them. You slip them over your head and a strong elastic band holds them snugly to your eyes. You can study birds in the trees, spot planes in the sky, read faraway signs, see who's coming up the block, and do all kinds of other things with them all year long. Yes, sir, they're the real McCoy. Four power space binoculars exactly like mine. Big plastic binoculars, five inches long and five inches wide. When you wear them, they stand out from your eyes three and a half inches. So you see, they're not flimsy celluloid goggles or a mask. Now, don't get left out. This is the biggest value we've ever offered, and the offer soon ends. Captain Dick Tufeld, tell the gang how to get their space binoculars. Buy a box of Instant Ralston. Then, with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and an Instant Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in the USA and may be withdrawn at any time. Gang, if you don't agree your binoculars are tops, return them and we'll return your money. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. And now, an action preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy have descended into a canyon on Venus to rescue a wounded space pilot. As they reach the injured man, a flash flood roars down the river, piling water up behind the dam above them. we got to get him out of here quickly, Happy. The water's rising fast. Once we get him to the ledge, we shouldn't have any trouble carrying him to the top. 
It's a landslide. Press close to the dam and keep your head down. Smoking rockets. That was close. Hurry. we got to get him up the path. There may be another landslide. Commander, look up there. Most of the ledge is swept away. We're trapped. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Mysterious Meteor, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present Space Patrol! This is Commander Corey congratulating a great organization on its 43rd birthday, the Boy Scouts of America. You're an inspiration to youth, a part of America itself. Space Patrol salutes you, Boy Scouts of America. Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmerer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston, directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Ken Mayer, Virginia Hewitt, Bela Kovach, and Stephen Robertson. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol. And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol program on your local ABC TV station. Consult your paper for time and channel. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston present Space Patrol! <laughs> High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! <laughs> In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy have descended into a canyon on Venus to rescue a wounded space pilot. As they reach the injured man, a flash flood roars down the river, piling water up behind the dam above them. We've got to get him out of here quickly, Happy. The water's rising fast. Once we get him to the ledge, we shouldn't have any trouble carrying him to the top. It's a landslide. Press close to the dam. Keep your head down. And rockets. That was close. Hurry. you got to get him up the pass. There may be another landslide. Commander, look up there. Most of the ledge is swept away. We're trapped. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Mysterious Meteor. Do you hear that, gang? That's the Terra Express train trying to get up speed on ordinary fuel. Not very speedy, is it? But now listen to that same train with super fuel in its tank. Yes, sir, that train's really traveling now because it's supercharged with super fuel. And, gang, without a good breakfast, you can't go very fast either. But with super fuel in your tank, you're supercharged. Here's how Buzz Corey gets up ahead of steam in the morning. He has a good breakfast with rice checks or wheat checks, the super cereals that help to supercharge you. For taste, they're terrific. And for size, they're perfect because they both have that modern bite size design. So, gang, get off to a quick start in the morning the way Buzz Corey does. Get supercharged. Just eat a good breakfast with the checkerboard super cereals and get them today in the red and white checkerboard packages. Rice checks, wheat checks. One of the 30th century's greatest achievements has been the transformation of barren desert areas on the planet Earth into rich, fertile farmlands. Buzz Happy and Major Robertson are in one of those regions now, completing inspection of a new spaceport at the Arizona city of New Arcadia, center of a thriving agricultural district. While Robbie is finishing up a few details in the city, Buzz and Happy have taken a surface car for a drive out in the country. Commander, look at that, another meteor. Must be fairly low in the atmosphere. Hey, it must be a whopper, too. Wow, did you see that? It got so hot it exploded. And what a flash. It lit up the whole countryside. Quite a show. I never saw one like that before. Oh, look, 
There's another one. Well, the earth must be passing through a meteor shower. Hey, it looks like it's coming right at us. Well, when this one explodes, it ought to make quite a display. It better explode pretty quick before it hits. Hey, Commander, it, it looks like it's headed right for the city. Commander, it hit. It landed right in New Arcadia. Well, they're pretty deceptive, Happy. It could have struck several miles beyond. We'd better get into town. If it did land there, it'd be a terrible catastrophe. We're getting close, Commander. There's a whole area roped off up there. And yeah, the people are jammed around it. Yeah, we'll have to stop here and get out, Happy. We can't get through the crowd with this surface car. Hey, look. There's Major Robertson. Commander, I'm glad you're here. What happened, Robbie? A meteor landed right in the middle of the park. Anybody hurt? No, by a lucky chance. But a few people got showered with dirt, and a couple of hundred got the scare of their lives. Well, how big is the meteor? Yeah, it's hard to tell. Dug a crater about 20 yards wide. The meteor's way down in the bottom of a deeper pit, glowing and red hot. Well, let's get through this crowd and have a look. Right, Commander. All right, make way, please. Space patrol coming through. What a crowd. <sighs> now there she is. Gee, it looks like a huge red eye. We don't know how large it really is. Part of it's buried by the dirt that fell back into the pit. Look at the size of the crater, Robbie. It's a miracle that landed where it did. A very lucky miracle. Now they're bringing up the uh, Tomo power shovel now. Well, aren't they going to wait until it cools off before they try to pull it out? Professor King wants to encourage her to make some tests. Professor King? Yes, sir. Professor James King, the meteorite expert. Hold that right there. Hold that. That's the professor shouting at the shovel operator. Professor King's been lecturing at the university here. Oh, I recognize him now. I met him a couple of years ago on Mercury. Well, apparently he's seen you. Here he comes. Commander Corey, isn't this most fortunate? Oh, hello, Professor. Yes, it is fortunate. It could have been a terrible calamity. Exactly. If I had followed my usual custom, I would have been home in my study. But something urged me to go for a stroll. And I was only half a block from the park when this green streak roared out of the sky. I was thinking it might have killed someone. Uh, that would have been tragic, of course. But think of it. A rare meteor falling right at my feet, so to speak. Uh, Commander, uh, do I have your permission to test it? Of course. Uh, thank you. I already examined it for radioactivity. How does it test? Well, it's rather high, but not unusually so for an object that has spent millions of years in outer space. It's not dangerous, then? Oh, no, no, except that... Right now, it's rather hot from the friction of the atmosphere. Uh, the shovel operator is going to scoop away some of the dirt so I can check its size. Would you care to watch? Of course, Professor King. Oh, by the way, this is Cadet Happy. How do you do, sir? Oh, glad to know you, Cadet. Uh, your first meteor? Well, not quite. Happy's uh, quite a few experiences with meteors in space. Oh, of course, of course. Now, here comes the first scoop. Get back! The meteor exploded. No, it, it didn't. It, it's still glowing. Yeah, but look at the shovel. I mean, look where it was. That huge scoop is gone. The cables are just hanging there. What could have caused it, Professor? I don't know, Commander. The meteor is hot, but not hot enough to melt a steel shovel. Uh, to say nothing... ...weren't hit by the hot metal. Professor, you'd better leave that meteor alone till we get this crowd cleared away. Uh, yes, Commander, you're right. Robbie, have the local patrol keep everybody out of the park except the professor and men on official duty. Yes, sir. And professor, I suggest mm. you get an endurium scoop on that power shovel. You'd better wait till that meteor cools off a little more. Good suggestions, Commander. I'll follow them. Uh, Robbie, put a guard around the crater. I don't know what we've got here, but this is no ordinary meteor. It's going to be a hot day, Commander. Yes, but it was cool last night. I hope the meteor has lost most of its heat. Oh, I see Professor King is already at the crater. Yeah, with his power shovel and a lot of paraphernalia, it seems. Uh, good morning, Commander. Good morning, Professor. Well, I made a few tests. What did you find out? Uh, the object has cooled considerably, although it's far too hot to touch. Well, I wouldn't advise touching it at all till we know a lot more about it. Well, I managed to make a spectrographic analysis of it. It seems to be of ordinary meteorite composition, uh, chiefly iron and nickel. Uh, the colors show a fair percentage of cobalt, copper, magnesium, and the common gases. 
Did you find anything to account for what happened to the steel scoop? No, no, young man. Uh, there were no unusual elements present. At least, none have shown up. Uh, Commander, I'd like to dig that meteor out and have it shipped to Terra for a thorough test. It might be a pretty heavy load for a spaceship. Oh, I don't think so. I was able to make some magnetic detection tests. There isn't much more of it underground. It should only weigh about uh, 500 pounds. Well, hand me that case, Happy. Before we start that endurium shovel, Professor, let's make a few simple tests. What kind of tests? We saw what happened to that hard steel last night, so I brought a few small samples of different metals. I thought we might toss them down on the meteor and see what would happen. It's an excellent idea. Let's go down into the crater a little farther. Fine. Well, not too close, Happy. We can hit it from here. Yes, sir. Now, here's a piece of steel. Try that first. Right, Commander. I hope my aim is good. It's gone. Vanished. Why, that fragment disintegrated. Yes. From here, it looks like it chipped a piece out of the meteorite. What'll we try next? Here's a lump of nickel, Happy. Okay. Smoking rockets, that's gone, too. Incredible. Well, Commander, if it destroys everything that touches it, well, why doesn't it just sink into the ground? Apparently, it doesn't disintegrate soil. Now, try this piece of endurium. All right, sir. Hey, nothing happened. The endurium is just lying there on top of the meteor. Well, well, now, now at least we know we can dig the meteor out with an endurium shovel. Yes, but don't forget, if you're going to move that object, it'll have to be packed in an endurium box. That's right. Well, we'll uh, need a box about... Three feet thick on each side, uh, perhaps a little thicker, just to be sure. Good idea. Oh, I can hardly wait to get it to my laboratory on Terra so that expensive tests can be made. Well, you better not try it with any expensive instruments. Mm, it's going to be a difficult object to handle, all right. Professor, we'll leave you now. Happy and I have got to get back to local Space Patrol headquarters and clean up a few details. All right, Commander. Uh, thank you both for your help. I'll have one of my men get a truck and an endurium crate. Professor... I'd like to see you at Space Patrol headquarters before you blast off. Commander. Come in, Professor. Oh, I'll get you a chair, Professor Cage. Uh, I hope I'm not interrupting anything. No, not at all. Won't you sit down? Have any trouble with your metal-eating monster? No, it's packed in an endurium crate with another ordinary crate around that. And it is now at the new Arcadia spaceport. So you're ready to go to Terra and solve the mystery? Commander, I think I have already solved it. Well, do you know what makes it destroy steel and nickel? Well, that meteorite will destroy any substance that it contains within itself. But how? Other meteors don't do that. Well, Dr. Rawlins and I have come to the same conclusion. We believe this meteor is... Matter in reverse. Matter in reverse? Yes. Uh, matter entirely foreign to our part of the universe. It may have come originally from a galaxy millions of light years away, where matter is formed in an entirely different way. But you said it appears to be iron and nickel and other substances with which we're familiar. Yes, uh, that's how it appears. But the atomic structure of each element is, is in exact reverse. Matter in our solar system has atoms with negatively charged electrons whirling around a positive nucleus. And this meteor has a negative nucleus with positive electrons. Exactly. For years, scientists have speculated about the possibility of such matter. Now we know it exists. Perhaps whole galaxies are made of it. But I still don't see why it destroys other metals. Well, that's only half of the story, Cadet. Part of the meteor is destroyed, too. In another form of atomic explosion, the two forms of matter cancel each other out. They neutralize each other. Precisely. Atom for atom. Uh, Commander, if we can learn to duplicate that process, we're on the threshold of a new era. Excuse me, Commander. Oh, Major Robertson. Uh, yes, Robbie? I'm glad the professor's here, sir. There's been a mix-up at the spaceport. That meteor was put aboard the wrong spaceship. What? Well, there's nothing to be upset about. Freight dispatcher traced it. It's aboard a cargo ship carrying mining equipment to Venus. Hey, Commander, we have to overtake that ship. I know, Professor. Robbie, if that meteor should come in contact with a large body of iron or steel, such as a building, it would cause an explosion that would kill or injure everyone around it. 
We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a moment. Gang, here's the story of a cosmic surface car in trouble. Listen. The trouble, it's got nothing to go on but ordinary fuel. But you hear that? The driver's filling up the tank with some super fuel. Something's going to happen now. Boy, that cosmic surface car is really roaring. That's because it's supercharged with super fuel. And the same is true with you, gang. What happens when you don't have a good breakfast? You're just a putt-putt. But when you fill up your tank with super fuel, man, you're supercharged. Here's how Buzz Corey does it. He eats a good breakfast with a checkerboard super cereal, rice checks or wheat checks. Wait till you taste them, gang. Boy, are they good. Flavor galore in every crisp, bite-sized biscuit. So, gang, get going. Eat a good super cereal breakfast and get supercharged. Get the super cereals today, rice checks. Wheat checks. While Buzz, Happy, and Major Robertson were in Arizona on the planet Earth, a strange meteor hurtled out of the sky and buried itself in a city park. Attempts to dig it up resulted in steel digging tools being disintegrated in a blinding flash. So far, only the metal endurium has resisted the strange destructive force. It's now believed that the meteor is composed of matter with reversed electrical charges, matter from outer space that can destroy matter as it's known in our solar system. By mistake, the endurium crate containing the meteor was put aboard the wrong ship. Right now, Buzz and Happy are aboard the Terra 5, racing to overtake the cargo ship carrying mining equipment and the strange meteor to Venus. Happy, keep the freighter in the view scope. Yes, Commander. Hey, if he's headed for Venus City, he's losing altitude pretty fast. That's been worrying me, Happy. I'll contact him again by space phone. Menacori aboard Terra 5 calling cargo ship EC-349. Menacori to pilot Bill Craig aboard cargo ship EC-349. Craig here. Go ahead, Commander. I was just wondering why you're coming in so low. I wanted to tell you, but I've been too busy to call, Commander. I'm sure you know your business, but those Torlock Mountains aren't exactly anthills. You bet they aren't. Believe me, I'd enjoy being about three miles higher. Having trouble with your ship? Uh, yes, sir. I came into Venus atmosphere on automatic trajectory control, and the control's out of adjustment. Looks like I'm going to have to set down outside the city somewhere on repel array. You don't sound very worried. Should I be? Well, you know your ship. Commander, exactly what am I carrying aboard this ship? Why is everything so mysterious? I'll explain it later, Craig. I wish somebody would. All space control told me is that something was put aboard my ship by mistake you'd meet me at Venus City Spaceport and supervise its removal. We didn't want to cause you any undue alarm. The fact is, you've got something very dangerous aboard. Explosives? <laughs> Don't worry, I've hauled some pretty ticklish stuff in my day. You've never hauled anything quite like what you have aboard now. Everything will be all right if you just set her down easy. Okay, Commander. Now look, uh, right now I don't think I can get above that Torlock range. If I can get any power out of the rockets, I'll deflect a few degrees and head up the canyon. Wow, he must be in a spot. Do you have any rocket control at all? A little. Enough to maneuver between those mountains. All right, Craig. Good luck. We'll be watching. Corey out. I hope he can reach a broad level space to set her down. I hope he does, too, Hap. Keep an eye on him through the viewscope. Yes, sir. Sir, why didn't you tell him he was hauling a wild meteor? No sense wasting time explaining. He knows he has a problem. Yeah, I guess you're right, sir. He made it, Commander. Yeah, he's headed up the canyon. I guess he's okay now. Let's hope so. Dropped way down, sir. He's losing altitude. Corey aboard Terra 5, calling Bill Craig. Craig here, go ahead. How are you doing? The canyon widens out into a valley beyond Crescent Dam. I think I'll be okay when I pass there. All right, Craig. When you find a good spot, ease her down carefully. Right, sir. Craig on. Well, he's pretty cool about it, I'll say that. He's a skilled spaceman, Happy. He's going to need all the skill he's got. the dam up ahead. He's getting awfully close to that canyon wall. Yeah. He isn't going to clear the dam by more than a few... He... He hit the side of the hill. His ship's skimming along that shoulder. If it'll only hold together. Smoking rockets, Commander. I can't look. 
Did he hit the dam? Not quite. It's a bad crack up. It broke the hull open. It's hanging over a rock halfway down the side of the canyon. At least the meteor didn't explode. The seal on the endurium crate must have held fast. We'll set the ship down on that flat stretch on the other side of the dam and get to Craig as quickly as possible. Looks at that sky, there's an ammonia storm brewing. I hope it holds off until we get Craig. Hey, this climbing is no cinch, Commander. This terrain is rough. Well, a few more feet and we'll be even with the top of the dam. See anything yet, sir? I can see part of the wreckage from here, but no sign of Craig. Come on, Hap, we've got to hurry. I feel that wind. Wow, that storm is roaring down the canyon a mile a minute. You better work fast, Happy. <sighs> Commander, look. Some of the cargo spilled out of the ship and rolled down into the water. Yes. A lot of the crates have smashed open. Hey, I hope the meteor didn't roll into the water. That looks bad. The hull is smashed right near the pilot's compartment. I hope Craig is all right. Let's work our way down into the ship. Commander, look. Isn't that a man down there at the edge of the water? It's Craig. He must have been tossed out of the ship. He sees us. He's waving. Nah, he's hurt. Come on, hurry. Watch your step. It's steep through here. Happy, there's a ledge that slopes right down to the dam. A couple of crates stopped there. Sir, it, it, it leads right up to that ladder on the dam near the gate. Well, let's head for it. Sure lucky we trailed Craig into Venus instead of going on ahead to meet him at Venus City. All right. Hey, look at that water level. There must be a flash flood up the canyon. Smoke and rockets. Nearly up to where Craig's lying. It's rising fast. You've got to get him out of there. Now take it easy climbing over that endurium crate, Happy. That's the meteor. Hey, the seal's broken. The meteor's part way out of the crate. Ah, we're in luck. Fortunately, none of those pieces of machinery came in contact with it. All right, let's climb down the face of the dam. Watch that ladder. It's going to be slippery. Have you out of here in a few minutes, Craig? Here, Happy, help me lift him to his feet. It's my right leg. I didn't mind the ship crashing, but bouncing down the mountain like a rubber ball was pretty rough. Can you put any weight on that leg, Craig? I'll try. I think I can make it. Oh, I put your arms over our shoulders. Rest most of your weight on us. How do we get him up over the dam, sir? Well, the tough part will be the ladder. From there on, we can work back up the ledge and zigzag to the top. Yeah, I figure I can make it with a boost now and then. All right. Start up the ladder. Okay. Uh, it's okay. I can make it. Look at that water. It's rising fast. A landslide. Press close to the dam. Keep your head down. Smoking rockets. That was close. Look at that. If you men hadn't come for me, I'd be buried under several tons of dirt right now. Let's get out of here. There could be another landslide. Commander, look up there. How are we going to get out? The landslide has swept away most of the ledge. He's right. We can get as high as a sluice gate, but from then on, it's sheer wall. Let's get up to what's left of the ledge. We'll be out of the water at least. All right, Craig, get on the ledge. Okay. All clear. Uh, go ahead, Happy. Uh, uh, all right, sir. Here, I'll give you a hand. Thanks. Uh, gee, look at the water now. It's halfway up the ladder. Yeah, and look back up the canyon. It's streaming down at big waves. Commander, do you think it'll come as high as the ledge? Look at the watermark of previous floods. It comes this high because of the sluice gate. Wow. Even if the water doesn't come over the ledge... We're stuck here. If that sluice gate were only open, I could go through the spillway to the other side of the dam. There's a ladder on that side, too. I saw it coming up. How can we get it open? Well, we can't. The control machinery is at the top of the dam. It's operated by remote control from a station far down the valley. Say, maybe they'll open the gate. Uh, by that time, it won't do us any good. See that line painted ten feet over the gate? The water has to reach that level before the flood warning sounds. He's right, Happy. Looks like I... Led you fellows into a trap. I'd only managed to get the ship over the dam. Oh, it isn't your fault, Craig. Well, I suppose we might as well sit down on the crates and relax. I'd be careful of my feet if I were you, Craig. Don't let the metal in your boot buckles hit that meteor. 
Meteor? What are you talking about? There's a meteor in that crate. That's what we were worried about. If certain metals touch it, they explode. Craig, get off that crate. Huh? But quickly, Happy. Give me a hand with that meteor. What do you mean, sir? Let's get this meteor rolling down the slope of the ledge. Into the water? No, toward the dam. If it gets up enough speed, it might crash into that sluice gate. Sure, but we'll be going fast enough to knock that gate out. Well, no, sir. We... Hey, Commander, that gate is solid steel. Exactly. Hey, solid steel, like the first power shovel scoop. Okay, Commander, I get it. Craig, get over behind that other crate. If this works, it's going to be quite an explosion. Uh, careful, Happy. Remove your cadet ring. Yes, sir. It'll be a pretty painful way to find if the meteor has platinum in it. Hey, this, this thing is sure hard to move. After we get it rolling, it won't be so bad. At least it's lighter here on Venus than it was on Earth. Watch your feet. And we've got it rolling, sir. Uh, quickly now. Get behind the endurium crate. Hope it doesn't wobble off into the water. Craig, keep your head down. Commander, it worked. There's a great big hole in the sluice gate. Come on, let's get off this ledge into the spillway. Yeah, let's get through before the water does. Hey, Commander... Can you see through the dam to the valley? There's our ship. Now, that's a beautiful sight. Uh, Commander, what about Professor King? What's he going to say? I'm afraid the professor will have to be content with telling another story about the big one that got away. An exciting preview of next week's thrilling Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. But first, gang, here's something that's more fun than anything you ever owned. Something that rates as the biggest value we have ever offered. Something new, different, exciting. I'm speaking of that wonderful new thrill, Space Patrol Space Binoculars. I call it a wonderful new thrill because this amazing piece of Space Patrol equipment makes it possible for you to see houses, buildings, cars, and people way off in the distance. Yes, sir, when you look through your Space Patrol Space Binoculars, you can see what's going on blocks and blocks away. And when you look through your Space Binoculars, you don't even have to hold them. No, sir, they have a strong elastic band that holds them snugly to your eyes. Makes you look like somebody from outer space, because when you wear your binoculars, they stand out from your eyes a full three and a half inches. Now, that's right, I'm not talking about flimsy little goggles or a mask. I'm talking about real, honest-to-goodness, four-power binoculars with four pure lucite lenses. The real McCoy, in other words. Real binoculars. They're made of solid black plastic, and they have a bright red leather-like trimming that makes them look terrific. Overall, space binoculars are five inches wide, five inches long. And boy, oh boy, the fun you can have with them. You can see who's coming up the street. You can read signs way off in the distance. You can spot planes in the sky. And you can name the kinds of cars you see blocks and blocks away. And hey, when you look through the other end of your space binoculars, they smallify. Yes, sir, they do the opposite. Instead of making far-off things look close, they work the other way around. They make close things look far away. Lots of fun. Now, gang, to get a pair of these space binoculars, a pair exactly like Buzz Corey wears, do this. And, boy, you better do it quick because this offer soon ends. Just buy a box of Instant Ralston. Then, with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and an Instant Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686. St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in the USA and may be withdrawn at any time. Gang, if you don't think your space binoculars are tops, send them back and we'll return your money. The address again, Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. And now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy are on the third moon of Jupiter in their spacesuits, attempting to pull Major Robertson out of a crevice into which he's fallen. Buzz has lowered Happy into the crevice where thousands of beetle-like insects are swarming, impervious to the cold and lack of atmosphere. Lower me a couple more feet, sir. Uh, gone these bugs? That's it, sir. Loop the rope under the Major's arms, Happy. Just a minute, sir. Till I brush off some of these insects. Hey, some of them just won't brush off. They're awful. They're on my suit, too. Yes, and all over the Majors. Hey, Commander! They're eating through our space suits. we got to get the Major out of there and get back to the ship. If these insects puncture our suits, we're finished. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Moon Beetles, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! <laughs>
High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmerer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Norman Jolly, Ken Mayer, and Bela Kovach. Dick Tufeld speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol. Be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston present Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy are on the third moon of Jupiter in their spacesuits. Attempting to pull Major Robertson out of a crevice into which he has fallen. Buzz has lowered Happy into the crevice where thousands of beetle like insects are swarming. Beetles that seem impervious to the cold and lack of atmosphere. Just a couple more feet, sir. That's it, sir. Loop the rope under the Major's arms, Happy. Just a minute, sir. Brush off some of these insects. Some of them just won't brush off, sir. They're awful. They're on my suit, too. They're all over the majors. Hey, Commander, they're eating through our space suits. We've got to get the major out of there and get back to the ship. If these insects puncture our suits, we're finished. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Moon Beetles. <laughs> The hour has struck. Yes, today is the last time we can offer you a pair of those wonderful new space binoculars that you can see way off in the distance with. Big four-power plastic space binoculars. Five inches wide, five inches long. Plenty big and plenty of fun. Gang, you can watch people blocks away, study birds in real tall trees, read signs way off in the distance, spot planes high in the sky, and listen, you wear space binoculars on your head. Yes, sir, a strong, elastic band holds them snugly to your eyes, makes you look like a strange man from Mars, leaves your hands absolutely free. Yes, the hour has struck. Today is the last time we can offer you these terrific new Space Patrol space binoculars. To get a pair exactly like Buzz Corey wears, do this. Buy a box of Instant Ralston. Then, with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and an instant Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in the USA and may be withdrawn at any time. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. And now, today's Space Patrol story, The Moon Beetles. In their space battle cruiser, Terra 5, Buzz and Happy are approaching Jupiter's number two moon to investigate the mysterious failure of equipment in one of the automatic instrument stations. Their viewscope is trained on a surface of a cold, barren, airless satellite as Happy watches for the dome-shaped image of the atmosphere shell to reveal they're nearing the unmanned instrument station. Jupiter's number two moon sure is a desolate place. Nothing but craters and mountains, and more craters and mountains. And they all look the same. I don't even recognize any landmarks. Well, we should have brought Robbie along. He knows most of Jupiter's satellites the way you and I know the Earth's moon. Oh, uh, uh, speaking of Major Robertson, sir, I was a little surprised to find out he was meeting us on Jupiter. Oh? Well, I figured he'd be getting ready for the big day on Terra on the third of the month. Uh, you know, the Interplanetary Medal Award ceremony. I hope we can all be there. We will if we don't run into serious trouble on this instrument failure investigation. But, sir, doesn't the Major have to be there? Uh, 
to receive the award? Well, I was under the impression that the name of the person to receive the Interplanetary Medal was kept secret until the day of the ceremony. What makes you think uh, Robbie's going to get it? Hmm? Well, I, uh, I heard rumors. <laughs> well, personally, I, I'd like to see Major Robertson get it, too. The final decision is up to the award committee. Well, they aren't going to let the news out ahead of time. You know, we're getting close to the incident station, Happy. See those two cone-shaped peaks at the edge of that broad, shallow crater? Yes, sir. The instrument station is right between those peaks. Well, that's funny. What's that, Commander? The small atmosphere shell should be visible now. Maybe the sunlight's hitting it at the wrong angle. Well, it should still show up in the view scope. Happy, the shell's gone. Huh? Switch the space phone receiver to the ultra-high-frequency automatic instrument channel and see if any signals are getting out. Yes, sir. This is the right channel, sir. Some of the instruments are still sending, but I can't understand what happened to that atmosphere dome. Uh, maybe a meteor hit it. Well, if it came in at a tangent, it might break the shell without damaging all the instruments. Get our spacesuits, Happy, while I set the ship down. We'll make an on-the-spot check. <laughs> saying there weren't even any fragments of the atmosphere, sir? That's right, Robbie. The whole thing just disappeared. Mm -hmm. And none of the instruments were physically damaged? No, Doctor. But some of them stopped transmitting because of the cold. It really got us puzzled, Dr. Conrad. What do you think could have happened? Well, Happy, I wouldn't even speculate until a thorough investigation is made. Well, at the moment, Doctor, I feel this is a job for the security section. Robbie, get a lab ship and blast off for moon number two. Yes, sir. Uh, do you want me to go with the Major, Commander? Uh, you'll be needed here in Chargon, Doctor. We've got to evaluate the data from the other moon centers. I'll keep in contact with you from number two moon and give you any information I can gather. Good. Robbie, I'll leave the investigation in your hands. Happy now, I'll go to our temporary quarters and get some rest. I can use a little sleep. I'll call you first thing in the morning, Dr. Conrad. Come on, Happy. Sleep is the next order. Happy. Happy, wake up. Hmm? Oh, Commander, what time is it? Six zero five hours, Universal Star Time. Are you going to sleep all day? Oh, don't be stupid, huh? I plan to be awake before you, sir. <laughs> Say, are you sure it's 6.05? Look at your watch. Yeah, but it's still dark outside. That's why I left the shade up, figuring the sun would wake me yes, up. Yes, I noticed how dark it was. Maybe we're having an eclipse of the sun. They're fairly frequent on Jupiter with 12 moons in the sky. I'm sure I should have thought of that. Uh, have you talked to Dr. Conrad? I phoned his lab, but wasn't able to reach him. <laughs> Maybe he overslept, too. From the sound of things outside, it sounds like the middle of the day. Hmm, come here and look, sir. The streets are full of people. These Chargon citizens must be early risers, <laughs> or else they got up to see the eclipse. The eclipse here wouldn't cause that much excitement. What do you know? The lights are on all over the city. Well, that must be Dr. Conrad. I told the charge of quarters to put the call in here. Corey speaking. Uh, Commander, this is Dr. Conrad. Oh, yes, Doctor. I've already called your lab. I'm not at the laboratory. I'm at the spaceport. Can you come over? Is something wrong? Haven't you noticed the darkness? Yes. The four biggest moons must be eclipsing the sun all at once. This is no eclipse, Commander. The Shergon atmosphere shell is completely covered with insects. Insects? Yes, I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. They're blanketing the entire dome. Billions of them. Space control isn't letting any ship in or out of the space lots. They're afraid the insects will swarm into the city. Doctor, where are you now? I'm in the space portmaster's office. I'll be right over. I'm ready, Commander. And let's go. Well, 
here's the office, Captain. Uh, Commander, I expected you sooner. I was beginning to get worried. We were tied up in traffic, Doctor. People are running around almost in a panic. Well, I can't say I blame them. It's not exactly reassuring to know you're under a roof of billions of living insects. I didn't think Jupiter had that many insects. Where do they all come from? We don't know. One spaceship came through the lodge just at dawn. The pilot said the insects are like a shiny black sea all around the atmosphere dome. I've got a few specimens here, Commander, in these two small plastic boxes. Let's have a look at them. Hundreds of insects were drawn through the space lock when the ship entered. That's why space control closed the port. Look at rockets. Look at the size of them. They must be about two inches long. They seem to be some sort of beetle. I don't recognize them. Well, I showed them to a friend of mine in the communication section, an amateur entomologist. He says he's never seen anything like them before on any planet. Very strange. Entirely new variety of insects appearing by the billions and here on Jupiter, of all places. Mm. Hey, hey, one of the bugs got loose. He's crawling across the desk. Did you take the lid off the box, Captain? No, sir. Look, the lid is still on it. Then how did it get out? Hey, listen, what's that? A warning signal. Yellow alert. Yellow alert. Something must be wrong with the city's atmosphere plan. Happy quickly. Close all the windows airtight. Doctor, cut on the emergency air vents. What could be the matter? That signal means the air outside this building isn't fit to breathe. Check the polaroid windows. All the windows are closed tight, sir. Airtight. Good. Emergency air vent on, Commander. We're all right for the time being. Yes, Doctor, but those people out in the streets, if they don't get inside a building with emergency air supply, they're in trouble. I'll get it. Courtmaster's office. Oh, he isn't here. This is Commander Corey of the Space Patrol. I see. Yes, Captain, your procedure's correct. Right, Corey, out. That was the atmosphere control center. The yellow alert was sounded because the detectors registered a high methane gas content in the air. Methane? You mean, you mean there's a leak in the atmosphere shell? More than a leak, a serious break. What happened? Look at this plastic box, Doctor. Mm-hmm. There is a, a hole in it. Exactly. That beetle ate through the plastic box. And above us, there are billions of insects eating their way through the plastic atmosphere shell. We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a moment. Presenting the mystery of the baffling basketball player. Sometimes this ten-year-old boy would be a sharp shooter. He'd make basket after basket after basket. But then, at other times, ouch, he'd miss shot after shot. And so it went. Sometimes a shooting star, sometimes a falling star. Here was the trouble. This boy was only getting supercharged now and then. On some mornings, he'd have a power breakfast with rice checks or wheat checks, the super cereals that helped us supercharge you. That's when he'd really shoot those baskets. But then, at other times... Well, he'd just eat any old breakfast. And that's when they'd call him Fumbler. So, gang, remember, to be a winner every day, you have to get supercharged every day. In other words, enjoy that rice checks and wheat checks in your cupboard all the time, not just some of the time. Make it a rule to do what Buzz Corey does. Eat a power breakfast with rice checks or wheat checks every single day. The bite-sized super cereals that help to supercharge you. Delicious checks. And now, back to our Space Patrol story, The Moon Beetles. The city of Shargon on the planet Jupiter is periled by a vast swarm of strange insects that completely cover the atmosphere shell. These beetle-like insects are gnawing through the thick plastic of the transparent dome over the city, and now the air is contaminated with the harmful gases that compose Jupiter's atmosphere. Buzz Happy and Dr. William Conrad have rushed to the atmosphere washing plant while Major Robertson, at the commander's order, is at the spaceport, ready to lead an exterminator squadron. Happy and the doctor are standing before the giant motors that force the atmosphere through chemical filters and purifiers, waiting for Buzz to return from the office of the chief air control engineer. Oh, the engineers just cut on another auxiliary motor. Uh That's the last one. The plant's working at full capacity. Yeah, but so are those bugs. Oh, here's the commander. Commander, what did the chief engineer say? Oh, it's a losing battle. You just can't build up enough pressure inside the shell to equal the heavy Jupiter atmosphere pressure on the outside. Unless those insects are stopped, pretty soon big chunks of the dome will fall in on the city. They could plunge right through the roof. 
Do you think that DB-12X insecticide will kill the bugs, Commander? I don't know. And if I give Robbie the order to take the exterminator squadron outside the shell, that insecticide will contaminate the entire city. You mean it's harmful to human beings? Definitely. But don't you think it's worth the risk, Commander? If the dome collapses... Oh, you're right, Doctor. There's no time to waste. We'll broadcast a warning for everyone to keep off the streets and to seal their doors and windows. Then we'll go back to Space Patrol headquarters and I'll tell Robbie to take the squadron up. Commander, the streets have been completely cleared and the Major and the squadron have been spraying the outside of the dome for 20 minutes. The DB-12X ought to be showing some results. If it's going to work, I'll contact Robbie. Men of Corey at Shargon Space Patrol Headquarters calling Major Robertson aboard Space Patrol Cruiser J571. Corey to Major Robertson. Robertson here. Go ahead, Commander. Is it working, Robbie? All eight ships have made ten passes with the insecticide, Commander. The insects are saturated with the stuff, but it doesn't seem to phase them. You've got to find something that's effective and find it quickly. Well, heat might do it. We can get enough ships with atomic flame ejectors and play them over the dome. There aren't any on Jupiter. What about trying ultrasonic vibrations? That's it. That'll do it, Commander. Dr. Conrad. You know of a lab ship here in Chargon that's got an ultrasonic generator in it? No, oh, yes, Commander. There is one at the space force. Good. Robbie, order the squadron to return to base, but you stay aloft. Happy, Dr. Conrad and I will get the lab ship and blast off immediately. Lab ship secured for blast off, Commander. All right, Hap, I'll notify space control. Manicorian Lab Ship X-211 in Area 28, calling Space Control Chargon. Space Control Chargon, go ahead. We're ready for blast off. So you may blast off at will, sir. Space Control out. Stand by to fire rockets, Happy. Standing by, sir. Ready, Doctor? Yes, Commander. Fire rockets. Check on the lock, sir. Reduce power and we'll circle back to the dome. What a sight. The dome is black with those insects. I hope this ultrasonic generator does the trick. I'd hate the idea of going back down through that roof of beetles. Dr. Conrad, will you operate the generator? Of course, Commander. That must be the major ship off on our starboard viewport. Right. Corey aboard lab ship X-211 calling Major Robertson. Robertson here. Go ahead, sir. You're going to make a head-on pass at the dome, Robbie. Good hunting. All right, Doctor. Turn on the generator. I've set it at one million cycles, Commander. That frequency should be fatal to most insects. Give it plenty of power. Yes, Commander. Here we go, right over the dome. Happy, set the viewscope to high magnification. Yes, sir. We'll circle back and make another pass. How's the viewscope setting, sir? Fine. You can see the insects quite clearly. Mm, they don't seem to be affected by the vibration. Uh, shall I increase the frequency? Oh, wait. Look, they're dropping off the dome. Hey, they sure are. Sliding off by the thousands. It's working, Commander. The sides of the dome are nearly clear. Would you look at that? They're sliding off like... like a black avalanche. We'll make a couple more passes just to make sure we've got them all. Look at how they're heaping up around the base of the atmosphere shell. It's going to be some job clearing them away. The first problem is to get a crew to work sealing up those holes in the dome. Commander, this is Robbie. Yes, Robbie? More trouble. I just got word that there's a plague of those beetles in moon number three. They've attacked the small atmosphere shell over the research station. That could disrupt the entire interplanetary communication system, to say nothing of ruining all space flight aid stations. Hey, we'd better get out there with the ultrasonic generator. It wouldn't work on that moon, Happy. There's no atmosphere to transmit the high-frequency sound of the insects. They've got to be brought under control. Smoking rockets. Well, there are 100 men on that station. They can't even be evacuated because they can't open the space box. What's wrong with the power unit? Communications picked up automatic signals that indicate a relay didn't work. If somebody could get there, get inside the power unit shell, and flip that switch, the research station would have power restored. But how about the insects? Doctor, the new delta ray, would that destroy the insects? Yes, but it had to be focused so that the rays wouldn't penetrate the shell, or it would destroy the men inside, too. Is there a delta ray here in Chargon? No, the nearest one is in Jupiter City. Robbie, you blast off from moon number three and get that power on. Happy and I'll go to Jupiter City for the Delta Ray and join you on the moon's research station. The 
There's the research station, Happy. We'll cut our speed and circle. I'll get the Delta Ray ready. Now, don't turn it on until I give you the word. Got to be sure of our focusing range. Yes, sir. Wow, look at that dome. Just like the one at Chargon, covered with beetles. Well, there's Robbie's ship near the dome. I wonder if the Major's got the power on yet. I don't think so. We'd be hearing from him. Just look at those insects all around the station. At least they aren't attacking the power unit dome. Major Robertson calling Commander Corey aboard Terra 5. Major Robertson calling Commander Corey. Corey here. Where are you, Robbie? Ah, in a pretty tight spot, Commander. Did you get the Delta Ray? What's the trouble? I was in my spacesuit walking toward the power unit shell when these confounded beetles attacked me, rolled all over me. When I beat them off, I fell into a crevice near the power shell, and I'm wedged in. We'll land and pull you out. I don't want to rush you, but these insects are eating my spacesuit. I managed to brush them off the plastic face piece, but they're all over me. Any minute now, they're going to puncture the suit. We'll set the ship down right away. Happy, get out our space suits and some rope. There he is, Commander. He's really wedged in. Look at those beetles. There are hundreds of them down at the crevice and all over him. Robbie, can you read me? Yeah, yes, yes. We're going to drop your rope. Grab it. Now go ahead, Hap. Catch, Major. All right, hang on. We'll pull you up. It's working. The beetles are dropping off the shell like like flies. Well, this ray works better than the ultrasonic generator. See that, Robbie? Yeah. Really shriveling them up. How's your leg? A little better. Good. As we wipe out the beetles, we'll land and turn the power unit on. Hey, if we can clean this up and blast off for Terra pretty soon, we'll, we'll be able to get the Major back for the Interplanetary Award Ceremony. Funny, I almost forgot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go on up, Major. Uh, the commander's ready to give you the medal. Quiet, Happy. The commander's going to speak. Fellow citizens of the United Planets, it's my privilege and honor as last year's recipient of the Interplanetary Award to present this symbol of courage and service to the current winner. It's a special source of pride to me because the award goes to a member of my own space patrol. Major, the commander's looking this way. He wants you to go up. The choice this year was a difficult one for the committee, and the person chosen by them has declined the honor. 
But, Major, I... I Quiet, Half. The commander's speaking. Yes. The selected candidate, Major Robertson, security chief of the Space Patrol, feels that the interplanetary award should go to the man who risked his own life to save another and thereby help save the lives of a hundred men. So, in a special session, the committee accepted the Major's suggestion. And I shall now present the interplanetary award to a member of the Corps of Cadets, Cadet Happy. Huh? Me? Me? But, but I, 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 I... Go on, Happy. Get up there. Hey, Happy. Happy. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll have to ask Major Robertson to accept the award for Cadet Happy. It seems the courageous winner of the Interplanetary Award has just fainted. An exciting preview of next week's thrilling Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. But first, gang, here it is. Here's the only way to get a pair of Space Patrol space binoculars. Now, all you do is... Uh Uh-oh. Here's a radio ray from Terra. Boys and girls, this is your commander, and I have a message for you that's so important, I've interrupted Dick Tufel. Now, here's my message. Today is positively the last time we can offer you a pair of official space binoculars. This is the greatest offer we've ever made, and it's one item I feel that every one of you should have. All those thousands and thousands of boys and girls now have their space binoculars. I know for a fact that many of you have still not sent in. So don't wait. This is important and vital. Send in today for your Space Patrol space binoculars. This is absolutely the last time we can make this sensational offer. Hurry out. Thank you, Commander. And boys and girls, remember this. These are not flimsy goggles. They are real, full-size, full-field, four-power binoculars made of long-lasting plastic. Real, full-size, full-field, four-power binoculars that make everything in the distance look bigger, closer, clearer. The revolutionary new binoculars you wear on your head. Thrills and fun galore. You can identify buildings way off in the distance, spot planes, study birds, watch far-off traffic, read distant signs, and do lots and lots of other things with your space binoculars all year long. Now, to get a pair, buy a box of Instant Ralston. Then, with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and an Instant Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 6. Eight six, St. Louis, Missouri. If you don't agree your binoculars are tops, return them and we'll return your money. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. And now, an exciting preview of next week's thrilling Space Patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy have just left Terra 5 to enter a damaged spaceship far out beyond the Pluto orbit. They've entered the wrecked ship in their spacesuits to rescue two unconscious men. Around the ship, huge chunks of metal hurtle through space on an unknown orbit. You'll have to carry them, Happy. You take this one, I'll handle the big fellow. Yes, sir. Hey, Commander, the ships are swerving right into that stream of metal fragments. I thought I set the controls to keep pace with them. Uh-huh. Those fragments aren't going in a straight line. They're in a swirling motion like a whirlpool. Hey, Commander! Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Strange Gift of the New Star, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! (laughs) High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space, visions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Ken Mayer and Bela Kovach. Dick Tufeld speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol! Be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol program on your local ABC TV station. Consult your paper for time and channel. 
Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Wheat check, rice check, and good hot Ralston present Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, commander-in-chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy have entered a damaged spaceship far out beyond the Pluto orbit. The rescue, two unconscious men. All around the ship, huge chunks of metal hurtled through space on an unknown orbit. You have to carry them, Happy. You take this one, I'll handle the big fellow. Yes, sir. Commander, the ship is spurring right into the stream of metal fragments. Now, they aren't all going in one direction. They're in a spurling motion like a world. Commander, they're battering the ship to pieces. They're breaking us up. We've got to get into our ship quickly. One of those fragments goes to the ship for a screw. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Strange Gift of the New Star. Captain Dick Tufeld speaking, gang. Speaking to you from an atomic power plant on Mars. Now, they're having trouble getting power, but I think I've found the trouble. Listen to this main power generator. Sounds pretty weak, doesn't it? My guess is this. They've been using ordinary fuel. Let's see what happens when I put in some of this super fuel. Listen to that power now. Supercharging does it. And gang, when you roll out of bed in the morning, you're just like this generator. You need fuel because you haven't had any for about 12 hours. But listen, don't settle for ordinary fuel. Get supercharged like Buzz Corey does with a power breakfast. Eat those super cereals in the checkerboard packages. Rice checks and wheat checks are those super cereals with that modern bite-sized design for easy eating. Delicious and how. Rice Chex is bite-sized shredded rice, and it's triple toasted. Wheat Chex is bite-sized shredded wheat, and it's baked crisper than a cracker. So treat yourself to the same swell-tasting breakfast Buzz Corey enjoys every morning. A power breakfast with Rice Chex or Wheat Chex, the super cereals that help to supercharge you. And now, today's Space Patrol adventure. Few spaceships venture out beyond the orbit of Pluto, the most remote planet in the solar system. As one veteran space pilot put it, only a comet has the time and the fuel to go poking around out there in outer space. But in recent weeks, commercial spaceships on the Neptune to Pluto run have reported a peculiar unidentified object far beyond the Pluto orbit, slowly approaching the space lanes. Commander Corey and Cadet Happy have just finished a routine mission to Pluto and have decided to do a little investigating. Now, far beyond the space lanes, they scan the dark void with super-sensitive telescopes. Is it a meteor, Commander? Odd shape for a meteor that size. Too regular. Take a look. Oh, I see it. It's shaped like a spaceship. Oh, but its surface is rough. It is a spaceship, Happy. But, sir, there's no sign of a rocket burst. No lights in the viewport. It's in free fall. By the looks of it, it's been in free fall for some time. But, sir, if it's coming toward the solar system, well... Where could it be from? Well, we can tell more about that after we board it. Get our spacesuits, a pommel lights, and a pommel cutting torch. We may have to force our way into the airlock. I'll maneuver into position while you're getting the equipment. Stand by to cut rocket. Standing by, sir. Cut rockets and apply magnetic holding field with secure airlock. Airlock contact secured, sir. All right, let's go. Get in your spacesuit. I'll take the cutting torch. You handle the atomo light and the radiation detector. No light on anywhere. I shall light over here, Happy. Let's see if we can find the registry number. I see the number now. It's uh, U87. U87. Let's see, that would be... Uh... That's an old registry number, Happy. The ship must have been out of commission for five years. That I can believe. It's not a robot job, though. Better take a look around. Search the aft section. Yes, sir. Hey, 
Hey, look there on the floor. Empty ration containers. Hap, turn your light on the air indicator. Should be up there in the box. Hold it. That's it. You read it, sir? There's some air in the ship, but the carbon dioxide factor is above the danger level. Commander, look back there, down the corridor. There's a man on the deck. Hold the light on him, Happy. I'll turn him over. Is he alive? Yes. That's to work fast. Get him back to our ship and try to bring him around. Commander? How's our passenger, Happy? He opened his eyes for a minute and then passed out again. I've still got him on pure oxygen. His pulse rate's increasing and his respiration and temperature are approaching normal. Good. He's not as old as I thought at first. That heavy beard fooled me. I have space phone to Terra headquarters for a check on the ship registration. Did you find any identification on the man? None, sir. But from the looks of his ship, he must have been aboard for months. We'll have it thoroughly examined when we tore it to Terra. I don't like that high radiation count. It could give him trouble. I wonder how long he's been exposed to it. It may not have been as bad inside the ship, but the rate from the hull is terrific. He must have had some experience. Why, he may have circled through a part of space where no one has ever been before. Base Control Terra calling Commander Corey aboard Terra 5, Sector 7, Pluto Orbit. Base Control Terra calling Commander Corey. Corey here, go ahead. I have some information for you now on spaceship U87. Happy, go back and keep an eye on our patient. Yes, Commander. Let's have it, Space Control. U87 is a Saturn registry ship owned by uh, Joe O'Malley. Joe O'Malley? Yes, Commander. We've run a check on O'Malley. He escaped from space patrol officers just over a year ago after his arrest on Saturn. Why was he arrested? On suspicion of foul play against his partner, a man named Wes Pence. Everything indicated that O'Malley had disposed of Pence's body. And O'Malley escaped rather than face trial. Yes, sir. Well, he's awfully close to cheating justice right now. Notify the Terra Hospital to meet our ship. Yes, Commander. And had a crew of technicians ready to examine O'Malley's ship. We're bringing it into Terra. It's hot. Radiation. Right. Hurry out. Commander, he's conscious now. He's talking, but, well, he's still pretty weak. I'll go back and have a look. He wouldn't tell me where he's been. I asked him, and he acted like he wanted to slug me. You get his name? Yes, sir. Was it Joe O'Malley? No, sir. He says his name was Wes Pence. Wes Pence? Had he put on full acceleration for Terra, we've got a double mystery on our hands. came from Major Robertson's office, sir. He gave me a preliminary report on O'Malley's ship. Fine. I'll wait here while I check it. I may want you to go over to the hospital and talk to our space hermit. Well, who is it, Commander? Pence or O'Malley? He may or may not be Pence, but he certainly is not O'Malley. O'Malley was much larger than this fellow. Heavier set and larger bone structure. Mm-hmm. Now I guess we know how O'Malley tried to get rid of Pence, stuck him in a spaceship, and sent him zooming out of the solar system. But the ship didn't have robot controls. And that was more than a year ago. Pence couldn't have survived that long. Happy, did you see this report of Major Robertson? No, sir. From all indications, the ship must have been spaceborne for six or eight months. Oh, six months alone in a spaceship. Happy, go over to the hospital and keep an eye on him. I'll join you as soon as I talk to you. Uh, uh, Want some water, Mr. Pence? Doctor, I... Uh, you're not the doctor, no, no, I'm Cadet Happy. I've seen you before. No, I haven't. I don't know where. In the spaceship, Commander Corey and I found your ship out beyond Pluto. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, they told me you, you saved my life. You just take it easy, Mr. Pence. Lie back and rest. Yeah. Oh, I never felt so weak. My ship. Where's my ship? Don't worry, it's here on Terra at the spaceport. Oh, uh, you brought it in? That's right. Fine. Fine. Where's the doctor? Well, he'll be dropping in shortly. I'll ring for the nurse if you want her. Oh, don't bother. I'm so weak. Oh, uh, could you get me some water, kid? Sure. And, uh, raise the head of my bed a little less. Where's the doctor? Well, Happy, how's our patient? Happy. Happy, what happened? Oh, my head. Happy, where's Pence? I don't know. Last I remember, I was leaning over the bed, fixing his pillow, and then he hit me with something. It was handled from the bed. But he seems so weak. He tricked you, Happy. He's escaped. But why? Why, Commander? He's not a criminal. We're not sure he isn't. 
Robbie's men found a million credits worth of stolen uranium hidden aboard his ship. We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. Hey, gang, you want to hear something funny? Listen to this. That's all. That's neat, though. So, cover off, buddy. Josh, you're a snake. That's all. That's neat, though. So, cover off, buddy. Josh, you're a snake. That's a word scrambler, gang. A machine that scrambles secret messages sent by space patrollers over the space phone. You want to know what that message said? Here, I'll have the machine unscramble it for you. Listen. To get supercharged, eat a power breakfast with instant Ralston. To get supercharged, eat a power breakfast with instant Ralston. Boys and girls, that's one of the most important messages a space patroller ever sent. Yes, sir, when you sit down to a power breakfast with good hot Ralston, well, boy, oh, boy, that's your day to shine. For instant Ralston packs a wallop in every spoonful. It's rich whole wheat. Remember, rich whole wheat. And that means it'll warm up your motor, tune up your thinking machine, help start off your day with a bang. That's the kind of start Buzz Corey gets. That's the kind of start he wants you to have. So come on, space patrollers, get supercharged. Eat a power breakfast with good hot Ralston. <laughs> And now, back to our Space Patrol adventure, the strange gift of the new star. Far beyond the orbit of Pluto, Buzz and Happy found an apparently deserted and powerless spaceship. Aboard, they found a man who identified himself as Wes Pence. This created another mystery. For more than a year ago, Wes Pence had been listed as a victim of a fatal assault by his partner, Joe O'Malley. O'Malley, in turn, has been missing since his escape from Space Patrol officers months ago. Buzz brought Pence to Terra and placed him in a hospital for treatment. But when Buzz entered the hospital room, he found Happy unconscious and the supposedly weakened patient vanished without a trace. Now, on a side street in Kepler City on the planet Mars, a thin, stoop-shouldered man climbs a stairway at the side of a shabby machine shop. He knocks at the door. Better open up. It's business. I don't discuss business this time of day. <laughs> don't you recognize me, O'Malley? There's no O'Malley here. My, my name is Zemo Forbach. You have the wrong address. Yeah, you can fool a lot of people with the name of Forbach front, but not your old partner. My partner? I have no partner. You did have... Don't you recognize me? Oh, I admit I've been through a lot since the day you and I had that fight on Saturn. What? No, it can't be. This is some joke. Better let me in. We got a lot to talk about. Of course. Of course, come in. I'll have to sit down. I'm pretty weak. Well... This isn't much of a place after what we used to have in the old days. I've had to lie low on account of the space patrol. I think I, I did away with it. Yeah, and so did you until a moment ago. You said I was finished, but I managed to crawl away and get help. You know, for nearly a year I thought of nothing but revenge. All those months on Venus, later out in space... Out in space? Yeah. Beyond Pluto. Far beyond. Where the sun is just a tiny star. It's good to have a strong hate out there. It keeps you warm and keeps you from going mad. What were you doing out there? Chasing your roommate. In your old ship, the U-87. The one you abandoned in the Venus swamps. You, you got that old tub space plane? Yeah. I lived like a miser to get it in shape. I starved myself. Then one day I blasted out. In your ship. <laughs> yeah. That's what we had the big fight about, remember? I wanted you to outfit a ship and you refused. But you wouldn't tell me what you wanted it for. No. But I tell you now, I need help. I thought you hated me. O'Malley, let's face it. One of us isn't worth a handful of space dust without the other. What's the pitch? What's out there, Wes? 
Uranium. Pure uranium. Tons of it. You're crazy. I've seen it. You don't have to mine it. You just lower a cargo scoop and pull it aboard. It's a cloud of uranium. Uranium particles all sizes. From dust up to chunks as big as a spaceship. Now I know you're crazy. Yeah? Well, I brought some back with me. In your old ship. Huh? If I broke out of the hospital. I came looking for you. The space patrol is going to figure out I stole the uranium. But before they find me, I want to be back here with a whole freighter load of it. A whole freighter load? I tell you, you're crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that's what they say. But I'm going to prove I didn't steal it. And we'll be rich for life. How do I know this isn't some trick of yours? Revenge. All right, O'Malley. I'll find somebody else. By the looks of you, you couldn't promote the spaceship anywhere. Now, wait. Just a minute. I've got connections over in Lowell City. There wouldn't be too many questions. Now, you're talking. I can get a spaceship, all right. And I'm going to do it. So you better be on the left. We got a line on Pence, Happy. He's gone to Mars. To Mars? Yes, in a regular passenger ship. How did he get the money? From a safe deposit vault in the Terra Bank. Pence put it there two years ago. The banker got suspicious and reported that he identified Pence from a description. Well, and then you checked with the spaceport? Right. He got on the transport ship to Kepler City. We're going to blast off right away and lead the search for him. As soon as he realized his ship was here on Terra, he knew we'd found the stolen uranium. That's another mystery about Pence and his ship. That uranium wasn't stolen. A careful check has been made at every plant handling uranium. None missing. But if he didn't steal it, well, why did he run away from the hospital? The more important question is if he didn't steal it, where did he get it? Gee, that's right. Pence couldn't have owned that much ore by himself. Suppose that uranium wasn't processed. Suppose it's natural, pure uranium. But, sir, it doesn't exist that way anywhere in the solar system. At least not in huge chunks like that. No, not in the solar system. But where did we find Pence? Look at look. He had been outside the solar system. I have an idea Pence is going back. Where he came from. For more uranium. Mm Mm-hmm. But unless he gets medical treatment soon, it won't do him much good. Huh? Pence is in a very bad way from his last prospecting trip. Come on, Happy, let's get one. Commander, I've just decoded the message from Security Lab. Here it is. Very interesting. Rather startling, isn't it, Happy? Well, sir, I just deciphered it letter by letter. I didn't take the time to read it over. Something about uranium and helium. That's all I got out of it. It's a further analysis of the uranium on Pence's ship. A notation by Dr. Bryson. What does he say? According to him, pure uranium could be found in space. Matter hurled off by forces in a newly formed star, he says, might consist almost entirely of uranium. Well, isn't that the way the uh, solar system was supposed to have been formed? Yes, but our system is billions of years old. The original uranium has decayed into lead and the other elements, including the lighter gases like helium. Well, then this stuff that Wes Pence found could be a hunk of a new star. Well, new as far as the life of uranium is measured. Could be millions of years old. Doesn't sound very new to me. No, but in that time, it could cross interstellar space and come close to our solar system. Space Patrol calling Commander Corey aboard Terra 5. Space Patrol calling Commander Corey. Corey here. Go ahead, Space Control. Report on suspect Wes Pence. Let's have it. Man believed to be Pence blasted off in special cargo freighter from Lowell City Mars Spaceport two hours ago. Destination unannounced. Why wasn't he stopped? He wasn't recognized by guards until the full description reached us after blast off. Pence was with another man. Was the other man recognized? The two guards who noticed Pence have checked old files, Commander. They've only rated their own identification as number three reliability. Well, they aren't too sure. Well, what's their opinion? They think the other man resembles... Joe O'Malley. Pence's old partner. Yes, sir. The two men arrived from Kepler City. Space Control, can you give me any information on the vector taken by that ship? A routine view scope trace shows it uh, headed generally toward Neptune. Its registry is MSC-312. Thanks, Space Control. Corey out. Happy check the application chart. In a blast off from Lowell City, Mars, what other planets would lie close to the Neptune trajectory? Well, none very close. Run a test trajectory from Mars to Neptune, then out beyond the Pluto orbit. What have you got? Well, if I go out far enough, it, it puts us roughly in the sector where we found West Pence. We'll keep on that vector unless we hear that their ship has been sighted in some other part of the system. You think they're going out for more uranium? If they are, they're in for a good long trip. Get some rest, Happy. I'll call you in three hours. Well, how much further is it? Just hold this vector. 
My best calculation, the uranium cluster is moving at about the same velocity as Pluto, which means... I think I picked them up on the view scope. That's about time. I've begun to think they've veered off on another vector. Not only that, but I've found something else in the view scope. It registers as a blurred object or a collection of small fragments. You mean this thing up here in the corner of the screen? Right. Hence the ship seems to be heading right for it. Wes, what's that in the view scope? I told you a while ago, it's the uranium. We're nearly there. No, I mean the rear view scope. It's a spaceship. Huh? Hey, you're right. And if they're out this far, they're after us. What'll we do? We'll lose them in the swarm. Huh? We'll get the uranium between us and them. When they get closer, those pallets will cloud out their view scope so bad they'll never find us. Here, let me take this in. Put on more acceleration, Hap. Keep them in sight. Crazy fools. What are they up to? They're flying right into that cluster. And it's uranium, all right. Our radiation instruments are going crazy. Hint must be trying to pick up some chunks at this speed. They'll crack up, sure. Probably trying to ditch us. Don't get any closer till we determine their next move. It's working. We got them buffalo. Space patrol, all right. Yeah, they're a fine. That means Commander Buzz Corey. We'll evade them, scoop out some uranium, and head back for Mars. Wes, look out, we're right in the middle of the swarm. Ah, calm down. We're keeping pace with them. Wes, Wes, do something. Uh, I got a smith ship. I'll look the compartment before we lose our air. Help me, I'm hit. I can't. Fragment hit me to my shoulder. Yeah, they got a big chunk right ahead of their power unit. Get our spacesuits, Hap. We're going in and get them. Hap, the cluster isn't all going in the same direction. It's in a swirling motion like a whirlpool. It's battering the ship to pieces. Hurry, Hap. Keep moving. If one of those hunks of uranium wrecks our ship, none of us will ever get back alive. Look, Commander. The nose port is cracked. This isn't a big break. Hurry, we gotta get Pinson and put into our ship before this one's riddled. Yes, sir. Into the airlock. Now into our ship. Now we'll drop them in right here when we get the ship away from this hot spot. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll close the inner hatch. Take off your helmet. All right, release magnetic holding field. Field out, sir. Now to fire rockets and get away from this uranium bombardment. We made it, sir. We're out of the stream. Yes, but look at the other ship. A hole the size of a space car all the way through the control compartment. We got out of there just in time. We're heading for Terra. You take care of our passengers. Uh, oh, Pence is coming around. Uh, O'Malley. O'Malley. He's safe, Pence. Just lie still and I'll, I'll bandage that shoulder. So that's O'Malley, huh? Yeah, it is. You know, Commander, this makes twice you two have saved my life. That may be. But if you don't mind telling me, why did you run away from the hospital and come out here on this wild expedition? Well, O'Malley and I wanted to get a share of that uranium so we could prove I didn't steal the chunk you found in the other ship. And to make yourselves a fortune, huh? Well, I, I guess that did enter into it. You took all that risk for nothing, Pence. We've known for some time you didn't steal that uranium. Then O'Malley and I are free. O'Malley is, but you aren't. You can't go around slugging space patrol personnel and get away with it. You remember the incident with Cadet Happy in the hospital. Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. You'll have to take whatever punishment or fine is coming for you. Well, I'm sunk. I can't pay any fine. I'm broke. <laughs> He's a comedian. It's the truth. Took all the money I had to lease the spaceship. Talk strangely, Pence, for a man with a million credits worth of uranium. Huh? That uranium you brought in your ship, it's yours by right of discovery.
And now, an exciting preview of next week's thrilling Space Patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy are in a relay communication station in space. Jim Comar, who is in league with a strange alien power, is using some mysterious crystals, forcing Buzz and Happy to obey him against their will. The crystals are getting brighter. That's all I can see or even think about. The crystals. Keep walking. Up to the generator. Closer. Closer. Happy fight it. Touch the connection. Reach out your hand. Don't touch it, Happy. I can't hold back. If you touch it, you'll be finished. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Seed Crystals of Zal Debran. High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol. <laughs> Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmerer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Bela Kovach and Ken Mayer. Dick Tufel speaking. Now don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol! And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story on your local ABC television station. Consult your local newspaper for time and channel. And now, a special word to mothers about a clever new idea. A salad that looks like a queen's crown, studded with jewels. It's peach coronation salad. One of the easiest and thriftiest salads you've ever made. All you need is creamy cottage cheese, bits of maraschino cherries and canned cream peaches from California. To make peach coronation salad taste its luscious best, serve with rye crisp, those crisp, toasty wafers with a wonderful, hearty rye flavor. For pictures of peach coronation salad, watch newspapers and magazines during the entire month of March. Your grocery is also featuring this colorful salad. Look for coronation salad displays at his store today. Be sure to serve with rye crisp, the perfect food to make other foods taste even better. For your figure's sake. Make your bread rye crisp all the time. Only 21 calories in a double square. The famous rye crisp reducing pan is printed right on the package. Remember, it's smart to make your bread rye crisp. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Wheat checks, rice checks, and good hot Ralston present Space Patrol! <laughs> High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol. In today's transcribed adventure, we find Buzz and Happy in a relay communication station in space at the mercy of Jim Colmar, who's in league with a strange alien power. Using some mysterious crystals, Colmar is forcing Buzz and Happy to obey him against their will. Come, follow me into the generator room. Commander, the crystals are getting brighter. That's all I can see or think about, just the crystals. Try to look away, Happy. Fight it. Keep walking up to the generator. Closer. Closer. Fight it, Happy. Touch the connections. Reach out your hands. Happy, don't touch it. I can't hold back. You've got to. If you touch it, you're finished. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Seed Crystals of Zelda Brand. <laughs> this is Space Patroller Dick Tufeld, gang, and boy, am I excited. We have a new machine here at Space Patrol headquarters, and it's terrific. It's called the Flavor Meter. It's used for testing the flavor of food. Now, I have a plain, ordinary cereal right here, so let's test it. The better it tastes, the louder it'll ring the bell. All I do is put the cereal in this slot and push the button. Hmm, not much flavor there, is there? I suppose we put in some other ordinary cereals. Well, not even a tinkle. Now, here's a couple of super cereals I'd like to test. I'll put them both in. 
Wow, that did it. Those cereals really ring the bell for flavor. You bet. They were rice checks and wheat checks. Checks, the cereals with that modern bite size design. Checks, the super cereals that helped us supercharge you. Test them yourself, gang, in your own cereal bowl. Believe me, they'll really ring the bell for flavor. Rice checks, wheat checks. <laughs> And now, today's Space Patrol adventure, The Seed Crystals of Zaldebran. Swinging in a wide orbit around the planet Saturn is the artificial satellite COM Relay 4, the powerful communications relay center. Serious trouble between two men assigned to duty at the space station has brought Commander Corey and Cadet Happy to investigate. With their ship, Terra 5, joined to the airlock of COM Relay 4, Buzz and Happy are now opening the inner lock of the huge disc-shaped relay station. Go ahead, Happy. Yes, sir. Welcome aboard, Commander. Oh, Ma, you look as though you haven't had any sleep for two days. Oh, it's been nearer three, sir. I've been working both shifts. Why didn't you report this dispute between Silo and yourself immediately? I should be able to handle my own assistant. I don't like to yell to the top breast for help. Where is Silo? Uh, he took a swing at me, so I had to lock him up. He's back here. All right, let's find out what this is all about. Come on, Happy. Yes, sir. He's in here. All right, Komar, if you'll wait for us in the control room, Happy and I will have a talk with Sila. Yes, Commander. I hope you can straighten him out. All right, Happy, open the door. Yes, sir. Well, Sila... Let's hear your version of the story. Didn't Komar tell you I swung at him? Yes. Okay. I assaulted the superior. Why go into it any further? Close the door, Happy. Yes, sir. Silo, I know your record. You've worked these two-man teams for years. I find it hard to believe you suddenly went space happy and struck Jim Komar. Now, let's have the whole story. We got along all right at the beginning. But lately, Komar's been unreasonable. He races his rockets over every little thing. And you don't feel that you've done anything to antagonize him? No, sir. When was the first blow-up? A couple of days after the meteor hit us. Meteor? It was just a little one, about the size of a marble. We patched up the hole in the hull and everything was okay. Then one day I walked into the control room to relieve him a little early. It was a favor, see, and he, he jumped down my throat. What did he say to you? Said he was tired of my sneaking up behind him. He kept his hand clutched around something as though he were afraid I'd steal it. Acted like a spoiled kid. Was that when you swung at him? No, it was later. He kept finding fault with everything I did. So I finally blew up. I swung wild and he connected. I was a little surprised. I didn't think Comar had it in him. Now, Sila, you're relieved from duty. I'm taking you back to Terra. But first, I want a written report from Jim Comar. Commander, I just put Bob Siler aboard the spaceship for Venus. Oh, a few weeks in the rest camp at Lake Azure will fix him up all right. He certainly was grateful to you for not entering that row with Colmar as a black mark on his record. I'm putting it down as a flare-up of temperament due to confinement and strain. Actually, beginning to think Colmar could do with the rest at Lake Azure, too. Oh, by the way, sir, the applicant for duty at uh, Com Relay is waiting to see His name is uh, Jack Perkins. All right, happy show, ma'am. The commander will see you now, Mr. Perkins. Thanks, Cadet. Good morning, Commander. Well, sit down, Perkins. Thank you, sir. So you want to be assigned to duty at Saturn Com Relay 4, huh? That's right. Do you know who's in charge there? Sure, Jim Colmar. Best space phone engineer in the solar system. I won't argue with you there. But you had a serious dispute with him about four years ago. And he had you court-martialed. Oh, I had it coming. I've learned a lot since then, Commander. There won't be any more trouble. You'll be notified of my decision. Thank you, sir. Believe me, I want this assignment more than I've wanted anything before in my life. Well, goodbye, sir. I'll um, wait until I hear from you. Oh, oh, oh that's okay. Oh, Commander. Yes, Robbie? May I see a minute, sir? Yes, certainly. I've been getting more complaints about Saturn Com Relay 4. Well, what is it now? Saturn and Neptune channels are weak, but Comar is feeding a wild beam out into space 40 degrees west of Pluto. He's sending gibberish where there aren't any planets or space lanes. And he's probably groggy from lack of sleep. You've got to get him an assistant right away. He's put in a request for a specific man. Came through the private channel about an hour ago. Oh, who does he want? Guy who just left here. Jack Perkins. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I'm either putting a lion and a tiger into a cage together, or I'm helping to restore a beautiful friendship. You mean you're going to okay Perkins' appointment? We need a man out there quickly, and I feel we should send a man of Colmer's choice. Yes, sir. See that Jack Perkins gets in the next space patrol transport to Saturday. Thanks for asking for me, Colmar. Strange, isn't it? Am I getting a hunch to apply for the assignment just at this time? Oh, it may not be as strange as you think, Jack. We'll get along fine, I'm sure of that. Sure we will. <laughs> there I was, wasting my time on Mars, when all of a sudden I thought of you. <laughs> uh, here's the control room. Wow. Say, you sure got this thing fixed up. Where'd you promote all this extra equipment? I'll tell you someday. For the time being... Well, I'd just say this isn't standard for a <coughs> relay station of this size. I'll say not. Jim, you, you've got something in this room. Something strange and magnetic. Something behind the amplifier. I knew it. The crystal. Yes. You have one too, haven't you? Yes, I, I've got it with me, but but yours is a much larger crystal. Where'd you get it? It crashed through the hall of a station a few weeks ago. For a time being, I was afraid my assistant would examine it. I told him it was a meteorite, and he seemed satisfied. Well, this one fell at my feet when I was <coughs> hiking across a plane on Mars. Mysterious, isn't it? Yeah. It, it even seems to be trying to tell me something. To tell me where it's from. From a world far away. Beyond the solar system. Zaldebran, perhaps? Yes, Zaldebran. What does it mean, Jim? It means we have been selected from all the people of the solar system to guide the invaders. The liberators from Zaldebran. I don't quite understand. You will. Probably millions of these crystals were fired out into space. In all directions from Zaldebran just on the chance that one or two might come to rest on an inhabited planet. But, Jim, are the crystals alive? No, not in the usual sense. But they vibrate in sympathy with the life force of the men of Zaldebran. That's how they communicate with us. Project the thoughts of these men. You've learned all this from the crystal? Yes. And we must keep these crystals a secret from everyone those are the orders. Yes, I know. All who have the crystal will be brought together, as we were. Only by working in secret can we guide our masters here, the conquerors from Zaldebran. Come, we got work to do. Commander. Oh, yes, Riley. Something's got to be done about Com Relay 4. Isn't that mess straightened out yet? Oh, it's improved a little since Perkins arrived. But our message center is still four hours behind schedule and clearing communications to Pluto. Due to Com Relay 4, Major? Yeah. Pluto reports signal strength is weak from Relay Center. We've run the code tape through twice. Have Colmar or Perkins given any explanation? None that makes any sense. Well, I'll get some sense out of them. Robbie, beam all outer planet spacephone signals through Jupiter Com Relay 3. Right, sir. Happy and I are blasting off for Com Relay 4 to find out what Perkins and Colmar are doing. The crystals are gleaming brighter, Komar. Yes. I'm using their pulsations to modulate a spacephone signal. It's amazing that a crystal can absorb the thoughts and feelings of a human being and then emit those vibrations to make us understand. Yes. If crystals hadn't sensed that we were friendly, they probably would have remained cold lumps of mineral. They know their friends, these crystals. And they know their enemies. Look, their light is fading. The crystals are warning us. Quick, disconnect them from the modulator while I check the space of Right, Comer. Someone must be coming. And just when I felt that we were about to contact Zelda Brand. Look, they're on the view scope. A spaceship? Yes, a space patrol battle cruiser. Terrified. It's Commander Corey, and he's heading right for the station. Those messages. We should have diverted more power to the regular signals instead of pouring it all towards Zaldebrand. Corey may be suspicious. The crystal will protect us. We'll let Corey aboard the space station, if that's what he wants. 
but hold on to your crystal. Let it guide you. And whatever the crystal tells you, obey. You're in the airlock. Hold your crystal firmly. And don't be afraid. We'll get out of this. I'm not afraid, Coma. Well, I hardly expected you back so soon, Commander. Hello, Coma. Well, I'm surprised to see you looking so well. I feel much better since Siler left and Perkins is here. Well, that's fine. But what about your relay transmitters? Pluto can barely pick you up. You've got a beam 40 degrees west of Pluto that nearly burned out our meters. Yeah, we tested it when we came in. I want an explanation, Coma. Very well. We are diverting the power of this space relay station to more important matters. What's more important than your duty, relaying official messages? I'm afraid you'll never know. Come with me, Commander. You're a little confused, aren't you? You take orders from me, remember? I said, come with me. Follow me. They must be space-happy, Commander. And what are those little bottles they're holding? Coma. Perkins. What's in those bottles? They are crystals. Crystals from another universe. Now come. Come, Commander. Commander. Something funny is happening. I, I, I can't take my eyes off those crystals. Follow me into the generator room. Happy, try to look away. They've got our reactions controlled somehow. The crystals are getting brighter. That's, that's about all I can see. Walk up to the generator. Touch the connections. Then you will know what we are doing with all the power. Happy, don't touch it. I, I can't hold back. Reach out your hand. It is not I, but our masters of Zeldebran who command you. Reach out your hands. Take the power connections in your hands. We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a moment. But first, this is Commander Corey. And Captain Dick Tufel. Reminding you that pulling up to your breakfast table... Is like pulling up to a filling station. Give them our example, Dick. Right. A jet cycle has just pulled into a filling station to get its tank filled. The man has it filled with ordinary fuel. Listen. Not much go in that jet cycle, is there? But now listen to that same jet cycle filled with super fuel. Man, that cycle's roaring like a rocket now because it's supercharged with super fuel. Same thing is true of you, gang. To get going in the morning, you need super fuel, too. So get supercharged the way Buzz Corey and all us space patrollers do. Eat a power breakfast with Instant Ralston, the hot super cereal made of rich whole wheat. Instant Ralston helps you to think fast. And act fast. So remember, gang, when you pull up to your breakfast table, it's just like pulling up to a filling station. You're there for fuel. Super fuel, so you can get supercharged. Uh, take a tip. Eat a power breakfast with instant Ralston and get supercharged. Get it today in the red and white checkerboard package. Good hot Ralston. And now, back to our space patrol adventure, the seed crystals of Zaldebran. Two mysterious crystals have found their way into the solar system from outer space. One crashed through the hull of a communications relay station in the Saturn orbit. The other landed on a Martian plane. Discovered millions of miles apart by two men who once were enemies, the crystals have brought the two men together in the space station, united in a weird project. Buzz and Happy, investigating failure of the relay station to operate properly, are under the strange power of the crystals. And the two space patrolmen seem powerless to resist their orders. One more step, cadet. Fight it off, Happy. I'm trying, sir. Follow the crystal. Reach out your hand and feel the surge of power you never felt before. You can leave this universe in a blinding blue-green flash of glory. Another inch, cadet. No, Happy. No! My crystal! And there's yours, Perkins. Now get away from the generator, Happy, quickly. All right, Commander. Get your hands out there. Don't reach for your ray gun. Don't try anything. Good work, Perkins. Watch him. Don't let him get up. Right. Coma. Where did those crystals come from? From Zelda Brand. And they're the guiding force that will bring the United Planets conquerors here from the planets of our masters. Coma, you've been out in space too long. You almost had us touching those generators. But put up that gun. 
I'll see that you get medical attention, and I won't bring any charges against you. That's mighty big of you, and uh, Look what happened to the crystals. When the containers broke, the crystals faded. They're just like ordinary lumps of quartz. Corey, I ought to fix you good. Hold on, Packer. Let's wait and see what the crystals say. They may have other orders. Lock Corey and the cadet in the empty compartment. We'll try to revive the crystals. Commander, how are we going to get out of here? Colmar and Perkins are completely out of their minds. Come here. Yes, sir. Put your ear close to this ventilator. Listen to them. The crystals are beginning to glow again. Yeah. They revive quickly in the fresh solution. They're in a compartment at the other end of this vent. And they said the crystals are giving off light again. Just listen. In a few hours, we can put them back in the modulator. This time, maybe we can get through the Zelda brand. I think the beam is weakened by the cosmic ray from the sun. If we could take this relay station out beyond the Pluto orbit... Oh, but how can we do that? There is one other person in the solar system who has found one of the crystals. He has helped me already by bringing the equipment I needed. Who is he? A very wealthy man on Terra, Zoltan Cephalu. If he can appear with a powerful spaceship... We could quickly accelerate the relay station out beyond the Pluto orbit. Come away from the vent, Happy. Yes, sir. It sounds crazy, but those crystals just might be a contact from some other system. Well, at any rate, I've never seen crystals behaving like that before. Whether or not they're from another universe, they're dangerous in the hands of Colmar and Perkins. Have you got your miniature space phone? Yes, sir. Good. We'll try to reach Major Robertson and have him pick up Zoltan Cephalu. If Colmar tries to contact Cephalu, we'll at least have evidence of a conspiracy. The crystals have revived enough to handle Corey and the cadet. And this time we'll be more careful. Mm. Unlock the door. Wait. Listen. That's right, Robbie. Hold Cephalo. And if he's got a peculiar crystal that gives out a violet light, take that too. Corey out. They got a space phone in there, a, a miniature. Quickly. All right, Corey. We'll just take that little space phone. Space phone? What space phone? Come on, hand it over. You'll get a worse clout than you did before. Uh, All right. Here you are. I'll fix this little device. There. Now let's see you contact anybody. Soon we will be carrying out the will of our masters, the rulers of Zaldebren. You really believe that stuff, don't you? If you were fortunate enough to sense the vibration of the crystals, you would believe it too. Colmar and I know things you'll never know. About a superior race of men, far out among the stars. Yes. These crystals are seeds they have scattered throughout us. When they find fertile ground and receptive life, they bloom and glow. And with our space phone equipment, we can transmit their pulsations back to Zaldebrand. Then our masters will know they can come here to a new home. Commander, what do you think? It makes no difference what the commander thinks. He's going to help us. Huh? How? We've got to move the space station before someone investigates. The commander's ship is connected to our airlock. We'll have him move Com Relay 4 to a better location. Now let's lock these two in here until we get our crystals. This time there must be no slip-up. What are we going to do, sir? And they're going to try to put us under the power of those crystals. If the crystals don't work, Colmar and Perkins still have our weapons. But if they think we're under the spell of the crystals, we may be able to catch them off guard after we're in the ship. Now, don't look directly at the crystals. And keep your eyes partly closed. Yes, sir. And pretend to be resisting with all your might. Come on. Follow the crystal into your ship. After me. That's it. Try to stall them, Happy. Hold back. I, I can't. My, my, my feet keep moving in spite of all I do. Come on. Don't fight it. It's no use. That's it. Now close the inner hatch. Take your usual position at the control panel. Quickly now. Now watch the crystals and listen. You will start this ship gently at first so as not to pull away from the relay station. Is that clear? Yes. <laughs> now go ahead. Your usual procedure. Just a minute, Commander. That's the space phone you just turned on. Major Robertson, Don't try to enter him. If I could only move my hand. Look at him. 
He's straining every muscle to turn on the microphone. Major Robertson to Commander Corey. I've tried to reach you for 20 minutes. Here's the message in case you can't acknowledge. Zoltan Cephalu has been captured. Oh. Cephalu had us completely in his power until I found the crystal. Then we grabbed Cephalu without any trouble. Repeat, Major Robertson... Turn that off! We got to get away from here quickly. Corey, start your ship. Stand by to fire rockets. Half G acceleration. Standing by, sir. One half G. Fire rockets. Space station holding to the ship? Seems to be, from what I can tell through the viewport. Corey, increase our velocity gradually. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. Set a course 40 degrees west of Pluto. 40 degrees west of Pluto? That's it. Uh, they're like automatons. Look at them. They're completely under the power of the crystals. It'll take us several hours to get beyond Pluto's orbit. But by then, we should be able to send signals to Zaldebrand. Then what about Corey and the cadet? Their usefulness will be over. We will dispose of them. How will we get back? Don't worry about that. There are supplies for weeks in the space station. We will calmly await the arrival of our masters from Zaldebrand. Correct course, one and a half degrees west. One and a half degrees west. Three degrees high. Three degrees high. Happy... Are you under control? Under control, Commander. When I give the word, move quickly, rush them. As steady as you go. Yes, sir. Now, get back to your control. Give me that crystal, Colmar. Let go of that crystal, Perkin. I've got one of them, Commander. Here's Colmar's. Hold it. All right, Colmar, stand back. I've got this ray gun on you. Corey, you fool. You've only temporarily broken the power of the crystal. Give them back. You know, that's an idea. We will give them back, but not to you. We'll fire those crystals out of the ship. That's the only way to break their control. Happy, quickly. Open the breach to the cosmic torpedo gun. Right. Breach open, sir. Put them in and close it. All right, Happy. Fire the torpedo. You... You shot the crystals out into space. Yes. Out towards Zaldebran, or wherever they came from. Hey, hey, I feel different. I can move my hands easily. Comer, what happened? Commander Corey and the cadet shot the crystals out into space. Yes, out where they'll never be found, at least by anybody in the solar system. Thank goodness. That's wonderful. Well, what are you so happy about, Colmar? I thought you wanted the crystal. They had some terrible power over me. Now it's broken. I'm free again. So am I. Commander, if you hadn't fought us, Colmar and I would have brought something horrible into the solar system. I don't know just what, but it wouldn't have been good. Half our space upon Robbie and give orders to blast that third crystal out of the solar system. Commander, Perkins and I are traitors. And we deserve whatever is coming to us. But I'm glad it's over. A brainograph test will show whether you were acting under the influence of the crystals or your own free will. Well, I'm glad it's over. And I've got something to settle with you, Comar. Oh, you yeah. have? Yeah. I'm going to punch you in the jaw for getting me court-martialed four years ago. I'd like to see you try no, you Hey, uh, wait, break it up. Break it up. Now, let's not have any more of that. Hey, Commander, it was the crystals. See? See, with the crystals gone, they're enemies again. <laughs> <laughs> And so, once again, Commander Corey's quick thinking and daring have prevented a disaster on the United Planets. But even now, events are taking place that may mean more danger for Commander Corey. And now, an exciting preview of next week's Space Patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy have landed on a small planetoid. At this moment, wearing their spacesuits, they're approaching the airlock of a prospector's cave where a criminal is believed to be hiding. Have your ray gun ready, Hap? I'll see if I can open the airlock. Right, Commander. Hey, where did that come from? Someone's firing at us. That one came from the other direction. The airlock won't open. We have no protection. Whoever's controlling those weapons can just keep firing till they get us. 
Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Magic Space Pictures, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Baylor Kovach, Ken Mayer, and Norman Jolly. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol. And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. And now, a word to mothers about the salad of the year. Peach Coronation Salad. A brand new idea inspired by the crowning of England's lovely new queen. A salad that looks like a queen's crown studded with jewels. But the kind of a salad a man can go for. It's made with creamy cottage cheese and luscious canned cling peaches from California. Give your peach coronation salad that perfect touch. Serve with delicious rye crisp. Those toasty wafers with a hearty rye flavor. Boy, what a way rye crisp has of making other foods taste their best. Mm -mm. You will see the coronation salad featured in magazines and newspapers and in special displays at your grocers all during the month of March. And when you serve this colorful new salad, be sure to serve it with delicious rye crisp. For your figure's sake, make rye crisp your bread all the time. Only 21 calories in a double square. No waiting for the famous Rye Crisp producing plan when you buy Rye Crisp. It's printed right on the package. Remember, it's smart to make your bread Rye Crisp. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Check, rice checks, and good hot Wilson present... Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy have landed on a small planetoid. At this moment, wearing their spacesuits, they're approaching the airlock of a prospector's cave where a criminal is believed to be hiding. Where did that come from? Someone's firing at us. That one came from the other direction. The airlock won't open. There's no other protection out here. Whoever's controlling those weapons can just keep firing till they get us. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Magic Space Picture. Hi, gang. It's nighttime here on the planet Terra. All is quiet. But in just a second, you'll hear news that'll rock this planet like an explosion. Watch out. Here it comes. Yes, sir. The news is out, and here it is. Rice checks and wheat checks now come to you in a brand new package with a big picture of Commander Corey or Cadet Happy on the front. Gang, you can cut these pictures out and paste them in your scrapbook or pin them in your room or clubhouse. And listen... Inside of these wonderful new packages of checks, you now get the Magic Space Patrol Space Picture. Here's how it works. You stare at the Magic Space Picture. Who is it? What is it? It's hard to tell. But when you look into the sky or at a wall, presto! That's where the magic comes in. You suddenly see a giant picture that looks like Buzz Corey himself, or a real flying saucer, or a real rocket ship. Now, gang, there's 24 of these pictures, all different, and you get one in every new package of checks. So start collecting the whole set of 24 today. Just look for the new packages of rice checks and wheat checks with Buzz Corey or Cadet Happy on the front and the magic space pictures on the inside. And now, today's Space Patrol adventure, 
a magic space pictures. Excitement is high at the Terra spaceport today. Rumor has spread that Commander Corey himself is to blast off for a test flight in the XR-51, the new experimental rocket ship which has been under top security guard for weeks while technicians installed secret equipment. In his central office at Space Patrol headquarters, Commander Corey is now making a last-minute check of charts and technical data as Cadet Happy bursts in. Commander, Commander, somebody's made a terrible mistake. Oh, Excuse me, sir. That's all right, Happy. What's the trouble? Well, I just received special orders from the Technical Training Command. Oh, let me see them. You'll report to Recognition School for a special briefing course at 1100 hours Universal Star Time today. Well, I thought I'd better report the mistake to you right away, sir, so I wouldn't be marked AWL. There's no mistake, Happy. But, but sir, I, I thought that... You uh, thought what? Well, well, you are taking the experimental rocket ship up today, aren't you, sir? Yes, in about an hour. Why? Well, I, I, I figured you'd be needing me, and, and, well, if I have to be at recognition school... I put those orders through, Happy. Uh, then, uh, then I don't make the test flight? Not this one. I'm taking a look at Jeff Fisher. He's been working in the project since it started. Anyway, the whole flight won't take more than an hour or two. I see. Well, sorry I bothered you, sir. In a few days, I'll be starting a whole series of flights in the XR-51. You're going to recognition school, so you'll be able to help me. Oh, oh well, that's different. Here, look at this. Well, it's... Just a negative picture of the planet Saturn. Anybody would recognize that. It's a special kind of negative picture, Happy. Look at that tiny spot in the center. Keep gazing at it. Yes, sir. I still don't see anything unusual. Don't take your eyes off that center dot. Well, if this is a sample of what the course is like, it's going to be a cinch. <laughs> All right, Happy, now look out the window at the sky. What do you see? Nothing. Just a... Uh-oh. Yeah, I must be going crazy. What's the matter? Why, Saturn's right out there in space, just the way it looks from a spaceship. You see it, sir? I can't see it, because I haven't been looking at the magic space picture. I don't understand. This is only one of 24 magic space pictures you'll get in the basic training course, Happy. You're going to see a lot of images in space. But how does it work? You'll learn that at the school. Uh-oh, look at the time. I've got to run over to the spaceport now to one of the technicians. Well, good luck, Happy. See you when you get out of class. Oh, Commander Corey, may I help you? Oh, yes, Vanek. I just dropped in to see if Lieutenant Fisher picked up all the equipment we need for the test. It's all in the ship, sir. I checked it myself. Fine. I want every bit of extra image reactor equipment removed from this building and returned to the security lab. That includes diagrams, check sheets, everything. Is that clear? Yes, Commander. Good. Then I'll go over to the ship. I want full security measures observed. Tell your men that, Vanek. All right, Commander. Good luck. Juro Vanek at Station 4, calling Station 6. Station 4, calling Station 6. Acknowledge with Code Y. Code Y received. Send three men and a surface truck to Station 4 to pick up some special equipment. Get it aboard my private spaceship before the security lab starts checking. I got Corey fooled. With a little luck, I can blast off for Planetoid 94. Oh, what a day. How'd you get along in class, Happy? Okay, sir, I guess. But I can still see planets and spaceships and special equipment floating in space. Oh, you'll get used to it. Well, they had us look at pictures, and well, the way I did here in the office. Only we were in front of a sort of brainograph machine. Mm, that's right. You've seen how our brainograph screen shows an image of a person's thoughts. Yes, sir. Well, our scientists have found a way to make those images send electric impulses to relays and motors and instruments. Oh, just the way our brain sends impulses through the nerves to the muscles. Exactly. Only the image reactor is much faster. Ordinarily, when you think of an action you want to perform, your hand throws a switch or moves a control. With this new device, your thought throws the switch. Oh. And the purpose of these magic space pictures is to train us to project the correct image at the right time. That's right. Hmm. After you've mastered the technique, Happy, you can maneuver the XR-51 from blast-off to landing with your hands tied behind your back. Wow. So that's the big secret of the XR-51. There are a lot of bugs to get out of it before we can equip all space patrol ships with it, but we want a supply of trained pilots ready to take over. Your private space patrol, sir. Space patrol headquarters. Corey here. Oh, yes, Robbie. What? When was this discovered? I see. Space patrol and all planets alarm. I'll blast off right away. Corey out. 
Come on, Happy, let's get to Terra 5. Well, what's wrong, sir? Some of the image reactor equipment and the key designs have been stolen from the security lab. How? All we know is that a technician named Juro Vanek has disappeared. Major Robertson says Vanek blasted off from here about 20 minutes ago. Come on, Happy, we're going after him. Shipped the patrol sighted, he could be going either to Mars or Jupiter. But in the meantime, he could have changed vector and probably has. Well, Commander, what could Vanix gain by stealing that equipment? He may be planning to sell it, which would be pretty risky, but more likely he's working for someone who doesn't want to see the space patrol become too efficient. Yeah. And with those image reactors, our ship could outmaneuver anything in space. Vanik has been with the project ever since it started. He's probably been waiting for months for a chance to make this break. I hope we catch him right away. I don't want to miss any of that course. If we don't catch him, the team program might as well be suspended. According to that last report from Major Robertson, Vanek got away with most of the reactor cells. The heart of the whole device. Space Control Terra calling Commander Corey aboard Terra 5. Space Control Terra to Commander Corey. Corey here. Go ahead, Space Control. Commander, Space Patrol Ship T-523 reports an unidentified private cruiser heading for the planetoid belt. The patrol ship gave chase, but the cruiser got away. Do you have the vector for cruiser? An approximate one, sir. 23 degrees, sun-Mars orientation, 300,000 DUs outside the Mars orbit. He's way off the Jupiter lanes. Space Control, inform Major Robertson. I'll proceed toward the planetoid belt in Sector J. Corey out. So Vanek isn't going to Jupiter. Well, he can't hide out in the planetoids very long. They're just chunks of rock with no atmosphere and no food. Well, how about all the prospectors who live on the planetoids? Well, even they have to make trips to the nearest planet two or three times a year for supplies. Vanek is probably just trying to throw off pursuit. Well, we'll see. Well, Juro, welcome to Planetoid 94. Here, Barrett, take some of this stuff. Let's get out of this airlock. My, you have got a load, haven't you? Here, I'll give you a hand. Just set it down and close that inner door. Sure, sure, sure. Oh, you'll get out of that space suit and I'll give you some nice hot Venus coffee. Well, this business of being a space patrol agent must be tiring. It is. I got to blast off again right away. But I will have some coffee. Say, that's um, real interesting looking equipment there, Joe. A special secret lock for the outer hatch to your cave. A lock? Why, Joe, I never had a lock on the place at all. So, so you started coming and storing your space patrol stuff here. In fact, last time I went out, I nearly forgot the key. Well, with all this secret space patrol equipment here, it's got to be locked up. Suppose some enemy of the space patrol tried to steal it. Oh. Couldn't have that happen, of course. Mm. And with this new lock, you don't need any key. You just think of a certain image, and the outer door opens. I do what? Uh, think of an image? Yes. An image that only you and I know. Uh, that, that's too steep for old Trog Bear. Not only that, but I got some special weapons I'm going to install on the rocks all around your cave. They work on the same principle. Weapons? Well, what in the name of purple comets do I need weapons for? Why, in case space bandits try to steal the space patrol equipment, I'll install a view scope outside. And if anybody lands on this planetoid, we just think of this certain image and the controlled weapons fire at the criminals. Well, you talk like you uh, plan to stay here, Jero. I will, after I get back from my next mission. But I'm going to install these weapons and the secret lock before I blast off. Oh, no, no. This, uh, this image business, that's uh, worse than a key. Uh, suppose I forget what the image is. Hmm. That's a good point. It ought to be something you couldn't forget. I got it. Your face. Huh? Just think of your own face. Think real hard. And the outer airlock door will open. I'll set up the image reactor right now and show you how it works. Vanek must be in another part of the planetoid belt, sir. All we've seen in the viewscope are those chunks of rock. Hundreds of them. Happy, look at the viewscope to starboard. A spaceship. It was hidden by that planetoid. He must have seen us. He swerved toward Jupiter. Hey, he's really kicked down the power. Let's get him, Happy. We're gaining on him, sir. He'll crash into one of those planetoids if he isn't careful. Yeah, or we will. Hey, hey, he's going to... Cr- wow, that was close. 
Did you see him gear away just in time? Yes. I'll say this for him. He's some pilot. Hey, where'd he go? Change Vector again. He's trying to keep a planetoid between him and us. I can't locate him, sir. We've lost him. Hey, what was that? The rear view scope. Look at There he is. He circled around behind us. He's on our tail. He's firing cosmic torpedoes. Yeah, now we'll have to use evasive action. Raise yourself, Happy. That ought to throw him off. Wow, that was closer than ever. Vanek's nearly as quick as lightning at those controls. He is, Happy. Vanek's ship is equipped with an image reactor. Unless a miracle happens, his next shot will blast us to bits. We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. Say, gang, here's big news. Big, big, big news. Remember that picture of Saturn, the one Commander Corey told Cadet Happy to look at? Remember what took place after Hap looked at it? Hap thought he saw the planet Saturn in the sky. Well, gang, how would you like to have some magic pictures that work just like that? Here's where you'll find them. Inside the new Rice Checks and Wheat Checks packages. The new packages with the picture of Buzz Corey or Cadet Happy on the front. Now, there's 24 of these magic space pictures, and they're all different. And you get one in every new package of checks. Saturn, Commander Corey, Cadet Happy, rocket ships, these and 20 other fascinating pictures appear on the magic space pictures. You'll want all 24. Here's how they work. You stare at the mysterious picture. What is it? Who is it? You can't tell for sure. Not till you look at the sky or at a wall. That's when the magic goes to work. Floating in space is a giant picture that looks like a real rocket or a real planet. Man, oh man, it's lots of fun. So gang, hurry. Get the new packages of rice checks and wheat checks with Buzz Corey or Cadet Happy on the front and the magic space pictures inside. <laughs> And now back to Space Patrol and the magic space pictures. Space Patrol scientists have developed a spaceship control device that reacts directly to the pilot's thought commands. Juro Vanek, a disloyal Space Patrol technician, has stolen several of these image reactor units and hidden them in a prospector's cave, a small planetoid. The prospector, Trog Barrett, innocently believes he's assisting an honest Space Patrol agent. Buzz and Happy suddenly came upon Vanek's ship in the planetoid belt and gave chase. But Vanek, with his image reactor control, executed a series of rapid maneuvers that enabled him to attack Buzz and Happy from the rear with cosmic torpedoes. He's laying those torpedoes closer every time he fires. It's like he knows what we're going to do before we do it. Stand by to fire rear torpedoes. Standing by, sir. We can't use automatic aim and fire because these planetoids will confuse a selector. Fire when you get him in your sights. I missed him a mile. He swerved just as I fired. He certainly didn't miss us by much. I'll try again, sir. Hap, you can hit a big target easier than a small one. This time, aim at one of those planetoids just when Vanek passes near it. I get it, sir. What an idea. I'll hold the ship steady for a few seconds. It'll make us an easy target, but you'll have a chance to aim. Vanek's moving toward one now, sir. Here goes. Nice going, Hap. At least I hit the planetoid. You got Vanek's ship with some of the planetoid fragments. He's in trouble. Good shooting, Hap. It was just luck, sir. We'll circle back and pick him up. There's a chance he's alive. I'll board his ship. Get my space while I join airlocks. Could that Happy calling Commander Corey? Go ahead, Happy. Are you all right, sir? I'm just entering Vanek's ship now. No sign of him so far. He's got an image reactor control, all right, both on his rockets and torpedo fire control. Now, the way he handled his ship, he must have been giving himself private lessons. Uh, it looks like he got away. Got away? Where could he have gone? He probably jumped out in a spacesuit right after his ship was hit. Okay, he could be hundreds of DUs from here by now. Coming back, Happy. Notify Space Patrol Jupiter to pick up this wreck. We'll search for Vanek. Hello, you're old. There's nobody on Planetoid 94. I'm not there. Barrett, is this truck Barrett? Yeah, but who'd you think it was? Yeah, Barrett, listen, I'm in trouble. You've got to help me. In trouble? Uh, what happened? I'm in a spacesuit, adrift in the Planetoid belt. Well, what in the name of Jupiter's moons are you doing out there? Don't ask questions, just listen. I was attacked by space bandits. They went after my ship and it's damaged. They don't know I got away. You've got to find me and pick me up before they come back. Space bandits? 
In the planetoid belt? Yes, yes. Uh, where are you? In my ship. I'm heading for planetoid 867. Uh, I'll pick you up, Joe. Uh, hurry, please. Here are my coordinates as closely as I can give you. I'm approximately at the front line. Just a second. I'll be with you. Here, uh, let me help you open that helmet face piece here. There, there you are, Joel. Get back to the control strut. Let's get away from here quickly. Oh, sure, sure. Oh, uh, thanks for picking me up. Oh, that's all right. After all, it's the only neighborly thing to do. Uh, you all right, Joel? Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. Now, let's see. You better take me to Mars. To Mars? Yeah, I'm going to have to pick up another ship and some special supplies. Then I'll come back to Planetoid 9-4. Well, I was going prospecting, but I guess the Space Patrol comes first. I admire your attitude, Barrett. Drop me off at Lowell City, and then you can go prospecting. Uh, remember one thing, though. Yeah? If anyone contact you, remember you haven't seen me or my ship. Now get me to Mars as quickly as you can. Juro really disappeared. I'll swear we've covered every cube yard of space he could possibly be in. We must have miscalculated, Happy. Happy, look at that planetoid. Hey, there's a spaceship there. I'll head for it. You turn up the viewscope sensitivity control. Yes, sir. There's a man in a spacesuit near the ship, sir. See? Crawling up that hump of rock? Mm, judging by the type of ship, he may be a prospector. When we land, we'll get the man aboard ship and see what we can find out. How do you do? As you probably know, we're space patrolmen. I'm Commander Corey. Oh, I'm glad to know you, Commander. I'm Trog Barrett. May I ask what you're doing on this planetoid? Oh, doing a little prospecting. Thought I detected a deposit of uh, Illurium over there. Uh, anything wrong in that? Not a thing. Have you seen any other spaceships in this area recently? Oh, I, um, no. No, I haven't. I don't have much company in the planetoid belt, you know. You haven't seen anyone at all or picked up any signals from anyone? Uh, no, Commander. I see. Where do you live, Barrett? On Planetoid 94. I've got me a cozy cave with my own air supply equipment. I see. Oh, thanks, Barrett. He won't keep you from your work any longer, but if you sight any ships, not notify Space Patrol Mars or Jupiter, will you? Oh, you bet, Commander. It'd be nice chatting with you. I hope you'll find that Illurium. All right. Thanks. So long. Close the inner hatch, Happy. Yes, sir. Commander. Did you see what I saw? The back of a spacesuit? Yes, sir. It's a fairly recent space patrol issue with the insignia almost rubbed out. Well, what would a prospector be doing with space patrol equipment? He might have stolen it. Still, he seems to be an honest old fellow. Let's blast off. We'll check on Barrett by spacephone with both Mars and Jupiter Space Patrol headquarters. And if we find anything suspicious, we can pay a surprise visit to Planetoid 90. Everything's in good shape back aft, Commander. I made a thorough instrument check on the power and air control. Good. I just got a report from Mars headquarters on Barrett. He's got a clean record. But early this morning, his ship landed at Lowell City Spaceport. A man got out, and then Barrett blasted off again. But he told us he hadn't seen anybody. I'd like to know who that man was that Barrett dropped off on Mars. We're going to circle back to Planetoid 94 and find the answer to that question. Oh, oh, what a trip I've had. When did you get back from Mars? Mm, a couple of hours ago. Hey, that's a dandy new ship you got. Barrett, what are you doing in that spacesuit? Why, I had to put it on to get to the cave from a ship, you know that. But that's my suit. The one I was wearing when you picked me up in space. Hmm. Oh, so it is. Same size as mine. Oh, I almost forgot some... Space Patrol fellows landed on number 867 and asked me some questions. What? Oh, well, I didn't tell them anything. I said I hadn't seen anybody or any ships. <laughs> You'd have been proud of me, Gerald. What did they want to know? Oh, what I was doing. So I told them prospecting. Then when I told them I hadn't seen anybody, they blasted off. 
Real nice fellas. Um, Commander Corey was the one I talked Corey. to. Corey! And he saw you in that space suit. Why, Juro, sure, what's wrong? Lundering fool. Juro, what are you getting all upset about here? Get out of the way. Let me turn on the fuse scope. Now, now look, Juro, this is my home. I, I don't like being pushed around even by my friends. Get away and shut up. Look at that. A spaceship. And it's headed for a landing ride near the cave. See what you've done. Well, I haven't done anything. I don't see what you're so steamed up about. Here. Aren't I? That's Commander Corey. You let him here, you bungling old fool. Now, you see, he's your commander. You can explain I was helping you there. Shut up. Just wait till Corey gets out of that ship. I'll fix him. I'll blast him off that planetoid. Juro, what are you talking about? Those weapons I rigged to cover the cave entrance from every angle. Why, you're no space patrolman. You learn fast, Barrett. Get your hands off of me. You're not going to harm the commander. I won't let you. I oh. said let go. Oh. Now, keep out of my way. After I get Corey, I'll finish with you. And don't try anything else if you value yourself at all. Have your ray gun ready, Hap. I'll see if I can open the cave airlock. Yes, sir. Hey, where did that come from? Someone's firing at us. Hey, that one came from the other direction. Quickly, run for the cave. They're getting closer. One chunk of rock nearly hit me. The airlock won't open. Whoever's controlling those weapons can keep on firing till they get us. We've no protection out here. We're trapped. Half, there's an image reactor unit here. Then Juro Vanek's inside. Yes, watching us through a view scope. Yeah, if we only knew what image would unlock this hat. He's got us bracketed now, Half. If we don't get in the cave, the next one will get us short. Think of me. Think of me. Who's that? Someone's on our suit's face phone frequency. This is Tog Barrett. Think of me. What's he talking about? Hey, Barrett! Barrett, what do you mean? Happy, he's telling us how to open the airlock. Think of what Barrett looks like. Think hard. Oh, gee, I only saw him once. I don't remember, except that he had a beard. Let me in front of that reactor, Happy. Let's see. Gray beard, blue eyes, space tan face. Commander, it worked. The airlock's open. Get in quickly. Close it behind you. Hurry. <laughs> Through the inner door. I got there. They were right in the line of fire when I... Corey, that's right, Bannock. Drop that ray gun. Stand back, Corey. Hey, nice going, Commander. Bannock, you don't seem to do so well when you have to depend on your own reactions. All right, get up. Commander, you... You made it. Yes, Barrett, thanks to you. I tried to stop him from firing at you. Thanks, Barrett. We'll take care of you from now on, Benny. Get up. Okay. Okay. How did you get into a cave, Corey? Barrett Spacer found us the right image to use. You you worked the image reactor after seeing Barrett only once? That's right, Vanek. I wouldn't expect you to know this, but a person can get in most anywhere with an honest face. That's my commander. <laughs> An action preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. But first... Commander! Commander, look at how fast that boy is running. Hap, that's the fastest running I ever saw. That boy's running to the grocery store, Commander. He just heard the big news. You mean the big news? Rice checks and wheat checks now have a brand new package with a big picture of the Commander and me on the front? Yes, sir. Plus the news that inside of each of these brand new packages, you now get a magic space picture. Hope you'll follow that boy to the grocery store, gang. I'm mighty proud of those new packages of checks with my picture on the front. Hope you'll cut my picture out and paste it in your scrapbook. And hey, gang, you can also get rice checks and wheat checks now with my picture on the front. You can cut out my picture, too, and hang it in your room or clubhouse. That sure would make me happy. <laughs> uh, don't forget, inside every one of those new packages of checks, there's a magic space picture. You stare at them, look in the sky, and wow you, you see a big rocket ship floating in space, or a speeding jet car, or whatever the subject of your magic space picture happens to be. There's 24 of them all together, and they're all different. And you get one in every new package of checks, so start collecting the whole set of 24 magic space pictures today. Just bring home the new packages of rice checks and wheat checks with Buzz Corey or Cadet Happy on the front and the magic space pictures inside. And now, an action preview of next week's exciting space patrol adventure. 
Buzz and Happy are in a magnetic tunnel car. A tunnel car in a mine shaft deep below the surface of the planet Venus. As they rise toward ground level, Happy prepares the weapons they hope will enable them to rescue Tonga from two criminals. Hey, what was that? Explosion. Dratcher has blown up the entrance to the tunnel. We're sealed in. Brace yourself. Our tunnel car is going to crash right into the debris. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Caverns of Venus, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! <laughs> Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. <laughs> Other players were Norman Jolly and Bela Kovach. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol. And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol program on your local ABC TV station. Consult your newspaper for time and channel. Mother's, an invitation from your grocer. See his special peach coronation salad display. 1953's most beautiful salad. Canned cling peaches from California. Creamy cottage cheese. Serve with rye crisp. Mmm, mmm. Space Patrol came to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Wheat checks, rice checks, and good hot Ralston present Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy are in a magnetic tunnel car. A tunnel car in a mine shaft deep below the surface of the planet Venus. As they rise toward ground level, Happy prepares the weapons they hope will enable them to rescue Tonga from two criminals. Two ray guns each. That ought to be enough. We'll have to be careful. We can't give them a chance to harm Tonga. It'll be dark in an hour or so. Then we can sneak up on them. What was that? An explosion. Dratcher's blown up the entrance to the tunnel. We're sealed in. Oh, brace yourself. Our tunnel car is going to crash. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Caverns of Venus. Space Patrol! A cyclone? Uh Uh-uh. Just Johnny Jones rushing out the door to the grocery. Gang, he just heard there's a swell surprise inside of every new package of checks. Man, oh man, oh man. Uh Uh-uh, Johnny's found the surprise. A magic space picture for Wowie. Wowie is right. Gang, with a magic space picture, you can have the time of your life. First, you stare at the mysterious picture. What is it? Who is it? It's hard to tell. But then, then you look up at the sky or at a wall, and suddenly... Jumping Jupiter! I can see a flying saucer in the sky. Gosh, this picture really is magic. Magic and how? Why, with magic space pictures, you can see all kinds of objects floating in space. Objects so big and clear, you'll think they're real. Flying saucer, rocket ship, planet Saturn, Buzz Corey, Cadet Happy. These are just a few of the magic space pictures. Altogether, there are 24, all different. And you get one inside of every new package of checks. So start collecting the whole set of 24 magic space pictures today. Look for the packages of rice checks and wheat checks with Buzz Corey or Cadet Happy on the outside and the magic space picture on the inside. And now, today's space patrol adventure, The Caverns of Venus. Buzz Corey and Cadet Happy, aboard their space battle cruiser, Tef 5, are en route to the planet Mars to see Tonga, who's been in the Mars capital, Lowell City, for several weeks. Under orders from Major Robertson, she's been investigating repeated disappearances of critical materials from government and private manufacturing plants. At this moment, the commander is briefing Happy on their procedure for contacting Tonga. Tonga's code message didn't give us much information, Happy. However, she seems to have uncovered a clue on how the robberies are being committed. 
Where do we meet her, Commander? There's a small science library on a side street in Lowell City. It's used by engineers and other technical workers. At 1700 hours universal star time, Tonga will be in the number four microfilm projection room. Well, it sounds like a nice, quiet place. I'm really anxious to hear what Tonga's found. We'll know in an hour or so, Happy. Contact Lowell City Space Control for landing procedure. Right, sir. Cadet Happy aboard Terra 5 calling Space Control Lowell City Mars. Cadet Happy aboard Terra 5 calling Space Control Lowell City. Here we are, Dracha. This is her apartment. Try the door. It's locked. Yeah. This electronic key will open it. We'll have to work fast. She may come back any minute. Close the door. Okay, Wharton, get busy. Look through the desk. I'll search these built-in drawers. Okay. Well, personally, I don't think the girl's a space patrol agent at all. Oh, you don't, eh? Huh? Well, she's only been working at the electronics plant for three weeks, and she wanders all over the factory, into every section. That's just a gad about. You know how some women are. Maybe she's just ambitious. Wants to advance. Well, she's too ambitious to suit me. Here. Yeah. Look at this. What is it? Notes on various employees at the plant. Just listen to this. Hastings frequently less to leave his section after work. Drives expensive surface cars. <laughs> Maybe she's got a crush on Hastings. Yeah. Anyway, let her watch him. Hastings isn't one of our men. And here's a sketch of the shipping room and a schedule of the departure time. Well, there still isn't much to worry about. She can't find out how we operate. Maybe not. But I will have to watch her from now on. Come on, let's get out of here. All right. Hey, wait a minute. Look at this. That's just a pill. Yeah? Well, look at it closely. Oh, one of the amnesia dream pills. That's right. We'd better take it before she has it analyzed. Uh, how do we know this is the only one she has? If she finds out there is chemical in these tablets which will give a person a partial lapse of memory. She'll know how we smuggle things out of the factory. Yeah, we can't take any more chances. Find her, trail her. And the first chance we get, we'll fix her so she won't cause any trouble. Yeah. Here's projection room four, Dracha. The microfilm projector's running. Yeah, I hear it. She must have the lights off if she's running the machine. I know where the switch is. Good. Open the door and turn the lights on quickly. Come in, come... Oh... Oh, I'm sorry. This room is in use. Yeah, we know. Shut the door, Wharton. I'll turn off this projector. What's the meaning of this? Get out of here right away. I'll call the attendant. The attendant is locked in the cloakroom. There's no one else in the library. I don't know who you are, but I've seen this other man at the factory. I'll report him to the superintendent. You won't report anything to anybody. You've done your last bit of spying. What are you talking about? What are you holding behind your back? Come on. Let's have a look. Here, hold it. Let go of me. It's an envelope. It's like the commander Corey of the Space Patrol. What's in it, Dutcher? A copy of the papers we found in her apartment. In the security department, Kemet's report on the anti-radiation pills. He's listed two grains of amnesodrin among the ingredients. His comment is... Enough to cause temporary and partial lapse of memory for a period of one hour. Oh, lucky we followed her here. Come on. We'll take her out to the back door, to our surf car. Why not finish her off here? Not a bad idea. There's nobody in the building. Take your hands off me. There's no use struggling, sister. All right, let's go, of her. It's Corey. Get him. <laughs> when he's laid on Morton, I'll get him with this chair. Commander, no. look out. It's not cold. Now let's finish them both. No. Corey may have somebody outside. Get those papers and let's get out of here through the back door. Right. Commander. Oh. Commander. Oh. No, we've got to stop them. Commander. Commander, somebody locked the attendant in. Tonga, what's happened? Two men knocked the commander out. They ran out the rear door. Are you all right, Commander? Yes. They took the evidence I had for you. We'll get more. Meanwhile, we know who we're after. Let's get to Lowell City Headquarters and send out an arm. We'll put guards at the spaceport. 
And this fellow Wharton worked at the electronics plant, huh? That's right, Commander. Drudge I've never seen before. Oh, it's the intercom. I'll get it. Colonel Carter's office. Commander Corey here. Oh, I'll take the message. I see. Well, good work, Major. Thanks. That was Major Blake. He's making a complete check of the electronics plant. The employees you mentioned will be brought in for questioning. I'm afraid that would do much good, Commander. Oh, yes, the amnesodrin. As Dr. Ryan explained it to me, the amnesodrin doesn't interfere with a person's ability to carry out routine tasks. If he's told to do some apparently harmless act, he'll do it. But an hour or so later, he'll have forgotten it. Well, then it's no wonder Dratcher and Wharton's gang could get away with thousands of credits worth of equipment and materials. They had perfectly honest people doing their dirty work. Why do you suspect the pills in the first place, Tonga? Well, it took a lot of little incidents before I really got to wondering. Once I misplaced a test meter. One of the girls said I put her on the bench. Mm -hmm. I was certain I hadn't. But there it was. I had no recollection of putting it there. Later, I noticed other people forgetting things. All of a sudden, it occurred to me that in every case, we'd been given an anti-radiation tablet. Commander. Oh, yes, Happy. The duty officer just got a report from the captain of the spaceport guards. About Ratcher and Wharton? Well, no, sir, at least not directly. But they've traced some stolen equipment to a small robot cargo ship at the port. Have the guards removed the equipment? No, sir, they're standing by for orders. Oh, that's a break. Now, maybe we can find out how Dratcher and Wharton dispose of these stolen supplies. How, Commander? They're going to put a miniature spacophone tracer transmitter in that ship. By keeping spacophone fixes on it, you'll know where it is from the minute it blasts off till it lands. Come on, Happy, let's get to the spaceport. Well, there's no one around the ship, sir. Okay, Happy, let's get aboard quickly. It's dark enough at this part of the field. Don't flash your atomic light, Happy. One of Dratcher's gang may be watching. Got the transmitter? Right here, sir. Come on. Maybe they won't take a chance of blasting off this robot ship, Commander. I think they will. I want to get this evidence out of the way. Open the hatch, Happy. Now, wait till I close the hatch before you turn on your atomic light. Yes, sir. Well, we put the tracer transmitter, sir. Up in the control compartment. We'll conceal it just in case someone comes aboard before blast off. They must not be planning to blast off right away. Space control tower hasn't been notified. Mm, let's take a look at this cargo section, Happy. I'd like to see what's in here so we can identify it later. All right, Commander. Shine your light around. Wow. This hold is really loaded. Mm, look at this stuff. There's a fortune and equipment in here. And stolen by people who didn't even realize what they were doing. Whoever loaded this robot ship knew what they were doing all right. Hey, how did that passageway door close? Slam shut. Open it, Happy, and prop it open until we finish inspecting this hold. It's stuck. Here, I'll give you a hand. That's locked. Somebody slammed it on us. I didn't hear anybody out there. We had tripped an automatic mechanism, electronic beam. Well, how are we going to get out? Hey, Commander, hang on. The ship's blasting off. Well, it's as though we'll find out where the ship's going sooner than we expected. We're lucky we got that tracer transmitter. Uh, yeah. We could send a distress signal. Turn it on, Happy. Sir, I I haven't got the transmitter. What? I left it in the forward compartment, and it isn't even turned on. We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. How does he do it, gang? He sees flying saucers in the sky. He sees a robot man on the wall. He sees the planet Saturn floating in the clouds. You bet I do. And sometimes, up there in space, I see a rocket ship or a speeding jet car. Gang, how does he do it? What magic power does this boy have? No magic power to it. Magic space pictures. That's my secret. Yes, sir, gang. That's the secret. Magic Space Pictures. And with these wonderful pictures, you can see flying saucers and robot men in the sky, too. You can even see pictures of Tonga in the sky and Mate Robertson and Carol. Pictures so big and clear, they practically look real. It's fun, gang, and it's easy. You just stare at the magic space picture, look up into the sky, and zowie, the magic goes to work. There in the sky, you see the magic space picture, real big and real clear. There are 24 different magic space pictures, and you get one inside of every new package of checks. So start collecting these wonderful magic space pictures now. Swap them with your pals. Be the first one in your gang to have the whole set of 24. Just get the new packages of rice checks and wheat checks with Buzz Corey and Cadet Happy on outside and the amazing magic space picture on the inside. <laughs> 
And now, back to our Space Patrol adventure, The Caverns of Venus. Buzz and Happy entered a robot spaceship at a Lowell City spaceport on the planet Mars to install a tracer spaceophone transmitter. In this way, Buzz hoped to learn the destination of the ship being used by a gang of thieves to transport stolen equipment. But Happy left the transmitter outside a cargo hold. While they were inspecting the stolen loot, the door slammed shut, locking them in the hold. Then the robot ship blasted off, leaving the unwilling passengers with no way to summon help. For hours now, Buzz and Happy have been trying vainly to force open the heavy metal door. Happy, notice the deceleration? Yes, sir. Hey, we're going to land. It's about time. We must be nearly to Pluto. Well, it hasn't been as long as it seems, Happy. That's a bad break, my leaving the transmitter outside the hold. I've gotten this into a fine mess. Oh, it wasn't your fault the door slammed shut. But, sir, nobody knows where we are. We don't even know. Well, we know this much. When that door opens, we're going to be in for a nice battle with whoever is going to unload this stuff. Commander, I just thought of something. What if we land on a moon without air? Uh, the men will be wearing spacesuits, and we'll be finished. But if there is an atmosphere, we stand a fighting chance. Get your ray gun ready, Hap. The ship's landing. Commander, aren't they going to open that door? We've been sitting here for an hour. Maybe they just wanted to get the ship off Mars. Yeah, and, and just leave it sit here on, well, wherever we are. It's not a very cheerful thought, but it's a possibility. Well, sir, we can't stand this much longer. The oxygen must be just about all gone as it is. Uh, I'm getting kind of sleepy. I'll try to stay awake, Cap. When that door opens, we've got to be ready to give a good account of ourselves. Uh, sure. I'll do my best, uh awful sleepy, but I, I don't... I, Happy. Uh, Happy, wake up. Happy, don't go to... <laughs> now, isn't that touching? Both of them sound mm. asleep. <laughs> yeah, their ray guns in their hands. It's lucky I forced the sleeping gas under the door. Yeah. Now, what do we do with them? We'll take them to the stone house and lock them up. When they wake, we'll find out how much the space patrol knows about us. Then what? We'll wait to see if this robot ship has been trailed. If not, we'll know we're safe here on Venus. Well, if the ship were being followed, whoever it was would be here by now. Let's play it safe. For cut, I want to produce Corey alive. I'll carry Corey. You take the cadet. Okay, gotcha. Uh, that's heavier than he looked. <coughs> Corey's no lightweight either. All right, let's get going. Uh, what was that? Oh, I guess I kicked one of their tama lights rolled over there somewhere in the dark. Uh, take it easy going down that ladder. Come on. Come on. Corey, wake up. You two cadets have had a nice long nap. Snap out of it. Hey, hey, what's the big idea? Leave him alone. Ah, so Corey's awake. Now we can talk. Dratcher and Wharton. That's right. Our meeting in the library on Mars was somewhat brief, but I see you managed to catch our names. Too bad that girl spy of yours isn't along, Corey. This will make a nice reunion. <laughs> She's back in Lowell City getting information on you guys that'll fix your rockets for good. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Now, tell us what information does she have. Come on, let's have it. Corey, you and the cadet better speak up. You're a long way from help. Where are we? You're on Venus. A very rugged, remote part of Venus. Well, that tells us a lot. Well, it doesn't matter. But since you're so curious, uh, do you know the Gorbeton Mountain region? Yes. You're right in the heart of that range, near the old Tungsten mine. This is your chief hideout, I suppose. Ah, it's more than that. This rock house is only a part of our merchandising venture. Yeah, quite a bit of it is underground. We got thousands upon thousands of credits worth of equipment stored away in the lower levels of the mine shaft. And enough food and water to last us for years, along with a supply of weapons. All set to stand a siege, huh? If necessary. However, I don't think that situation will arise. You see... Wharton and I are the only ones who know you're here. How did you get off Mars? You weren't in the robot ship, were you? No. We managed to get a ship belonging to a member of my organization. We controlled the robot ship from there. 
One of our men saw you get aboard in space and phoned us the information. Mm -hmm. uh, now that we've been so free with our information, suppose you tell us... Roger. Uh... Listen. What? Uh, thought I heard a spaceship. Uh, I don't hear anything. <sighs> Guess I'm getting jumpy. Yeah. Uh, all right, Corey. Just what information does the Space Patrol have about Wharton and me? You're wasting your time, Dracha. I have plenty of time. Sorry I can't say the same for you. Perhaps a few hours or days without food and water will loosen your tongue. Come on, Wharton. Let's leave our guests alone for a while. Lock the door as we leave. Gee, sir, I'm sure hungry. Try not to think about it, Happy. Yes, sir. I wish there was some way to break out of this place. The walls are a foot thick. Yeah, if I could be sure where Dratcher and Wharton are, we might try the window. Yeah. We'd better do it before we get too weak. Oh, the fluoride glass won't break. We could pry the lock loose, but well, there's nothing to pry with. I've looked. There's not even anything under the bed, if and call that hunk of junk a bed. The bed? That's it. Huh? Well, how can we pry it with a bed? It's got a steel frame, Happy. If we can work the bolts loose, we can use one side of the frame as a crowbar. That's great, Commander. Let's get to work. It's going to be a tight squeeze getting through the window, but as soon as you hit the ground, head for Dratcher's spaceship. Right, sir. Well, at least we've got one break. Hey, these bolts are loose. Looks like we won't have any trouble with this. Now, Corey may not be ready to talk yet, but I'll bet that cadet's getting mighty hungry. What you ought to do is separate him. We could probably work on the cadet if the commander wasn't there to bolster his courage. Mm, you may have something, Warden. It's worth a try. We'll go to the stone house and take the cadet out to our shack. I got you. Uh, look, they're out. They're running for your ship. Uh, quick. Head them off. Hurry, Happy. Into the ship. They're cutting us off. They've got ray guns, too, sir. I head the other way toward the mountain. Yes, sir. We'll hide till it's dark. Let him go. Why waste our breath running? What are we going to do out there in the mountains? There's no food or water. Okay, you're right, right there. They'll come crawling back in a few hours. Well, if they don't, we just saved ourselves a nasty jar. We've got to keep watching those spaceships off. Yeah, we'll take turns. Wharton, just keep walking and don't turn your head. Well, what's the matter? You did hear a spaceship after all. That fool girl has come here. What? Yeah. She's hiding around the corner of the shack. She armed? Yeah. Ray gun. Pretend we're going to walk right past the shack. I'll get you. Okay. So, uh, why should we take 10,000 credits now when we can get twice that much by waiting a few weeks? Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, Dracha. But on the other hand, we could use a little ready cash. Well, I'm not saying we can, but... Oh, take the tray, gun, man. Oh, please. We said drop it. Oh. Hold still and you won't get hurt. You made a very bad mistake by coming here, Tonga. What have you done with Commander Corey and Happy? They aren't around right now. But I think they'll be back before long. When they get a look at our new visitor. I guess they aren't coming after us. No. We'll wait till dark, then try to surprise them. Let's rest a minute. They're standing down there by the shack. I can... Hey, Commander, it looks like there's somebody with them. Smoke and rockets, Commander. It's Tonga. How did she get here? You just pop out of the ground? Wharton did hear a spaceship after all. She must have landed on the other side of the mountain. We can't leave Tonga with those two rats. What'll we do now? Wait a minute. Dratchers said there were food and weapons down in the mine shafts. Hey, that's right. There must be an opening up there. A few hundred yards. Come on. We're in luck. A tunnel car. But it looks like there's no power. It's a magnetic car with self-contained power unit. We can zip down the shaft and come back with food and ray guns. Get in, Hap. Hey, this thing's just like a miniature spaceship. Only much simpler to operate. Shut the door and shove off. Here we go. I 
unlock the controls of the robot ship and my space cruiser, Tunga, in case Corey and the kid are trying to pull a fast one. They'll find a way to get you. Yeah? Well, I found something, too, in the robot ship. This miniature spacerphone transmitter. So that's how you traced us here. Not entirely. When the commander in Happy didn't come back from the Lowell City spaceport, I blasted off on the trajectory that space control said the robot ship was on. I didn't hear the tracer signal until the robot ship had landed. What? Wharton must have kicked it on when he dragged the kid out of the ship. Gotcha. We got a problem. Wharton, I told you to go over the mountains and smash the controls of Tunga's ship so Corey can blast off. He's not going over the mountain. He's going under it. Corey could have gone down in the mines. What? Could have taken the tunnel car. They'll be back up here in a few minutes with weapons of their own. We got to stop that. How can we? Get some cosmic detonators and close up the opening. No. No, you can't do that. I'll watch the girl. Hurry. Bless that tunnel lantern. Two ray guns apiece. That ought to be enough. We'll wait till dark and sneak up on them. There's the entrance up ahead. What was that? Commander, look out up ahead. Stop! The tunnel's caved in. Brace yourself. We're going to crash. Wow. Are you all right, Happy? I just bumped my head a little, but I'm okay. They've blown up the tunnel entrance. There are tons of rock between us and the surface. How are we going to get out? Get out of the tunnel car, Happy. Bring your tunnel light. Hey, shine your light over there. Seems to be a small side passage this side of the cave in. That's funny. I didn't notice that passageway when we came in. Let's have a look. You can't leave them down there in that shaft. You can't. And just how would you suggest we go about getting them out? You'll pay for this. Well, watch the girl. No, no, you don't. I'll fix both of you. Oh, you will, huh? Tie her up. We can't wash her all the time. All right, watch her, Wharton. Call him up. Look out, Commander. Take care of Wharton, happy. Right. Well, Wharton won't bother us for a while, Commander. That's enough, Corey. Get up. Got the guns happy? Yes, sir. Oh, Commander, and happy. I-, I thought they had you sealed in the mine. Now, we found a passage leading to a small opening several hundred yards up the slope. Another opening? I didn't know there was one. The explosion must have opened up an old passageway in the mine. Huh? That just shows you, Dratcher. You don't know your own mind. <laughs> we'll be back in just a moment with a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four. Yes, sir, gang, there's 24 different magic space pictures. And Buzz Corey wants you to have all of them, just like real space patrollers do. There's three of Buzz Corey, and they're all different. There's two of Cadet Happy. And two of Tonga. There's a magic space picture of Buzz Corey's insignia. And the space patrol badge. There's a space liner pilot. A picture of Major Robertson. A jet car. A flying saucer. A rocket ship. A planet Saturn. A space pirate. The deadly iron fist. And all kinds of other magic space pictures. They work real easy, gang. First, you stare at the mysterious picture. What is it? Who is it? You can't tell. Then, you look up at the sky or at a wall. And hocus pocus, the magic goes to work. You see a giant space picture floating in the sky. And it's so big and clear, it almost looks like the real object or person. Fun man oh man. So, gang, start now. Collect all 24 of the magic space pictures. There's only one place to get them, and that's inside of every new package of checks. So look for the new packages of rice checks and wheat checks with Buzz Corey or Cadet Happy on the outside and the swell magic space picture on the inside. (laughs) And now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy are exploring a deserted city on the planet Saturn. As they enter a room filled with precious gems, a stealthy figure slinks to the door and aims a ray gun at them. Look out, Commander. He's got a ray gun. He's firing. Quick, Cap, run down that passage. Keep going. He's right behind us. It's dark in here. He won't be able to see us. Uh Uh-oh. Commander, it's a dead-end passage. We're trapped. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, 
the forgotten city, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! Boys and girls, this is your commander with a vital message. Answer the call of the helpless by giving like a real space patroller to the 1953 American Red Cross Fund. Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmer as Commander Corey and Glenn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Nina Berra, Bela Kovach, Ken Mayer, and Stephen Robertson. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol. Be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. This transcribed program came to you from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston present Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Ory, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy are exploring a deserted city on the planet Saturn. As they enter a room filled with precious gems, a stealthy figure slinks to the door and aims a ray gun at them. Look out, Commander. He's got a ray gun. He's firing. Quick, Cap, run down that passage. Keep going, Happy. He's right behind us. It's dark in here. He won't be able to see us. Uh Uh-oh. Commander, it's a dead-end passage. We're trapped. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Forgotten City. It's the serial of the future, the real space serial. The serial that's different from any other serial in the universe. The serial you see on Commander Corey's own breakfast table. Delicious Rice Checks, the cereal with a flavor like no other flavor in all the universe. Delicious Rice Checks, crisp shredded rice spun in that modern bite-sized design for easy eating. Delicious Rice Checks, a real space cereal. Gang, those bite-sized biscuits have space inside so they can fill up with milk or cream. Try Rice Checks today, the only bite-sized rice cereal in the universe. Rice Checks. The only official Space Patrol rice cereal, Rice Chex. The super cereal that helps to supercharge you. Rice Chex at your grocer's in the brand new red and white checkerboard package with Buzz Corey or Cadet Happy on the outside and the magic space picture on the inside. Rice Chex. Rice Chex. Rice Chex. Rice Chex. Rice And now, today's Space Patrol adventure, The Forgotten City. Buzz and Happy are flying low over the Sender Mountains on the planet Saturn, searching for a trace of a meteorology specialist believed to have crashed in his atmosphere ship in the rugged region. So far, their spacephone receiver has failed to pick up a signal from the automatic transmitter carried by the scientist, Byron Stearns. Professor Stern's transmitter must have finally conked out, Commander. According to Space Control, Saturn, we're very close to the point from which the signal came. Watch a viewscope, Hap. We may be able to spot the wreckage. It must have been a pretty good crash to knock out that automatic transmitter. Well, let's hope Stern's had time to get a spacesuit. The ship's hull was smashed. He couldn't survive very long in this part of Saturn. Well, what was it he was trying to tell Space Control just before the emergency transmitter cut on? Well, there was a lot of interference, Happy. Almost like a jamming signal, according to Space Control. The operator thought Stearns was telling him about sighting another atmosphere ship making close passes at him. Stunting or on a lab ship? Uh, If we can prove stunting was responsible for whatever happened to Professor Stearns, some pilot will be grounded permanently. If he saw Professor Stearns was in trouble, he probably got away from this area as fast as he could. We may not be able to trail him. Uh, We'll see. If that was the case, the pilot was further negligent in not notifying space control that the lab ship was in trouble. We'll just keep searching. 
The last signal from the professor's emergency transmitter tells us that his ship was grounded. I hope he didn't end up in one of those narrow ravines. Well, there's a chance he might have landed on the other side of the mountain, Inge. We'll round that peak and circle back. Commander, am I having hallucinations? What do you mean? Well, I was sure we were 100 DUs from the nearest city, but isn't that an atmosphere shell way up there on that mountain? Yeah, it certainly is. And it's no hallucination. That's the Dome of Rubeck. Rubeck? Yes, Rubeck, the forgotten city of Saturn. Well, what's it doing out there in the Sindar range? It was built centuries ago by one of Saturn's first space pioneers, a man named Lucian Rubeck. It's the last remaining privately owned city in the solar system. It doesn't look very big by modern standards. Still, it's pretty impressive, stuck way up there in the mountains. It's been deserted for nearly a hundred years, Happy. Lucian Rubeck's descendants lived there for several generations, and they gradually drifted away to the largest cities on the planet. The Forgotten City. I'd like to visit it sometime. It's pretty interesting. I understand it may be reopened by the government as a museum or put to some other use. That is, if none of the surviving Rubeck family object. Well, why should they object? They, they are using the place. Technically, it's still their property. The government's legal staff has been trying to locate the Rubeck heirs, if any are still alive. Space Control Saturn calling Commander Corey aboard Terra 5. Space Control Saturn calling Commander Corey. Corey here, go ahead. A commander of a space patrol ship has located uh, Professor Stearns. Is he all right? Oh, yes, sir. He was wearing a spacesuit, wandering around in the Vulcan range, dazed and shaken. The Vulcan range? That's a hundred DUs from the Sendar region. Uh, yes, sir. The automatic transmitter could have been out of adjustment. I'm glad he's been found. Did he say how he crashed? He wasn't able to give much information, Commander, and we haven't found the wreckage of his ship. Where is he now? He's being brought to Saturn City Hospital. He's under the care of a space surgeon in the patrol ship. Withdraw all patrols except a squadron in the Vulcan range. They'll proceed with the search till Stern's ship is found. Yes, Commander. Hurry out. Well, that's rather strange, isn't it, sir? About Stern showing up in the Vulcan range? Yes, sir. He was probably confused about his exact location. The important thing is he's safe. Yeah, and very lucky. His best bet would have been to stay with the wrecked ship instead of wandering through the mountains. We'll give Stern's a chance to recover from his ordeal before we question him. In the meantime, are you still curious about the Forgotten City? Yes, sir. Then get out our spacesuits. We'll land outside the dome and do a little investigating. Here's the lock control switch. Hey, that doesn't look so ancient. It's in Durium. Just as shiny as if it had been installed yesterday. I hope the power's still on. We'll know in a minute. I'll open the switch housing. Let's see. Where's the inside control? Oh, here we are. Well, so far, so good. Now, let's try the inner lock and go into Rubeck City. Once you get inside the dome, this city really looks big. A hundred years ago, Rubeck City was one of the most important settlements on Saturn, Happy. Yeah, and now it's completely deserted. Hap, check your atmosphere indicator. Yes, sir. Say, that's funny. According to the indicator, the city's air is fit to breathe after a hundred years. And then we can open the faceplates of our helmets. <sighs> See, the air is really fresh. How do you account for that, Commander? Well, there are two explanations. The dome is so well constructed that none of the poisonous Saturn air has leaked in... Or else the atmosphere washing plant is still in operation. After a hundred years? Well, it wouldn't have to work very often. Everything inside the city shell to use up the air. See, yeah, that's right. Smoke and rockets. This is some city. Look at that tower up there. Uh, Rubeck Tower. Lucian Rubeck designed it himself. He had his headquarters in the top floor. And now Rubeck is a ghost city. Completely deserted. Uh, makes you realize how impermanent human beings are. Uh-oh. What is it, sir? What'd you find? A small bottle lying on the sidewalk. Oh, probably thrown there by one of the last people to leave Rubeck. It's a medicine bottle. Space sickness formula CH-12. And whoever threw it there hasn't been troubled with space sickness for a hundred years. I'm not so sure. This is a new formula, Happy. Hasn't been on the market more than six months. What? Keep your eyes open, Hap. Evidently, Rubeck City isn't as deserted as we thought. Come in. Orlana. There are visitors in the city. I know, Shefka. I've been watching them from the tower room. They're space patrolmen. What are they doing here? we got to get rid of them. Don't get excited, Shefka. 
By their casual attitude, they must think the city's deserted. But no one ever comes here. They must know something. If they suspected what we're using the city for, they'd have brought more men with them. Let them snoop around. It isn't likely they'll come up here. But suppose Graken comes back while they're here. I've contacted Graken by space affirm. He'll keep away from the city until the space patrolmen leave. Did he get rid of the lab ship pilot? Yes. Turn him loose in the Vulcan Mountains. Pilot's already been picked up. Suppose he tells them he was shut down near Rubak. Oh, he's in a very dazed, confused condition. Graken saw to that. Space Patrol will assume the pilot was mistaken. Besides, you removed all trace of the wreckage of his ship. Yes, and I destroyed the automatic transmitter. Then there's nothing to worry about. But old Lana, the Space Patrol men in the city... I know why they're here. The government's getting ready to take over Rubeck. We'll have to leave before they find the stolen jewels and space credits we hidden here. They won't search the city when they find out I'm the great-great-granddaughter of Lucy and Rubeck. What? You are a descendant of Lucy and Rubeck? No, of course not. But I can convince the government I am. I'm having special documents forged in Saturn City right now. I'll be able to convince the most skeptical attorney that I'm really the only living legal heir to Rubeck City. Mm, I hope so. But I still don't like the idea of those space patrolmen snooping around. Let them snoop. And don't interfere, understand? Hey, this is some building, Commander. Yes, Happy. Rubeck spent a fortune on this one building alone. Here's the elevator, sir. Shall we go up to the tower? We could get a real good look at the city from there. Just a minute, Happy. Look at the carvings on this door. I'll bet anything Lucian Rubeck had this imported from the planet Earth. Mm hmm. The looks of it, the door was taken from an ancient Oriental temple. From a deserted city on Earth to a deserted city on Saturn. Mm. It's a massive handle. You don't see metalwork of this kind anymore, Happy. I wonder where this door leads. Commander, there's a light on in there. Mm, flashed on automatically when I opened the door. Let's have a look. We'll go up to the tower later. Yes, sir. Hey, this must have been Lucian Rubeck's treasure room. It's amazing. Look at those gold and silver goblets and old-fashioned candlesticks. And look, an ancient platinum electric lampstand. I thought Rubeck's descendants had cleaned out everything of value from the city, but apparently I was wrong. Imagine all this stuff sitting here for hundreds of years and, and with no lock on the door. Hold on a minute, Happy. This object isn't a hundred years old. Why, it's a model spaceship studded with jewels. Yes, yeah, and a very recent model, too, Get it. Diamonds and rubies. Happy, listen. I heard a sound at the door. Uh oh. Somebody's out there. Look out, Commander. There's a man with a ray gun. Hold your fire. We're space patrolmen. That's why I am shooting. Quick, Happy, down this passage. Look. You aren't going to escape that way. Keep going, Happy's right behind us. Yes, sir. It's dark in here. He won't be able to see us. Commander, it's a dead end passage. We're trapped. That's right. You're trapped. And I'm going to wait right here and pick you off, one at a time. We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. Hi, gang. Captain Dick Tufel speaking from the planet Earth. Doing a man-on-the-street broadcast this morning. And to see what some of these kids here on Earth think about the three official Space Patrol breakfast cereals. Now, here's a sharp-looking lad. Say there, what would you say the very first time you tried bite-sized wheat checks? I said... Mmm! <laughs> and here's another fine looking chap. Son, what did you say the very first time you tried bite size rice checks? I said. <whistles> and here's still another youngster. Tell me, what's your opinion of instant Ralston, the hot super cereal made of rich whole wheat? Man, oh man, oh man, oh man! <laughs> Try them yourself, gang. You'll say the very same thing. Mmm! <whistles> man, oh man, oh man! Yes, get them today, boys and girls. Rice checks, wheat checks, good hot Ralston. And remember, checks now have a brand new package with Buzz Courier Cadet Happy on the outside and the magic space picture on the inside. And now back to Space Patrol and the adventure of a forgotten city. Buzz and Happy were searching for an atmosphere ship crashed in the cinder mountains of Saturn near the deserted city of Rubeck. After learning from space control that the missing pilot has been found a hundred DUs away, Buzz and Happy decided to visit the deserted city. They entered the atmosphere shell without any trouble, but unknown to the space patrolman, Rubeck is being used by a woman named Orlana as a hideout for stolen jewels. 
While Buzz and Happy were examining a treasure room in the base of a tower, they were fired upon by Orlana's henchman, Shefka. Now Shefka has them cornered in a darkened passage and is waiting to shoot them with his ray gun. Happy. Yes, sir. He can't see us. Lie down flat on the floor and make a scuffling noise with your boots. When he fires at the place he thinks you are, I'll rush him. Yes, sir. Don't try to sneak up on me. I can hear every move you make. I warned you. I'll take that ray gun. Have you got him, sir? No, stay down, Happy. He broke loose after him, Happy. Yes, sir. There he goes to that door. He's locked that door on us. We're in a spot. It's opening, sir. After him, quickly. He's in the elevator, Commander. Come out of there. Oh, he's going up to the tower. He'll take the stairs. Come on, Happy. You fool. You blundering fool. But they were in a treasure room at the base of the tower. What if they were? I could have explained everything that's there. I'm going to have a difficult time now after your idiotic interference. I'm sorry, Orlana. I only did what I thought was best. Attacking space patrolmen. They'd never have known anyone was in the city if you'd obeyed my orders. What are we going to do now? I'll have to face them and make an explanation. They're probably searching the tower now. If you get me another gun, I could still fight them off. No. Get in the next room and contact Graken. Tell him to come in whether the Space Patrol ship's outside the shell or not. I thought that... You've done all the thinking you're going to do. From now on, just do what I tell you. If I can explain our presence here, I can explain Graken. Mm. If the Space Patrol's skeptical, mm. well, Graken's a good man to have around. Yes, uh, Graken can handle them. If you keep your mouth shut, we won't need Graken. Now go on, make that space phone call. Yes, Orlana. I'll go out and look for our visit. This is the top floor of the tower, sir. Yeah. Now, be careful, Happy. We'll search every room. Oh, wait till I get my hands on that character. Hap, hold it. Hmm? There's someone on the other side of that door. Oh, there you are. I was hoping I'd find you. We're looking for someone, too. Oh, you mean Shefka, my assistant. He told me what happened. I'm terribly sorry. Where is he? I want to talk to him. Well, please step in here. He'll be right out. Thanks. Come on, Happy. Yes, sir. I'm Commander Corey of the Space Patrol. And I'm Orlana Rubik. Rubeck. Then you're related to the Lucian Rubeck who built this city. Yes, that's right. He was my great-great-grandfather. I was under the impression that the city was deserted. Well, I came here a few months ago with a couple of servants. Shefka, the, the man who fired at you, has been with the family for years. Does he always treat visitors so cordially? Oh, really, I'm awfully sorry about that. Shefka has a great sense of loyalty. He thinks his chief duty is to protect me. So why do you live here in this deserted city? Well, I'm not surprised that you're curious... But the explanation is very simple. I'm writing a book about my family. And you like to work in the solitude, huh? Yes, it's a great inspiration to work right here in Rubeck City, where so much of Saturn's history was made. And, too, there are many ancient records and family documents right at hand. I see. I suppose that you can prove that you're a member of the Rubeck family. Oh, naturally. I can refer you to some influential people in Saturn City. Fine. Now, would you bring your servant out here, please? Well, yes. I'll be only a moment. Well, sir, what do you think? I don't know. I guess writing a book is as good an explanation for being here as any. As a matter of fact, a book about the Rubex would no doubt be very popular, but we'll see. Hey, Commander, look at this plastic folder. It was on the desk. Let me see. Looks like an official identification folder. Happy, this is Byron Stern's ID folder. What? The lab ship pilot? Yes. He was found in the Vulcan Mountains. His identification folder is here in Rubex City. Wow. How could he... Sh- She's coming back. Act as though nothing happened. Yeah. Oh, here he is, Commander. This is Shefka. Hey, Commander Corey, please accept my apology. I was greatly in the wrong. I acted from a mistaken sense of duty. If you thought we were intruders, there'd be some excuse. But have you forgotten that you seemed to accept the fact that we were space patrolmen at the time? Well, I... I acted on impulse, Commander. Again, I am sorry. All right, Shefka. Uh, Miss Rubeck. Yes, Commander. I was just telling Cadet Happy that a book on the Rubeck family ought to be very popular. Well, I hope so, Commander. I'd like to look over the first few chapters of your manuscript. Well, as a matter of fact, I'm merely in the note-gathering stage right now. There's really nothing down in manuscript form that anyone could read but myself. I see. Then would you show me around the tower? I imagine you must have a lot of family curios. Well, uh, is this an official search, Commander? No, I don't have a warrant, but... If you object to an informal tour... Oh, no, no, not at all. Uh, Chef can I be delighted to show you around. 
Judging by a few items, Happy and I saw down below, this ought to be very interesting. Well, I think you've seen just about every room in the tower, Commander. How about that room over there? Oh, that's just a closet for uh, cleaning supplies. Would you mind opening it? Well, really, Commander, I... Or I, uh, I could come back with a warrant and a squad of patrolmen. Very well, if you insist. But there's really nothing in there. Unlock it, Shefka. But Orlana... Open it, Shefka. All right. Wow. Well, some real old family heirlooms. Stacks of space credits. And brand new. All that money in a closet for cleaning supplies? I suppose it is rather odd. But then here in this deserted city, one place is as good as another. I'd like to ask you something, Miss Rubeck. How do you happen to have an identification holder belonging to a space patrol scientist named Byron Stearns? Byron Stearns? Uh... I don't understand. Stearns was reported in trouble in this area, then was rescued in the Vulcan Mountain region. I'm waiting for an explanation, Miss Rubeck. Great, and get some. Uh, hold on up. Look out, Commander. Uh, uh, that takes care of the big one. Now, for you, my smaller uh, friend. Take your big mitt off me. Quit struggling or I'll break your arm. Ow! Uh, that's better. I'll help uh, you, Graken. Get away, Shepka. So I can handle them. You got here just in time, Graken. What are they doing here? They just wandered in. But they know about that lab ship pilot. They found his identification folder. Then we'd better take care of them for good. I don't want any slip-ups this time, Graken. You better let me take care of it. He fumbled the last one. Don't listen to him, Arana. I can fix them. Hold still, Cadet. Ow! Oh! My shoulder! You'd better oh. hold still. Graken's capable of breaking you in two. Yeah. And Chef too, if he doesn't keep his mouth shut. That's enough of that, Graken. I need both of you. You see? You big Venus buffalo. Chef Stop break... that bickering! Watch those two space patrolmen. It's Graken's fault we're in this mess. He left the lab ship's pilot's folder in your office. That's enough of that, Shafka. If it hadn't been for your stupid behavior, these men would never have known we were here. Well, what did he do, Arlana? Doesn't matter. Just hold on to that cadet. Hold still, cadet, or I'll fix you like I did the other fellow. The other fellow is Commander Corey, the commander-in-chief of the space patrol. Oh, <laughs> oh, what do you think of that? I have knocked out the great Commander Corey. <laughs> That's just fine, Graken. Uh, but I've got more work for you to do. Oh, uh, yes. You and Shafka get rid of the commander's ship. Shafka, take the ship far away from here and hide it securely. Mm. Graken, you'll take my ship and bring Shafka back. Mm. Very well. But first, we've got to dispose of Corey and the cadet. I don't want any trace of them in case Rubeck City is searched by the space patrol. There's a room in the sub basement of the tower. Seal them in there, Graken. The room behind the stairs. Mm, yes. And make sure you seal the door up completely. I don't want anyone to suspect that there's even a room there. You leave it to me, Orlana. Shefka, you help Graken take these two down to the sub basement. Yes, Orlana. All right, go ahead, Graken. Orlana, what did Shefka do while I was gone? To, to bring the space patrolman here, huh? You just follow my orders, Graken. And Shefka, don't stand there with that smug look on your face. Both of you report to me when you're ready to hide the command. Commander. Commander. Uh, yes, Happy. We've got to do something quick. Where are we? In a room in the sub-basement of the tower. Orlana has one of her men sealing us up in here. Then they're going to get rid of our spaceship so nobody will come looking for it. That, that big bruiser is out there. See, you can see him through the window. Uh, is there anything in this room we can use as a weapon? Uh, no, sir, I've checked. All there is is well, some old books and filing cases. There's Graken grinning in here at us. He's getting ready to seal over the window. He's a monster of a man. He certainly is. He carried me down here under one arm. What are we going to do, sir? Well, if you only get him to open the door for a moment. But whatever we do, we've got to do it quickly. I don't see what we can do, sir. The door's locked and practically sealed. And and when Graken and Shefka get rid of Terra 5, nobody will ever even come down here looking for us. Where is Shefka? Up on the surface level, I think, waiting for Graken. I don't think those two like each other. They, they both seem to go out of their way to make the other look stupid in front of Orlana. Well, they do, huh? Yeah, Graken kept asking questions about what went on while he was away. I got the impression he wasn't very smart, but he's awfully inquisitive. And suspicious, perhaps. You'll see how curious he really is. Let's go to work in those books and filing cabinets, Happy. Huh? You take the files, act as though you've found something about Greg and point at him. Pretend we've found some information about him. Oh, I get it. As though Orlana had a secret file on her henchman here at Rubeck. That's the idea. If we can arouse Graken's curiosity, we might have a chance to get out of here. Is he 
you watching us, Happy? He sure is. He stops cementing up the door, and he's gawking in through the window. Point at him again, laugh. As though we had a great joke on him. It doesn't matter what you say. Point at the files, too. Yes, sir. <laughs> hey, well, what a dope this Graken is. You know, he's just about dumb enough to tear down that concrete and, and open the door and find out what we're doing in here. Keep it up, Happy. We've got him going. Yeah. Hey, look at that big, dumb face. He's just aching to know what we found in here in the files, Commander. <laughs> Commander, I think he's going to open the door. All right. Ignore him for a moment. Act very interested in the files. Here he comes. Hey, what have you got in there? Nothing. Oh, don't try to fool me. I've been watching you through the door. What does it say about me and Files? Why would there be anything about you in here, Graken? There's something in there. I know it. Some lies Shefka told Alana. Oh, sure. That's it. Shefka's up there now laughing at me. He figures he's tricked me into sealing up evidence against myself right where he can get his hands on him when he needs it. Graken, there's nothing in these files about you. Get out of the way. You can't fool him, Corey. Well, I guess that's right. Corey, you can't. Uh, got him, Commander? Uh, yeah. Oh! Uh, try to hold me, will you? Now, Corey. No, now, you, Graken. <laughs> Happy. Yes, sir. Hey, Commander, you knocked Drake and cold. Yeah. Let's get out of here before he comes to. Shefka, hasn't Graken finished sealing up that room yet? No, Orlana. But I could have done it in half the time. A clumsy oaf. We've got to get Corey's ship away from Rubeck City right away. While Graken and I are gone. You might hide the stolen money in Juke just in case the space patrol squad comes here. It's a good idea. We won't take any chances. Go down to the sub-basement and see what's taking Graken so long. I'm afraid that Graken got a little too curious, Alana. Corey! Shifka, do something! Come back here, Shifka boy! Get him, Happy. Uh, let go of me! Come on, Shifka. I've got him, Commander. Uh, take Shifka's ray gun. Go down and bring Graken up here. Yes, sir. Oh, Commander, while I'm down there, shall I, uh, shall I bring up some of those files? What for? Well, sir, I just thought that uh, Orlana might really decide to write a book about Rubeck, because, uh, well, after all, now she's going to have plenty of time on her hands. Ah! <laughs> a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure follows in just a moment. It's a fire, a four-alarm blaze on Terra, but hey, what's the matter with that atomic fire control jet car? Oh, too bad. It's trying to get along on ordinary fuel. But wait, that fire control officer's filling the tank up with super fuel. Wow! Listen to that fire control jet car go now. It's supercharged, that's what. Supercharged with super fuel. Yes, sir, boys and girls. To really get going, the answer is super fuel. That's why Buzz Corey eats a good breakfast with the super cereals that help to supercharge you. Rice checks and Wheat checks. Ah, there's a couple of really swell-tasting cereals. And both of them have that modern, bite-sized design for easy eating. So, gang, get a quick start in the morning like Buzz Corey does. Eat a good breakfast with a checkerboard super cereal and get supercharged. Get them today. Rice checks. And wheat checks, the grand new packages with Buzz Courier Cadet Happy on the outside and the magic space picture on the inside. And now, an exciting action preview of next week's Space Troll Adventure. Buzz and Happy are searching for a saboteur in the vat room of a plastics factory on Jupiter. Cautiously, they duck under pipes of hot gas feeding into the vats. All right, Happy, keep your ray gun ready. Yes, sir. Ow! Drover was right about these pipes being hot. Be careful. Uh, look behind this one. Let's try number... Wow! What was that? One of the pipes has exploded. Blew a valve, probably. Smoke and rockets feel that heat. I... I... <coughs> Come on. we got to get out of here. My... My throat, I can't breathe. It's the gas from the broken pipe. That gas is poison. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Vanishing Lake, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! Special bulletin for boys and girls in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and Knoxville, Tennessee. Buzz Corey's own space battle cruiser, the Ralston Rocket, will be in your area next week. Don't miss it. The Ralston Rocket. Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmerer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson.
Other players were Bela Kovach, Ken Mayer, Virginia Hewitt, and Stephen Robertson. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol! Be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol program on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander in Chief of the Space Patrol. In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy are searching for a saboteur in the vat room of a plastics factory on Jupiter. Cautiously, they duck under pipes of hot gas feeding into the vat. Wow. What was that? Well, the pipe exploded, blew a valve, probably. Oh, could rockets feel that heat? I... <laughs> Happy, come on. You gotta get out of here. I told it. I can't breathe. The gas in the broken pipe. That gas is poison. <laughs> than 50 years, the manufacturing colony on the shores of Lake Tarnhelm on the planet Jupiter has been supplying the United Planets with the amazing product called Vitaplast. Vitaplast, made from a sticky clay-like substance scooped from the banks and bottom of the lake, becomes an almost magic material of 10,000 uses under the manufacturing genius of the people of Tarnhelm. But for unknown reasons, the lake is drying up. Skilled workmen are without jobs. And industries from Mercury to Pluto are facing a shortage of the vital material. That's why Commander Corey and Cadet Happy are in the office of Thomas Purvin, director of Tarnhelm Industries. Commander, unless something is done right away, Tarnhelm will have to be closed down. There will be no more vitoplast. Can it be made synthetically? The best chemists in the United Planets have been trying to find a way for 50 years. And they have failed. I'll be frank, Mr. Purvin. The United Planets government feels that Vitaplast is an important product. But what I must know is how you intend to use the money. Mm, we are working right now on a new type of Vitaplast. A discovery that makes all of the uses as primitive and crude as the automobile or the mechanical lighting machine. I financed it with my own funds until the shortage of raw Vitaplast cut down our revenue. In addition, Mr. Purvance, we've been hearing reports of trouble between various factions of workers here in Tarnhelm. The government can't put money into a venture where people are working at cross-purposes. Oh, I admit we had some difficulties. A few families have left because of lack of work. And a few hotheads have tried to steal our trouble. But I assure you there is nothing serious. Well, Mr. Fervent, there's been some more trouble that... Oh, excuse me. I'll talk to you later. Oh, wait a minute, Zoga. We're keeping nothing back from the Space Patrol. Well... Okay. Uh, Commander Corey, this is Mr. Drober, one of my foremen. How do you do? Glad to know you, Commander. The Commander and the Cadet are here to consider our problem, so speak out. Well, 25 men in the block pressing section are quitting. They demand immediate transportation to Jupiter City. What's the trouble, Drober? Oh, they're sore because the Vitaplast tubing workers got their full check this week, and the block pressers did. They're pretty much worked up. Pay them in full, including what they would have made if they had been able to turn out their full quota. Why, this disappearing lake sure is causing enough problems. Mr. Purvins, is there any Vitaplast in the other two lakes? Are there two lakes? Yes, sir. We saw them on our way in. One is up in the hills, a couple of miles from Tarnhelm Lake, and the other is down in the valley. No, the lake in the hills has no trace of Vitaplast, and there is no lake in the valley. Oh, I guess it must have been a mirage or something. Yeah, sure, that, that's it, a, a mirage. Well, I'll pay off the workers, Mr. Purvin. All right, Droger. Thank you. Now, Mr. Purvin, about this special research you're carrying out. We've kept it a secret, but if you and the cadet will come down to the lab, I'll show you. All right. Hey, Commander, I feel pretty foolish about seeing a lake that wasn't there. I thought that happened. I thought, too. Droger calling Halstead at broxite number one. Rover calling Halstead at Brockside, number one. 
Posted here. Go ahead, Drover. I just fixed permits right in front of Commander Corey. Yeah? Uh, where are you now? My office at Tynehill. Pervins had just finished telling Corey there was no real trouble at Tynehill when I rushed in and told him about the walkout in the block dressing section. How did you get the men to quit? I had some of the boys spread a rumor that Pervins was trying to cheat them. We had them convinced their jobs were finished for good. Nice going. Is Corey still there? Yeah. Pervins is still trying to promote a government loan. Now, don't miss a trick to make Pervins look bad in front of Corey. And if you have to, you'd better pull some rough stuff. Make the morale look really bad at Tarnhelm. Right. Now, have you still got the bills going in the Bronx side, Chap? Yeah. And yeah, the quicker the lake's drained, the better. I don't know. Corey's cadets saw some water in the valley. Apparently, the drainage from the lakes isn't staying underground. What? That's uh, nothing to get excited about. I didn't have any trouble convincing them it was a mirage, so there couldn't have been much water. I'll stop the drills for a few days. It won't take the water long to sink into the valley. It's mostly sandy soil. How much longer can you hold out with that fake mining operation? Oh, several weeks. Urban's can't last much longer. If he can't get government help, he'll be willing to sell you an interest in Tarnhill. Uh-huh. And after I get my hooks into him, the lake will start filling up again. And we'll have a share in the Vitaplast profits. Good. Now, do you have any further ideas on what I should pull off next year? A little sabotage ought to fit in pretty well about now, if you can arrange it without any risk. I think I can. As a matter of fact, I had a little idea that might work. Now, Commander, if you and the cadet will step over here to this flat bench, I'll show you our new project. You've done wonders here, Mr. Perlin. We're very proud of it. Uh, here's what I want to show you. See this shapeless mess of vitaplast? I would like you to feel it. Uh. Very much like soft rubber. <laughs> uh, squeeze it in your hand, Cadet. Like this? Yeah. Well, it feels soft and doughy. And now I will apply a small electric current. Wow. Hey, it pulled right out of my hand like it was alive. I saw it move. That's right. Uh, now watch it. I will vary the intensity and polarity of the current running through the vitaplast. Hmm. Look, it's curling up at the edges and crawling. It is alive. No, not alive. Just responsive to electric current. You noticed it was blob-shaped a moment ago. Uh, now watch it. Why, it's drawing itself together. It's rolling up. I advance the current. It's forming into a ball. Almost a perfect sphere. Uh, pick it up today. Don't worry. You won't get a shot. Why, it feels something like a like a hard rubber ball. <laughs> Bounce it on the bench. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Hey, that's wonderful. And uh, now throw it down again. Hard. Okay. Better stand back, everybody. It'll probably bounce all over the lab. Hey, what happened? It's not a ball anymore. It just spread out flat the way it was at first. Mr. Pervin, this is the most amazing substance I've ever seen. Now, wait till I show you some mitoplast in tube shape. It can be made to crawl or coil itself tightly around any object or release it all by electric control. This is a tremendous discovery. Its applications are limitless. Exactly. Now, when you consider that this type of vitoplast works the same in extreme cold or intense heat, it's obvious that it's... Uh, there's been some more trouble. Yes, Drover, what now? Uh, someone's been tampering with the automatic control panel in the refining plant. What? All process routines been thrown out of order. We may have to throw out thousands of tons of vitoplast. Let's get over there right away. Lead the way, Drover. I want to see this. Uh, the master control panel is right here, Commander. Come on, Happy. Yes, sir. How did you discover this, Drover? Well, the foreman at stage 17 drew up a routine test sample. Didn't even look like vitoplast. He called me and I checked the master panel. You know what the trouble is? Uh, you see where those red lights are flashing? That means something's wrong between stage 16 and 17. This is terrible. It could put us out of operation. Commander, I just saw somebody look in that door and then duck back. Let's get him. Come on, Happy. Yes, sir. Did you recognize him, Drover? No. No, but I think he was wearing a regular plant uniform. Hey, here are some stairs here. He may be hiding down in stage three. If he is, we've got him. What do you mean? Well, the only way out is back up to the control room. Is there any place down here where he could hide? Well, there are big bats of raw vitaplast. He may try hiding behind one of them. Oh, be careful of the pipe. What pipe? Well, the pipe leading to the vat. They're hot. They're full of hot dioxoline gas, which is being pumped through the vitaplast. Okay, Drover. Down the stairs, happy, quickly. To the vats, Commander. All right. Get your ray gun. We'll search behind this one first. Yep. Ow! 
Bob Drover was right about these pipes being hot. Be careful, Harry. Well, there's not behind this one. Let's try number two. Hey, what was that? One of the pipes burst through a valve, probably. Hey, feel that heat. I... I... <laughs> Come on, we got to get out of here. My throat, I, I can't breathe. The dipoxylene. It's poison gas. Buzz and Happy are on the planet Jupiter in a manufacturing colony which is the only producer of vitaplast in the entire universe. Production of the urgently needed substance has fallen off, partly because the water in Lake Tarnhelm is sinking into the ground, and partly because of sabotage within the plant. Unknown to Commander Corey, both the disappearing lake and the sabotage are the work of the plant director's assistant, Drober, and Drober's partner, Halstead. Pretending to see a suspicious character in the plant control station, Drober has tricked Buzz and Happy into searching among the Vitaplast vats. Due to Drober's tampering with the control process, Pipes carrying poisonous dyed toxaline gas have burst under the enormous pressure. Now with the heated gas fumes searing their lungs, Buzz and Happy are trying to get out of the vat room. Don't try to go back that way, Happy. The gas is worse there. Where's that other door that Robert told us about? It must be this way. Commander, my lungs. I... Happy, listen. Drop down to the floor. Crawl. I can walk. No, get down low. Hot gas will rise to the ceiling. There won't be so much of it near the floor. Wait, Commander. That's it. On your hands and knees. Keep your head down low. It is easier to breathe like this. All right. Come on. Commander, you're safe. While you were in stage three, we discovered someone had allowed the pressure to build up to the bursting point, And there was no way to warn you. I was pretty close. Oh, does that fresh air feel good? Well, we got the gas under control now. Trover, that man you saw did go down to the vat room. He's still there. We didn't see him. We didn't look very close, though. We were busy crawling out. Yes. Yeah, looks as though I was mistaken about his going down into stage three. Sorry I put you two in such a spot. Well, it proves one thing. Tom Helen isn't exactly the proper atmosphere for scientific research. Mr. Purvin, I'm going to have to recommend against the government putting money into your Vitaplast project. But, Commander... But obviously, there's some people here who are willing to wreck the entire plant, even if it costs lives, just to ruin Vitaplast production. This is only the work of one or two dissatisfied persons. I'm certain. If the plant were backed by the government, there would be no more sabotage. The way the space patrol works, Mr. Purvin, we stop sabotage first. I'm going to Jupiter City now to file my preliminary report to the Secretary General... And I'll assign some special agents to track down the persons responsible for this incident today. But I'm afraid you're going to have to wait a while for government financing. Come on, Happy. Let's get to watch you. Stober calling Halstead at dark side number one. Stober to Halstead. Halstead here. Go ahead. Now you can start selling that drilling equipment for junk. We're in. You mean the government won't back permits? Uh, not after what Corey saw today. He's going back and report that this is a very bad risk. Uh, good work, Stober. When do you think Pervins would be receptive to another offer to buy into Turnhelm? Right away. Why don't you give him a call? I'll do that. I can't figure it out, sir. Why should some of his workmen sabotage Mr. Pervins' plan? Hey, it's not his fault the lake is drying up. I'm going to recommend that the Secretary General send a couple of scientists out there to talk to Pervins. There may be some other plastic that could be made with the same properties. Something not as rare as Vitaplast. Mm -hmm. Look, there's our mirage again. The lake in the valley. Uh, that's no mirage, Happy. That's real water. Not very deep, but no illusion. It doesn't seem to be as much of it as when we saw it before. No. Very likely it sinks into the ground quite rapidly. Isn't that strange, sir? Lake Tarnhelm is disappearing, and this one shows up a few miles away? When we get to Jupiter City, we'll consult a geologist. This happens to be part of the water that's been lost from Lake Tarnhelm. There may be an underground spring fairly close to the surface. Yeah, with phytoplast clay in it. Perhaps. But a few rare factors must occur to produce phytoplast. It isn't just the water itself, but minerals and even bacteria in the ground. However, our main job is to get to the bottom of this sabotage of the plant. Hey, Happy. I tell you frankly, Mr. Halstead, if that lake wasn't drying up as rapidly as it is, I wouldn't even consider your offer. I understand, Purvance. 
controlling interest in exchange for your financial backing of my vitoplast research. Right. And that's more than fair. You have your rapidly shrinking assets. The lake, I mean. I suppose it is. But still, I, I'd like a little more time to think it over. You don't seem to realize, Provence, that I'm doing you a favor. I'll give you four hours to decide. All right, Mr. Halston. You'll have my answer. The communications operator said he'd notify you when he contacted Mr. Perkins, Commander. Fine, Happy. Have you had a chance to find out about our wandering lake? Yes. I got a geological map of the Tarnhelm region. Through past mining operations around there, they've got a pretty good idea of the location of underground springs. Here, take a look. Hmm. Doesn't mean much to me, sir. The mountains around Lake Tarnhelm were formed by an upthrust of rock billions of years ago. Underground springs flow in the opposite direction, away from the valley. Well, what do these marks mean, sir? They indicate an old bauxite mine that was first worked about 15 years ago. They hit a promising vein of bauxite ore, but it played out just about the time the mine shafts were flooded. By an underground spring? Yes, so they abandoned drilling. It costs more to keep the mines pumped out than they get from the bauxite. Oh, I see. However, the geologist says the mine has been reopened on a small scale. Some fella has the idea that there's bauxite in another part of the mountain. According to this scientist, though, the man's just wasting his money or somebody's money. No broxite there, huh? There couldn't be. On Jupiter, broxite is only found above a layer of solid rock. Except for this small pocket that's already been worked, that mountain is all rock, right to the surface. <laughs> that guy must be crazy. Perhaps. Still, geologists have been known to be wrong. And he might be lucky enough to find something besides broxite. That's probably Mr. Pervin, sir. Corey here. Uh, Commander, this is Pervin at Tornhelm. Oh, Mr. Pervin. And anyone there overhear this conversation? No, Commander. This is my private speak, Lindsay. Good. I'm sending out two men to go to work at Tarnhelm. Oh, your uh, agent? Yes. Uh, good, Commander. By the way, I got some good news. I got private financial backing for my mitoplast research. Oh, you have? Fine. I'm glad to hear it. Yes, I made an arrangement with a man named Halstead. He's got a little money he had made in mining and wants to get into plastics. I had to give him controlling interest in the business, but then I need the money. I see. Well, Mr. Pervins, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you, Commander. Goodbye, Commander. Happy. Do you hear what Pervins said about his new partner? Yes, sir. This man is willing to buy into a business that is sinking into the ground. Halstead must be as crazy as that broxite miner. <laughs> Halstead is the broxite miner. What? Oh, he seems to have a mania for doing stupid things. Happy, we're going back there and meet Pervins' new partner. He found. Come in. Oh, it's you, Drober. Yes, Mr. Holster. I uh, thought I'd pay my respects to my new boss. <laughs> <laughs> we put it over, didn't we? Uh, how do you like my new office, Drober? Oh, great. Or uh, maybe I should have said, how do you like my new Vitaplast plant? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's more like it. Well, when do we get the water back into the lake? Uh, we'll wait a few weeks, but it'll be easy. Here, look. Here's a cross section of the mountain. Yeah. And here's the mine. We close up this passage when the water's been draining out of the lake. Then we reopen this one. Yeah. And the underground spring flows back into the lake, just like it used to. And we're in business. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of business, would you like to go down to the lab and look at this new vital plant? I most certainly would. That's sensational. We'll make a point. This is quite a surprise, Commander. I had no idea you were coming back here. I wanted to meet your new partner. Oh, this is his office. I don't know whether he's in or not. Oh, he's not here. Oh, he should be back very soon. Oh, we'll wait. If you have something to do, Mr. Perlman, just go ahead. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I do. I want to make a list of some equipment I need now that I have financial backing. Go right ahead. We'll be all right. Uh, thank you. Oh, I just happened to think where Mr. Hawks said might be. He said something about wanting to look at the lab. Well, if he doesn't come back soon, we'll wander down. Yes, Happy, it's all very strange. About Hawks said, you mean, sir? He's a man who mines a territory that has been proved worthless. Then he demands controlling interest in a business that virtually doesn't exist anymore. Well, maybe he has faith in this new Vitaplast thing. How did he know about it? If he did, why didn't he ask for a share in the profits from that? Yeah, it is sort of. But well, here's a chart, something like the one you showed me back at Jupiter City. See? It was, it was partly folded over, but I could tell it was a cross-section drawing. Uh-huh. 
smallest section, but part of the same territory. Lake Tarnhelm. Some mine shafts. Look how this is marked. Underground spring for lake. And it's filled in for a short distance. This shaft is marked drain from lake. Take this down to the lab, Happy. Perhaps we can get Mr. Halstead to explain it. It's amazing, Grover. This, this Vitaplast does everything you say it does. Yeah, now watch, Mr. Halstead. There's about 50 feet of Vitaplast cable on those two big spools. I'm going to boost the electric current a few amps. Wait. It's unwinding, rising, and squirming. I could make those heavy strands of Vitaplast crawl all over the room, then wind back onto the spool. It takes practice, but when you master the control dials, it's easy. You can control Vitaplast for production of anything. Turn it off. Someone's coming. Rubens hasn't told me exactly what new type of Vitaplast I'm financing, so it wouldn't look good for you to be giving away the secret. Yeah, you're right. Oh, hello, Dober. Oh, hi. Commander Croy. And this, I presume, is Mr. Pervin's new partner, Mr. Halstead. Huh? Uh, yes, that's right. I'm glad to know you, Commander. This must be quite a change from the mining business. Oh, yes, of course. I I don't know much about plastics yet. No, particularly Vitaplast. And I don't know much about mining. Happy, would you give me that diagram, please? Yes, sir. Thanks. Mr. Halstead, I thought maybe you could explain this to me. <laughs> Where'd you get this? It was on your desk. Since when does the space patrol have the right to enter a man's private office and go snooping around his private papers? Now, just a minute, Mr. Halstead. I was admitted to your office by your partner, Mr. Pervin. I didn't think you'd be so upset over a little diagram. No, I, uh, I... I'm not upset over the diagram, not at all. This is a mine right over the mountain from the lake, isn't it? I, uh... Yes, what about it? If this diagram is accurate... And it might be possible to fill the lake up again by reboring this shaft. It's a, uh, just a theoretical sketch. Wishful thinking on my part. <laughs> you know, well, it might be interesting to take a look inside those shafts. Happy, wouldn't it be a coincidence if the shaft exactly fitted this uh, imaginative diagram? It sure would. In fact, I think I'll call a couple of mining specialists and space patrolmen at Jupiter City and have them come out. Now look here, Corey. Just what are you getting at? Your controlling interest in this company would mean quite a bit if the lake should uh, accidentally fill up again. I don't have to put up with that kind of insinuation. Would you put up with a brain graph test? Stay where you are, Grover. Okay, Corey. I'm just going to shut off these controls. Keep an eye on them, Happy. Yes, sir. The hall said, I may be wrong about you, but there's... Commander! Commander, look out! Look out for those cables! Get back, Walter. Get out of the way! Those are vital cables, Happy. Get Grover. Yes, sir. Uh, Ow! That's there, Cadet. These vital cables can give you the whipping of your life. Turn that control off, Grover. I've got a ray gun on you. Yes, so you have. Oh, shit, I have. Knocked it right out of his hand. And, and look at it, it's coiling around him. Hey, Commander, I can't move. I can't either. Of course you can. Now with those coils around your leg. Now I'm really going to tighten him. Grover, look out. Boy, pull it. Oh, oh man. It's smashed. Nice going, Commander. Well, what's wrong? Look at the biter plants now. It's falling off them. That's right. Now that the current's off, it's just as limp as spaghetti. Here's where you two get a working over. Oh, this is Corey's gun. It's over there. Go by the house that I'll get it in a minute. Come here, Grover. Oh. Well, happy. Get that taken care of. As limp as, well, as bite up glass. Yeah. But for a while, it sure was a tight squeeze. <laughs> <laughs> Join us again next week for another thrilling adventure with Space Patrol. High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander in Chief of the Space Patrol. Wheat checks, rice checks, and good hot Ralston present Space Patrol. <laughs> High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander in Chief of the Space Patrol. <laughs> In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy are being held in a cave on Pluto by two criminals who plan to dispose of them. Now the commander and Happy have managed to get to a space phone in the cave. 
All the meters check, Happy. There's nothing wrong with the space phone after all. That's great. We can have a whole squadron of space patrol ships out here in a few minutes. This is an emergency call from Commander Corey to Pluto City Space Patrol Unit. Send ships to Sector G-18. Look for my ship, Terra-5, grounded near a steep bluff. Professor Walker, Cadet Happy, and myself are being held by... Look Use the radon quickly! I want to get Corey permanently! We'll return in just a moment with today's Space Patrol adventure, The Prisoners of Pluto. Hiya, gang. This is Captain Dick Tufel speaking. I'm just having myself a stroll down the street before I turn in for the night. Uh-oh, what's that light blinking in the window of that house across the street? Say, I'm going to investigate. That light's a signal, and it's a space patrol code system. It says, be sure to tell the boys and girls how to get a space patrol pocket projectoscope. Hey, that's a real projectoscope that boy's signaling with. Gang, I'm going to get him to tell you all about his projectoscope because you can have one, too. I thought that'd bring you running, Captain Tufel. Come on in. Boy, am I glad I sent for this projectoscope. It's really something. Tell the gang all about it, Space Patroller. Well, kids, it's not only a keen signal light. You can use it as a film projector in a dark room. Watch me flash pictures with it on the wall, Captain. There. See that picture? That's a picture from a space patrol adventure called Mighty Meteor. And it comes with your projectoscope on a strip of film with three other swell stories called Space Pirates, Men from Mars, and Robot Invasion. And Buzz Corey and Cadet Happy are in them, too. And gang, on this one film, there are 24 different pictures. The projectoscope's a real flashlight, too. A flashlight in the shape of Buzz Corey's rocket ship. And it's a winner for looks. A neat six inches long, made of smooth, tough plastic with four big tail fins and a one-inch radar antenna. Just think, a signal light, flashlight, film projector, and model rocket, all in one. Gang, to get an official Space Patrol projectoscope, complete with bulb, battery, and film, do this. Buy a box of rice checks or wheat checks, the cereals with a wonderful magic space picture on the inside. And then, with your name and address, send 35 cents in coin and a rice checks or wheat checks box top to Space Patrol. Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. Don't forget your 35 cents. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. And now, today's Space Patrol adventure, The Prisoner of Pluto. Commander Corey and Cadet Happy have been in Pluto City awaiting the arrival of Professor Malcolm Walker, who is from another city on this outer planet. Deeply concerned over the professor's failure to arrive, Buzz has ordered patrol ships to search the dark, constantly frozen surface of Pluto. Several hours later, Buzz and Happy join in the search, scanning rocky crags and valleys of frozen air with infrared probe rays from their ship Terra 5. Finally, Buzz sees the wreckage of a small lab ship at the base of a long slope. Now, in their spacesuits, Buzz and Happy are climbing the slope in order to investigate the wreckage. The ship doesn't look too badly damaged, Commander. Even a tiny hole in the hull would be serious damage here on Pluto, Happy. Unless Professor Walker managed to get into a spacesuit, the intense cold and lack of air would finish him in a few seconds. There doesn't seem to be any sign of life, sir. I don't see any lights in the ship. Let's get the hatch open. Walker, sure, Tom will light over here, Hap. Yes, Commander. I'll go in first, Happy. Be ready to open that first aid kit. If the professor's still alive, we'll have to work fast. It's ready, sir. Secure the outer hatch. Hatch secured, sir. He's not in the control section. Want me to check the aft compartment, sir? All right. He may have sealed himself in after the crash. Hey, wait. What's this on the control panel? It looks like a note, Commander. Hold your light on it. Ship crashed due to instrument failure. Space phone equipment damaged by crash. I am not hurt. Two hours after crash, I thought I saw a flash of light due west. Since rescue at this position is unlikely, I've gone to investigate source of light. I shall appreciate finder of this note relaying this information to Commander Corey of the Space Patrol, who is now in Pluto City. I'm carrying a projectoscope and an atomo light. Professor Malcolm Walker. Professor Walker should have stayed with the ship. Well, it's good to know he wasn't hurt. But I wonder what caused that flash of light he saw. There's nothing out here in this part of Pluto, unless another search ship has landed here. I believe the light was probably a reflection in the frozen air that covers the ground. A reflection from a ship far above this planet. 
Well, if Professor Walker took an atomo light with him, it shouldn't be too hard to find. Let's get back to our ship, Happy. We can head due west at low altitude and see if we can locate him. Right, sir. First, just to prevent any further wild chases all over Pluto, I'll add to this note in the event he returns here. I'll ask him to remain. Just a minute. There he is on the sled, just like I told you on the space phone. Found him unconscious, almost tripped over him in the dark. All right. Let's lift him out of this airlock. <clears throat> Say, didn't you chop any more frozen air, Orman? Oh, that first load will hold us until we find out who this guy is. Just set him down here. <clears throat> well, anyway, he isn't with the space patrol. Yeah, his suit says the United Planets Research Foundation. Mm. What kind of a research would he be doing out here? His eyes are open now, Hagel. Open his face, please. We'll find out who he is. Wait, Orman. Chances are he's just lost. If we didn't arouse his suspicion, we can keep him here until our supply ship arrives next week without any trouble. But then what? Then we will turn him over to the boys. They can get rid of him out in space. Okay. All right. Open the face piece, and I'll do the talking. Just take it easy, my friend. We'll have you out of that space suit in a moment. Thank you. My heating unit went out. I guess I'm lucky you found me. <laughs> you certainly are. Uh, how do you happen to be on this part of Pluto? My lab ship crashed a mile or two from here. Mm-hmm. I'm Professor Malcolm Walker with the United Planets Research Foundation. Mr. Um... Uh, Hagel. I'm a geologist. I see. I wonder if you would let me use your space phone to contact a friend of mine in Pluto City. He's probably worried about me. Well, as a matter of fact, we're having a little trouble with our space phone transmitter. As soon as my partner can repair it, we'll be glad to let you send a message. Thank you. Of course, it may take several days. Several days? Yes, yes. You see... We don't have much spare equipment here, but our regular supply and relief ship should be here in about a week. You will be able to go back with them. It's rather inconvenient. What am I complaining about? Here I am, recently saved from certain death, and I'm fretting about spending a few days in a warm cave with congenial companions. (laughs) I understand exactly how you feel. Oh, by the way, was my projector scope signal light on when you found me? Uh, Signal light? Uh, No, just the regular atomo light. And it was turned on. Oh, oh, good. And there may be a chance that a search ship will see the other light. I remember dropping it just before I collapsed. I'm afraid I was so numb with cold that I don't remember exactly. You had a signal light? Yes. As I said... I it... see. Uh, Professor, if you'll come with me, I'll get you something to eat. I'm sure you must be quite hungry after the ordeal you had. If you just go into the next room and make yourself comfortable... Uh, right through the door. I'll be right in. Thank you, Mr. Hagel. I'm most grateful. Oh, you're entirely welcome. Oh, uh, Roman, can I speak to you for a moment? Yeah, Hagel, what is it? Well, I'm afraid you'll have to go out again and get some more air after all. Go out there again? Yes, please. Uh, the old fool has dropped the signal light. You will have to find it before a search ship spots it. Now get going. The signal light, that's all we need. Yeah, hurry. Uh, I'll prepare a snack for our guests. There's not a sign of anybody down there, sir. Keep your eye on the viewscope, Happy. The professor couldn't have gone much farther than this on foot. He'll circle back and cover the area again. He may not have headed due west after all, sir. Shouldn't the infrared beam have picked him up by now? Unless he's fallen into a crevice. Yeah. And yeah, that would account for our not seeing the lights he said he was carrying. It doesn't look too good. We better send for more search ships. Space upon Pluto City, Happy, but still keep an eye on the viewscope. Yes, sir. Get it happy aboard Terra 5 calling Pluto City Space Patrol. Get it happy Now, hold aboard... on a minute, Hap. Check your transmitter setting. Yes, sir. Seems all right to me. Oh, oh, I forgot about the new double scrambler circuit. You were on two frequencies, Pluto City and Terra Headquarters. Yeah, I'll have to watch that. Terra would probably wonder why we were bothering them with a the Pluto search problem. The double scrambler is a good security measure, Hap. You can send the same message in two different codes, and no outsider listening in can tell if the same message is being sent. Now, well, I've got it set for Pluto City alone now, Commander. Fine, Hap. Look, and look, it's a, there's a projector scope light, Commander, down there on the ground. That must be Professor Walker's light. Happy, hold that call until we can land and do some investigating. All right, Commander. Why doesn't he turn it back on? He must have seen our ship light. Well, got a rough check on the location. Shouldn't be difficult to find him now. Well, that didn't take you long. Any luck, Roman? There's a professor. 
He's in the next room eating. Yeah, I found the light. Oh. He's fallen into a narrow fissure in the rocks. Was it down? Yeah. It's pointing downward. I doubt if it could have been seen from his ship. Certainly had a close call at that. What do you mean? Just as I was picking up the light, I caught a glimpse of a spaceship's light over to the north. Quickly shut off the light. Are you certain they didn't see the light? I'm almost certain. They'd have had to be looking right at it. Anyway, they wouldn't see anything out there now, even with their brightest atomic the search beams on. You're right. They never see the airlock opening unless they landed and stood right in front of it. Well, that was a delicious supper, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Oh, you're quite welcome, Professor. Uh, now, if you'll come with me, I'll show you. Well, you won't give us any trouble for a few hours. You sleep? Yeah, dropped off the moment he laid down. Look, Hagel, why can't we get the supply ship here quicker? We can space phone him tonight. That would be pretty stupid, Rorman. With search ships flying around this area, in a week they'll have given out the search. Then it will be safe for the supply ship to land. Well, I'm sick of hiding out in this cave. We've been here ten months. Surely the space patrol isn't still looking for us after all that time. Well, I'd rather be here than in some space patrol detention center undergoing suspended animation. Yeah, people. I'd like to know how this differs from suspended animation. Listen, you hear that? Sounded like somebody in the airlock. Hagel. Look. Sorry if we startled you. I'm Commander Corey of the space patrol. <laughs> hey, yes, Commander. We were startled. You see, we weren't expecting company. We're looking for Professor Walker. Professor Walker? Why, there is no one here but my partner and myself. Professor Walker's lab ship crashed near here. Yeah, we found a note that it was headed in this general direction. Oh, and he probably went right on past our airline. Oh, we often miss it ourselves. I don't imagine he's very far away. You're sure you haven't seen him? Oh, no. no we haven't seen anyone. Have we, uh, uh Mr. Evans? No. no. No, of course not. Well, in case you hear anything about him, would you please notify the United Planets Research Foundation? The United Planets Research Foundation? I see. If you forget the name, you'll find it engraved on this projector scope you have here on the table. Projector scope? This one, Mr. Hagel. Hagel? I didn't believe I told you my name. You didn't. You looked familiar to me when I first came in. I just recalled where I'd seen your picture. And where was that, Commander? We have a method of remembering faces we see in the Space Patrol Wanted file. I didn't believe I understand. Well, it's very simple, but I'm not going to explain it now. If Professor Walker isn't here and you haven't seen him, how do you happen to have his projector scope? Roman, get them. <laughs> commander! Here we are, cadet. Nice work, Roman. I saw the commander heading toward the projector scope. I couldn't grab it in time. Oh, it's probably just as well. Corey and the cadet have forced our hands. Now we'll have to play it safe. Lock them up. We'll get rid of them and the professor, too. We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a moment. Hi, gang. This is Captain Dick Tufel speaking from the Interplanetary School Stadium on Terra. I just saw a swell baseball game here. Listen to that crowd cheer the winners. Yes, it sure is fun when you're a winner. And here's something like that. But remember, to be a winner, you have to get supercharged. And here's the way to take care of that. Eat a good breakfast with rice checks or wheat checks, the bite-sized super cereals that help to supercharge you. Delicious! And there's plenty of zing in that Rice Chex flavor. And man, oh man, Rice Chex biscuits are toasted and toasted to make them crisper and crisper. And Wheat Chex? Ah, there's a flavor you'd fly to the moon for. Now, gang, remember, it's fun to be a winner and hear this. So move right up and be a winner. Move right up to the breakfast table... Or the breakfast that supercharges you. A power breakfast with the super cereals, rice checks or wheat checks. The cereals with Buzz Corey or Cadet Happy on the outside. And the wonderful magic space picture on the inside. <laughs> and now back to today's space patrol adventure, The Prisoner of Pluto. Buzz Corey and Cadet Happy have been led to a secret cave on the dark, frozen planet Jupiter by a projectoscope signal lamp dropped by Professor Walker when he collapsed in his spacesuit near the cave airlock. Confronted by the commander, the two criminals, Hegel and Rorman, first denied they had seen the professor. But when Buzz discovered the professor's telltale projectoscope, the two fugitives rendered Buzz and Happy helpless with a paralyzer ray gun. Now, still under the effect of the paralyzer rays, Buzz and Happy have been carried to a cave room next to the one in which Professor Walker lies sleeping. Okay, come on, let's get going. 
paralyzed ray out to hold them for another half hour. That'll be plenty of time. Did you hear that, Happy? Yes, Commander. Try moving your arms and legs. I've already tried, sir. My paralyzed ray seems to have worn off. Good. The spacesuits protect us from the full effect. Let's try to locate a space phone and alert Pluto City. How about the space phones in our spacesuits? Remember, we're inside a cave. A long distance from Pluto City, the signal won't carry. Oh, well, that's right, sir. Well, you're here. We must have a space phone in here. We'll search the cave first and find Professor Walker. Then we'll see what we can do about a space phone. Professor? Professor Walker? Well, wake up, Professor. What's going on? Who are you? I'm Commander Corey of the Space Patrol. Hmm? Of course, sir. Commander, am I still in the cave? Yes, Professor, you are. Yeah, that's a relief. I'm afraid I owe Mr. Hegel and Mr. Rohrman an apology. You do? Yes, sir. For a brief moment a while ago, I, I suspected them of trying to keep my presence here a secret. <laughs> isn't that ridiculous? I suppose it was due to my fatigue and fear after cracking up. Now, listen, Professor, there isn't much time. Your suspicions were correct. Hegel and Rohrman are criminals. What? The Space Patrol has been searching for them for months. You happen to stumble on their hideout. Then you captured them? Not yet, but we will. We'll need your help. Where's their space phone? Space phone? Uh, they told me it was out of commission. Well, I'll bet they've got a space phone around here somewhere. And in good working order, too. Well, we'll check. Professor, better get your space suit on. Be ready to move out of here in a hurry. I certainly will, Commander. If we're unhappy, we'll try to locate Hager. Come on, Dave. Put this stuff down here. We can store it away later. Okay, Hagel. <clears throat> I say, this is a real hole. We got quite a load of supplies out of their ship, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, we sure did. Now, let's get the three of them. And put them on Corey's ship. Uh, have your ray gun handy. We may have to give them another blast. All right. Are you sure you can make the ship crack up look like an accident? Oh, just leave it to me. We'll take Corey and the cadet to the ship first. Then come back for the professor. Wait. What is it? I hear voices in the space of phone here. Be quiet. I'm going to open the door. Emergency from Commander Corey to Pluto City Space Patrol. Send a patrol unit to Sector G18. Look for my ship, Terra 5, grounded near Steep Bluff. Professor Walker, to then happen myself are being held captive. Roman, bust them with a ray gun, quickly! Uh, that takes care of them. Switch off the space patrol. We got to get them to the ship in a hurry now. Space patrol Pluto City calling Commander Corey. Message Hegel, received. Hegel, I heard you. Hmm? We have established a fix on your location in sector G18. Rescue ships will be dispatched immediately. Space patrol unit Pluto City out. Confound it. Hegel, what are we going to do now? We can't wreck Corey's ship. Those rescue ships would eventually locate the cave. If we contact Jackson and Trask. Maybe they can get here before the space patrol arrives. We can do better than that. We can get away from here in Corey's ship. Yeah, but who's going to pilot it? Where will we go? You don't know, Astrogation, neither do I. Oh, I can get it spaceborne. After we're off Pluto, we'll wait till Corey and the cadet come out of the ray gun effect. Then we'll force them to take over and take us to Mars. Yeah, but what about the professor? Well, if we take Corey, we'll have to take Walker, too. He'll be a good protection for us in case we're intercepted before Corey revives. All right. Let's get him into Corey's ship. It won't take long for the patrol ships to get here. we better be gone. Happy, are you awake? Huh? Yeah, I mean, yes, sir. Hey, where are we? Aboard Terra 5. Commander, you got us off Pluto. Well, the last thing I remember we, we was having Hegel and Roman surprise us when we were using the space phone. How did you manage to get us away? I'm afraid I didn't. Hegel and his partner put all three of us aboard our ship. Oh, yeah. Commander. Yes, Professor? I uh, don't suppose you know where they're taking us? No, I don't. You? To Mars. They were talking after they used the ray gun on you and the cadet. To Mars? Why would they risk discovery by blasting off in my ship? Well, you see, the Pluto City Space Patrol unit replied that they had established a fix on the cave and were going to send rescue ships immediately. What? I don't see how that's possible. Hegel and Rohrman got us before we established contact with Pluto City. Besides, they couldn't have plotted a fix that fast. It was my voice they heard. Your voice, Professor? Yes, sir. I saw them watching you, and I, I knew they'd never let you complete the call, so I used the transmitter in my spacesuit to make them think you'd succeeded. Perhaps it wasn't such a good idea. I'm not so sure. At any rate, it was very quick thinking, Professor. But it didn't have the effect I hoped it would. 
I thought perhaps if they thought their position was hopeless, Hegel would surrender without harming us. Well, at least it got us off Pluto, Professor. But we're still their prisoners. Well, we've still got a chance. So I hear somebody in the next compartment. Oh, you've come out of it, eh? Come on, Commander. You and the cadet have work to do. And if we refuse? Roman and I can easily find a way to change your mind. All we want you to do is to plot an astrogation lecture that'll take us to Mars. Can't you do it? I wouldn't be asking you if I could. There's a lot about the ship that I don't understand. And listen, Corey, don't try any tricks. I'll know Mars when we're close enough to see it. And don't forget, whatever happens to the ship happens to you, too. All right, Hegel. Okay, up to the control compartment, then. Professor, you'll stay here. Hegel, there you are. We're on automatic control now. You ought to reach Mars at about 2300 universal star time. And you swear that the vector you said keeps us off the regular space lane? I said it did, didn't I? I'm going to watch that view scope, Corey. And if another ship appears following us, you'll regret it. Well, can we help it if, if somebody sees us accidentally? It'll be up to both of you to avoid that accident. Yeah. Now look, Corey. I want my men to meet us on the Martian plane and pick us up there. Turn on that space phone so that I can contact them. No tricks on this, either. I don't know how this thing works, but I do know when the scrambler circle is set to the right combination. And which one is that? Scrambler code 31567. Now, set it. All right. That's it. Now, cut on the transmitter. This is Hagel calling Jet Trask at Saturn City. Hagel calling Jet Trask at Saturn City. I hope he and Jackson are near the receiver. Hagel, spaceborne out of Pluto, calling Jet Trask at Saturn City. Maybe Corey's trying something. Well, the space phone's on, don't worry. Hagel to Trask. Trask here. Go ahead, boss. Uh, Trask, listen carefully. I got a job for you. How did you get off Pluto? I thought Just were... listen. I want you to take a ship and meet me on the Martian plane, Sector 5G. We'll be there at about 2300 universal star time. Got it. I'll be there. I'll be aboard Commander Corey's space battle cruiser, the Terra 5. What? Hey, listen, are you making a deal with Corey? Don't be a fool, Trask. If I were double-crossing you, would I use Corey's ship? I've got Corey and his cadet and Professor Walker here at the ray gun point. Okay, Hagel. I'll pick you up at Sector 5G, Martian plane at 2300 hours, universal start time. All right, Trask. Hagel out. Cut it out, Corey. Roman, take Corey and the cadet back to the compartment. Won't bring them out again when it's time to land on Mars. Nice landing, Corey. And now this is where we say goodbye. Yeah, we'll miss you. You won't miss a thing from now on. Yeah, this is it. For all three of you. Uh, let's finish them before press land so we won't waste any time getting away from them. There's just one thing I want to do first, Hagel. Yeah? What is it? This! Uh, get them happy while they're off balance. Well, I guess that takes care of our friends, sir. Get their weapons, Happy. Foreman, why didn't you watch Corey? How did I know he was going to jolt the ship with a rocket blast? Anyway, maybe Trask can help us. That's right, Corey. The lurch you gave the ship will tip him off that something's wrong. He'll get us out of this. I think you'll find that Trask is having troubles of his own. Have a look in the viewscope. Space patrol ships. That's right. Where did they come from? You told them where to find us, Hagel. I did? Yes. When you were talking to Trask on one scramble frequency, the same message was being sent out on the regular space patrol emergency frequency. Happy, take them back out and lock them up. And ask the professor if he cares to join us. Right, sir. All right. Come on, you two. Be our guests for a change. <laughs> An action preview of next week's exciting space patrol adventure in just a moment. And now, gang, here's Cadet Happy to tell you how you can have fun ten different ways with that swell new Space Patrol projectoscope shaped like a rocket ship. Number one. Show pictures on the wall with it. Two. Use it as a flashlight. Three. Give signals with it at night. Four. Hide secret messages inside of it. Five. Play Space Patrol with it. Six. Light it in a dark room. Looks like a rocket flying at night. Seven. Wire it on your bike for a new and different kind of ornament. Eight. Keep it to dress up your room. Stand straight up on its tail fins. Nine. Keep it by your bed at night. Comes in mighty handy. And ten. Take the bulb and battery out and use it as a roomy pocket case for marbles, jacks, money. Yes, sir, gang. The projectoscope is lots of fun. And it comes to you complete with bulb, battery, and film for showing pictures on the wall. 
To get a projectoscope, do this. Buy a box of rice checks or wheat checks. Then with your name and address, send 35 cents in coin and a rice checks or wheat checks box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in the USA and may be withdrawn at any time. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. And now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy are investigating a space factory revolving in an orbit around the planet Venus. Suddenly, they find themselves locked in a freight-handling chamber room, floating in the middle of the room. Trowbridge has cut the artificial gravity field. We're completely weightless. Well, how are we going to get down to the floor? Huh? Oh, my head. Smoke and rockets, Commander. We fell up, up to the ceiling. There's the floor down there below us. Trowbridge reversed the gravity field. The pull in this room is toward the ceiling. Well, now how are we going to get down to the floor? We'll get down to it all right. The hard way, I'm afraid. Trowbridge will reverse the gravity field from floor to ceiling till he breaks every bone in our bodies. Be sure to listen next Saturday for the exciting story, The Venus Space Factory, when wheat checks, rice checks, and good hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! Special bulletin for boys and girls in Springfield, Illinois, Terre Haute, Indiana, and Washington, D.C. Buzz Corey's own space battle cruiser, the Ralston Rocket, will be in your area next week. Don't miss it. The Ralston Rocket. Boys and girls, this is your commander speaking. Help science help you. Give every nickel and dime you can to the American Cancer Society. Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmerer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Ken Mayer, Norman Jolly, Bela Kovach, and Stephen Robertson. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol. And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol program on your local ABC TV station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. Space Patrol came to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston present Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy are investigating a space factory revolving in an orbit around the planet Venus. Suddenly, they find themselves locked in a freight handling chamber floating in the middle of the room. They've cut the artificial gravity field. We're completely weightless. Well, how are we going to get down to the floor? <laughs> oh, my head. Smoke and rockets, Commander. We were pulled up, up to the ceiling. There's the floor down there below us. They reversed the gravity field. The floor in this room is toward the ceiling. Well, now how are we going to get down to the floor? We'll get down to it all right, the hard way, I'm afraid. They'll reverse the gravity field from floor to ceiling till they break every bone in our bodies. We'll return in just a moment with today's Space Patrol adventure, the Venus Space Factory. <laughs> Hi, gang. Space Patrol Rick Tufeld reporting to you from the Terra Airport. Just got back from a trip to Venus, and boy, do I need supercharging. Well, I'll just have myself a Space Patrol breakfast with one of the super cereals, Rice Checks or Wheat Checks. They're bite-sized, you know, and so easy to eat and so different and delicious, the commander made them official cereals of the Space Patrol. Try them yourself, gang, and don't wait. Not for a swell treat like Rice Checks and Wheat Checks. I am today. And say, gang, here's something important. We are swamped with orders for space binoculars. We have plenty of them, but we just can't mail them out fast enough. So if you're waiting for space binoculars, please be patient. We'll soon be caught up. Well, i got to go get supercharged right now. See you later, gang. And now, today's Space Patrol adventure, the Venus Space Factory. 
Swinging in wide orbits around the planet Venus are two gigantic constructions, popularly known as space factories. Power is obtained from the sun by use of solar energy reflectors. These privately owned factories are inspected at regular intervals by space patrol personnel to see that United Planets regulations are observed. Right now, in the control section office of one of the factories, Space Patrol Inspector Curtis is talking to Vincent Trowbridge, owner of the plant. I've completed the inspection, Mr. Trowbridge. Oh, find anything wrong, Inspector Curtis? No, nothing serious. The heat insulation on the mercury vapor conduits needs replacing. Oh, you aren't going to enter that on a report, are you? Well, I should. But I'll overlook it this time if you promise to have it repaired by the time of my next official visit here. Of course. Uh, you just play ball with me, Curtis, and I'll play ball with you. Fine. Oh, uh, Mr. Trowbridge. Yes, Curtis. About the investment you're handling for me, uh, is everything all right? Well, uh, it doesn't look good right now. What, can I get my 10,000 credits back? Perhaps in a few months. A few months? Well, Mr. Trowbridge, you said last month we could expect a quick profit. Yes, I also said there were certain risks involved. You remember that, don't you? Yeah, but all our other investments, they turned out all right. They were for small amounts, 100 credits or so. I was counting on that money. You put me in a terrible spot. I didn't put you on the spot, Curtis. You insisted I take your money. It uh, was your money, wasn't it? Yeah, of course it was, except for a few hundred I borrowed. But it has to be paid back right away. Well, I'm afraid there is nothing I can do. Oh, look, you've got to help me. If the Space Patrol finds out I've been having business dealings with one of the firms I inspect, I'll lose my job. Well, you didn't worry much about that when you were winning. That yeah, was foolish, I admit it. But I was relying on your business judgment. This gets out of I'm finished. Hmm. Perhaps I should have realized you weren't in a position to risk so much money. Tell you what. Suppose I return those 10,000 credits to you. Will you, Mr. Tobridge? Now, understand, Curtis. I only do this out of the goodness of my heart. This is just a loan, you understand. It's my money you're getting. Your 10000 is still invested with another firm, and I can't touch it. I'll pay you back every credit when the other deal begins to pay off. Yeah. Oh, uh, in the meantime, uh, you're in a position to do me a favor. Well, what do you have in mind? Well, you, you also inspect the other space factory, don't you? Stan Larkin's plant? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, what's his record? Excellent. Why? Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps you've been somewhat lax in your inspection. Somewhat indulgent, shall we say. Oh, no. I'm always very careful. Yes, but there is always room for improvement, Curtis. From now on, you can even be more careful when you check on Larkin. Uh, when are you due there again? Two days from now. Well, just make sure you examine his entire factory thoroughly. I'm sure you'll be able to find that Larkin is guilty of several uh, irregularities. You aren't asking me to turn in a false report. Would you rather a true one be turned in on you? All right, Mr. Crowbridge. <laughs> oh, uh, this may ease your conscience a little. I have a couple of men working at Larkin's factory. You wouldn't have to use your imagination too much in reporting violence. Commander Corey's office. Cadet Happy here. Yes, sir. All right, Major, I'll tell him. Well, what is it, Happy? Oh, it's Major Robertson, Commander. He says Inspector Curtis is due back at Venus City headquarters tomorrow. Uh, he's been on sick leave. Happy, remind me to space a phone, Curtis, in the morning regarding the space factory report. Yes, sir. I can't understand what's happened to Stan Larkin's operation. Well, who is this Larkin, sir? He owns one of the two space factories circling Venus. The last two inspection reports have been pretty bad. Till three weeks ago, Larkin's plant had a very high rating. Well, what's the trouble, sir? Curtis listed six counts of defective safety equipment, including the main airlock. When he returned for another checkup two weeks later, three of the previous citations hadn't been corrected. Well, what about the Trowbridge station? Oh, that's excellent. You know, it looks to me as though Larkin's trying to cut corners. It's not a very smart move with a new government contract still sitting on the Secretary General's desk. That's well, not a smart move in any case, Happy. Any negligence in one of those space factories could cost the life of every man in the plant. First, I'll see what Curtis has to say about the situation. Then I may pay Larkin a visit. Curtis at Venus City calling Crowbridge at Space Factory Number 2. Curtis calling Crowbridge at Space Factory Number 2. Crowbridge here. Go ahead, Curtis. I just thought I ought to let you know. 
McCoy's going to blast off for a visit to Larkin's factory. Is he coming here, too? He didn't mention it in our space phone conversation. But better be prepared just in case he does. I am always prepared. Uh, did he question your report on Larkin's? Uh, no, not yet. But I'm worried. I don't want to get into this any deeper. Now, look, Curtis, stop worrying. Just take it easy. All right, but I won't make any more false reports. Well, we'll talk about it later. When is Corey due at Larkin's? At about 900 hours universal start time tomorrow. All right, Curtis. Throw bridge out. Uh, now, what can my men do to convince Corey that Larkin isn't? You can start decelerating now, Happy. We're nearly on the factory's orbit. It certainly doesn't look very solid, Commander. Like a bunch of wheels strung together with wire. Well, it would never do on a planet, of course, but out here in space with no gravity pull, it's strong enough. Where do we join airlocks? Sir? At the end of that tube projecting from the circular structure, we'll make our approach from the other side. It looks like we've got a clear approach on this vector, sir. Right. Let's contact Larkin and tell him we're coming in for inspection. Commander Corey, I've been in the manufacturing business for 20 years. This is the first time I've been accused of mismanagement. All you're being accused of right now, Mr. Larkin, is failure to correct certain faulty equipment after receiving a citation from our inspector. But I tell you, I ordered it corrected. Did you check to see if your orders were carried out? Well, frankly, no, I didn't. In the past, I've never found it necessary to check up on my employees. Mr. Larkin... Our inspectors have a regular procedure to follow. Would you say that in the past, Curtis has ignored defective equipment? I don't know whether Curtis has ignored defective equipment or not, but I haven't. Well, then what about those last two reports? What about the complaints of impurities in your products? Commander, would you like to inspect this factory right now? I certainly would. But you haven't answered my questions. Maybe we'll both know the answers after inspection. I manufacture plastics, not excuses. All right, Larkin. I'll call my cadet and we'll inspect the plant. I'll say this for you, Larkin. For all, your factory has run very efficiently. We haven't finished the tour yet, Commander. With these accusations against me, I think it only fair that you make a complete inspection. All right. What's next? Well, you've seen the crew's living quarters, the power control station, and the process control room. As I recall your inspector's last report, there was a defective airlock in number two loading chamber. That's right. Has it been repaired? I ordered it repaired. Come with me. You can see for yourselves. Oh, here, uh, wait. You'd better both put on heavy coats if you're going in there. Why? Is it cold in there? About five degrees below zero centigrade. Uh, the coats are here in the locker. Here's one for you, Commander. Thank you. And here you are, Cadet. Thanks, Mr. Larkin. Oh, why is the loading chamber so cold? This chamber is where we keep the hexaplast sheets. They're moved directly into the hold of a cargo ship, which is also at five degrees below zero. Hexaplast? What's that? It's a light but very strong plastic, Happy. It's called the material with a memory. A memory? Mm -hmm. Oh, excuse me, Commander, the intercom. Larkin at chamber two. Yes? Can it wait? Oh, but I'm... Oh, all right. I'll be right back. Commander, I've got to go back to the central control room. Two of my technicians seem to have misinterpreted my instructions on a process routine. Uh, why don't you examine loading chamber two, and I'll join you in a minute. Of course, go ahead. Thanks, Commander. Now, let's go in, Happy. We'd better secure the door to hold the temperature down. Oh, it's not as cold in here as I expected it to be. It's a dry cold, low humidity. These coats are pretty heavy. Boy, there sure isn't much room to move around with all these bales stacked in here. Now, there's the airlock at the other end of the chamber. Let's check the indicator and see if there's any leakage. Yes, sir. Oh, by the way, Commander, what did you mean when you said hexaplast was a material with a memory? Well, it can be molded into a certain shape at a fairly high temperature. Then when it's cold, the way it is now, it flattens out. Uh -huh. When the temperature rises, it springs back into its original form, just as though its molecules remembered what shape to take. <laughs> what was that? I don't know. It sounded as though something snapped. Oh, look, up up there. That top bale came undone. Yeah, somebody did a sloppy job of packing. <laughs> oh, there goes another one. Hey, look, it's moving. The cargo's shifting. We've got to get out of here, Happy. <laughs> hey, Commander! Commander, what's happening? The hexapass expanding to its original shape. Open the door, hurry. <laughs> 
Locked, sir. We've got to get out of here in a hurry. If we don't, the hexi flash will crush us against the wall. We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. This is Captain Dick Tufeld reporting the morning news direct from Terra City. First, the headlines. Commander Corey offers projectoscope to boys and girls on Earth. Space Patrol mail bags jammed with orders. The commander interrupts all communication lanes to warn projectoscope is offered for limited time only. Those are the headlines, now the details. Today, Buzz Corey is again offering all boys and girls a chance to send for the new six-inch pocket projectoscope. This streamlined blue and yellow plastic model in the shape of the commander's rocket ship has been designed to do three important things. One, to flash on and off so rapidly it can be used as a signal light. Two, to throw a steady beam of light so it can also be used as a flashlight. Three, to throw pictures on the wall by means of a special strip of film. Response from Earth has been terrific. Orders have been pouring in without let-up. But supplies are still big and work is on schedule. When a letter is received, a projectoscope is mailed at once. But Commander Corey warned in a special bulletin that the projectoscope could be offered for a limited time only. So, gang, send for your projectoscope today. Just buy a box of rice checks or wheat checks. Then, with your name and address, send 35 cents in coin and a rice checks or wheat checks box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in the USA and may be withdrawn at any time. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. And now back to today's adventure, the Venus Space Factory. Vincent Trowbridge, owner of a space factory revolving around Venus, has forced a Space Patrol inspector to turn in false reports against Stan Larkin, owner of a competing space factory. Commander Corey and Cadet Happy went to the Larkin plant to investigate. While in loading chamber number two of the space factory, the two space patrolmen find themselves in danger of being crushed by a rapidly expanding plastic known as hexaplasm as the temperature rises in the chamber. Stand back, Happy. Let me try that door. Yes, sir. Somebody must have locked it after we got in here. Do you suppose it was Larkin? Ha, look out! Huh? Wow, if you hadn't yelled, sir, I'd have been smashed between those two blocks of hexaplast. It's going to keep expanding till it fills every inch of this chamber. That's hard as rock. Yes, after it reaches its original shape. Commander, could it break through the hull of the chamber? Uh, By the time it does, it won't matter to us. Hey, wait. You've given me an idea. There's a bale that hasn't broken open yet. Help me drag it to the door. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let's move fast, Happy. This bale feels soft. Uh, now let's wedge it between the stack of hexaplast and the door. A little tighter. Commander, I can feel it expanding. Stand back. When those metal packing strips burst, they'll lash up like clips. There it goes. It's swelling up. Let's hope that door is the weakest part of the chamber. Hey, it works, sir. The door is open. Let's get out of here quickly. Hey, Commander, it's colder out here in the passage than it was in the chamber. Let's get to the control room. I want to hear Larkin's explanation of this. Uh, here's the control room, Hap. Larkin. Commander, you're safe. And you know what happened in the loading chamber. Yes. Uh, did you secure the outer door to the passage? Yes, I did. Now, maybe you'll tell me who locked the refrigeration door. Locked it? It wasn't locked. Oh, no. We had to use expanding hexaplast to break it open. You, you were in there with that wild plastic? Where did you think we were, Larkin? I don't know. I, I settled the argument between the two technicians. Then I came back here and checked the instruments. I could see the temperature was rising in the loading chamber. And what made it rise? The thermostat must have been defective. But it's all right now. Even if the hexaplast bursts the chamber hull, we won't lose any air in the other sections of the factory. But I'd still like to know what made the temperature rise in the door lock just when Cadet Happy and I were in that chamber. Commander, you don't think it was deliberate? I don't know, Larkin. But somebody here is guilty of criminal negligence. As of this moment, your factory is officially closed. Closed? But why? Safety. One incompetent or vicious man in this space factory could destroy the lives of everyone aboard it. I'm going to order a ship to be sent here from Venus to remove every one of your staff to Venus City until we can have a complete investigation. I'll assign a space patrol ship to cruise alongside this factory in its orbit around Venus to protect your interests. Very well, Commander. I'll order a complete shutdown. All right, Larkin. Come on, Happy. We'll get to our ship in space upon Venus City. Then we'll head for Terra and organize an investigation. Good 
Curtis calling Trowbridge aboard Space Factory Number Two. Curtis calling Vincent Trowbridge at Space Factory Number Two. Trowbridge here. Go ahead, Curtis. Are there any cargo ships loading or unloading at the factory? No, no ships are due till tomorrow. Why? I'm coming there to talk to you. What am I? I'll tell you when I get there. Now, isn't that rather stupid? You aren't due to inspect for another ten days. I'm nearly there. Have the airlocks ready. Why can't you tell me what you want over the space phone? We're both on the scramble circuit. I've got to talk to you. In person. All right. Come ahead. But if you are in trouble, don't expect... Commander, shouldn't we be on the Terra Vector? I've changed course, Happy. We're heading for the other space factory on the opposite side of Venus. Why? Is something wrong at the Trowbridge plant? Well, so far it's not as serious as what went on at Larkin's. I've been getting some interesting information from Major Robertson, though. Trowbridge has been putting out some defective plastics, too, worse than Larkin's. Hmm. Was it in the inspector's report, sir? No. The Bureau of Standards discovered it. It should have been detected by our inspector at the factory. Yet he's consistently given Trowbridge a high efficiency rating. Does the same man check both factories? Yes, George Curtis. Well, maybe he needs a vacation. Yeah, he seemed to be right on his toes when he checked Larkin's plant. Inner City Space Control was supposed to notify me when they located Curtis. He's off duty for 18 hours, so he must be somewhere in the city. Oh, there's another collection of wheels in the view scope, sir. We're getting close to the Trowbridge factory. Curtis, tell me what was important enough to bring you here to the factory at this time. I found out what your men tried to do to Corey with the hexiplast. You might have killed him. Oh. Oh, and that have put Larkin in a hot spot? It is. This will probably finish him. Yeah, but you don't know the rest of it. Corey had the whole crew, including Larkin, flown to Venus City for an investigation. I'll be called in to testify. So what? That close call, Corey Ed will convince him that Larkin isn't fit to operate a factory. Ah, you just calm down. Go back to Venus City and be there when he calls you. But, Trowbridge, don't you realize? Corey will probably give Larkin and his crew a brainograph test and find out about your spies. Uh, I, I hadn't thought of that. Corey will find out you're behind this whole scheme and find out about me. You know, I'm glad you did come here, Curtis. You can find me to Venus before Corey organizes his investigation. We'll have to eliminate those spies of mine before they're given the brainograph test. Oh, I won't have any part of it. All you have to do is keep your mouth shut. Being a space patrol inspector, you won't be asked to take a brain of half test. Not if you play calm. Commander Corey aboard Terra 5 calling Venus Space Factory number 2. That's Corey. Shut up. Corey aboard Terra 5 calling Space Factory number 2. Now keep your mouth shut, Curtis. Let me do the talking. Venus Space Factory number 2 to Commander Corey. Throwbridge here. Mr. Throwbridge, I want to talk to you on official business. Why, of course, Commander. You'll be ready to join airlocks with the factory in about three minutes. Uh, three minutes? Yes. Well, come ahead, Commander. Thanks, Mr. Trowbridge. Corey, out. You recognize my ship. Why didn't you stall him till I could get away? It's too late now. He'd see you anyway. Don't worry. Just do as I say and we'll both be all right. Just get back in that living compartment and lock the door. I'll handle Corey. What are you going to do? Just leave that to me. Go on. Get in that compartment. Go on, Happy. Yes, sir. Well, Commander Corey, this is rather a surprise. Hello, Mr. Trowbridge. I recognized our inspector's ship at number two airlock. Is he in here? Yes, he's inspecting my factory. It was my impression that he was here four days ago. Oh, you mean you didn't know he was coming here today? I'm afraid Inspector Curtis is a very thorough young man. I've been getting quite a going over from him. You have? Why? Well, I'll let him tell you. He's probably in the handling room now. Uh, this way, please. And second thought, maybe I'd better tell you myself. Frankly, I tried to deceive Curtis on his last trip here. And I thought I succeeded. Deceive him? Uh, How? Some defective insulation. Well, what about it? Well, I could tell that Curtis wasn't feeling very well. And I thought I'd put it over that he wouldn't notice. Well, I found out differently. He's going over the entire plant with a vengeance. After I see Curtis, there are a couple of other matters I want to discuss with you, Mr. Trowbridge. Well, certainly. You'll find Curtis right in here, Commander. The handling room. Just go right... In. Hey, hey, hey. You... On your feet, get through that door after him. Oh, oh, oh. Commander. Commander, I can't touch the floor. What happened? We're floating. Trowbridge cut off the artificial gravity in here. 
We're going right toward the ceiling. Now, take it easy. When you reach the ceiling, push yourself gently toward the floor. Yes, sir. Gently now. You might bounce back up again. When your feet touch, make your way carefully toward the door. Remember, we're completely weightless. I can reach the ceiling. Oh, here it goes. That's it. We're going down. Yeah, like a couple of feathers. Oh, this is the strangest feeling. Easy now. Your feet are almost touching the floor. <laughs> Ow. Oh. oh, my head. Smoke and rockets, Commander. We were pulled up, up to the ceiling. There's the floor down there below us. Trowbridge reversed the gravity field. The pull in this room is toward the ceiling. How are we going to get down to the floor? The hard way, I'm afraid. Trowbridge can keep reversing the gravity field from floor to ceiling till he batters us unconscious. Look, sir. Everything that wasn't bolted to the floor is up on the ceiling all around us. Crates and tools, everything. Now you see why Trowbridge called this the handling room. We can handle any object by adjusting the gravity field, no matter how heavy. Yeah, including us. Wow, feel that. I'm pressing harder than ever against the ceiling. Trowbridge is increasing the gravity field. What's he going to do? Knock us out by giving us extra G's? I doubt that he has that much power. Well, it's strong enough so that I can't stand up on the ceiling. If he reverses it at this strength, we'll break every bit in our bodies when we hit the floor. Wow, this is awful. Just waiting for him to smash us down. Happy, look down there on the wall. See that switch box? Yes, sir. It's right by the outer loading hatch. Maybe a gravity control emergency switch. If we can just turn that lever to the off position. But we can't reach it, sir. Not even if we could stand up. No, but there are a lot of objects around us up here in the ceiling. Small things we could throw. If we can hit that switch before Trowbridge reverses the gravity. There's a small crowbar. It's even hard to crawl with all this high gravity. There. Now, take careful aim, Happy. Remember, be ready to duck. That bar is going to fall back up to the ceiling. Yeah, that's right. I'm glad you reminded me. Well, here goes. <coughs> oh, watch out. It's falling back. <coughs> I didn't throw it nearly hard enough. I'll try it with this wrench. If you hit it, we'll have quite a drop to the floor. If I hit it, we'll stay here in the ceiling till we push ourselves down. Across your fingers. <coughs> hey, you hit it, sir. We're weightless again. All right, Happy. Easy now. Press against the ceiling with your legs. Push yourself down toward the door. Okay, careful now. Let's go. Come on, Curtis, quick. Get him to your ship. What'd you do with Corey? He's floating around in the handling room, up near the ceiling. What? Well, just as I was about to reverse the gravity pole and smash him to the floor, the field cut off. I guess I overloaded the coils. Come on, we gotta get out of here. Hurry, get it to your ship. All right, Trowbridge, stay right where you are. Corey! Commander. I didn't know you were here. Curtis, you had the right hunch in coming back here, but evidently you didn't know just how far Trowbridge really would go. But no, Commander. Uh, yeah, that's right, Curtis. I I might even take a brainograph test. Happy, take Trowbridge into custody. No, you don't. Get your hands up, Cadet Curtis. Go on, you too, Corey. Uh, hey, what is this? Curtis, are you out of your mind? Uh, good work, Curtis. Now, Corey, we'll see. Get him, Happy! <laughs> 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 All right, you two, on your feet. I've got their weapons, sir. Commander, Trowbridge forced me to help him. He bribed two of Larkin's guards to heat up the hexaplast chamber. I didn't have a thing to do with it. Curtis, keep your mouth shut. You might as well let him talk, Trowbridge. We've got enough on you right now. Commander, I'll tell you everything. Honestly, I will. I only did what I did so, so I wouldn't lose my inspector's job. Curtis, you have a peculiar idea of an inspector's duties. Yeah, don't worry, Curtis. You'll still be an inspector. Uh, you can inspect the inside of a criminal rehabilitation center. <laughs> An action preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. Gang, everybody's talking about the projectoscope, and no wonder, it's terrific. Now, here's a boy who's been talking about his projectoscope since the moment he got it. That was on Saturday morning. Hey, Junior, look. I got my projectoscope. Man, it's really neat. Look at that. It's shaped like a real outer space rocket ship with tail fins and a radar antenna. Sunday night, and he's still going strong. Hey, Dad, turn out the light. There now. I'm going to show you some pictures on the wall with my projectoscope. That's Buzz Corey and Cadet Happy, you see there, in a real space patrol adventure. It's called Mighty Meteor, and there's three other adventures on the same film. And so it went with his friends on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Hey, look, look at Joe. Look at this projectoscope flash signals in the dark. See how fast I can blink it on and off? Then Thursday, Friday, and Saturday again. And this boy is still talking about his projectoscope. Now, don't cry, sis. I'll find that nickel you dropped here in the dark. 
See, I have my projector scope in my pocket. And it's a swell flashlight, too. See that beam of light? Hey, here's your nickel, sis. Good old projector scope. Gang, get yourself one of these wonderful projector scopes. We have enough for all of you, and we'll send you on the day we get your order. Just buy a box of rice checks or wheat checks. Then, with your name and address, send 35 cents in coin and a rice checks or wheat checks box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. Write that down. Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. And now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy have joined airlocks with a spaceship in which two criminals are holding Carol Kistel. Although the criminals have meekly surrendered over the spaceophone, Buzz is still wary. Happy, I'm going to open the inner hatch. Have your ray gun ready. Yes, sir. You got us, Commander, with our hands up. Uh, look, I'll turn on the light so you can see better. Happy, the lights. They're blinding, Commander. I can't see. Let them have it, Rambo. They can't see. They're helpless. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Cosmic Ray Detector, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! Special bulletin for boys and girls in Indianapolis, Indiana, and Washington, D.C. Buzz Corey's own space battle cruiser, the Ralston Rocket, will be in your area next week. Don't miss it. The Ralston Rocket. <laughs> Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. <laughs> Other players were Ken Mayer, Bela Kovach, Norman Jolly, and David Duval. Dick Tufel speaking. <laughs> now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks Rice. Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston present Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy have joined airlocks with a spaceship in which two criminals are holding Carol captive. Although the outlaws have meekly surrendered over the spaceophone, Buzz is still wary. I'm going to open the inner hatch, Happy. Have your ray gun ready. Yes, sir. You got us, Commander, with our hands up. Keep them that way. You can put those guns away because you can't see. Happy the lights. They're blinding, Commander. Now let them have a trembo. They can't see. They're helpless. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol adventure, The Cosmic Ray Detector. <laughs> Gang, it's terrific. It's sensational. It's new, different, thrilling. It'll pop your eyes wide open in amazement. It'll have you whistling like you never whistled before. It'll have you yelling with excitement because, gang, this is it the swellest regulation Space Patrol equipment you ever had the chance to own. I'm speaking of the Space Patrol Pocket Projectoscope. What does it look like? What does it do? How can you get it? Well, gang, I have the answers. It's a model of Buzz Corey Rocket Ship Terra 5. It's six inches long. It has four big tail fins. It has a one-inch radar antenna. It's made of beautiful blue and yellow plastic. What does it do? It blinks on and off rapidly. Flash, flash, flash like a real signal light. It throws a steady beam of light like a real flashlight. It shows pictures on the wall like a real film projector, complete with bulb and battery, complete with film containing four Space Patrol adventures. Now, you put this film in your projector scope, you darken the room, push the radar antenna, and there on the wall, you get a picture. To show a whole adventure, slide the film from picture to picture. Loads and loads of fun, and nothing, nothing like it ever before. Gang, to get a projector scope, do this. Buy a box of rice checks or wheat checks. Then, with your name and address, 
Send 35 cents in coin and a rice checks or wheat checks box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in the USA and may be withdrawn at any time. That's Space Patrol, Box 86, St. Louis, Missouri. And now, today's Space Patrol adventure, the Cosmic Ray Detector. In Commander Corey's central office at Space Patrol headquarters on Terra, Cadet Happy is checking through a file of search mission reports from the Venus Command as the Secretary General's daughter, Carol, enters. Hi, Happy. Oh, hello, Carol. Hey, that's some outfit. You like it? Dad got it for me especially for this trip to Jupiter. Hey, it looks great. Uh, what time does your ship leave? In about an hour. I'm going on the SS Space Queen. Hmm, traveling in style, eh? Well, I want to fly my own ship. But Dad talked me into taking the passenger transport. Mm. Is uh, the commander around? Oh, he stepped out about a half hour ago. I, I don't know when he'll be back. Oh, gosh, I hope he didn't forget. Say, that reminds me. He said this folder was for you. Oh, good. It's the data for my talks at Jupiter University. What are you going to talk about? Opportunities for youth in interplanetary government service. Well, that shouldn't give you any trouble. Well, I imagine the commander's notes in the space patrol will be a big help. Well, I'd better get over to the spaceport and see what's happened to my luggage. Okay, Carol. Good luck. Thanks, Happy. Oh, and thank the commander for these notes. Oh, sure. How are you doing, Happy? I'm nearly finished filing the reports, Commander. Oh, uh, Carol was just here. She got the notes all right. Good. You can finish that job later, Happy. We've got to get over to the spaceport. Is something wrong, sir? Yes, Happy, there is. One of our agents was on his way to the security lab with some of those new cosmic ray detector units. He was waylaid and slugged. The thief got six of the units and a copy of the formula. Smoke and rocket. Our agent got a brief glimpse of the man who slugged him. He's not positive, but he thinks the thief might be Dolph Rambo. Dolph Rambo. Mm. Now, where have I heard that name before? Rambo's been questioned a couple of times in the past in regard to some gem swindles. We couldn't make anything stick. Mm. So now he's branching out into cosmic ray detectors, huh? If it is Rambo who did it, I think he'll try to get the detector units off Terra as quickly as possible. I have an extra detail at the spaceport now. Let's get down there and look around. Oh, excuse me. Uh, could you tell me where the interplanetary transport ticket office is? Yes, I'm headed that way myself. Follow me. Why, thank you. Got the detectors, Hensley? Yes, in a jewel case right here in my pocket. No one's watching. Hand it to me. Better be careful, Rambo. The terminal is swarming with space patrol men. So what? Didn't you fix the detectors into a necklace the way you planned? Yes, and it's a beauty. It would take an expert to tell the real gems from the ray detector crystals. What about the formula? It's hidden under a false bottom of jewel case. Uh, and slip it to me. In ten minutes, I can be aboard the Space Queen. I think these Space Patrol agents are looking for somebody. If they get suspicious, they'll hold the gems for a careful examination. But they wouldn't hold me, Hensley. I've got those identification papers you fixed for me, showing that I'm a representative for Jupiter Gem Importers. It's too big a risk, Rambo. I wouldn't be surprised if everyone who was getting on the ship was thoroughly searched. Well, what are we going to do? Stay here on Terra? Ah, that's risky, too. Say, look over there. Hmm? Isn't that Carol Carlyle, the Secretary General's daughter? Where? Over there, checking her luggage. Yes, it is. Looks like she'll be aboard the Space Queen, too. Well, now, I doubt very much if her luggage would be searched. Well, what do you mean? Just this. You go on ahead. I'll wait here. And as soon as I can, I'll slip the jewel case into one of her suitcases. And after the ship gets to Jupiter, you can steal it back from her. Yeah, that's a great idea, Hensley. All right. But watch your step. Go on now. Get aboard. I'll take another ship to Jupiter and join you there. Commander, isn't that Carol over there by gate 12? Yes. Let's go over and say goodbye to her. It'll explain our presence here in case the thief is watching us. It's about 15 minutes until the Space Queen blasts off. Mm -hmm. While we're talking to Carol, we can get a line on the other passengers. Uh-oh. Come this way, Happy. Hmm? Just saw somebody I'd like to talk to, that fellow with the briefcase. Who is he, sir? Rambo. Get on the other side of him in case he tries to make a break. 
Leaving Terra, Rambo? Hmm? Oh, Commander Corey. Uh, yes, Commander, I'm going to Jupiter for the firm. The firm? Uh, Jupiter Gem Importers. I've been with them for nearly a year now. I see. I wonder if you'd mind coming with me to the guard office. Why, is something wrong? I'd like to ask you a few questions. It'd be less embarrassing in private. Oh, naturally, I have no objections, but the Space Queen is due to blast off in a few minutes. The ship will be held here until we've finished our checkup. If everything's all right, you'll be aboard, Rambo. Oh, very well, Commander. I'll come with you. Would you mind if we examined your luggage? <laughs> Certainly not. But, uh, may I ask what you're looking for? If you have it, you know what I'm looking for. If you don't, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Satisfied, Commander? Oh, not quite, Rambo. What did you find out, Happy? All the luggage has been checked, sir. Nothing. How about Rambo's? His is okay, too. All right, Rambo, you can go now. Thank you, Commander. I must say your men have been very thorough. That's their job. The Space Queen will be blasting off in a few minutes. Yes. I uh, hope you find what you're after. <laughs> Whatever that may be. Well, sir, it looks as though we drew a blank on Rambo this time. Happy, you and I are going to blast off for Jupiter and Terra 5 and see what we can find out about Rambo and his honest business venture. This is Dolph Rambo on Jupiter calling Burton Henchley aboard private space cruiser J-437. Rambo calling Burton Henchley. Henchley here. Go ahead. Henchley, something's gone wrong. What do you mean? Where are you? At the Hotel Juno in Jupiter City. Did you get the ray detector? No, they weren't in Carol's suitcase. I checked right after the luggage was taken off the Space Queen. But they got to be. Are you sure you picked the right one? Yes, but they weren't there. The jewel case was gone. Now listen, don't get panicky. The girl probably has it. Where is she staying? At the Olympia Hotel. Well, I'll be landing at Jupiter City in a few minutes. Just sit tight till I get there. We'll search her room. Suppose she's in it. Figure some way to get her out for a while. A fake phone call out to do the trick. Yeah, but what'll I tell her? Well, that's your problem. After all, it should be simple for an experienced con man like you. All right, Hensley. I'll think of something. Happy? Yes, Commander? You want me to take over the controls? Oh, no, thanks. Space control has cleared us for landing. I'll bring her in. I just wanted to tell you that our suspicions of Rambo are well-founded. Oh? You mean he's the one that slugged our agent and took the ray detector? He might be. At any rate, this gem importing firm he works for has a dubious reputation. Space Control just relayed some information on it. Jupiter Gem Importers is run by a man named Burton Henchley. And Henchley blasted off from Terra right after the Space Queen. Did they find anything aboard his ship, sir? No. no. Henchley was clean. Very likely he was the one who was talking to Rambo at the spaceport. Well, I, I wonder why Rambo didn't go with Hinchley. If they're both going to Jupiter, it would have saved a fare in the space queen. Well, maybe business is so good they don't have to worry about credits. Well, it could be that Rambo intends to pick out a future victim among the passengers. After we land in Jupiter City, we'll pay Carol a visit and then check up on our gem experts. This is Carol's room, Henchley, 1209. Is anybody looking, Rambo? All clear. Ah, it's locked. We'll have to use the magna key. In here, quickly. Now, let's get to work. Let's see, we got about 20 minutes before she realized that uh, there is no Professor Blackwell who's going to meet her in the Juno Hotel coffee shop. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good gimmick, wasn't it? When I found out Carol was here to talk at the university, I thought she'd probably fall for something like that. Yes, yes, very clever. Now, let's see if you're clever enough to find a jewel case. Uh, and that suitcase there on the rack, that's the one it's supposed to be in, isn't it? Yes, but it's been partly unpacked. See, like I told you, it isn't here. Uh, she must have found it on the ship. Uh-uh. Look. Here on the dressing table. Is that it? Oh, it's the case, but the necklace is gone. She's either wearing it or she had it locked up in a hotel wall. 
Now what are we going to do? Well, we'll have to wait till she gets back. Yeah, but suppose she's turned the jewels over to the space Let's patrol. Let's see now. See if the formula is still in the case. Yeah, yeah it's still here. Well, my guess is she's wearing the necklace. After all, she'd never suspect that some of the gems are really ray detector crystals. Wait, what's this? A space agreement. Look, she started to send a message and was interrupted. To Secretary General Carlisle Terra. It's to her father. Dear Dad, what a wonderful surprise. I found a necklace when I opened the suitcase on the ship. You really shouldn't have. That's all the farther she got. Oh, my phone call as Professor Blackwell interrupted her. Oh, that's a break. Supposing she'd send this spacegram. Yeah. I'll just take this message. Listen. Someone's at the door. It's probably Carol. Uh, we won't get rough unless we have to, but we're going to get her out of here. Here we are, sir. 12.09. We won't stay very long, Happy. Carol's probably anxious to prepare a speech for the university. Yeah, and I'm anxious to find out what Rambo and Hinchley are up to. Carol, it's Cousin Happy. Well, didn't the clerk tell you that Carol just got back, sir? Yes. Well, she's here, all right. The door's ajar. Well, maybe she's in another part of the suite unpacking. I don't think she'd mind if we went in. Carol, are you here? Uh-oh. What's going on? Chairs are upset. Things on the desk. The table are smashed. Let's look around. Carol? Carol? Well, she's not in here. Oh, gee, sir, what do you suppose happened? Carol's been taken away. By the looks of this room, she wasn't very willing to go. Happy notify Jupiter City Space Patrol. I'll start questioning the hotel staff. We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. Say, gang, how's your morning takeoff? Are you blasting off with your jets really roaring? Are you riding your bike like Buzz Corey rides his rocket? I mean with your speedometer smoking like a volcano on Venus. In other words, space patrollers, are you supercharged in the morning? Well, here's the way the Commander Corey gets supercharged. He tucks away a power breakfast with Rice Chex or Wheat Chex, the super cereals. Try Rice Chex today. What'll you say? Delicious. And try Wheat Chex today. So swell tasting, you'll eat more and more and more and more. Rice Chex, Wheat Chex. The only cereals in the universe with that modern bite-sized design for easy eating. The only cereals in the universe with a picture of Commander Corey or Cadet Happy on the outside of the package. And the only cereals in the universe with that mysterious magic space picture on the inside of the package. The super cereals that help to supercharge you. Rice Chex, Wheat Chex. So gang, one, two, three. Get ready to blast off to your grocer's forum right after today's Space Patrol adventure. And now, back to our Space Patrol adventure, the Cosmic Ray Detector. Buzz and Happy are investigating the mysterious disappearance of the Secretary General's daughter, Carol, from her hotel room in Jupiter City. Knowing that Carol's luggage would not be thoroughly searched for the stolen Cosmic Ray Detector crystals, the two thieves, Burton Henschley and Dolph Rambo, had put the crystals in one of Carol's suitcases. They intended to retrieve them before the luggage could be removed from the Jupiter City spaceport to the hotel. But their plan misfired when Carol accidentally discovered the crystals, which the thieves had disguised by working them into an expensive-looking necklace. While Happy examined Carol's hotel room for clues, Commander Corey has finished interrogating the hotel staff. Find anything, Happy? Mm, no, sir. Maybe one of the lab experts could make something out of these smudged fingerprints. I can't. Two technicians are on their way over now. I finally located a maid that's pretty sure she saw Carol. She was with two men. They were going down the rear stairs. Did she say Carol was struggling? According to the maid, she didn't appear to be. Of course, they could have held a ray gun on her. The maid thought it was strange they didn't see the elevator. Mm. Well, here's one thing I found. It may not mean much, sir, but... Well, it was in the wastebasket. Here it is. It was all wadded up. A spacogram. Carol's father. She must have decided to rewrite it. It isn't finished. Dearest Dad, I opened my suitcase on the ship to get a book to read, and there was this beautiful necklace. I was so surprised. Necklace. That could be a motive, all right. Someone in the ship may have seen it. Rambo. Possibly. Rambo doesn't go in for strong-arm methods. 
Besides, taking the necklace would be one thing, but forcing Carol to go with him, well, that's something else. Well, maybe she didn't have the necklace with her, and the crook was making her take him to where it was. But where else would it be? Carol just arrived here. It would be here in a room or a hotel vault. I'll check with the manager. Hmm. That phone call, I wonder. Phone call? The desk clerk said a professor Blackwell of the university called Carol shortly after she checked in. She told the clerk she'd be back in an hour, but came back much earlier. Happy, let's get over to headquarters. Yes, sir. We'll check with the university on Professor Blackwell, and then I'll space upon the Secretary General for a description of that necklace. Rimbo, I'll let you out here. Go to the spaceport and get clearance for our ship to blast off. What about Carol? I'll take care of her. Take her to the lab till I hear from you. You're going to leave her there till somebody finds her? No, we'll get her aboard the ship. Once we get her out in space, nobody will find her. And if they do, she won't be able to tell them anything. All right, Rimbo. Get out and hurry to the spaceport. Are you sure you can handle her? And drive, too. Yeah, if she gives me any trouble, the paralyzer ray will quit her down. Now get going. All right, Hensley. I'll call you at the lab. It's only a few blocks to the jewelry lab, Carol, so don't make it difficult for yourself. Well, I don't understand why you're forcing me to come with you. You could have tied me up in the hotel room and gotten away with the necklace. Of course. And within an hour, you have the space patrol looking for us. All right. Well, take your hand off that wheel. Stop it. You idiot. You... And now, see what you've done. You... Uh, come back here. Get back in this car. Thanks for the ride. Come back here. Come back. I just checked with the university, sir. There's no Professor Blackwell on the staff, and nobody there knew that Carol had arrived on Jupiter. Then that call was designed to get Carol out of her room while they searched for the necklace. I've talked to the Secretary General. He didn't give Carol that necklace. Well, then who did? I don't think it was ever intended that Carol find it. It was smuggled into her suitcase back on Terra. By, by Rambo? Or his partner. They figured that Carol's luggage wouldn't be searched. Yeah, but it was searched, sir. It was a clever trick. You simply wanted to get the jewelry through. Mm, certainly. No one would suspect the Secretary General's daughter of having jewelry that wasn't hers. Well, here's the important point, Happy. Rambo is supposedly a messenger for a legitimate gem importer. Why couldn't he openly carry jewelry? Hey, that's right, sir. Unless something else was being passed off as jewelry. The ray detector crystals. Right. And perhaps the stolen formula. I'll get it, Happy. Maybe for Captain Raymond. He's using Major Young's office temporarily. Commander Corey here. Commander, this is Carol. Carol, where are you? I'm in the Jupiter Arcade building at Public Communications Booth 27. Are you all right? Yes. I managed to get away from Rambo and Hitchley. They're planning to blast off from Jupiter and Hitchley's private cruiser. Are they at the spaceport now? Rambo is. Hitchley's somewhere near. I managed to cause an accident with his surface car. All right, Carol, you stay right there in the arcade building. Happy and I'll be right over to pick you up. Come on, Happy, let's get going. Expecting someone, miss? Hinchley. Don't spread any alarm, Miss Carol. I've got something here that's more painful than a paralyzer ray. Now quietly to my car. <laughs> Rambo should have my ship ready by now. I've looked all over the arcade, Commander. She's not here. Did you check the communication booth? Yes, sir, and the cafe. I told her to stay right here. Maybe she saw Hinchley or Rambo. That's what has me worried. Oh, but they wouldn't try anything here in this crowd. If they suspect that Carol called me, they're desperate enough to try anything. Get into our surface car, Happy. We're going to the spaceport. See, Miss Carroll, that break for freedom didn't do you a bit of good. Yes. We're hundreds of DUs out of Jupiter now. Where are you taking me? Well, your part of the trip is just about over. We have to get rid of you. It's regret. Hensley, look at the rear view scope. Huh? Looks like something's coming after us. Spaceship. Increase the sensitivity. Let's see if we can identify it. It's a space patrol battle cruiser. Commander Corey. Now, I am glad I brought you along. 
Corey 1, dare fire on us now. Commander Corey aboard Terra 5, calling Hedgley and Rambo aboard private cruiser J-437. Commander Corey to Hedgley and Rambo. What are we going to do? That's Corey's problem. Let him worry about it. Corey to Hedgley and Rambo. I'm right behind you. Stand by to be boarded. Here, I'll talk to him. Uh, Hedgley to Corey. Let me give you some advice. Turn around and go back and keep the rest of your space patrol away from us. We got Carol Carlyle all aboard. I'm giving you a chance to surrender, Hensley. Better play it smart. Corey, if you come any closer, we're going to push Miss Carlyle out into space without a spacesuit. I thought that would cool you off. Rambo, stop her. She's running back up. Hey, you, come back here. Rambo, grab her quickly. I'm warning you. I mean business. Now, come out of that compartment. Open up, you little fool. Open up or I'll break the door down. Go ahead. Rambo, did you catch her? She locked herself in the compartment. What are we going to do now? The only thing you can do is give up. You can't harm Carol now. Well, what's your answer? Uh, all right, Corey. You win. We'll cut our velocity and stand by to be boarded. I'm coming up to join airlocks. Uh, check. Hensley out. You'd cut off the space phone, Corey. I'd never known we couldn't carry out our threat. We're not through yet, but I want Corey to think so. Yeah, but what can we do now? Listen, get a couple of high-powered atomo lights. Rig them up so they're focused on the inner hedge. Atomo lights? Yeah. Stand in front of them. Then when Corey comes through the hedge, step aside. Before he can recover from the glare, we'll take care of him for sure. Join airlocks, Commander. Stand by with magnetic holding field. Standing by, sir. Airlock secured. Apply holding field. All right, Happy. Into the airlock. Yes, sir. Do you think they'll try anything, sir? We're going to be prepared just in case they do. Have your ray gun? Yes, sir. All right. Open the outer hatch. Now into their airlock. I'll go first. You got us, Commander, with our hands up. Yes, you, you can put those guns away. Because you can see. Happy, though. It's my eyes. Uh, let them have it, Rambo. <coughs> I got the cadet. Oh, yeah? Where are you, you coward? Up right here. <coughs> I could just see where you were so I could get my hands on where you. Where are you, Hap? Over here, sir. Then this must be Hensley. <coughs> <coughs> Hang on, Happy. I'm coming. Thanks, sir, but I think this will do it. <coughs> Nice going, Hap. Oh, for a while there, I thought they had us. That was close, all right. Buzz, Happy, are you all right? Yes, Carol, and you? Oh, I'm fine. Oh, Commander, here's the necklace. I found it in Hinchley's pocket. Oh, good. Hang on to it. Uh, uh, but which ones are the ray detector crystals? We'll let the lab experts figure it out. Oh, Buzz, look at the time. How, how long will it take us to get back to Jupiter? I don't know exactly. Oh, about an hour. Why? Well, if we don't hurry, I'll be late for my lecture at the university. Oh, fine. She was pretty nearly thrown out in space, and now she's worried about the lecture. What's your subject for the lecture, Carol? Government service. A job with security. Security, she says. <laughs> <laughs> a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. Hey, gang, imagine the fun of owning a model rocket that shows pictures on the wall. Imagine the fun of owning a rocket you can use as a signal light and also as a flashlight. Well, the new Space Patrol Pocket Projectoscope does all these things. Yes, sir, it's a film projector, signal light, and a flashlight all in one. Nothing like it on the face of the earth before. It comes with a real strip of film for showing pictures on the wall. And, gang, wait till you see what those pictures are. Four complete Space Patrol adventures with Buzz Corey and Cadet Happy. Listen to these titles. Space Pirate, Men from Mars, Robot Invasion, Mighty Missile. Don't they sound terrific? You bet. And just think, gang, you can show these complete Space Patrol adventures on your wall. You just slip the film in your projectoscope, darken the room, push the radar antenna, and there on the wall you have it, a real picture. So, gang, don't wait not a single day. Send for this wonderful new Space Patrol pocket projectoscope just as soon as you can. Remember, it's a film projector, it's a signal light, it's a flashlight all in one. A six-inch blue and yellow plastic model of Buzz Corey's own rocket ship. And it comes to you complete with bulb, battery, and film. To get a projectoscope, buy a box of rice checks or wheat checks, the cereals that bring you the magic space picture. 
Then, with your name and address, send 35 cents in coin and a rice checks or wheat checks box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good in the USA only and may be withdrawn at any time. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. And now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy are in an underground passage deep beneath Saturn City, attempting to capture a plutonium thief, Victor Drumlin. Drumlin has burst the atmosphere pumps and is drawing deadly methane gas from Saturn's atmosphere into the lower levels. Protected by a shielded hideout, Drumlin refuses to surrender. That methane gas isn't going to stop us, Drumlin. We can break that door down before it reaches this level. That door is built to shield against an explosion, Corey. The kind you're going to hear in a moment. What does he mean, Commander? He's bluffing, Happy. Methane isn't explosive. It is when it's mixed with ordinary air and ignited. Listen! What's that, Commander? He's turned on the generators, Happy. If he overloads them, he'll ignite the gas and blow up Saturn City. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story... The Secret of Sub-Level 7, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! Special bulletin for boys and girls in Dayton, Ohio, and Baltimore, Maryland. Buzz Corey's own space battle cruiser, the Ralston Rocket, will be in your area next week. Don't miss it. The Ralston Rocket! Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmerer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Katapi, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Bela Kovac, Ken Mayer, and Virginia Hewitt. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday, every Saturday, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol. And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story on your local ABC television.